Learn jewelry design and object fabrication through ZBrush. Expert, beginner, and every skill level in between. ZBrush Jewelry Workshops can help you bring your digital dreams into reality. Taught by leading industry professionals. Use the offer code SUMMIT to get a $100 discount on membership.
Learn jewelry design and object fabrication through ZBrush. Expert, beginner, and every skill level in between. ZBrush Jewelry Workshops can help you bring your digital dreams into reality. Taught by leading industry professionals. Use the offer code SUMMIT to get a $100 discount on membership.
Hello again, people at home and around the world, live from the green stage here at the Mobion facilities in sunny Burbank, California. I know you've heard me say it, the weather never changes really in California, and we're mm. flexing like a Steve Houston drawing over to my associate and friend, Paul Gabriel. Say hello to the people He's, at home. Is it, This is the new material for today. This is fresh. I like that. I love the you were very official, too, right when you started off. I'm ready to go. Papers. Off yeah. and running. You gotta, it's on script. They're blank pieces of paper. I mean, let's be serious. He's just trying to make himself look like he's a reporter or something up here, right? Traffic and weather on the ones. <laughs> Traffic and weather. We already know what the weather is because we're in Southern California. So. Do you know I was once expelled from a radio broadcast that I used to do for the Seneca College what? in Toronto? Yeah, I had this radio show uh, called The Freak Show. I'm sure nobody nobody could imagine me hosting something called The Freak Show. Hey, wait, is this show. available for us to watch? Because I'm in front of a No, computer. this is before the... Because I'm before, happy to share the thank link goodness, in the this chat. This is before the times of social media. I'm aging myself. This is definitely before the time of any of these things, and I'm so glad. Um, we had No, a, I think it would be a lot of fun to see that. You're probably right. Listen, well, yeah. I did a video when I was in high school, too, you know? That would be This fun. was not a video. Are you, are you hearing what I'm saying to you? This was a weekly thing. I go into I a it. booth, and they have me there, and it broadcasted like, yeah. you know, I, I can't believe they let me get away with this. And again, I'm getting away with it again. Here we are. <laughs> I, I was about to say, you're getting <sighs> away with it again Stretch right now. Stretch one more time. That's hey, what I was about to say. Let me ask you yes, something. please. So yesterday mm -hmm. was chock full. I mean, that was, mm -hmm. can we rewind mm -hmm. the tape for a mm -hmm. second? for the, In case you're mm -hmm. tuning in today for the first time to the 2000s. Yeah, who didn't tune in yesterday? I would be intrigued to know on the chat. I, I they couldn't imagine. Able to make it yesterday. I couldn't imagine with all the free tidbits and information that was being thrown at you. And then that one illustrious, the one, I'm going to look at you straight in the camera, that one illustrious thing that happened. We went live behind the guarded veil of Sideshow Collectibles in Thousand Oaks, California, the one and only Sideshow Collectibles, and we met with the elves. They're not really elves. They're they're grown people that make the magic happen. The one thing I will say, yep. as great as it was, Ian Robinson, our foreign correspondent, our on-location correspondent, a fellow ZBrush teammate, mm -hmm. took us live to the scene of the crime where they make all the good stuff happen. What is the one standout for you? Uh, I, the detail of work that they kick out, really. Like, you see it. Like, it's crazy how much Like detail. on the scarecrow, right? Everything, yeah. Should I do the first? Like that first piece of mat, yeah, that Matt had, yeah, it was just is crazy. Crazy. All of them were. I mean, I like that it was different. We got to see the opportunity of seeing different types of styles during that, too. So right. every artist had something different. You know how I feel about me, about me some Transformers and some Hard Surface. So you got your Hard paint. Surface. Yeah, yesterday. Yeah, Optimus, you know. The paint see. roller. That was, yeah. the, that was the other one. He was like, that. I'm, I'm feeling very yeah. physical today, very De Niro. Looks the like Louis had, Louis had some sleep last night. Hardly. Hardly. We are at summoning. All. We all know this. We, we are summoning. summoning. There is no such thing as sleep these days. We'll sleep till Brooklyn is the song. I think. I think they yeah. say. Hey, so I know uh, someone. Someone's jumping in there saying they really enjoyed the cloth demo from Sherilyn, which I oh. thought was outstanding. So it was like, yeah, there were all there was a the lot of good stuff. You mean the cloth uh, disposition? We we basically got a, a dissertation, rather a dissertation on how to do cloth inside of ZBrush. In case you missed it, you should tune in to the replay action. Uh, via our streams and our channels and see the action and magic again. Uh, hey, so for me, you know, you know what? I was kind of a little bummed. There was only one thing that I was bummed about. We didn't mm -hmm. get into the costuming area as I had, as I had uh, so desired. I wanted to see the threads, the little elves making the jackets and the tight pants. I know you were wishing for Everyone that. Everyone knows I like the tight pants. You know I mean? It worked for the tight pants. I'm going to go on a limb and probably say that's because it was probably... Somewhere where they weren't able to go at that moment. That's, you're probably right. It was probably top some, secret. Top secret, as you like to say. Yeah. Secret. That's, that's like the mothership of top secret. Did you see that office? we got to redo our office at ZBrush. Well, they did do it, remember. All the artists did it themselves. Made right? in ZBrush. They printed everything off. And Tell the people at home. Put it all together. Where yeah, was it they made? Did, they used a lot of ZBrush for Hold on a second. And some other. Where was it made? It was made in ZBrush. Made in ZBrush as well. Pointing so, at the logo. Look at look at my desk. Look at that. Pointing at the ZBrush logo right there. Okay, you're traveling, traveling over here. You see what I did there? Mark. Hey, so let me yes. uh, let me get on with it here. So again, that was our, our own very own Ian Robinson who will be joining me later here because you're going to be doing something uh, spectacular as well today. I'm a little jelly that I, I get I get locked in here. You know what I mean? You are jelly. I will give you that. That's a great way to yeah. Great way to put it for you today. I'm never jelly. I mean, I'm never I'm never really jealous of anything to be honest. But I, I'm kind of uh, there's a bit of I want to go out there and get scanned too. Oh, you do. So you just you just dropped some of it. Yeah, what's I, happening I, today? I'm I'm pushing it on you now. But should we talk ahead. about what's yeah, happening? Go ahead. Okay, go ahead. well, go ahead. I, you're gonna be you you're should. you're gonna be well. You're still gonna be with me, and and mm -hmm. he's gonna be out there again. Uh, we're yep. gonna be first. We're gonna kick off the action with Rand Manilov, of course, by uh, by internet feed, the magic of the internet, through the ether of the space and time, Gavna. Where's the vicar? And he will be with us, um, of course, by way of London, England.
Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah, I think he's right now currently in London. He's moving around a lot for projects. You think he's think sitting he's currently in London? Right now. You think he's sitting right now getting that first cup of tea? Simon Walker. Probably not. No, I, Probably <laughs> not. The, the big one Getting that they, I'm sure they're going to be clamoring by their screens in droves. There probably be multiple people sitting at their desks watching that one. The God of War, Sony Santa Monica, the art and the characters of God of War. Wowie wow. The game just dropped. Yeah. Where's the camera? You can't see my face. The game just dropped. I, my, my jaw is coming off the desk. The game just dropped. And we've got the whole team here. And, yeah. and the, the guy himself. Rafael Grossetti on remote location from Brazil. Yeah, he'll be joining us. For o Grande Brasileiro is going to be yeah. with us live on a remote feed. Yep. And we get to chat with him. And then him. we've got a bunch of people from the team here in Of course. Not to take anything away from them. Yeah, it's going to be good. I just There's... bumped into him. You know where? Where? At the Lightbox Expo. Okay. And he still has the biceps. He still has the, the physique. Yeah. I told him you look good. Look good. Yeah, he said the same thing. He's to me. got awesome work. Definitely. Okay, so uh, Marco Plouffe joins us later on today, sculpting and posing. Um, and then. We're going to be uh, having some fun, mm -hmm. and we move on to Wednesday, and we've got the AFA, Foundry and Form. That is where you're going to be slip sliding your way with the molten hot stuff and, and pouring some stuff, right? Yeah, we're going to take a tour. You're being very subdued. I know you've a got tour. this in you. I know you've got this in you. You think, uh, you think I don't know. He's very excited. He's being very subdued, very professional these days. Um, <laughs> very professional. Frame store is going to happen with the creatures from sketch to screen. I like the, I, I say it, I'll say it again. I've said it before. I'll say it again. Yes. There's something very evocative and joyous about drawing something and then working to bring it into life in a 3D space like ZBrush. And that is what keeps me going. If you ever want to know what the secret is and how I keep the energy up, uh, sketch and draw in your little books or on papers whenever possible. Yeah. Then what about the next guy? Raphael Phillips. Who's that? He's an amazing artist. Also, get us on the camera background. a second here. Wakanda and forever. You, and yeah, they showed that piece yesterday at the sideshow walkthrough. The piece that he did. He'll be breaking down that piece. It was the Black Panther. What did you think of that? Really? It's in crazy insane. Especially that suit is. Yeah. That's no joke, trying to replicate that and yeah. make him look like the on-screen suit. Those are always extremely difficult to do and figure out how you're going to do that as an artist. You know, I was with last night. I had, I'm, I'm going to drop a name. I dropped you, the name. You were with such, who? I was with uh, Joe Mena last evening. Oh. But he, he also brought uh, out um, Juan, the, the rooster. Shout out to the rooster and the people who work on those costumes. Really great work. But mm -hmm. uh, not to take anything away also from Raphael and his representation of it in the digital clay format and giving uh, the glorious... Uh, spotlight to Chadwick Boseman, the late Chadwick. Uh, mm. Really great characterization of that. Uh, I, you know I have that first appearance comic book. You, <laughs> that doesn't do. surprise me. Of course I do. What sea do Beast. Of course you do. What do you sea think? Beast, the making of a character. Uh, we've got Viz Dev model of the Sea Beast. The Netflix uh, is a great, great film. Have you seen it? I have. Beware the Beast. Fun. It was I'll a fun it movie. I loved it. It, it kind of reminded me, if you, if you want to go back in the annals of video games, PS2 uh, type people, uh, and maybe even, even to the back. Have you ever played that game Shadow of the Colossus? Shadow of, yeah, I think I you know. You know what I'm talking about? These big monsters, about. and you had this yeah. little character, and you're wandering around on a horse, and you get this. That's what CB's reminding right. me of. Like, why are they trying to okay. kill these things? You know, and I wish yeah. I'd get a screenshot. And then, and then, and then on Wednesday, the, the coup d'etat, the last thing that we will do is our own, very own, you, me, and Ian Robinson. That's Paul Gabery, Ian Robinson, and Louis Tucci are going to show you the latest inside the ZBrush, uh, under the hood, as they say, a little sneak peek. And then we'll do the sculpt off announcement where we will crown the winners with the top five. We'll get, uh, we'll get some spec. And Paul, tell them everybody wins something, don't they? Yeah. Everyone's winning. What? Wakanda! No, I'm kidding. Everyone's Everybody. winning right now. They're Every seeing you. That's a win. That's a joy. <laughs> That's a win right there. It's a there. joy for me. I would like to point out that we're getting the trend going a little bit right here, and I really, I'm really, it makes me smile. A moment with Louie is starting to trend. Okay, we're starting yeah, to trend. You know what? And speaking of that, I would love to see how people are watching us. Uh, so hashtag, take a picture of how you're watching us at the Zebra Summit and hashtag ZBS22. Again, hashtag ZBS22. Take a, take a selfie of how you're watching us. I'd love to see, see that, especially if you're watching in a group. We'd love to be able to see that. Uh, that would be something else? really cool that I think would be fun to go back and look at all the people the way they were watching. I, 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 think I got a post someone sent me. They said, oh, we were watching many of us on the screen. And I thought, oh, send a picture of that. I'd love to, we'd love to see that kind of thing. Like they're having a street festival somewhere watching ZBrush. Um, I wanted yeah. to ask you something. Yes, Something really do. stood out to me. I wanted to say that uh, I remain hopeful about returning to a, a more glorious smile after seeing the work of uh, not only Dr. Shivago but of Dan Catrius. But Shivago rattled me to my core with some of the technology and the science and the, and the magic of science. Rattled you to your core. Rattled. You can hear that? Rattle my teeth loose almost. 
uh, after playing well, hockey yeah, for well, so many you years. See the drills, yeah, that's going to rattle me f to the core for sure. The yeah. science and technology, seeing the fusion of science and technology in the place that ZBrush plays in that in the lexicon of what could be the future of science and medicine, that's the stuff that really keeps us going. You can. You know what I, I really like? It's, it's a different way of showing ZBrush too. It's a different way of seeing how it's being used in so many different ways. ZBrush is being used by easily, I would say, 10 plus industries, if not more, where it's a large part of the pipeline. It's not just a little sliver, it's pretty large parts of the pipeline, whether it be 20, 30, 50, or even the whole pipeline um, in some cases. So it's really cool to just be able to share that with all of you to see how things are happening. Because these are conversations Louis, Ian, and I are having, many other people on the team, with different artists from different backgrounds. Um, on a regular basis and uh, our goal point. is always when we're developing is thinking about all those user bases and thinking about how we can come up with stuff that would really push all artwork forward. Yeah, yeah. and we, we really derive a lot from the community as well. There's, there's no shortage of concepts or ideas. So I mean really at the, at the end of the day it's, it's on us as artists to push the envelope of what could be possible and we've got a lot of wonderful things plotted and planned for, uh, for ZBrush as it continues to evolve and develop into and maintain its title as the world's leading digital sculpting software. I think that's fair to say. And yeah, if uh, if you would uh, be courageous in your efforts and your uh, and your scope, try to reach further. And you know, the software is there to help you to do that. I think that's that's all very fair sort of language to use when we talk about that experience. Uh, it's really up to the the imagination of users to do with it what they will. Really excited about today. Um, we've got uh, Rand Manilov is going to be joining us again. Like I said, mm -hmm. on remote. Yep. He's, got, he's running a ton of different projects, too. Love, Death, and Robots is one of them. We ended it yesterday with Damien. Yeah. Right? The and Damien. You, you've got Dame the name Standard. of the brush down for you. Now you know. That's Dame Standard, people. Dame. Okay. There ain't no yeah. Dame about it. Yeah. <laughs> ain't misbehaving. <laughs> <laughs> and then you showed the second one. You got to show the second one, too. And Hard got to go into poly painting. I think that was also a highlight. It's just seeing how poly painting is being done and how that can be used within a workflow, and that's like traditional old school way of maybe painting stuff. So I think that was a really good behind like little tip that a lot of people ask, hey, how can I start getting better looking painting, what, especially Kinte? Yeah. As an extension to that, he showcased the power of polygroups for creating more um, succinct seams. And I thought that was really special. There was this really kind of sharp thing that was happening there. And uh, and I think that that's something to, to rewatch if you haven't watched. I mean, that that, was a, a glorious little tip and trick. Yeah. And, yeah. looking at you, looking at me, <laughs> and yes. it actually ties in so expertly. Did you do this on purpose when uh, sure. casting these people? Absolutely. It's almost as if you've curated a wonderful group of people to go after each other in this order. Rand Manilov, this guy that we're going to bring to the stage, can I start to talk about him a little more? Yeah, go ahead. Please yeah, do. When I start to talk about this guy, this guy's got awards coming out the Yazoo. Woo woo! And his, his classicism, he's trained. He's a real trained artist, and his work looks the part, and so I think um, it's really fascinating to see all the ways that people play ZBrush. I, I want to start transferring the idea of playing ZBrush. You know, do you think about it that way? Do you think about it as a, as a, as a game? Like I think about it as, do you play ZBrush mm -hmm. you know, the, as an instrument, so to speak? Well, I, yeah, I could see, honestly, you can see it in that sense because you're sitting there sitting with a back. ball of clay. You're sitting with a ball of clay, and then you're making something, whatever's in your mind, and letting it just come as it goes through. Sometimes on the screen, sometimes that carries you through the sculpt. Hence, you know, I'm sure musicians have some things like that. They just start jamming away. Futzing along. And just something clicks and they yeah. just start finding something that works for them. Stump, you know, there's a, there's a root there. There's something that I found, I, I won't name them all because it's a serious bit of business, but I think that there's, um, there's that concept of stumbling forward. And stumbling forward we will do here live as I'm getting the cue. Ran is nice ready one. in, see what I did there? That was Unscripted. a good one. My God, who is this guy? Someone put that in chat, that was a good one. Was, you better believe it, I'm on fire. I had my Wheaties and I'm ready to roll. He had so his Wheaties, people, he's not on the box yet, but he's by, reaching for it. <laughs> this, pro, this portion of the program is brought to you by Paul Gabriel and the Gabriel Foundation, I'm kidding. Okay, let's go live with uh, Ran Manilov from uh, Her Majesty's Empire, London, In uh, here he is, London calling. Ran Manilov is gonna be up next and we'll be back with that in a moment right yes let's cue the tape hey ran ran hey guys how are you i'm great yes um Waiting yeah, you. How are you guys doing great i love the uh, is that a little christmas tree already getting started and going back there with those lights in the back it's, corner um 
It's actually not a Christmas tree. It's a simply decoration. I like uh, it. From, oh, yeah. it looks like a mountain village in Spain. Oh, there you go. Yeah, it could be a mountain village. Well, thanks for joining us. We're excited to have you. I know you've got a lot of stuff you want to share and several different projects possibly that you'll be able to share with us. You, I've worked on so yeah. many things, so we're really excited to have you be a part of uh, the summit this year. Before you start, Rand, I want to give kudos like I do to so many others. Uh, you have won numerous awards. Master of Arts Academy of Fine Arts, Sofia Bulgaria. Uh, Master of Arts Academy, again, winner. Universidad de Granada, Faculty de Bellas Artes in Granada, again, in España. Uh, I just want to tip the hat to you. This guy's got a list. I, I could go on the laundry list, the special prize winner, um, all kinds of award winner in a graffiti. Con I want to hear some of those things if you have a chance to talk about them. So don't uh, don't forget. Yeah, of course. About the, um, People should know you got a, a great style and you're a fantastic artist. Take it away, Ran. Thank you, thank you so much, guys. Uh, thank you, Louis, for the kind words, and thank you, Paul, for welcoming me here. Uh, seriously, guys, for me, this is a huge honor, and I've been uh, basically waiting for, uh, you know, being part at some point, uh, finally. Uh, Appreciate made it. it. And uh, just thank you so much for invitation, for hosting us, uh, everyone organizing everything. Uh, you guys did an amazing job, even though we are streaming from all over the world, and some of some of us made it uh, all over to, all the way to LA, but amazing um, and really, really happy to be part of it. Thank you, man. That really means Thank a you. lot as well. It's uh, it's for the community that we do this and for the people around the world who, uh, who can't be with us, like you said, we're with you in spirit and we're tuning in and uh, broadcasting live for that very reason, just to be able to keep the fabric of the community strong and together now more than ever in these trying times. Uh, you, you hit the nail on the head. And for you to take time out of your day and, pre and all the work you leading up to this too. Thank you. It's Absolutely. A lot. Thank you yeah. in all the languages. Gracias. You're welcome. Gracias, Emilio. Yeah. I'm excited to I'm excited to see what you're going to show. Yeah, it's you have a lot a, of fun. You have a tremendous style. I, I was really um, taken aback. Your your forms and your volumes, everything is really traditionally based and rooted. It's really great to see that, um, and the fusion of that kind of style with the technology is is a joy to see. So I'm I'm happy to have a chance to meet with you. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you so much. It means it means a lot, and uh, it's great to hear that it's um, in a way getting recognition. Um, with me, it was a little bit of a, I mean, as you already mentioned, coming from a traditional background, et cetera, at some point, I wasn't sure if uh, if this will be a plus or it's going to be a minus in terms of when it comes to uh, commercial work, right? Um, you are, in a way, um, a little more away from it, at least in the beginning, until you uh, make your your way in it and you you find your the best way to express and 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 this artistic touch that i have and it comes mostly from uh from drawing really um the awards you mentioned they are mostly for um yeah traditional drawing contemporary drawing and all that kind of stuff but then uh, throughout the years i realized that actually it was super uh, super useful and very important to uh, understand the line and the silhouette and it comes to uh, to shapes and volumes and rhythms and uh, which I'll be talking about but um, not to go too uh, yeah too abstract I have a lot to show you um, I'll be sharing uh, today some of the work I've done for love death and robots uh, working with with together with blur um at the moment i need to like to say that i am um collaborating with few studios um just working as a freelancer uh, more and more as a conceptual sculptor um also as a asset supervision um creature supervision and uh concept design as well um as well as uh here in london I am the head of the studio and VFX supervisor of Worldwide FX, um, which is a um, fairly small boutique studio uh, for film and visual effects. Uh, we have a great team of 25 to 30 people, and uh, we are getting more and more uh, involved with uh, game uh, design, with uh, asset production, and also, of course, uh, the main thing for us is the visual effects and the film. However, today, since I'm not coming um, 
only representing the company. Uh, I'm mostly representing myself as an artist as uh, and talk about a little bit uh, about myself. So thank you for that and allowing me to do it. I'll be it's talking more about my freelance, uh, yeah, my, my freelance projects and uh, the stuff that um, basically I am combining and working on after um, working hours, um, staying up late and, you know, working on some cool projects that I didn't want to miss throughout the year. So being very lucky and um, yeah, to, to have the chance to, to work on. So if you guys don't have any questions or if you do um, shoot now, because we are diving in uh, the Love, Death and Robots trip that I had with Blur. I like that how you awesome. said that. Ask your questions now, because we're about to do a deep dive into the Love, Death and Robots universe. Take it away, Ren. <laughs> yeah, OK, cool. So um, I will probably share the um, one of the episodes trailers. It's not the official trailer, because uh, it's purely restricted and related to that episode, That's great. which uh, personally I saw yesterday. You guys did an amazing uh, day one Zebra Summit. Uh, the presentations were super, super interesting, and already some of the topics got covered. So I will try to uh, just strictly stick to what I've been doing and not, um, yeah, not taking away the audience. Uh, so I worked on two episodes from um, Love, Death, and Robots in this particular season, um, and this is the bad traveling one. I will. Play this one, and then we go from there. Oh, oh what? Oh, what? Anatomy further. I go willingly. I am willing to see the failed attempt on my life. It's an expression of global art. This nightmare is worth I swear. Unpleasant as it was necessary, like we are at last in spirit, goal, and purpose. Great. So, apologies for this being a little bit too long. No, no. However, no, no, no. I worked on several several different assets, so this one showcased them all. Um, usually. The way uh, the way things go for me, uh, working with uh, different companies, is very often I find myself <clears throat> working on different things, mostly uh, the sculptural side of things. Maybe sometimes readdressing 
feedback that wasn't really, I mean, at some point in production, you're getting pushed by, pre pressured by deadlines. So you need someone to really get you from a uh, point A to point B. So uh, I've had that a few times where I've been um, actually commissioned to, uh, I, I don't want to say correct, but take over someone else's work and then bring it to the standard that uh, basically um, the creative director or the supervisor wants to, uh, to go really quick without any back and forth and um, any other uh, yeah, hiccups along the way. So this has happened in uh, commercials and also in film and in TV. Uh, in this case, I had the chance to uh, basically, why I'm saying this is because several assets for me for one episode and then jumping on another episode and doing another few assets was uh, really intense and uh, uh, all that was done in a very short amount of time. Um, I didn't do in this particular case uh, texturing and shading, but the team of um, from, from Blur they had their own departments and I'm just stepping in doing something that is basically, again, uh, in a way nailing uh, where it should be and then jumping on the next one, maybe creating it from scratch, doesn't matter, but kind of uh, this is how it works. So the first character I worked on uh, was actually, I think it wasn't this one, but let me start with the human characters that I worked here on. So this is Chantre. Uh, she's uh, one of the main characters there. Not the main character, but I was anyway lucky and happy enough to, to work on that. So her face was quite tricky. Um, she is, I mean, here you can see the um, stylization. It's it's realistic approach of the skin shading and the pore detail and all, all that, but on a very um, stylized, in a way, proportions. Uh, they're quite interesting. The concept uh, department did an amazing job. Um, in this case, I had to take care of the surfacing detail all done in ZBrush. I do not use XYZ or uh, 3D scan, although both of these resources are amazing, not to take anything away from, from the guys that are working um, tirelessly. Um, I did a similar approach to Chris Costa's um, mixture of basically hand sculpting with uh, a few alphas that I've created, but mostly I find it, um, I find the result mostly most satisfying when you really go in there and you do your, the sharpness is really, really um, up to the level that you would expect um, if you do it hand, uh, hand sculpted and then you pass that. And then maybe on top you can do like a, at the moment, the V face uh, maps, etc., for just some extra, extra level of detail and bump on top of that. But once you have a solid underneath, uh, like a structure and uh, shapes that they work in correlation to each other, you'll be basically fine. Uh, the rest you can add a little bit in texturing and then it's all about the shading and, and animation where things get broken. Um, so in here, I am, um, this is straight coming from ZBrush, um, just changing the lighting really, it's super important. Uh, yesterday I watched you guys spoke with the guys from Sideshow. Someone mentioned that, but I personally know this one from uh, um, watching Steve Lord. And um, he kept saying that looking the shapes and the volumes from different angles is really important. and. Uh, I can't agree enough with this thing. So from certain angle, something can look fine. Uh, from another, it can, can be uh, kind of washed out. So you need to be checking. Also, I've applied some a little bit of a specular. Uh, I think that's modified matcap straight uh, default one from ZBrush. Um, OK. So this is mostly Chantra's work um, that I've worked on. Okay. Sorry, guys, I'm trying to... Oh, it looks great. Keep going. Yeah. 
Okay. Great. So going to the next one, after addressing uh, basically Chantra's face, I worked mostly on the face. That's important to say. Everything else is, uh, yeah, everything else was done by the, the team. I had the chance to work on the isopod, uh, which is kind of a, oops, um, so sorry. I think I need to that uh, real quick. Okay, not too bad. Apologies. So I had to um, the chance to work on the isopod, which is um, a sort of a little, yeah, creature. Um, very, there is a huge, as you saw in the trailer, giant kind of crab creature. But also there were these little guys, who's basically the the, the little uh, hatched creatures. Um, this was the concept that we had. Um, not very, not too descriptive in a way. Um, still, it's a great drawing, but you need to add so much more. So in this one, uh, this is the size comparison here on the left. You can see all that done by uh, blur, um, including the little creature here in the middle. Uh, the render on the right is uh, basically me testing displacement uh, coming out from coming out ZBrush. Uh, this particularly was rendered in, in in Maya, but talking about the ZBrush and the work and the surface detail, I think it's more important uh, in this case. So you can see some extreme close-ups here. I had a few days to work on this one, uh, starting from scratch, building the entire thing, and um, going through basically the surfacing detail. Um, so it was a lot of fun. Of course, reference here is super important, uh, but um, again, when you build the, the big volumes and the shape and uh, you're already close to uh, what the references was like, then you start treating the surface. And again, uh, it's very important to kind of Oh, there we go. I have now a laser pen. Oh, laser pointer. Look at that. Where did yeah. you get that from? Look at this guy. Look at that. Subsurface scattering happening there. Look at that. Yeah, there's a lot. Someone Impressive. Uh, did a quick comment. How much subsurface you want? Yes. Yeah, so, I like it though. Like, So you ha you got two days to do this? No, I had a, I think it was between five and seven days or something okay. like this. Um, Let's stick to five so I look better. Okay, uh, I like, yeah. I well, five four and three quarters. <laughs> <laughs> five's still impressive, right? You got, five is you're great. making an important character for the film yeah. uh, that is going yeah. to carry the story through. It looks yeah, great. True. It's really it was, it was important. And uh, yeah. one thing oh, I nice. wanna touch base to is, mm -hmm. um, for example, I'm also thinking of when working in production, you need to understand there are time limitations. There is a certain budget per asset. And of course, uh, you need to respect that, right? Uh, that's why you're there, not only for your sculpting skills, but again, uh, getting from point A to point B, delivering and then passing on to the um, certain department. And also, it's very important to know how far the creature will be um, from the, ca the camera, how big you're going to see it on screen, etc. Um, so in this case, I wanted to, in a way, not to sculpt each leg uh, three times and then, okay, it's going to be mirrored. So that makes my life easier. But what about the rest of the legs? I want to have like a different, uh, basically, uh, detail, but some of it as a base, I wanted to uh, have it like the same. And this way, I'll be able to spend a big amount of time uh, really diving into a really surface and, and fine details such as like the peeling of the skin Look and then that. that's beautiful that's all beautiful. the striations are going for and then you need like something that you know we can reference from uh, all the little um, insects and all these little creatures so in order to do that and to get real quick um, to this level of detail you need to think uh, pragmatic and basically uh, I had all the three legs sharing the same topology so I did spend time on capturing really nicely the topo manually for the one leg then I did the topology for the other 
uh, for the rest of the creature, and I welded those later on. But they use the same UVs and the same detail that here I really can spend enough time, right? Instead of losing time and get an average result on each leg. That's pretty slick. Um, thank you. So that's the face, although, I mean, it's super small. I wanted to, I mean, I was excited to be, uh, to be fair, to be part of, uh, you know, working with the guys for, uh, like from Blur, um, great supervision by Nicholas Collins and uh, just the entire team was amazing. So for me, it was like, okay, um, um, so you previously you previously mentioned like you were you don't do a lot of X Y Z the same thing for this were you just doing a lot of hand sculpting finding alphas that you liked and just going at the character with all those details? I don't really I don't really use lots of alphas even um, really? I have a few uh, but then for example let's talk about the the little uh, dots right yeah. I mean you can do that in various ways you can invert uh, actually you can do a spray um, on a <clears throat> On a damn standard, let's say, or you can modify the uh, the profile of your uh, standard brush, and then you can spray around. Done. Okay, it doesn't look that good, but then I'm using a lot. I mean, a lot of the smooth peaks brush because when you do the smooth yeah. peaks, you kind of flatten the rest in between, and you suddenly, very quickly and very easy, you get that um, yeah contrast between the hollow point the cavities and then a flat surface then you can do a little bit of uh, edge polish here and there but then um you know what what i mean is like these are all like standard brush then a little bit of damn standard and then here it's more about actually looking at the references nothing is too um too complex and also it's very much depends how close you go to certain things because if you want to do some alphas on top uh, can work, yeah, of course. But if you, again, uh, if you look at the reference, all can be done with a, a bit more of a manual approach and it's not too, uh, too it complex. That's beautiful. Really uh, nice, yeah, we agree, we concur. Yeah. I think that's nice part group. of your traditional background kicking in, right? Just let's do it in a way I would do it traditionally in a little bit and just- I think so, yeah. yeah. Which which could be a problem. Uh, that's what no. I said. Oh, no. stop! No, no, I think it actually is a, an incredible example of extrapolating the most possible detail out of the simplest possible. Yeah. Uh, and that smooth solution. peaks brush is in your light box and brush uh, folder. So that's a beautiful smoothing brush. So yeah, yeah. I can. I mean, at some point, if we have time, I doubt that, but we can go over UI and what exactly I'm using. Sure. But um, yeah, Paul, yep. you, you know. Uh, Basically, guys, watch what Paul does and uh, Michael Pavlovich as well. For me, uh, you know, kind of that's where I'm. Uh, that's where I learned from. So, oh, look at that! Well, thank you. Hey, I'm, hey, take a hey, take uh, a moment there, thanks. ladies and gentlemen. Paul Gabriel. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to help in any way I Teaching can. one master at a time. <laughs> I, 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 Good I'd work. love to have a session with everybody. Let's go. Oh, joy! Well, let's give it back to Rand. We're taking Rand's spot. Yeah, I mean, please do. Um, Okay, so next thing is I had, uh, that was the third character from the same episode that I worked on. Mm -hmm. And this was uh, here on the left, you can see um, there are certain stages of uh, basically the zombie character. I mean, he was a normal guy in the beginning, but uh, not anymore. So I had to jump on this one and build the entire character. Um, it's quite of a complex character here. So there are quite a few uh, screenshots. So these are shots from the lovely episode. And these are some renders that I did in the, at the end of it. Uh, of course, it's just simple materials here. These are uh, Marmoset renders, uh, real time, all baked. And um, just for the sake of everything running a little bit smoother. And um, the rest was taken care by the i mean texturing was taken care of by the how long how long did you get for this one i think we had like uh two weeks or a day or two more i mm -hmm. think i went a little over the uh time but it was appreciated because again the level of detail we reached yeah. here wasn't anticipated as well um so 
what I did here is I took the base um, asset when he was looking normal um, and then detailed him further uh, skin wise. After this, I basically kind of masked certain areas uh, on the lower res, res. And then I, um, I think I created uh, poly loops and then this created a clean, in a way, cut that I modified with the move brush and, and then got rid of it, right? And, and you get a hole. And for the rest, I once I had the poly loop and it was clean, I duplicated this uh, poly, poly loop um, as a separate mesh. And I went to Z modeler and I gave a little bit of thickness for this extra uh, layer of fat. Because if you go from skin to bone and to muscle, it just simply doesn't look um, complex enough. Uh, of course, a lot of it, it will depend on how you will shape things, uh, how much subsurface scattering will connect these two. Will you have a little bit of a uh, wetness and, you know, all sorts of um, jazz in between. But um, I wanted to, to get all the possible um, all the possible objects to be actual geometry. Um, I think it's better because the displacement can only take you to a certain point, but then if you have a geometry and on top of that, the displacement for certain, like a different object, it's way better and it's a lot sharper and you can tell, okay, this was properly done and then it looks nicer in, uh, of course, when you watch it on the big screen. Mm -hmm. So here are some screenshots from, uh, uh, from straight from ZBrush, um, showing all the, the ribs and all the, you know, gnarly stuff. Um, yeah. Wow. That's really cool. Really, really beautiful piece too. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think that he's making good points or pushing those details a little bit more because especially in your production of a film or a TV show, there's all those other, like you said, jazz things happening after the fact, whether it be the renderer and everything else, the blurring and all that. So pushing those details, I think. And a lot yeah. comes down to lighting too, right? The way yeah. it's gonna be lit on the scene. Yeah. It's awesome, Ren, it's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, really Thank cool. you so much. Um, last thing is, you know, arms um, and, and hands. I mean, even though you don't see them much, if, um, I think it's a very important part of a, like you probably have seen me or whoever follows me around, not many people, but uh, oh, enough. There we go. Uh, <laughs> they know that I pay extra attention to hands because they're super, super expressive. And uh, people tend to, even when you draw, um, a lot of uh, people tend to kind of run away from it and they put them in the pockets or behind the back or, or a fist, you know. Uh, easy stuff, but you know, show the hand, it shows a lot, a lot, uh, what, even what the character is like, is he working? Is he a bit more on the like uh, artistic side with long fingers and uh, like pianist or he's a worker and you can tell a lot about the, the character itself and his story. So here, even though we're talking about the zombie and, and, and this guy, um, it was important to take his hands and pay attention because if you see them around hanging or something, you don't want them to look uh, overlooked and neglected. Um, so all the tendons, all the little veins were modeled. Uh, this piece actually has bones, uh, muscles. Then it has the little veins here and there where you're going to see them. These were made out of, I think, um, I masked what I wanted before even the mesh was uh, punched holes in it, and then I mask them, uh, what did I do? Then extract, guys, this thing with extract is just super amazing because you get real quick the geometry right where you want it. Um, and then zero mesh, even though it's production, okay, I'm not going to extrude little veins and make them branch out, etc. It's just not time efficient. So zero mesh, push them in there, uh, pay attention to how they lie down on top of the muscle. Uh, do the fat tissues interestingly enough to connect with the skin. Pay the you know extra uh, level of uh, skin pores and detail there, and then you have the the the, the arm. Ran, I've got a great question if I can, real yes. quick from the audience because uh, I think mm -hmm. the stuff we're talking about speed and production. Um, yeah. What technique do you find makes the biggest difference? to speed up 
the sculpting process? Sculpting better. Uh, <laughs> oh, so no, technique. Good. The technique is... Uh, I would say, I would say, understand what's the, what's the goal of the piece, meaning, again, uh, I'm saying those things because I am also um, supervising the VFX work in our studio. So you, by supervising, you are aware of a few other things. And this is how far, again, the piece will be to the camera. Are you going to see it? Is there going to be motion blur or it's going to be crystal clear, crisp right there in front of like, uh, you know, the, the audience in theaters. So you need to take all this into account. Always ask your supervisor, hey, what's the deadline? How many days do I have? And then, of course, you need to ask, what's the importance of the character? How much? Of course, you, you, you always try your best, but um, you don't want to neglect something that will be seen, right? Because when something is in film and it's not games, and that's one of the differences that I find working in both industries, is once rendered, pre-rendered, you only take care of certain bits that you will see. And uh, once uh, you have a gaming asset, then you need to take care of the entire thing. Although there, you need to... Uh, at least take into consideration that it's not going to be super, super extra detailed. So know what the target is yeah. um, and plan your work. That's, I think that's great advice. According, yeah, accordingly. That's great advice. Yeah, accordingly, I would agree to to, yep. um, to your point to where the shot is, right? I mean, that's what you're you're asking really of, of where is this place going to be, where is the placement of this asset going to be in the shot, and does it have to yep. be sort of if it's 12 feet away from camera, it's not really necessary to get into porous details. I think is what you're saying. Exactly. Yeah. Good. Good points, man. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is uh, not film um, and TV, but yes. a little bit about uh, my involvement with uh, Diablo 2 Resurrected. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Chris, and thank you, Christo. Uh, Chris was our art director, uh, Christopher Amaro. He did an amazing job, um, and we paid extra super attention to everything that has happened before uh, in the 2000, I think it was, and then 2001, Lord of Destruction, um, meaning we had to respect the amazing art and uh, atmosphere of this game. So I will, without further ado, I always wanted to use this uh, expression, I will play the trailer and then we're going to talk about the work. Hey, Ran, just to let you know, your audio from the video isn't coming through to the audience. It's still coming through your speakers. So it's coming through the speakers. Yeah, it's not coming going to the audience itself. Just so you know. Just crank. Should I mute myself? No, no, it's fine. We can probably just talk uh, while the video is playing since the music isn't coming through for them. Okay. So how much of this project did you also get to work on? Uh, this one, the Diablo? Yeah. I did two characters for it. How are you getting uh, the work like this as a freelancer being freelanced out since you've worked on so many projects? Oh, man, it's difficult. It's basically working nonstop. And uh, I mean, there are certain like projects that I can't miss. So I'm, I had to stay late and to do all the, you know, anyway, we love our job. So my partner is super understanding and thank her for that. So yeah, you need to have a partner to understand why you spend like all day and all night. Yeah, doing, right. So you got to. You got to know how to work on those late nights. Bit of an understatement early there. mornings, for yeah. sure. Yeah. One intangible. 
Because that's always a question, is how do you get freelance work? Uh, it's always difficult to try and... Or how do you get the energy to get it done? Or the energy, for that matter, yeah. Yeah, after... Look at that. Look at that. Yeah. So this oh, is one of the characters you did, of course. Uh, sorry? This is one of the characters you did, of course. Yes, so I was responsible for... Um, all these are still work in progress. Not that the asset hasn't been done, it has. But here, I'm talking about the screenshots. So I was responsible for the werewolf and the werebear forms, um, which was something really, uh, really, mm, I mean, amazing and great. So I am also passionate about, as you can see, as, as you can tell, uh, the anatomy of things and also not only the um, animalistic side, but the, the, the human anatomy. So a mixture of both is always super challenging. And um, this is how the model looked like in the uh, 2001 um, when the game was released. And this is uh, what we've been doing to basically resurrect uh, the character. Um, so these are the two guys, the werewolf and the werebear. Simple material um, straight out of ZBrush. Nothing fancy here, but it was challenging because the first characters, even though they are so tiny and pixelated, uh, pixelized, you still have a lot of, uh, I mean, respect and we all love the game. So in a way it has to be like really <clears throat> spot on so that you can preserve the silhouette, but also to kind of up and change the stuff that you think could be better um, without changing too much because you're also a fan. So I think the entire team on this uh, project was in a way fan, fan, fan boys working as artists or the opposite. I, I don't know, but it was really, uh, really cool to be part of it. So after I blocked out the, um, the shapes and the, the, the main expression, this was another challenge uh, to establish what type of expression, because you're not going to have an animated, I mean, after all, the character on screen will be quite small because of the way you see and the way Diablo 2 is, right? Even though it's going to be um, HD and it's going to be super beautiful, of course, uh, you're not going to have each character animated and talking and that's not film. So we had to come up with an expression that is somewhere in between relaxed and uh, you know, and angry and uh, readable from from a good distance, but also looking nice. After we uh, locked the expression down, and I have for the word bear, I have a few um, a few stages of this uh, of this thing. Uh, how you get you know from the relaxed pose to the expression. It's not really a blend shape here, and you don't have to care so much about the um, compression and the behavior of the mesh, because after all, it's going to be baked. It's going to look like this. Um, and then what I'm showing here before and after is uh, this is basically a submission uh, that I've, I, I did for uh, when sending the work to, to Blizzard. Uh, these are the extra details and hand sculpted, like additionally stuff on top of some alphas and, and and some manual sculpting as well. But this is coming extra because when you, then again, when you judge how far that would be, um, you need to enhance a little bit more the, the details. So, so a question came through, what did you uh, start to block this out with? Since you had mentioned you, once you block it out, you start getting, what did you, what do you use? Do you start from a sphere for the project like this one or? So for this project, um, I was, I started with, um, yeah, just a sphere. Ex, like a sphere and then you you go from there. You I use a lot of, uh, you know, mask and snake hook and just to get the shapes. Um, I actually worked on this one in the very early stages on another product of yours guys, which is called uh, Maxon Forger. Um, yeah. 
I'm a heavy forger user just because sometimes you get tired sitting in front of the desk and mm -hmm. uh, you are addicted to your work, but you want to carry over and do sit maybe on the on the couch. And uh, it's surprisingly good. Um, I picked it at the very, very early stages of the development of forger. And I've been blocking this character even on the tube going to work. And then I know that I'm going to work in at, at night, but, uh, you know, you think about how the hands will be and what's going to happen. Um, so it's here, it was a lot about proportions, what to enhance, what, what will be a little more human, like the hands, maybe the elbows, uh, but where the scapulas will be, what's going to happen with the, with the spine and let me get my cool. Yeah, there we go. That thing's awesome. I don't know what plugin you're using. I love it. No, it's uh, basically I'm doing a Google presentation and it's ah, cool. That's awesome. That thing's great. Yeah, thank you. That looks like my lower back. That looks like your lower back. Yeah. Get up super early in the morning. Take care. Oh, there you go. <laughs> well done, Lou. Look at those um, details. That's wow. amazing. Yeah, so here is just, you know, torso close-ups. But I think it's yeah. cool to see the level of, uh, of detail. And even if, I mean, my always uh, something that I keep saying is push it as, as hard as possible. Uh, later on, you might end up showing this in Zebra Summit, right? I wasn't um, actually, I dragged this for so long and uh, Chris asked me why you're not showing them. And I'm so um, attached to this work and to... Uh, Diablo um, IP and, and and those characters that I never think that they were uh, they need a little more they maybe even though we have uh, you know Blizzard is happy maybe we can push them a bit more and I can finish them later on and finally reveal them and I still haven't but now that I'm showing this one to you guys it's all kind of makes sense now so I'm like okay maybe that's why I held back right So after this, I just wanted to quickly, because of the presentation, um, and after all, I want to showcase them in a better uh, pose than just the A pose. Um, I recorded a small time lapse of how am I posing my characters, especially the ones that they um, they're used in production. So you're using the transpose line here? Is that what you're using the pose or are you using the gizmo? Yeah, I'm using the transpose line. Ah, the gizmo is great as well, I, but I, I use both of them. You do? Yeah. So there's a lot of just masking yeah. and, and, you know, respecting what the... So you can pose and you can get to a very cool pose um, using the transpose line and masking if you know where and how soft the mask should be but you need to know your anatomy first so that you know you read what's deformed what you have to uh, fix later on so a lot could be done very simple um so i wanted to uh, show even more from the uh, werewolf and uh, the final look of it, but I decided to maybe keep that for uh, later on, uh, later stages, uh, probably in a few days, they will be released. Um, and also because of the one hour uh, difference that I didn't um, anticipate. I like for. how you have the side by side of the 2001 model and the, yeah. and the zebra. It just goes to show how much has changed. It's so incredible. How rapidly it changed. But I find the 2001 model quite endearing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, it's 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 great. Kind of it's, uh, yeah. So that's the breakdown a little bit of the um, facial expression. So here, as you see, there's no detail just yet, but it's more about okay, uh, the detail will get it there. That's that's the easy part. Um, but let's talk about you know asymmetry. Let's talk about how much. Um, of this um, angry face we need. And also um, the bears, they have quite like this very typical, um, you know, um, lip going out, but it might look goofy. So you need to be careful with all this. And then uh, you can start once you have that in place, 
you can start taking care of all the little uh, wrinkles and everything else. This is a mixture of uh, alphas and a lot of um, a lot of hand sculpting. Wow. I can wow. actually show real quick. That's a bit dangerous, but I'm gonna be okay. So this one, that's actually the werewolf uh, foot, and you can see the hand sculpting here. Going what, what, there. Brush, what brush are you using there? That's the our lovely Damien standard. Damien. Um, and also um, another brush that um, it's slightly modified. Um, yeah, it's like a, a standard one, but modified. Because the, the damn standard sometimes has a little bit of pinching, which um, you don't always need. Sometimes it's super useful. And knowing the behavior of the brush, you know what to what to expect. This is, uh, I think it's, you're showing a great example of just, you know, sculpting. Don't just try and find the quick way necessarily to always do something, but find the right way. I don't think there's a quick way to do that. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm just looking alphas. Well, alphas, most people probably go with an alpha. Yeah. But I think this shows a great example of alpha might not be the answer, and it's worth that extra time, that extra work. Absolutely. Look Without at. looking like a stamp, you know, or something yeah. you just clicked and dragged on there. Yeah, look at that. Look really at the sick. details Ryan's getting. This is incredible. So, I mean, you can get certain bits with alpha, yeah. but then you need to puff some of them. You need to go and pay, um, you know, the, the, the extra level of detail so it so you, you break the evenness and you give the uh, the additional detail that makes it believable. So I always think about, <clears throat> even though we're making uh, fictional characters and creatures and everything else, they have their own imperfections, their own uh, kind of scars and um, things that probably they wouldn't be so proud of, but that's what makes them uh, relatable. And uh, this is what can, you know, kind of make us believe that, oh, maybe, yes, if there was a werewolf and a werebear, that's how they could look like, you know, you will have this extra, extra um, skin getting a little bit more um, pinched there. And then you have the strong leg, which is, yeah, just just a mixture of all these little little things. I want to believe they're real. I mean, I don't. You want to believe they're real? I want to believe. All right, Rand. Just want to let you in about time check. You got ten minutes. About ten minutes of what? Do you still have ten minutes left? Do do I? Oh yeah. God. Okay. Uh, then we're going forward. Excellent. Okay. Some extra close-ups. Those are great. Don't rush through that. Hold on a second. Don't rush through that. Yeah. That was really nice. Look at that. Oh, there's so much character in those hands and fingers, the way you've got them. He's forward. right. They're the expression. There's so much expression yeah. in hands and the eyes. There's, it's you worth it. there? I think everyone, you should do studies on just there? hands. Yeah. Yeah. I see what you did. I see what you did. My, my father made me draw hands all over um, all the time. Oh, really? That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I had to, to do that a lot. So... Let me talk about a little bit about uh, actually. A I like how project. stoic you were when you said that. My father made me draw these hands over and over again. It was like <laughs> good yeah. example. Good. Yeah, my that's dad was doing I, that. Yeah, that's how I grew up. Like basically, in order to skip um, afternoon nap, I had to draw. So if I draw for an hour, then I can go and play. Um, otherwise, I better sleep or stay home. So of course, I had this task of. 10 sketches of my grandpa or grandma or like friends uh, awesome. just as, as a kid. And you know, that made you appreciate. So guys, I wanted to um, also chat about something interesting. Yep. So this was um, an actual sculpture um, that is being uh, at the moment is in the National Museum in at Liverpool. Uh, this is the sleeping Venus and hermaphrodite, uh, which was uh, at some point uh, censored. Um, this is the original statue, um, actually a drawing of the original statue. Uh -huh. And um, the male char characteristics and the infants around his breast were removed from the figure, but the drawing of this um, sculpture remained. 
and um, I got commissioned to uh, by Oliver Larrick to um, basically he went to the museum and scanned with their uh, allowance and agreement uh, wow. scanned the sculpture. Um, wow. This is the real sculpture, but as you see, a lot has been um, a lot has been damaged and lost. Also, uh, this hand is made only after. Um, and then, if you look closely, there were no sandals. These little uh, these little dots, uh, not dots, but lines, indicate where uh, it was broken even back then. And then they tried to repair it, but they couldn't, or at least. So with that said, before going into all this, that was a heavy teaser. That's that an amazing to... teaser and, and a wonderful surprise for the viewers at home, I'm sure. Yes. Great. So here, I had to do three little kids and then to pose them and to sculpt them so we can um, re-establish the sculpture as it was before the censorship has happened. So in this case, I knew again that it will be a lengthy job, right? So I had to, at least as a base, start from the one little kid. Um, and uh, I made a quick time lapse of how am I blocking the hair, basically here. What brush would that be that you're using there, the clay buildup? Man, it's all clay buildup. Um, I absolutely love these guys. It's very, very natural. It gives me, um, basically throws me back of when you add the clay and you look at forms and you look at the rhythm and then you go through it. Let me speed this up. Look at that. Isn't that something? And then I am unifying a little bit by smoothing and after this with a very broad and big damp standard, or um, like a pinch brush here and there, I'm only defining just the, the uh, curls that I would like and I know it's going to work. Some of them I do quite the opposite because not always everything that you sketch is like right there. But as you see here, almost everything worked. And then of course you need to take care of some of the little, I mean, curves so that of course, you use smooth and, and smooth and take care of that so that you can end up with one of these little guys. Uh, there is another, this one, but we already saw it. So then what we did is um, I started, I started posing one by one. Um, and of course, after the rough pose, you have a lot of sculpting to do after to take care of the anatomy, the weight, the compression of the skin. Um, all these are uh, simple. ZBrush um, screen grabs of the work in progress. That was an extremely complicated one, not because it's a very complex uh, pose, but because after all, you need to go back all the time to that drawing and you don't simply create your own piece but you respect what the drawing and what the sculpture might have looked like um so oh, oh, i'm skipping there we go um that time lapse basically shows i had to reconstruct the sleeping figure um to remove the sandals oh wow that's and to reconstruct all the basically sculpt all the folds and then we made a little i kept sending pieces high-res pieces um so that we can keep track and we knew this video will come later on of how uh, i wanted to mimic of how an actual um sculpture will be made out of clay and then you can see wow Oh, that's a really awesome time that's lapse. That's an awesome video. I'm so glad you did that that way. Look at that thing. Jeez. It almost looked like a stop motion. Creepy. I love yeah, it. Yeah, because when I pose, this is exact, ex the same example as the werewolf and the werebear. Oh, I do the pose, but I keep on every, I wanted to kind of, you know, do that. Awesome. Um, awesome. Every movement Record. is recorded on a separate layer. And then you start exporting after you're done with the app. So you don't actually think and export, etc. You keep recording layers. It gets super heavy, whatever, but it's super amazing that we can have all in the same mesh. 
Then I've exported each layer and we made the time lapse. So I'll just play it once again. Oh, you're making my day. I'm so glad you're playing it again. Are you kidding? This is a, a, a incredible presentation. Thank you. Thank Look you. At that thing. Look at that. Look at that. That's it's like, creepy. It's like melting <laughs> kind of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where <are> the milk. <laughs> A beautiful work. And there's a lot of people in chat can tell that you have a traditional background and because you've got that just beautiful touch to your sculpts. That's just, you definitely see in a traditional artist. It's really great. Yeah. Thank you. Just absolutely and this breathtaking. Is the piece when everything was done and. Uh, wow. All, wow. Yeah. So once again, and then I'm moving to the next one. How many? You have minutes. one minute. You left. got about a minute. You got one minute. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, some renders. That's the Diablo stuff, but I have a lot you more. You pulled up so. your centaur. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Let's, let's get that centaur up so people can see it in the AR environment. Yeah, we actually have, we actually it, have in it in our environment as well. Rand okay. provided that for us. So we let's also want to show a let's nice close up of that, too. Let's take a moment of let's, pause and look at that in the, in the digital space centaur. here yeah. on the Mobian stage. Check it out. Look at look that. that. So this is a little bit inspired from that project, Ran? Is that where this is coming from too? Because um, no, actually, my I mean, <clears throat> my personal pieces and my art are always uh, driven by a certain story or something that I wanna I wanna say. Um, I'm yeah. leaning more towards the actually the simplicity and uh, the the shape and rhythm and and storytelling throughout the. So as you can see here, super quick. Yeah. Um, you want to throw his screen up real quick again for us? Yeah. One sec, Rand. So, yeah. I think it's awesome. I, I, I just am taken aback by the work uh, in its entirety. There you go. Rand, your screen's back up. Okay, cool. So start it from Forger. Just you have an idea, throw it in there, go back to like uh, ZBrush. Then I have a quick time lapse, which... Do you have links to those projects at all anywhere that you can share? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and uh, that's it. Boom, boom, boom. And then what, where do you go there is, yeah, that's the bird. I'll skip that. So at some point, even if you're happy, you need to keep revisiting your work. So this is the later stage of the piece. This is how it started. This is how it ended. Very and this is before, and then you can see the after. So, yeah. you know, you need to take care of all the little uh, basically angles and the rhythm of the entire piece. Yep. Uh, this is a render of it. Oh, it's just lovely, exquisite work. Just breathtaking is literally the only word I can think of right now for myself. Just rant. Rand, I have to take the reins here uh, from you and bring us to the end of it. Uh, we want to say thank you so much. Paul, any last words for Rand before I send us off for the break? Uh, breathtaking. He's bre he for the first time in many years. Speechless. Paul Gabriel has left and rendered speechless. Myself included. There's really nothing more to say. Now I understand, having met you and spent a little bit of time with you here live on our feed. Thank you so much for participating in the Zebra Summit 2022. I can see why uh, the the merits and the accolades have piled on the way they have. Uh, the the awards you've received are uh, well placed and well deserved. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to meet you. And to have Thank you a guys. presentation for us. And that last little bit with the hermaphrodite sculpture and restoration is something I'm sure people are all uh, very happy about. You have something to say? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I have, if I have 30 seconds, I we'll just. We'll give you 30 wanna... seconds. Go for it. Okay, cool. So, in my, um, apart from the, um, the Deer Tower, I am now working more and more towards the, the actual pieces and the actual bronze switches. Right here behind me. Here we go. Oh, see, here we go. 30 seconds, people. I was hoping to see the dog, and there he is, the pooch. Look at how beautiful. So, this thing at the moment, this is bronze, and this is only a smaller one, but uh, the actual is a little bigger. All this is uh, thankfully um, possible by the cool guys from Linan 3D. Uh, they have an amazing, they're uh, relatively new on the market, but they have a relatively, uh, I mean, amazing actually uh, piece of hardware and uh, their printers are amazing. Go check it out. I put the link here so that oh. everyone can see it. Um, it's a dual axis and this is super important. Um, so this is how at the moment I am, this is already the print. Uh, after this, I went and I uh, touch it up everywhere around. Then we went to cast wax. Uh, I'm not gonna play any time lapse. This is and this is what I'm wrapping up with, just because it's a very physical uh, piece. 
So you ship it, we had to create a wax model out of it, chop it into pieces, not just for manufacturing like a toy manufacturing, but you know that this will be very much dependable on how the foundry would like uh, this piece to be. So we had to create bring that, that up. a wax model, uh, which is right here, the copy. And then the next page is, all this is now the bronze without the patina, right? It looks, eh, it's okay. I, I thought it's going to be uh, looking better, but after this, you take the bronze piece, which is assembled those pieces so that you can end up with the same piece only in bronze. And then you go into the patina, which is a reaction of an acid uh, with the metal and a flame uh, torch uh, basically solidifies. And then you end up with the actual bronze piece, which you exhibit. So um, soon I'm working on a few pieces, basically 10 to 15 pieces. Um, there will be an exhibition here in London in um, at Chelsea Gallery. So uh, you guys will Amazing. always be welcome or whoever wants to be. Uh, well, and this is thumbs up. my work with and presentation. Thank you so much, Ren. And, and that brings us to the end of the, the first presentation of the day. I want to say the most important thing to take away from that, you showed us an incredible last piece that was, I'm sure, made in ZBrush, the running theme. Thank you, uh, yeah. Ren, for your time and for presenting with us. And we'll be back with some prize giveaways with Paul Gabery. Thank you so much, Ren. Thanks, Ren. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. See Gorgeous. You Absolutely beautiful. Gave it away. Okay. <laughs> so as Louis said, we got some giveaways and I'm gonna pull up one I think is just perfect for what we just watched with Ran. So I'm pulling up one of the on-site yes. an animal anatomy workshops from Anatomy Tools. You do have to pay your way to Vegas, but you're getting that workshop. If you can get there, I'm telling you, go. It's amazing. And you will also get the wolf anatomy model that you're seeing here in the image. Two. So I want to draw the winner for that as well so that we can get that person. The winner is Marcelo, and I'm probably not going to pronounce the last name correct, but again, I'm putting it in the chat. Inez. Inez? Probably not even close. Inez. Inez. In Inez. 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 All right, so there you are. Congratulations. So let's do let's do something else. Let me do another one here. I'm gonna Give it away again. I'm gonna do, I'm, uh, again. Oui. It's the season of uh, giving. So let's do let's do one of these. Let's show this image real quick. Get this over on our board. Here you go. Let's give away one of the space mouse enterprise kit from 3D Connection. Again, this is gonna be able to be used in ZBrush for navigation and all those buttons you're seeing on that you can use also to customize and do whatever you like with that. So let me draw the winner of that, the Space Mouse. And the winner is Darren Nevin. Darren Nevin. So I'm gonna put that in there. There you go. Darren, congratulations on winning that. I'm gonna put those in the chat because I don't know what chat you're in right now. So I'm making sure you have that. Let's do one more. Let's do one more here. Let's see what I got. Mm, I'm feeling good about this one. Let's do, let's do a little, uh, little Nolman workshop, Lou. Woo! Let's do a little Nolman six month subscription. The MIT of the CG a, industry. The MIT, he says, of the CG industry. The MIT, that's a good way to put it. So, Javier Gonzalez. Javier Gonzalez, oh, here Gonzalez, we go. Javier Gonzalez, you are the <laughs> winner of the six month subscription, so congratulations. So, listen, don't go anywhere. We're doing more giveaways this whole day and tomorrow, but I know up next, We've got the team from Sony Santa Monica sharing God of War with us. Straight fire. The game came out one week ago, and they're going to be fire. breaking down how they use ZBrush within this amazing game. And congratulations to them, because it across the boards, it's just been doing phenomenal. I know a lot of people are playing it. So stay tuned. We'll be right back with the Sony Santa Monica team.
Learn jewelry design and object fabrication through ZBrush. Expert, beginner, and every skill level in between. ZBrush Jewelry Workshops can help you bring your digital dreams into reality. Taught by leading industry professionals. Use the offer code SUMMIT to get a $100 discount on membership.
Learn jewelry design and object fabrication through ZBrush. Expert, beginner, and every skill level in between. ZBrush Jewelry Workshops can help you bring your digital dreams into reality. Taught by leading industry professionals. Use the offer code SUMMIT to get a $100 discount on membership. The adventure of a lifetime and the excitement continues live from the Mobian stage here in Burbank, California. I'm Louis Tucci with the ZBrush Summit 2022, and now the moment of truth is upon us. I'm here with my compatriot and friend, fellow ZBrush master at arms, Paul Gabery. We have the moment as the book is open and the saga unfolds fresh off the foothills of a stellar release. It is a global phenomenon at this point. It is played the world over by countless many. Uh, we have the team from God of War, Sony Santa Monica with us live in the studio. Uh, sitting to my right, Della Longfish and Angela Rico to start the action off live here in the studio. And we're gonna be taking it away with what promises to be. They're smashing the like button somewhere. I can hear it. the keys are smashing across the universe. And we're gonna have a, a remote in from uh, Rafael Grassetti. Yes. The Brazilian bad boy himself will be tuning in uh, live from the, the, mother, the mothership, as I like to call it, the Brazil. Josiah Scholten is gonna join us as well, and Andrew Arisa, uh, Arisa, excuse me. And we are gonna be taking it, and in a moment we are going to take you into the world of God of War, so sit tight and it's gonna go live. Paul Gabery, we're back, and there they are. We have none other than Della Longfish. Wave to the people at home and around the universe. Hey, tuning in from the moon. We've got uh, Angela Rico. And online, there he is, a face, a familiar face in a different place. How are you, my friend? Rafael Grassetti, I miss you already. <laughs> I'm doing good, I'm doing good. good we're happy you. to be here. We're gonna try to make this work. So it's been a successful launch. The Congratulations. Yes, high five, Paul Gabriel. Awesome. I gotta touch somebody. Seriously. Yes. Go no team. Go yes. guys killed it. Tens, 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 tens Ten. everywhere. What's your favorite number? Ten. Yeah. Wait, what's the Wait, number of the day? Wait, can we get an 11, please? <laughs> what's can I get a bonus point? <laughs> Wait for the number of the day. You ready for this? You remember when you were a kid, Sesame Street? They mm -hmm. go, yeah. ten. <laughs> can you, get, you want a smiley face sticker too? <laughs> get a little gold star? I'm just going to keep saying it. Ding, ding. Ring Seriously, the congratulations to yeah. the whole team, man. Yeah. It's off, man. Thank you. The camera yeah. operators are trying to clap their feet. I mean, it's off the hook in here. <laughs> no, no, thanks. It's been a wild week, and it's great that we're having Rafa all the way uh, from Brazil to kind of represent. And uh, Rafa, I'll let you take it away, but it's great that the team gets to show a little bit of the work that they've been doing on the characters. Um, and it, it's been a whirlwind for us. The reception from the critics and fans has been fantastic. So, uh, we're really happy to be here. Yeah, like I said, this. a global phenomenon at this point, and we really appreciate it. Yeah, it's it. wild. Yeah, Absolutely. It's, really <laughs> it's pretty awesome. Yeah, so you guys got a lot to share, so we'll share your screen so we can uh, start letting you see everything that you want to share, and then I'll let you guys take it from, from there. And we're going to be having, like Louis &A. said, a couple more other artists from yep. the team joining us later on a little bit. But... And questions coming okay. in online from... I'll do my sure best to funnel the questions where I can. 190 and we'll, we'll do our best to answer them in a way. A billion viewers are waiting to ask you a bunch of things, so take it away without... Take it away. Do spoiler warning. <laughs> so we, yeah, so we are, we are not talking about any uh, story stuff here. The focus is on the work that the character team's been doing over the last few years under the, the guidance of Eric Valdez and obviously the art direction of, of Raph. Uh, so no story stuff, but there may be a few characters that, that you haven't seen, so I know a lot of our fans are trying to really... Uh, 
keep it all there for the experience themselves. So uh, nothing major by any means, no story stuff. But just a heads up, uh, if you want to come back and watch this after you played the full game. Um, Raf, you want to take it away, my man? That was a great public service announcement you just made. There. <laughs> so if, it, if you're listening and you're watching, there is a spoiler warning that you may uh, see some characters. If you haven't played the game yet, you haven't gone down to the store and got the game or haven't downloaded the game, beware. Take it away. Yeah, Raf, if you just want to open up a little bit. Away, I'm sorry, I can't really hear Della that, that well. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Saying, but okay, well, I'm we'll, just going to be his voice. Yeah. He said, go ahead, take it away. It's all you. It's all you now. <laughs> all right, we're going to make this work. Uh, well, let's just say, you know, I know you guys mentioned about the spoiler, and there's a, it's a big team, right, that works on this, and we're just here representing uh, the crew, and we're going to show, I, I think we're going to have to run through some of the stuff fairly quickly because we have a lot of a lot of stuff to share. Um, so let's, let's do this, Della. Wait, now I can uh, see the screen. But... Yeah, they're showing you full screen. There you go. There you go. Beautiful. Let's go. All right. So, Raph, I don't know if you want to just talk about coming off of 2018. This is the cast. Yeah, talking. yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, 2018, I get, you know, hope all you guys play the game. But you, we did a lot of work to develop the, the world. You know, reboot the franchise and, and build all the characters. We started touching on all the factions and, uh, you know, we built the universe. Like we ended up doing a lot of uh, a lot of work that we didn't expect on 2018, but coming into Ragnarok, like we knew that we had to expand the cast, you know, expand the universe, expand all the realms, expand, you know, all the enemies, the heroes, companions, everything. So since the beginning, you know, we took a step back and really started to break down the factions a little bit better. So when we expanded in terms of color palette, in terms of detail, um, that everything felt cohesive in the universe. So. You know, if you haven't seen a lot of the work that we did on 2018, like this is just some of the the cast members that we that we did. Yeah, and, then, and uh, uh, go for it. Right, one thing I think that, that early on in development when we left 2018, it, it was received really well, and we we were really happy with the cast that we did. Uh, we found out right away that it would just be a sequel, that the saga of Ragnarok would be concluding in this sequel. Uh, so on the character side, on the concept as well as the modeling team. That meant everything was on the board. Everything we wanted to do uh, was fair game to be there uh, in the cast, and this was our opportunity under the direction of uh, Raf, and then working closely with Eric Valdez and his team to really push it uh, from all angles on this, because uh, this was going to be it for us, so we wanted to make sure everything was in there. And the results speak volumes. Yeah, Eric, if you're watching, we miss you. Yeah, love you, man. Absolutely. Um, and Raf, I can go to the next slide, too, if you want to just talk a little about uh, the art direction stuff. Uh, Kind of yeah, as we went into this, we want to go for that. Yeah, so a lot of the things that we did 2018, we, we kept, like Della said, was a continuation, right? We're continuing the story. We're continuing, like, all the races and the characters. So some of the things that we always look for in the art direction side of things is mixing, right, the Norse mythology, um, which is, you know, kind of the base of what we're doing. And then one thing that we, we talk about is the historical detail. We always look at uh, artifacts, details from, you know, anything historical that we can find. Uh, Norse mythology doesn't have a lot of stuff out there besides just the kind of the public or the entertaining stuff that has been done. But we try to go in and look for, you know, real artifacts and things that we can pull from. And obviously, like the, the classical fantasy, which is what we're trying to pull from, 80s movies, like that feeling of, you know, fantastical. Like we're trying to get that uh, even on the, the smaller characters through, throughout the whole cast, right? Like trying to get the feeling of uh, fantasy, like children book, like really going in a journey and, in, in getting kind of lost in the universe. So that combined is what we call mythical realism. And we did that on 2018. It was a very good formula for us to really make sure everything, you know, was feeling right, was feeling cohesive within, you know, the, the franchise coming from the past games. And, you know, Ragnarok was a little bit easier uh, for us to continue building upon that, but still a lot of work. And you guys are going to see, like, some of the work that goes behind this, and we can always check on these uh, the, the, the pillars to make sure things feel uh, correct uh, for our franchise. Yeah, and this was like Raf said. This is something uh, on 2018. We <clears throat> we developed as the as a style guide and basically an art direction bible that we could give to uh, the artists that were there or anyone coming onto the team. So we minimized kind of the ramp up time, but also got you know a big part of what Raf is looking at is, is the cohesiveness across you know Ragnarok across the 2018 game and across both games. And this gave a way that we could use a shorthand. The nice thing about these pillars is it's not all you know, 30%, you know, we lean into a little bit here, a little bit there. Um, but it really helps establish the look. Because there's a great art, but I think the thing that Raph's always looking for is to make sure that it fits for the game, the world, the narrative aesthetic that, that uh, he was going for with this. 
it's good for artists coming into the, the project as well, right? Like when first things that people usually do is go into the classic Norse things that has been done, like, you know, the Marvels or like even just more books. And, and we always kind of push back and, and, and use the pillars to give feedback and make sure people are kind of filtering their, uh, you know, their references and things like that. Yeah, like, like Raph said, one, one of the interesting things when you're trying to get the historical detail in there, which you want this believable world with these fantastic characters, you know, we have the fantasy and the historical side. Uh, coming off the Greek saga, it was nice. There was a few more stuff to pull from. Viking, like Raph said, uh, not as much, a lot of stuff built of wood, so we kind of had to um, take what we could, look at what way they traditionally did stuff uh, to really get that look. Um, then one thing we'll typically go into too, just to give you an overview of how we start to concept this right before it goes to the modeling team. Um, this is a little bit of our process. Uh, you know, every concept starts with a kickoff, and usually that is sitting with Raf, um, Eric Valdez, uh, our directors uh, from gameplay and, and narrative, and really going into what they want. A lot of times we'll start off with a write-up, a bio, uh, a narrative bio, as well as um, a combat bio as well. Uh, from there, once we get the kind of broad direction, the artists just jump in, start grabbing some research and reference, kind of marinating themselves in the subject matter. And from there, start doing some really quick and loose ideations and thumbnails. Uh, what we're trying to do, especially dealing with mythology, which is kind of an abstract uh, themes and visuals sometimes, uh, we just go for it, let's see what we can do, and it really kind of exhausts everything, make sure we've turned over every rock. Um, at this point, this is something that we can show to RAF and the directors um, who have a good visual eye and see, can see the shorthand, because a lot of times it doesn't look at all what it will look like uh, in the final game, but when that's working, we'll move to comps. Um, and the nice thing about that is it starts to validate uh, the designs and the ideation process and see if it actually works and, and what we had kind of thought of was working. Um, Again, as we go through a review after that and things are working, we'll sync with the necessary departments and then we'll move into a final. Um, and that's really just polishing everything. Uh, what we'll do at this point too is provide model sheets, turnarounds um, and reference packets as we hand it off. The, the one thing I wanted to bring up and it's something that me and Della, since we started in the studio, we've been trying to implement into the pipeline is the use of 3D, right, for this phases. And, um, it helps a lot with the process for testing thing in, in game. So a lot of the things that we try to test in game, that we usually do a quick gray mesh. Like you see a lot of my work kind of evolved into kind of quick sketches to test out, you know, proportions and things in game that then we do paint overs on top. So the process kind of moves a little faster when we're doing that kind of stuff because people can see it in game and then we can keep working. So we usually do a gray mesh, which is kind of the initial block out of the model. And we hand it off that to rigging and animation so they can play out with poses and try out like, you know, how the character moves and really start playing with the rig. And then that's the phase that they give feedback the most. And ZBrush obviously helps a lot with that because we can quickly sketch out a model and then, you know, do a quick retopo um, and, and, and send it off to rigging. Um, and then while that's happening is kind of what Della was, was uh, describing. Like we do a lot of then exploration, paint overs, go deeper into details, really flesh out the design while animation is playing out with the rig because that's the phase that where they can have a lot of input because after that when things get locked down we all know how long it takes to do you know some of these characters so we don't want to have a lot of back and forth and spend the time like changing things down the line we really try to lock that down early on and that's when you know zbrush is the most you know our, our tool to, to make that happen so so you're kind of doing 3D concept in the beginning. In a way. Yeah, we're doing a mix, and a lot of it sometimes is we can hand even a loose sketch. And we'll get a block out real quick, almost like a ZBrush sketch, and we can kind of paint over that. We want to make sure that we don't miss anything in the 2D that can't translate into the 3D and the, the final design of the character. And like Raf says, we're trying to troubleshoot everything that we've learned through experience that could be a, a hurdle. Right. So we want to try and address it as, as early as we can. It, it, it doesn't always work, but if we can get most of it at that stage, it just saves us time. Yeah, a good uh, fusion the process line. there. Yeah, uh, then to Raph's point, working with Eric and his team, uh, a lot of collaboration, a lot of collaboration. This doesn't happen without uh, a team of people coming at it from every angle. So um, that's something I really like, the chemistry on the team uh, that Raph's set up. Uh, it has a really good working relationship, which um, is huge in games. Yes. Uh, yeah, this is a great slide. He's really showing you guys. Yeah. The, everyone that. like behind the scene. That's the business. That's the working. business. Of, yeah, that's yeah. the business. And of this business. is yeah. the great thing is this is an, an overall. This is kind of we can rely on this process. You know, there's there's timelines and, and things we have to deal with. So this can be expanded or condensed into an yeah. hour, depending on when how fast we need a, a design and concept. But at least we have a base that everyone understands, so we can evaluate it for this. I know it's not pretty artwork. 
but it's an important slide. Yes, yes, I'm taking is. screenshots as oh, I yeah. speak. I mean, are you kidding me? We have me? 400 more, so. Oh, you have 400 more. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah, let's get to it. says, stop talking, Paul. <laughs> right on. So uh, we can just hop into uh, the cast for God of War Ragnarok and starting out with uh, our main man here. Point. The big boy. Yeah, Kratos, I know we uh, coming out from, from 2018, the amount of work that we put into this character was insane at the beginning. So we knew that we needed to almost redo him from scratch since we're talking you know, kind of cross-gen and, and what's next for him. Uh, so very early, like I sat down with Eric and we started to re-sculpt the, you know, Kratos from ground up. This is some of the work that we also did on the costume. Like we wanted to keep the iconic costume that he had, but also doing a new take from what happened on the story. You know, some of the, how we could improve the sculpt, how we can improve the low res because we had some limitations last game that we could push on Ragnarok. So. These are some of uh, the early sketches from uh, Jose Cabrera as well, because he did a lot of work early on on Kratos with myself and Bella. Um, yeah. You know, it's always fun on, to work on this guy. Yeah, and again, you know, with the concepts that we started working through them is, is really seeing the effect of, of Thimble Winter on the characters, so you get to see a little bit more. They're, they're a little more covered up, but still trying to retain, like Raph said, those iconic elements that made the character so good from the, you know, the first game. Um, and then themes uh, that Raph and I and Eric had talked about is really kind of bringing in what we had in 2018 is Kratos represented by the bear and Atreus the wolf. Uh, giving a coat which felt like it uh, was good in wintertime also helped us to push that silhouette and get that feeling of a bear for Kratos. Um, yeah, we were not going to do a, another game with him not wearing a cloak because we, we really tried to push that on, on the last game. Yeah, yeah. Then that, that's the fun thing too. A lot of the ideas that uh, were generated in the first game found a place in, in Ragnarok. Um, this is work by Jose Cabrera. Great thing about Jose is we really try and understand the costume work. So you can see here, like, he'll even design things in layers to make sure that as we go through, it actually kind of makes sense. Again, that's a little bit of where that historical detail comes in. Uh, we want that fantastic with the believable, so it kind of grounds the characters and then allows us to really push the creative freedom uh, throughout the game. Yeah, you, you're gonna see that as a theme throughout the presentation. A lot of, like, making sure things are make sense and how they're fabricated, uh, all the details and materials that we always use. Like we always try to make you feel like it belongs to the, the place where they're, they're living. Like here, you know, in the story, they're just trying to survive in Midgard. So a lot of the materials that they can use is basically what they can pull from. Same thing on the story, uh, you know, they're kind of makeshifting their armor. So we, we didn't want to go crazy and make, you know, make like this crazy armor where it wouldn't make sense that Kratos made that. So a lot of those elements is just storytelling and the details and, and the materials that we're using. And same thing here, like you see a theme between uh, Kratos and Atreus, like what we try to keep coming from the last game, like what's iconic for them. So, you know, his armor was very iconic in terms of like the half, half shoulder pad uh, showing off the tattoo, like all the iconic elements, the skirt that made him, made his design, you know, recognizable. Like you're going to see that here and you're going to see that with Atreus as well. Yeah, we'll, we'll go through a lot of design details too to work things out. So this is just an example, just even things on the leggings and stuff, how much is too far, you know, we'll explore all that. And like Raph said, you know, the, the storytelling element with our, our team is great. We work with a great narrative team. And uh, the idea is this has been three years without the Holder brothers. So Kratos and Atreus have been making their costumes uh, in the meantime. The guy looks like me with no hair. <laughs> 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 yeah, here you can you can clearly see like what some of the collaboration is from like the two 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 D three D concept that you mentioned, Paul. Like some of the stuff here, I did a, a very quick model without worrying too much about construction at this point. And this is something that usually people ask, and it's a little bit confusing if you're starting. But you know, if you, for you to make a character like this ready for the game and, and completely fleshed out, it takes a long time to sculpt something like this for production. Where the things that I'm doing, it's a lot more sketching out. The overall proportions, like getting all the shapes blocked out, and you can quickly do that in ZBrush. Like within a couple of days, you could, you know, kind of block something out, and then I'll do a render, and then in Photoshop, I try to bring in a lot of texture detail, a lot of the the texture kind of wear and tear, and really kind of flesh out the concept in in 2D at that point. And ZBrush only, you know, the 3D aspect of it only works as an initial block out, and then you know whoever takes it to final definitely needs to go, go back and pretty much scratch everything that I do and, and just use it as an overall guide because a lot of the detail that needs to be made for a game like like we're making, it's, it's very intricate and it needs to be very well polished so everything holds up in the low res. So a lot of the work that you see from the team, like you know what Angela's gonna show and Josiah and Andrew and, and Eric uh, work on this presentation, it's like you know taking it to final. Like that work takes like a month, two months, like a lot of time just to get it there. So here's just a quick example on Kratos. Like, 
I want to get that out of the way because I want you guys to understand the separation of what the you know what the work really is. And this is my uh, my quick concept, 2D, 3D concept of Kratos for us to get things approved. And like Della said, the collaboration, the back and forth really helps us to get things moving. When people see this, there's a big buy-in of like, you know, this this is gonna work, materials feel feel correct, even though the final looks different. Uh, in, in terms of polish level, like this is a, a good way for us to get things approved. Thanks for demystifying that because there's a lot of misconceptions I think that people might have. They think, oh, look, it's just a quick thing and, and your your breakdown of the process, professionally speaking, is uh, warranted and valued. Thank you so much. Well, Raf's quick yeah. sculpting is completely different than anybody yeah. else's, though, I'd like to point <laughs> out, right? Raf's quick sculpting. Here's a whole character in a day. Like, you're good. So you guys re-sculpted him for this one? Yeah. Completely? Yeah, so Eric did a lot of the work um, of the, the sculpting in it, early on. Like we couldn't go back and completely redo the low res because we already had a lot of the facial animation or, you know, kind of facial shapes that we didn't mm -hmm. want to redo. A lot of the kind of, you know, there's some animations with the rage mode and things like that that we wanted to keep based on UV, uh, UVs. Um, so that we try to preserve so we didn't have to go back and redo because that takes, you know, a lot of time, kind of like six months to a year to get all that fleshed out. So. But the sculpt side of things, like we went back and re-sculpted his face, re-sculpted the details. You know, the armor is completely from scratch. Uh, Eric redid his legs, you know, redid the whole armor's, uh, armor set. Uh, but on the body, which I think is the more iconic and important part because that carries over throughout all the, the upgrades, that we did a lot of work on. You know, we did the eyes, we redid the beard. Um, so a lot of work went into that, which is it's really fun. Like when we get to work on these characters, especially Kratos, like we want to spend the time to make him feel next gen, right? Like kind of the next step for him. And I think the the work that we put in, having a base to start from, like it was really helpful because then we could push and fix things that we didn't like on the last project. There was a lot of things that bothered me when uh, after we shipped and we got a chance to kind of really fix that. But you can see the amount of detail that Eric put in. And if you see my early sketch, you'd be like, night and day like this is the you know very very well polished a lot of the stitching was kind of handmade and really taking the time to make sure everything feels natural you see a little bit of the um imperfections on the stitching and how it kind of damaged the the leather as you're making it we really wanted to make it feel like kratos could have put this together based on the things that he had and you can you know kind of get this sense of with the leather treatment and, and all the details and that's one thing, Raf. I love that you and Eric looked at too. Is just getting the frequency of detail. Um, it's it's easy to really go in and add add too much. I think the, deciding where we want those elements to pop and where we want kind of a, avoids it getting noisy, uh, which is you know a nice subtlety that's, that's added to it from a design point of view that I think helps kind of with all the stuff under the hood to get that final design in there. Most definitely. You can jump to the next one though. We can show a little bit more of the in-game um, stuff. And you can see this uh, clearly the amount of detail that was put into this model is kind of crazy from Eric's side. And uh, props to him because he likes to really spend the time in making these things perfect. Yep. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's really looking we, tight. When we go to the the low res, like like I said, like we try to preserve uh, a lot of the setup that we had last game. Kratos has a lot of uh, armor upgrades, so the things how we break it down, like the upper torso is like one set, then we have one set for the arms, one set for the the waist. And when I say set, it's UV sets, so you guys can kind of think about how textures were made, and uh, one set for the legs as well. So there's a lot of um, you know we could play, and and a lot of detail that we can put on these sculpts to make things look. Uh, as good as we possibly can. And then on top of that, we do a lot of tiling with uh, materials and, and details. And you will see, I know the, the crew is going to talk about some of that on the other characters. But, uh, you know, a lot of the work went into this big guy. And, and Angela, you can talk about some of the textures. Uh, yeah, we, uh, you know, Eric Valdez did the textures for Kratos. Um, I helped him out with some of the textures for the armor sets. Uh, but just trying to keep all that detail that he put into the base mess and carry it on on all the base on, a, on all the armor sets uh, was you know great learning experience. You know I got to to learn from Eric, um, who did this amazing work. So awesome. a lot of fun. <laughs> and you see some of the work that uh, Angie is going to show also in the in the next characters, like a lot of the work done in substance and um, and some crazy stuff for Kratos. I mean we try to put as much detail as we as we possibly can, but like Bella said, we always try to balance out. You know the frequency of details like how much we want to dirty him up when we're working with pbr 
and uh, a lot of the base materials, we try to keep them as clean uh, sometimes as, as we have to because things read a little bit different in game. Uh, but you can see here, there's a lot of uh, time spent on, on the leather, you know, you know, kind of the, the difference of the values of the leather to make sure all the layering feels uh, visible because there's a lot of detail going on and we want to try to, you know, represent as much as possible. You can see here on the beard, like the beard was completely redone based on last game. Uh, we try to make it a little more fuller and add a lot, we could afford more cards uh, this time around. So I, I did some work on that as well to make sure the glorious beard felt next gen. <laughs> our, our beard tech. No, and it was it was one thing too. I think Angela was really nice too. Like some of that pattern work is kind of played down within the values in there too, and then the material breakup and all that attention to detail. It's subtlety, but you get the variety in it without it being uh, too noisy or splitting the eye. You know, because I think once we get to this stage too, we look at how we can kind of compose the character where we want uh, you to look for a second and third and, and keep that up, and that's all the work. And there. it's cool because you can get to see Kratos from the camera behind, you know, like you don't always see him up close, you do sometimes, but as you're playing, you know, he's a little bit farther and those details need to stand out and have a lot of contrast so they pop. Yeah, I think we'll like, it, when we're lucky, a character will be the size of your hand on screen. So making sure that that, that holds up. And like you said, uh, we'll probably see our main character from the back more than the, the front. Yeah, <laughs> the shoulders. <laughs> One good thing about gray meshing, like we talked early on, is that we can uh, really get a sense of what, how things are looking for from just the initial block out in game. But then when you get to the finals, like you get everything, you know, perfect as close as you can possibly get because of photo mode and, and all the cinematics. We use the same models in game for cinematics, so we don't have that any any difference on that. So all our models hold up with tiling textures and all that stuff. And it's funny because even the team sometimes look at the gray mesh and be like, oh, this looks amazing. It's, it's you know, it's final. And we're like, no, no, it's not. You know, <laughs> like if you spend the time, like we need to make these things perfect. But again, like that step of us grading a gray mesh in really unblocks the team to keep moving. It's just a little bit more on Kratos. Let's awesome. get a sense of all the, the cool stuff. Uh, and then moving to Atreus. Atreus, we had some other really fun uh, design uh, stuff that we were looking at with him. We wanted to see a lot of growth on this character. It's been three years, and uh, he's been growing during Thimble Winter, um, so a lot more change uh, in his design. We wanted to bring a level of confidence. Um, and like with any main character, a lot of work goes into it. Uh, if you get the art book, you can see more of this, but these are just some examples. Here's some early sketches by Stephen Oakley. Um, some stuff at this stage, obviously playing up the wolf theme, uh, getting a little more confidence kind of in the character. Um, then another artist that we had, Vance Kovacs, did some work too. Oh, nice. um, this reflects a little bit more of the idea and the effect of the costuming of Thimble Winter. Like we have with Kratos, he's a little more covered up. Um, some of these explorations also kind of imagined if he's going a little bit more towards his father, we added some bulk and stuff to the character and Vance was even putting in, you know, any narrative stuff that we can pick from mythology and the story is great. Um, there's a rooster that's supposed to, uh, in the mythology, uh, signal Ragnarok as well. So he added some of those rooster feathers in there and all those elements. One thing we want to do, like with all the characters, is just make sure that we do a, a pretty valid uh, exploration of it. Um, and then the choices that we have kind of bring them uh, into what the final is. So I know Vance is a zebra shooter. Did he only do 2D, 2D stuff for you guys, or did he actually end up doing something? Uh, no, Van you? Vance is a real great example of, of the combination yeah. of both. Uh, and I, Vance Sweet. is... Working that out, he did a lot of stuff with the Valkyries last game and, and how things could articulate and all yeah, that. Yeah, he's too, awesome. So. He's beautiful. Um, but that's also working in collaboration with uh, Eric and his team. And I think having that that understanding with the back and forth as we talk about characters right. as they move forward is really good because none of it is de designed in isolation and we want to keep that conversation going. Um, small things too, just even like hair studies, how do we want that to evolve, something that feels a little more confident. Uh, we are going with more neutral natural palettes, but we still wanted to bring in the yellow because that represented his mother. Um, and then this is a concept I did and we started to dial it in here. Uh, some of the influences that came into this design is we wanted a lower profile costume to go with the more agile, nimble uh, feeling with the trace that we've always had. He still has the wolf fur uh, from the original game. And one thing thematically that we talked about with Atreus on 2018 is he has a yellow scarf from his mother and then also a red sash from his father. And it was about equal in that game. And now that he's growing, you know, and he's got the lineage with the Norse, uh, you can start to see the yellow coming out forward a lot more in his design. So that connection is supposed to be there. Um, and then once we have something like this, or we'll, we'll also add the, the smaller details, like the for anyone who played the 2018 game, the Mistletoe Arrow, which uh, had helped uh, 
in the final battle, he's still carrying as, as a kind of signal of good luck. And this is a good example of what Della uh, was bringing up. You know, a lot of, from this stage, uh, we were doing a lot of uh, sketches in 3D as well to see kind of what felt good. Like we put it in the game, make sure it kind of feels feels correct. And we're showing here kind of like the, some, some examples, but we do a lot of work to get to this point. Um, some of the things that Della brought up, like with the skirt, like we did it. We did a breakdown. Kratos was a little bit easier because uh, his design is very iconic to what we wanted to bring into Ragnarok. But for Atreus, we had to, you know, kind of do a little bit of a, a breakdown and, and explain to people like what things we wanted to carry over for his design to be iconic. So, kind of the cross on the chest was, you know, something that we decided to keep from last game. You know, kind of the Spartan uh, skirt on his waist, and then like Della said, the. His mo the mother's scarf from his neck, and, and these things iconic. These iconic things like is what we tr started to build even on upgrades. As we, you know, these characters change, we really want to make, you know, very clear to the public what is, you know, what Atreus represents and things that he. When you break him down into simple shapes, what are the things that we need to keep to make sure he feels iconic? And you can even see some of the details that Della added, which was really really cool. Is like the, the Kratos's tattoo on his arm. And starting to really represent a little bit of the father into the design, and, and we did that a little bit on the scar uh, scars on his face last game, and uh, I think this uh, starts to kind of connect them a little bit more within the family. It's, it's pretty cool. And then uh, again, same process here. Like I did an initial sketch, and um, even the one before was a little bit of a combination between myself and Eric, a little back and forth, where Eric would spend a little more time. You know, I'll, I'll get the models, tweak some stuff, send it back. So we, we really try to make uh, the process very fluid and I'm very thankful for the team because that's, you know, I, I think that's why, you know, our things look so good is because nobody owns a certain character. Like if anybody wants to get it and give feedback and kind of send it back and forth, we really kind of, um, you know, push this collaboration because I feel like it really makes our characters look better. And this is the kind of prime example of Eric's work on Atreus. There's a ton of work that goes that went into this to make it everything feel like the layering is um it makes sense that everything feels like he's wearing it like we even had a cosplayer uh come to the studio last week and then was talking to me and Della, and uh she was saying like how hard it was to get all the layering down because there's so much going on and we try to sell that with like you know kind of the the, the weather and what he would be wearing uh even the leather on his chest is kind of like flipped of the kind of a pelt right so you get the fur coming off of like pockets of it again looking at reference looking at things that will make sense for the for where they're you know they're living and they're trying to survive like we look a lot of that stuff again that's kind of the historical detail and how people would dress up you know in kind of northern uh, countries and, and things like that to make sense everything to make sense and feel like you know these characters really exist and things that they're making is not just to look cool even though atreus is like we can play and have a little more fun because he kind of a teenager we want him to look cool because you know kratos is very much like the big guy and you know his stuff is a lot more practical we had some fun with him uh to make sure he felt uh kind of you know a little more stylish in his his choices there again it's all just, the yeah. crazy details go for it more the more of the design work too and uh, i was working closely with uh raf and eric on this and we, you know we'll also have weekly syncs where we we talk about the director feedback of uh, stuff that they did like and that uh, wasn't hitting the mark so when we hand off a character and design they when it goes to 3d it's not just given a cold piece of concept art they understand uh the direction and, and all those elements so uh you know i that was in office and working closely with eric when he was doing all this stuff and um <laughs> I think uh, me and Eric and Raf too all feel like proud parents, like Kratos. So uh, this is our <laughs> our baby boy here is doing good. Um, and well, just years, years working well, on it. Yeah, years and, years you know, an institution. A, a lot of attention to detail. And, and you know, there's a point on a concept where we hand it off, but it's in such good hands as it goes forward. Their understanding, because when things come where it's cuts or edits that we need to kind of be aware of, um, the changes that Eric and Raf do it are 100% in line with the direction of where it's going. So each step actually makes the characters better. And, uh, you know, this one took a lot of love from the team. Yeah, I think even when you guys continue the franchise, what you guys are doing, what Raph's saying, you guys sharing stuff, mm -hmm. right? You guys, that team will just keep going the right yeah. path in the right direction. And that's a big thing I think that, that's helped with, you know, uh, Eric and Raph and myself and, and all the other departments too, it foster in the studio when we've learned to work the best and, and try and kind of create that, that environment as best we can. So it, 
it maximizes the artist's output. Yeah, it definitely shows cases that it's more than one person that, to make a oh. cultural phenomenon like this. I mean, it's uh, yeah. celebrated. The 100%. Whole. I think in, in my experience, too, I think some of the strongest design work, um, not just on this, but other projects I see, have been through collaboration. Those are some of the strongest designs. Sweet. Well, the scores online is saying enough for what you guys have done. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Yes. You can, uh, you can clearly see on the trailers, um, like the, the attention that we put into make sure things feel like there's proper attention to mm -hmm. how he's wearing so everything doesn't feel super stiff. You know, like a lot of that, I feel like it's what makes a lot of difference when we go into like more of these complicated characters that we try to make sure, you know, kind of stitching feels correct, that it has the correct scale. You know, there's tension to where he's wrapping things around, but then we can kind of play up with volume where it's not. So. Uh, especially when we're dealing with Norris and uh, the stuff that we have to play with. Like there's not, we can't really put a lot of metals on these characters, especially at the beginning. So the use of cloth and, and the separation between the elements are very important. And when people are looking at their own sculpts, like I feel like that's kind of, the, the, you know, kind of a step when you go into paying attention to how things are fabricated and how things got, should fit together, look at scans and things like that. Like it, it definitely helps. We're looking Let's keep going. Again, for Atreus, uh, uh, we, we had the initial phase from 2018 from Sunny, which was a scan. Uh, this time around, like we re-sculpted the face, so we got a new scan from him, from Sunny. And we, you know, I, I did a lot of work trying to find the correct balance because Sunny also is very different from Atreus, but also, you know, being the actor, you know, I started to blend in percentage-wise, like how much we wanted his aging to affect Atreus's aging. So that was a lot of uh, back and forth to really get the, the correct face. Because when you look at 2018, even myself working on that game for so many years, like you have an idea of what Atreus looks like, but once you go down into like making the face, is like there's a lot of nuances, nuances to the, the design of his face, different from what Sunny used to look like. So here was, again, uh, sitting down and kind of playing up with how much we wanted to age him. So yeah, we sculpted the face, the eyes are all completely new. From last and game, we got new shaders and everything. Even just like some of the pattern work and stuff that you would kind of helped out on here too. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> yeah, but no, I think that that really came into it too. Just that attention to detail and that work and everything. Yeah, and like all the work that um, Eric did in the texturing became kind of like the staple. Like um, what we were shooting for with the other characters, you know, all the stuff that we did, he did with Kratos and, and Atreus. Just we we're looking at constantly to so we can reach the same quality so that they all would be cohesive. Mm How -hmm. are we looking on time? I think we're doing good. About You're doing good. Time. Yeah, yeah. It's all good. Doing good? We're doing yeah, good. Let's do it. All right. Um, Rep, I can actually, oh, do you want to talk a little bit about? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I got to do one of the, the um, armor sets that Atreus gets. Uh, I was really inspired by the armor sets that Andrew and Bernardo were, were sculpting for Kratos and Atreus. Uh, this one, uh, it was a cool challenge because uh, we usually tend to sculpt our characters with the arms down, like in a more relaxed pose as opposed to the A pose. Uh, this lets, uh, you know, Raph see how the character is going to feel in game uh, instead of it being too stiff. Um, and then once he approves it, then we go ahead and move the arms up a little bit and then clean up the armpit area uh, to get the better bakes. And then ultimately go take him to the A pose for rigging in the low poly. Uh, the challenge with this one was that the shoulder pieces were so round and, you know, they fit nice when his arms are down, but then when I had to pull them up, they started distorting. So it was fun to uh, play around with that shape to make it feel good when it's, you know, when his arms are moving. Um, and also ma uh, making sure that the hook in his back uh, fits around it because the hook st uh, needs to stay in that place uh, throughout all the armor sets um, because that's where his bow goes. Um, and then uh, also another thing I like to look at when sculpting is making sure that all the layers interact with each other. Uh, so for example, on the, on the far right image, the, the back, you can see a little highlight on the belt because the metal in the back is pushing it forward. So you really want that interaction of elements pushing and pulling each other so that they feel grounded and it just feels more realistic. Yeah, I love, the, I love that attention to detail. And uh, yeah, I think this is... This turned out beautiful. It's, like I said, it always feels good when it's going over the good modeling team under the direction of everyone and, and the result. The next slide. Uh, yeah, so another thing we got to uh, watch out for when sculpting for games is making sure that nothing is at a 90 degree angle. Uh, you want to make sure you have bevels and everything set at an angle so that it bakes correctly or else the bake is going to be pretty much non-existent. 
Uh, we also make sure that things are watertight so the low poly can bake correctly. Um, and yeah, it was a lot of fun, like, you know, doing like all the little scales on his torso, uh, just moving things by hand, uh, and basically avoiding noise, noisy, too, ma too much noise and making the pattern stand out. Uh, and yeah, just balancing out the details throughout the whole costume. Another thing that I was looking for, that, that main belt that he has, that's the belt that, he, that his original, his base custom has, and that's the belt that the pouch and all the accessories hang from, so that one needed to stay in place. So then when sculpting the armor sets, it becomes a, a, a challenge of sculpting things around the one belt, but making it feel like it's grounded and that, that it belongs there. And it's not just, you know, an afterthought. Well, that's one of the big things too, like we had talked about, is like, how do we address those challenges? And because every, every team that goes out has, has to kind of keep that in mind. And hopefully all this stuff under the hood that we're kind of telling you, you, you don't realize it just feels right and, and, and looks really impactful in the final design. And like that is along with the artistic side, the technical stuff that uh, the team needs to keep in mind. All right, Raph, I can go a little kind of quick through this. This was just an example on the concept side of expanding some of the characters. Um, uh -huh. You want me to just run through this? Yeah, this is a, a good example just for what we go through with these characters and, and really flashing out, because we're showing kind of the, the final, some of the final uh, models here, but Della, you can yeah, go through some of yeah, these. Yeah, I'll just go through this real briefly. This is just a way that we kind of visualize that process that we showed you earlier. So starting out with really loose thumbnails and, and stuff, we kind of go through this. Uh, this was a new class called Ionajar, and I'll just kind of go through and talk about it. Uh, it's Odin's army. Um, this was nice because we actually had mythology to pull from for these characters. Uh, we wanted them to be reflective of the raven. They're, in the mythology, they are chosen from uh, the most, uh, the best warriors who were uh, killed in battle by the Valkyrie to, to come to Odin. Um, so we're designing a new class. We wanted something that, you know, while humans felt equally as imposing as like we had the Draugrs and the Hellwalkers in the last game, um, so bringing those elements, a lot of times too, we'll look at silhouettes and stuff and see how that works across the board. Uh, we also have to kind of take like narrative stuff into mind. So some stuff that we thought too is maybe Odin breathes life into their bodies after they catch them or, or after they choose them. So he puts his hands on, breathes life, and it leaves this black mark, which actually creates a raven on their faces. And the idea that they are dead, so they have the, the pale skin, but the raven still reads on them. We wanted something, we knew we'd get them armored because we have to deal with a lot of combat. Uh, stuff and make sure that the accommodations for all the combat needs for a class like this, for a light, medium, large, elite, and then varieties all read. Uh, and then as we go to heavy, this is some work that, that Raft did, is, is really making sure that once we get a look for any faction that it can expand throughout the entirety of the faction. We can't just have one design that works, but then can't really propagate. You know, if you imagine you saw all those <laughs> exact same characters running at you on screen, you'd tell right away that uh, we, we didn't have the variety that we wanted. Um, but again, like we talked about the 2D, 3D collaboration, and then Raf goes in and, you know, see how does that work and can really validate it. The nice thing about it is looking at it in 3D, and then we also will put the stuff in game to make sure that that holds up. Um, other things when we're working with uh, combat is also making sure that within light, medium, heavy classes that we can get the variety we need there. You can see the Raven theme coming through here, so a mix of some of the classic Norse helmets, but still bringing those elements into these characters. And again, it works for the lights as well as the heavies. Um, and then across to our elite classes as well. Things like this with the Raven motif and being you know, trained by the Valkyrie that we start to see those influences and their weapons are even more reflective of the Valkyrie. Again, a large part is also the weapons they use. We need to make sure that the uh, combat is supported and has the weapon variety that they can use and, and switch and try out what makes the best combat experiences within game. So even stuff like weapon design, and then mythical stuff too, like they'll have a power and making sure that that reads, like we talked about being small on screen, uh, we want the clear legibility because it's easy to design up close uh, on the concept side, but then drop it in an engine to really see how that reads. And like we said at the end, we just want a character that you feel is impactful and imposing and, and, and a big threat, but that's a lot of the under the hood stuff that we go into. Um, and so jumping into some more of the cast here, uh, we knew Freya would be returning. Obviously, she was a, a huge character in the last game and the way it ended. Uh, we find her and a little bit of the design work here done by Raph and Shan was really looking at how she's been as a mix of uh, revenge and grief that she's been facing as well as she's been hunting Kratos and Atreus uh, for three years and reflecting that in her design. Raph, I don't know if there's anything you want to touch on this. Yeah, just real quick, like this is a good example of things that we could use, especially 
beneficial for the 3D side of things because we already had those models from last game. And once we're talking about like, you know, kind of redesigning them for the for Ragnarok, a lot of things that we could pull from uh, and the details that we grabbed from even Baldur's design last game, a lot of the, you know, kind of the legs are very similar to what he was wearing. Uh, the necklace you see, she has like this under armor, kind of like more battle ready, but still keeping what, what was iconic for Freya because this should still feel like what she was last game. But again, a little more uh, what Della described, like a little more of the storytelling within the, the design of how she's surviving and getting ready for, for the battle. And here, you know, some of the work that uh, I was able to transition from the models as well as Eric's um, sculpt on, on her design. <clears throat> again, that collaboration with Eric and the back and forth, very similar things, the attention to details, all the stitching, making sure my initial sketch was just to make sure she felt uh, proportionally correct and things kind of, you know, the weight was there. But again, once you go to the details, you just got to really spend the time. There's no like deep secret on like tools that we're using. And I'm sure that the crew is going to talk more about. So there's some specific character that we had some uh, tricks, but here it's a lot of just spending the time detailing, uh, making sure everything feels believable. Oh, it's believable. All right. Yeah, that's the, that's the hope. That's a historical detail. I'm selling some art books over here is all I know. I'm giving links. <laughs> <laughs> Get yes, get the art book, by the way. Yeah. There's a ton of stuff that's <laughs> yeah. coming out. It's coming out end of the month. It looks great. All the yeah, so yeah, for the textures... Yeah, I can't wait to share this stuff. Oh, sorry. Go, <laughs> oh, Angie, sorry. Uh, for the textures, we knew that Freya was going to be a big player in this game. Um, so, you know, she just went through a lot of personal struggles uh, after the, the death of her, of her son. Uh, so we wanted her textures to, to show that. Uh, you know, I added a lot of wear and tear and stuff and you know, a lot of scratches on the straps. Uh, but, you know, there's a storytelling behind it, like, we want you to feel like maybe she's been on the hunt for Kratos for three years. Maybe they've already encountered each other. Maybe they've already fought before. Uh, you know, she hasn't just been sitting still. Uh, so all this comes uh, across in the textures. Uh, another thing I like to do for texturing is if you can see the legs are usually darker. So we usually play, uh, make a gradient out of the characters so they can uh, read better in game. So keeping the light and the attention and the upper torso and the face. Um, because our, our in-camera game, or in-game camera, sorry, it's very cinematic, so we have to take into consideration mm -hmm. when texturing our characters. Uh, so yeah, for her face, it was a, a new model, new textures. Uh, this is just to show you guys the, the new makeup and fear treatment. Uh, just, you know, figuring out how to make her look impactful and, and you know, a badass, because she's a badass. <laughs> um, her tattoos were also done from scratch again. I, I hand drew the, the designs, and this let me have a lot of control uh, also getting clean masks to be able to to change the things in in game um, You know there's a point where her tattoos needed to glow so we, we can easily control that control that in the engine um, We also like to break up our misses so, so it looks a bit more natural when she's in movement um, A cool challenge with with Freya was designing her her skirts in 3d because you know You want it to flow you want it to feel like they're sitting on top of each other nicely, but at the same time Rigging needs to have a gap in between each layer so that the simulation works better. So it was a cool back and forth with rigging to try to uh, figure that out. Um, another cool thing about Freya is that she's one of uh, the few characters that uses tessellation, and we use that in her cape. Uh, so tessellation is something that we don't usually use in the characters. It's usually mostly used by care, uh, environment artists. Um, but yeah, we just wanted to steal that technique to to you know, put it in our characters to where it was most impactful, and the cape was a uh, was a good thing to do it on. <laughs> the seeming was way better. Yes, PS5 only, but baby PS5 steps. PS5 only, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and one thing we do too is that attention to detail is in our main cast as well as even the uh, the smaller characters. This was a, a, a creature Stephen and Shan designed that we'd see in another realm called Vanaheim, um, and a lot of what we do really doesn't exist, so we don't have a lot of reference. But it, it's really great. Uh, the modelers kind of take advantage of that and, and run with it. Yeah, so this one was a lot of fun to scold because there's no real life uh, reference to pull from, you know, as, as, as like the whole shape. Uh, so in things like this, you really have to use your, your artistic experience to be able to, to establish a look in 3D. Uh, for this one, I wanted him to look, you know, like there's a speed and movement with all the directionality of the feathers and the, and the, and the fur. Um, and in overall, just make him feel aggressive and just make him feel like, you know, you gotta watch how you see this guy around. <laughs> yeah, um, I love the way this turned out. The 2D doesn't always 100% communicate, so the way you guys artistically do that stuff that doesn't exist is great. Yeah, 
And then like for the feathers, we usually, like these are not the feathers that you are going to see in game. Uh, we still like to put them and pl hand place them in, in ZBrush, uh, in the high poly so we can see the feel and how the, 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 the creature is going to look like. Um, and then once it gets approved, then we bake a few feathers and then we hand place again the cards uh, for the game. Uh, a cool challenge with this one was um, Spiro. He had made uh, another version of the Ravager before and they need to share the same rig. So I, I took his bar, the body that he has sculpted and you know, modified it for this concept, but then I also had to keep the, the neckline in place and the eyes and the jaw. So you know, I had to like, figure out and solve the, the shapes in 3D while keeping those things intact. So that was, that was an interesting challenge. <laughs> yeah, there's always working within the limitations so it never looks mm -hmm. like it at the end. Um, Another uh, fan favorite was Brock and Sindri from the last game, and we see them again in this game. Uh, again, we played up the idea with the uh, Nimble Winner being in, in full effect in their costume work. And the one good thing about the, these guys, too, is like a lot of the work that we had to do to redesign their costumes, but also like keep them very to what was iconic in 2018. And uh, this is a good example of just like the mobility, how we kind of switched his skirts and and the armor to make sure like the shoulders to make it a little more easier for rigging to, you know, so for him to move, like he's, they're doing kind of climbing this game and uh, being a lot more um, around. So we need to make sure that everything felt like they could move around. And, but again, we try to preserve as much as possible from what we had and then re-sculpting what we had to, to make sure they felt like an evolution from last game. But uh, we had to kind of work with a lot of what we had before. And, and you can I like see- to say Oh, sorry. sorry. I was gonna say I, li I like I like to to think that Eric used like alphas or like you know fancy techniques to do all the patterning on his armor set, but knowing him, he probably hand sculpted everything. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> my mind is officially blown. That's hand sculpting. <laughs> yeah, it's a combination of a lot of things, oh, wow. right? And we try to create patterns and then use the patterns as as we see fit. And patterns is kind of a tricky thing for Norse. Like you think there's a lot of things out there, but we actually had to recreate a lot of pattern patterns and. Uh, look at other artists to help us create a library of things that we could possibly use. Uh, but yeah, a lot of ornate stuff on, on this character. Just a heads up on time, you're at the halfway point in 10 minutes. Yeah, so you know. Cool. I think we'll, if we can oh, go to 11.30 on this and then we'll... Yep, sure. Okay. Uh, so for the textures, we really were focusing on, on improving the metals uh, on this game. Uh, we really wanted his armor set to shine and, you know, like all those historical details that Eric got into the sculpt. We want him to, you know, to be able to show and, and, and glow in the game. Um, a cool challenge with, with, with Sindri was making, sh you know, giving him a lot of wear and tear on his costume to make a feel lived in, but also not crossing the line of making it too dirty because of, you know, Sindri's personality of being a clean, germophobic dwarf. <laughs> <laughs> so that was cool to work on. Um, I also got to work on the, on the hat that he wears in the snow. Um, also hand placing all the cards. Um, I did do a try on, on doing cards in next gen. But uh, there's just like a something magical when you do something by hand. You have more control of, as to where the, the cards are flowing. And it just, it just shows, you know, the handmade work shows a lot. Oh, and I, I like to point out the little detail in the, the, in the tip, the zipper. Uh, we added the little anvil as the zipper pattern. So that was a cool, you know, thing to get the, the vibe as a, as a blacksmith going. Yeah, a dwarf is artistic as Sindria would, would definitely have that in there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Exquisite, yeah, it looks really great. And uh, yeah, Raf, you just want to talk a little bit about Thor, and then we'll jump into the model. Yeah, yeah, we'll kind of real quick. And, and this guy, you know, he made his rounds out there of his design. We really try to push what you know, kind of a different take of what was done before. A lot of the design inspiration from for him was like some of the horns for uh, kind of the ghosts that he has on the mythology. We pull a lot from the mythology to get inspiration for the hair color, kind of his weight, and things that how you know how he's uh, talked about in the in the setas and. Uh, to make sure we had that style but again bringing our own take to what the character is bringing that fantasy um push and, and and really making him iconic like we did a ton of exploration of what he could look like corey since 2018 had a very uh, clear idea of what he was looking for and then eric w williams the director also had a lot of input on how you know kind of the decision making how he should look and there's a, co a lot of cool stuff here for his design and, and as we go into the model you can kind of make out yeah, it's, it's it's always interesting designing too. Uh, the, just a character that's been done so much in you know pop culture and by other projects, and given something that that hopefully is a little bit of new take from the narrative that really fits within uh, the story we're telling. Uh, even the hammer, something as iconic as that, that was designed by Jeff Klegerman, uh, getting all those elements in there and then reflecting it in the model. 
and you can see here like uh, kind of the back and forth in 3d as well like my initial sketch then hand it off to eric for the final sculpt and, and he really took the time to make things um perfect here because a lot of the pattern that i put was uh, in 2d you can kind of see it kind of the raven pattern on his forearms kind of a little callback to odin's design uh, a lot of like the the goats in uh, some of the patternings for his skirt uh, same thing that goat design into the hammer so it's kind of like we find these the themes so we could play up and we create patterns like that so when every, you know when we throw them into the, the the character everything feels cohesive into what the azir gods would use like you can get a lot of the details and colors from you know his sons from last game so again always try to bring that storytelling and obviously the the detail and the, the polish level and the sculpt is like you know top notch like i wouldn't expect anything less from from the crew um, I mean, this stuff is, is pretty awesome. A lot of the work that we put in is back and forth within the design, how we make things feel uh, with the right scale. Like Thor is way bigger than Kratos, so the size of stitching, the amount of details that we put in certain areas had to balance out so he doesn't feel out of place. And um, kind of, I think that the result speaks kind of by itself. There's a lot of cool stuff happening with this this guy. Yeah. Same thing for the hair. I like the girth of the matter. Well, yeah, that's that's part of it too. You, you want a character that represents thunder? That's kind of that's what we wanted thunder, in the yeah. background with that, like Rap <laughs> says, de dealing with those themes. Definitely and, bringing some thunder. Yeah. yeah, that's definitely thunder. Yeah. Among other things. <laughs> the hammer, too, bringing the hammer. Yeah. Right? Um, so the textures were, you know, I had a, a lot, a lot of fun working on this one. You know, he's a big guy. Um, one of the challenges I had with this one was that his design has a lot of leather layers. There's leather on top of leather on top of leather. So I had to figure out a way to, to make them, you know, feel like they belong with each other and they don't fight each other. And, you know, with a lot of hue variations and breaking up the gloss in different manners in each layer. Um, at first, I was doing the layers uh, like more brownish, reddish tint. And, uh, you know, Raph was, his art direction was to make him uh, a bit feel uh, like cooler hues, so, so more bluish. And I think it was a perfect um, decision because it makes him look uh, more cohesive. It contrasts more with the hair. And when you put him in the environment, he just stands out. Um, I think we're lucky to have a and our director that you know, has a background in characters because the, the expectations are always really high. Oh, look, he's oh, making look a little heart. <laughs> heart. By the way, Raphael Grissetti is the art director. There you go. <laughs> Along with Eric. He made a big Thanks heart you. there like this. <laughs> a kid taught me this one. And <laughs> another cool thing that we did with the letters was adding like little hints of, le of gold. Uh, it's something that maybe is not you know, hyper-realistic. You don't find gold you know, on leather, but just adding those little hints makes him look you know, more special, feels more majestic. Um, so it's a cool little little trick that we did there. Um, the tattoos were fun to work on. I, you know, I kept the, the design flat in Photoshop and then used a substance painter to, to wrap it around his body. And then, you know, whenever we updated the tattoo design, it just would automatically update in, in substance That's without great. having to redraw a lot. That's really great. Um, for the skin, I got a lot of tips and tricks from Andrew that was making beautiful skin on other characters back then. Uh, so then I started adding like little tiny veins and little blemishes, things that you maybe don't, you know, you don't see right away, but, but they're there and you feel it and it just makes it feel more realistic. Um, also, we, we added dirt to the nails of all the characters. It's just a, such a subtle detail that makes it feel just alive. And, no, that's something we wanted with all the Azers. They felt dirty. There was a, like a 1970s biker gang kind of feel to them. Oh, I like that. That's what yeah. I was thinking too. Yeah, in contrast <laughs> to the Greek pantheon, you know, this is uh, the direction that Corey and Eric both really want you can say that I, I can't get it Louis, that one's getting closer to you that's getting closer that one's getting right? closer okay <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna just bite my tongue i want to say something i'm not going to <laughs> <laughs> um so this image um you know amanda irony she worked on our hair a lot of our hairs uh we got a good base started from outsourcing but then she worked her magic in the game and made the character's personality come through with the hairstyle uh, as far as the texturing the face one cool tip would be to add a lot of uh, hue variation around the eyeballs <laughs> So I had lots of reds and blues and yellows. Uh, it makes the character feel more alive. Um, I feel like with Thor, it makes his eyes feel a bit more troubled. And you know, when you see your characters, we want you to feel like they're about to talk to you, like they're breathing. So just whatever you know, it takes to make them feel. But, but capturing that detail really settles and in, in dials in the personality for when, you, when everyone plays the game, you'll see how that's reflected, that, that kind of troubled nature. Uh, we wanted that just at first glance. Yeah. Um, and then, Rafi, you just want to go into tier? I think this is the last one before we swap. Before you do the swap? Yeah, we're going to have a swap. Oh, yeah. Under we'll, do a very, we'll do it very quick. And again, 
all the things that we talked about, you can kind of see it, it replicate on all the characters. Like Tyr, there's a lot of backstory to him on 2018, like him traveling to different cultures, different realms, and him being more of a traveler. And again, we wanted to play up the different Encredos where he is the god of war, and, and we knew that Tyr was going to be a little more on the, the, you know, kind of the reserved side. So even his armor, uh, there's, you know, he's wearing like a, a jacket, but also like very distinct from a Kratos. We didn't want any comparisons at all to what Kratos represents into in the game. And, uh, you know, we, this is a good example of inspiration that we bring from the environment side as well. There's a lot of tier related structures in, in 2018. And you can kind of see hints of that, of him kind of hiding his old gear, his old gear, his old armor underneath a lot of layers and, you know, some coins from different places and in and, and the tattoos as well, a little bit of the different cultures that he represents. So a lot of oh, cool yeah. stuff on the design and, and the final model, again, collaboration between my, me and Eric. Um, and, you know, I feel like it speaks to uh, the, the quality that we put on these characters. Again, these are just a very brief um, showcase of what we did on the game. The art book's coming out, like we said. You guys can check out a lot of cool stuff. And, uh, you know, the, the next guys are also going to blow your minds with some cool creature stuff it, as well. Is, we, yeah, this is the guy right here for me. I mean, wow. <laughs> I'm just in studio. It kind of looks like you, right? It does. <laughs> that, uh, definitely. That's, that one's definitely. Let me know we have the one that looks like Paul coming up. Raphael. Oh, great. <laughs> you know, no. Let me know when you need me to come over to the studio in Santa Monica and sit tight. We're going to have it. We, I mean, need some, uh, we need some bandits, kids. someone to kill. I've been working yeah, out a lot. My, I'm ready. I'm ready for the scan. I'm ready to be in the game. Here we go. <laughs> well, guys, we'll make I, it happen. I think we're going to do a transition and I, I, let's give them, you and I can give them a clap. That is some stuff right there. We're going to transition. Do you have any other slides before you do the transition? We're going to add. I just wanted to mention one. Uh, uh, yeah, please, 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 please. I, I think a cool, cool, uh, you know, advice for texture artists, like if you really want to make be a good texture artist, you should become good at storytelling. Like have like all your textures, mm -hmm. you know, tell a story of, of why they're there, have everything with a purpose. And wise words coming from Angela Rico here. Uh, we are so happy that you said that at the tail end of this <laughs> uh, this presentation because it's really important. Rafael's waving goodbye. Are you waving goodbye, or you want to say something? I'm not a part of the second half, so I just want to thank you guys, and uh, I'm, I'm sure they're going to kill it. But, yeah, play the game. If you guys haven't played it yet, there's a, a ton of stuff that we are not showing because, like, you know, we try to keep it. We're still very early, so we want to keep it uh, very, you know, small for the fans that want to play it and experience it themselves. And, yeah, get the art book. Uh, we had a lot of fun, and I think the work that the artist made is, is amazing. So thank you, guys. I oh man, are you, you kidding? I was going to bring it back to you and tell you on behalf of all of us here uh, on the ZBrush team and the Maxon uh, Global team as well, we want to thank you for participating in the ZBrush Summit 2022. Looking forward to seeing you again when you come back to America. And uh, again, to quote Paul Gabriel, it is what number? 10. It's a 10. Yeah, but we've got, uh, we're going to add Andrew Arisa and uh, Josiah Scholten to the mix. So don't go away because it's it's not we're not ending this we're no, continuing no, we're on the, magic the second of, part of yeah. this presentation for sure we're going to do God of War continues so. yeah 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 it's going to continue I'm I've also been sharing the deluxe uh, book as well there is a deluxe version where of are you sharing this book. deluxe book I've been putting in the chat like I said I'm slinging books over here I'm trying to help out with the books. You know, because uh, honestly, looking at some of those pieces is like, mm, that could go on a wall, that could go on a wall, that could go what on a wall. What were they saying in the chat, the by the way? I'd just like to They're them. super impressed with all the details um, that have been coming through with the work that they've been doing there. Um, and I think it's really cool to be able to uh, see them collaborate. Uh -huh. And it really, like I said before, I think it makes the game, even if they want to do it, continue the franchise and do another one and do another one, this team, obviously you all can see, is very close. They're very much working off each other, and then they, they know the stories of the, all the characters and everything else as You well. keep mentioning the details. I think it's fair to say that the details are, are the highest level that we've seen in years, and I think people are really finding ways to push it. It's really fascinating stuff to watch. And it looks like there is... They're a, just getting adjusted. They're just getting adjusted here off to my off to my right. And are you excited? That one dude really yeah. kind of did look like me, didn't it? I, it did. Could, it could look like it me. It did. If I continue down this... There was a lot of Louis. If couple I continue possibility down this trajectory, it could right. look very much like me. Uh, I'm still youthful, though. I mean, look, So look, look who's joined us here. Wow. Taking it on here. Andrew, am I saying your last name correctly, Aritza? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you so much for, for correcting me if I'm wrong, but I, I'm glad I was right. Ha! And we still have Della Longfish here. You're saying that Joseph. one right, too? Yeah. Thank you very much. I, yeah, it's important. And uh, we are also going to welcome to the stage now for the first time today, Josiah Scholten. Hello. Guys, thank you so much for being here. Again, you, if you're just tuning in now, we're with members of the God of War team, Sony Santa Monica, so graciously here to spend their time with us. Uh, 
And off to uh, our stage left is Angela Rico, who is um, very and gracious in her Raph last. Has left us as well. Of course, I'm coming to that too. I was going to say she was very gracious with that last minute tip. If you're, that's the one thing to keep in mind is the tips. I'll hand it over to you guys. Rafael has gone uh, back to do his thing in Brazil, but on to you guys for the second part of our Sony Santa Monica presentation. Go ahead. Right on. Yeah, we'll, we'll get right into it. Uh, and we're looking at uh, some more characters in the cast. Uh, and we will start off with some of the work from uh, Josiah and Andrew and go into some details of the, the making of. Uh, so this was another character, uh, Anger Boda. Again, this is nice because we actually got to pull from mythology for this character. Um, one of the things, too, I think that we look at when we're designing a character is, I think when you think of coming to work on a game that deals in so much fantasy, like a God of War title, uh, it's the big monsters, the big creatures, the huge fantasy. Uh, the other side of that, though, is we are designing uh, costumes and trying to get the subtle details in a character that has something that's more uh, historical based or uh, designed with inside the silhouette and, and getting a little bit of that that nuance and subtlety to still make an impactful design uh, when you take away things like the uh, the silhouette change and, and all those elements within a character. Um, but let's jump right into the models. Yeah. So when I see a character like that, I see a lot of bells and whistles and pieces, and I like to mentally go through a checklist and break it up, how I'm going to tackle a complex thing like that, and, so, uh, and keep a couple things in mind. Um, so yeah, I usually try to focus on um, <laughs> readjust here. Uh, I usually try to focus on where the most detail is, and so in this example, I like, usually focus on the face and the torso, and really nail that down before moving too far along. And also thinking about where can I reuse certain um, pieces around the whole character and what kind of motifs there are. So in this case, she's got a form-fitting outfit, so I want to keep that in mind when I'm not getting too crazy with big armors and stuff like that. And then also uh, the snake motif that we worked into the design. So from her arm to her medallions to the brooches, all that kind of has that um, working. So on the next slide. So yeah, in the face, uh, we like to spend a lot of time. And in this case, we actually started from an actress scan um, of the voice actress, which was super cool and very helpful. But we still always like to modify and adjust things to fit the concept and fit the final in-game look we're going for. So it's not just like a one-to-one -one <laughs> scan and then you're done. We, we still have quite a bit of work to do. Um, and especially when sculpting faces, I'd like to point out it's super helpful to look at it at really drastic angles because there's some forms that look great when you're looking head on, yeah, yeah. but then the second you rotate, you're like, oh, it's a little weird. Or like look at a very harsh top-down angle to get the, the cheeks and the mouth feeling, feeling good. I think it's, that's also that attention to detail that works because this is, again, something that's not scary or frightening, but add a little beauty and elegance and that, that subtlety that you get in every inch of that is good. Yeah, and so we wanted to, especially on the face, because that's obviously a lot of the character, is, is keeping that elegance and that um, energy there, even in a neutral expression, so super important. And then on the, uh, the hair also, we usually do a, a workflow where we block it in, which we've talked about uh, in ZBrush, and then kind of go through the process of getting outsourcing and other teams to help build that hair, and then do a final polish pass on it. Um, yeah, the also, hair's the hair's got a lot of comments going on right now. The hair's phenomenal. Yeah. I'm, the hair's I'm like, look at that hair. Man, yeah. my hair looks like that. So you block it out in ZBrush and then Jeez. Yeah, do a bunch of tubes in ZBrush and yeah. like some Dynamesh to get the idea going and then rebuild it in the low poly and then do a final pass, sometimes using ZBrush even to to poly group and move around the cards themselves, because that can be easy sometimes. So So that's all cards still. This is like essentially a couple tubes mm -hmm. and with cards kind of stuck into the tube. Right. So couple layered tubes to get the effect and then some cards on top of that so yeah yeah and that, that collaboration even in something like this is still there too like you said looking good outsourcing wow. and internal yeah. kind of absolutely and then uh for some things like uh the cloth um it's important that we we put a lot of work in the high res most of the time just to kind of prove that it's going to look good in the game uh so things like the cloth tylers i'll always put on there on a layer or something to get the idea going and then uh, it's always important to add a little extra detail and juice where you like kind of rip up some threads or like have a little variation so it doesn't look too static. Um, and you did a yeah. really good job on that too. Like I, th I think sometimes we walk the balance of a costume feeling too fashion forward, but I think that level of detail and wear that we kind of set up with the, the historical detail in the style guide is, is super evident here. And yeah, a lot of people are asking if you guys are actually putting the details sculpturally in all the clothes and everything else. So the answer is yes, a lot of the time. And then we might take it back out when we do texturing or yeah. kind of like tone sure. it down and then mm -hmm. use tricks like tilers and, and, you know, smart materials and stuff to get it back in. Are you hand sculpting the cloth or is it you doing marvelous? It's pretty much all hand sculpted. Actually, all hand sculpted. Yeah, all right. so I tend people. to 
I tend to work pretty traditionally where I actually model it in like a low yeah. poly plane, a wow. yeah. couple layers, and then subdiv it up and then start adding in that detail. So nice. it's kind of a, a little slow process, but it, it works. So Slow and steady, apparently. Uh, the it looks good, ten. so you're doing it. <laughs> Another <laughs> high five <laughs> to Paul <laughs> Gabriel. That's a yeah. 10. <laughs> and then on the uh, on the shoes, same example. I, I like. Yeah. They're very kind of intricate and overlapping forms of the leather at the bottom. So. Again, I went in and actually modeled it so it worked how I wanted it, where there's overlaps exactly how I want it, so I don't have to, you know, fiddle around trying to get it to work. Let me ask you a quick question. Yeah. What, what do you like? Where do you get reference for those things? Because oh man, Della, you did the concept for this, huh? Yeah. So we we went back and like Ralph said, with the historical details, we really looked at how shoes were made and worn. So we found a lot of stuff uh, pre-Roman or like even like pure cultures of of Norse. Uh, at, at the time and historically and to see how they made shoes and bring it into it and that's always the coolest thing for us is seeing something that's completely different than <laughs> what we're wearing these days and you know that that attention to detail pops out and we even though you may not see all of it we want you to be left with the feeling that everything has that kind of sense to it and, and we think it stands out as a team and then um, the result in the model I think oh, it looks kind of yeah, very contemporary that. as well I'd wear it <laughs> <laughs> Not a shock. Not a shock at all. Shock Kidding, at I'll all. go back and look at a it one more time. Free pair comes with the art book. <laughs> I got the art book on pre-order. I think you guys found another cosplayer over here. Yeah. Holy smoke. Mm. So uh, obviously, we got to get this thing in the game at some point. So this sure. is the final in-game model. And like I said before, we, we kind of tone down and tone up some of the parts of the high-res to help get the texturing going. And uh, yeah, there's actually a lot of tweaks after the fact, right? You get the model, and then it inevitably gets a little flatter and a little less form, so you gotta go back in and pop it back out. So after all the bakes and everything are done, it's good to do a pass and kind of accentuate certain areas. And even evaluating the, these in the environments with the colored color Yeah, palette. absolutely. So like in, in her example, uh, she's in a very orange and warm environment most of the time, so we noticed that early on, like, hey, we should have a cool color palette to help her really pop out, because she's also pretty quick, so. Yeah, I think the initial uh, color palette, since she was a giant, was more yellow, and while it looked good in the concept, uh, it would disappear in the environment, so you can see where the team brought the blues to complement and, and bring that forward. I yeah. think the color choice is really working there. Yeah, it's absolutely. Really great. And then, uh, yeah, the hair, like I said before, it took a lot of work to get um, finessed into place, and there were quite a few people who worked on that, so shout-outs to Angela and the outsourcing team also. Uh, and then we had a new class of character, uh, which was the Cave Dweller. Uh, this was a little bit different than some of the other characters. These are some sketches by Stephen Oakley. Uh, it, it's interesting dealing with a character that doesn't have the one-to-one -one relationship to uh, the mythology. So Stephen ended up doing a wide range of explorations on this character to really make sure that it felt right uh, within the cast of the other characters. Um, oh, that'll and, keep you up at night, yeah. yeah. Again, there, there's a lot more uh, in the in the book if you want to take a look there when that comes out. but. Uh, and this was handed over to uh, Andrew. Yeah, and one of the things that I really enjoy working with the this dev uh, department is this, we always have this conversation. It's like a very um, synergic workflow that we have going on and, and working with, with my idol, uh, Stephen Oakley, was definitely uh, an amazing experience. So shout outs to him. Uh, so uh, how do we approach uh, creating a creature like this? So uh, I think, as we have mentioned during the presentation, one of the things that we do from the beginning is create a very basic model and we put that guy into the engine as, as soon as we can. We are trying to find what silhouettes are going to work, what colors, maybe it's maybe too early for that, but we are trying to make sure that uh, what we are creating in the VizDev is actually going to make sense in the, in the gameplay. And, and on top of that, you, you get a chance to sort of like see animation, see, uh, show it to the other teams and they can kind of grab from what you are working on. So uh, that's extremely important. So working on these guys, um, uh, of course, we had this extremely huge catalog of drawings and little uh, concepts and, and, and doodles and all this type of stuff that Steven was uh, making on the side. And, and we started like trying to translate that into, into a model that actually felt uh, cohesive and you know, starting to research real, li real life uh, references to to enhance that, um, that detail. And some of the ideas that you can see on this slide, for example, is that we started like thinking uh, and understanding what the design team was doing, the animations, how they were looking, and we started like wrapping our heads on how we make sense of the abilities that these guys have. For example, you see the, the hands on the claws of these guys. They, they tend to climb to walls, and, and 
and kind of sneak up behind you and, and attack you. So a lot of that is, again, kind of grabbing and referencing not only from stuff from the outside, finding creatures and finding animals that you can use and bring to the concept, but it's also like trying to understand what the other teams are doing. And um, I think we can keep going with this one. And, and a lot of this comes from understanding, and this is a very highlight that I have here in my notes, is that um, understanding what the other teams are doing. And that conversation doesn't have to be straightforward, or it can just be you sneaking on what they're doing and kind of grabbing from what's happening in the other departments. So when you see the environments, you can use that as, as reference to put some details in your scope, kind of bring some of that dirt, some of that, uh, like I said, biological um, uh, representation of the capability of these characters. So yeah, I know, too, you were pulling a lot of references mm -hmm. from, uh, you talked about frogs. And yeah, those exactly. That's, that's another thing that we do a lot. These characters are supposed to be like a vermin that is invading many of the, of the realms. So one of the things that we uh, started looking into was not just grabbing from reptiles and amphibious life. We started like going into rats, for example, and you can see some of that on this character. And you can see a little bit of a, of a lich type of a probe, and you see all these teeth inside his, his mouth. And even on the, on, the, on the eyes of this character, you see a little bit of, of a golfer, kind of like a rat looking, looking at it, and we end up making it um, wider and not necessarily black because we were trying to make this these characters pop. That's one thing I think yeah. you, you did really well too, is you took all those influences, but none of them dominated exactly. too. Like you yeah. get the feeling of all those yeah. kind of characters in there without it just feeling like a frog. Yeah, it was definitely a, 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 like a long back and forth with Raph and, and with Steven to sort of like dial down things and push others. So we end up with a character that looks pretty much like nothing else really, but is grabbing references from well, the, and I think that's part of the, that the team works really well with too is designing stuff that doesn't exist. You can't just go to reference for this, but you yeah. still want it to feel believable. And that's it, it, it's not for everyone. Like it's stepping into that unknown. Um, it comes with its own challenges. But the, the the team is always great under the leadership of Eric Valdez too. Is like that excites them. Let's go see what we can kind of exactly. make out of this. That's exactly. why I like art books. I'm an art book collector. Are you really? Yeah. This guy li oh, letting the oh. secret out of the bag. It's great that we get to kind of share this here, but the nice thing about the art book too is we've, we've gone into and Dark Horse really broke down our, our thoughts and approaches right. to that because I I think we're a fan too of just what, what went into designing right. all this. Like, stuff. They make great products, by the way. Dark I Horse. like art books because I'm like, what am I going to search online? I'm stuck. I don't know where to right. go with this character. Yeah. That's what you're searching can, on Google. I'm searching. No, no, I'm, I'm saying I can pull a book <laughs> off and I can cycle through and get some inspiration from other artists. I'm like, ah, that's a good idea and go. No, that, that's, I like it. That's why we're saying some of the stuff under the hood on how we approach yeah. this stuff because every project similar has a. Yeah, and what Andrew's talking about, I could totally see the eyes. I immediately went to him. That was awesome. Yeah. You know what? I would be remiss too. What else you can do is read books. Okay, books. thank you. Yeah, read more books. I prefer books. pictures. I'm just. <laughs> so, uh, talking about a little bit of a struggle, I remember working on these characters and, and sort of like trying to find what their skin detail should look like. And I work a lot with Raph. We were kind of like bouncing ideas and, and working on these guys. I remember sending the model to Raf. Raf did something, sent it back to me. And we like kind of started that exploration and, and trying to bring uh, this uh, character's skin to, to life. And we started pretty much combining reptile and amphibious life. But the thing with uh, amphibious, for example, is that if you try to find a scan data for, for these guys, you're going to realize that they are pretty smooth. All of these ideas that we have in our minds is a combination of like hue values and little uh, small wrinkles and the fluids, this disgusting stuff that they probably have. And, 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 and we have to exaggerate a lot of that. We grab also from the concept that Steven did. And, um, and from there, we, was, we, we were just pretty much like kind of developing a, a very specific look for these guys. Yeah, and I think also just with the cohesiveness of the characters in the world, stuff with the, the skin I know that you did is kind of like tier where it pulled from the concept work that uh, Luke Berliner and his team did. Same thing when we first see these in Svartalheim, we looked at the reference for the environments that they had created and, and brought a little bit so they yeah. felt like they had that consistency across Absolutely. them. Absolutely, and again, um, uh, if I remember correctly, for these guys, we were doing um, a sculpture for the most part. I think we rarely went back and used a photograph that we transformed into an alpha and we brought into Zebras to, to use it around. For the most part, we were just grabbing what we were sculpting like uh, using the tools that we have at our disposal and, and, and kind of trying to save time. But for the most part, it was a very like hand, uh, hand work for the, for the most part. Yeah. A lot of hand work, I'm hearing. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> nope. And going to, to the textures, um, I remember these guys being a little bit more greenish uh, towards the yellowish, and it goes back to, I think, uh, what the team has been talking about during today is that we are trying to make art look beautiful and badass, but at the same time, we are making a game. We are trying to work and focus our efforts towards making a smooth experience for the players. So uh, that's something that we are pretty much kind of like balancing all the way uh, throughout the process. And I feel like it's extremely like special in the work that we do at Santa Monica is that we are trying to, to work together to accomplish that goal. It's not just animations, it's not just cues in the UI to prompt characters, uh, sorry, players to, to see what the character is gonna do. It's also like in our hands to contribute to that idea. But even in, in the texture work here, you can see the, the highest contrast is in the mm -hmm. eyes and the mouth, the things that are because exactly. coming at you first, we want to really make sure like that is the, the primary. Yeah, and that belly color just yep. brings yeah, you right Yeah, all and that it, goes into consideration. And to that point, talking about the belly color, that's something that, for example, like we, we talk a lot and I work at the, uh, uh, with Eric in, in many of these characters to sort of like find a difference between the back and the front of these characters seems like a very simple and kind of silly thing that you will not think. Maybe it's just a, a design choice, but it's also, a, we are thinking about the gameplay. Mm -hmm. How do we know that the character is coming towards you or is going away? That is like That's what the point. Yeah. thought process behind this type of decisions. And of course, we are artists. We are trying to make these technical and gameplay decisions look amazing. And that's kind of like the challenge that we always uh, have to deal with. Yeah, always in the back of our head is the idea. If it just looks pretty but oh. doesn't play well or work exactly. for the, it, it's not a success. So that's something. Look, that I'm in the game too. Oh, stop. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. What a guy. What a guy. I can't believe you said it. And of course, from all these amazing uh, catalog of ideas that Steven created and 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 the and grabbing from the environments, I think we had the need to create a family, a trio of of these creatures to sort of like this, like make a you know, a set of different abilities and sort of like different types yeah, of attacks. Again, yeah, this is a, yeah, a faction like the other yeah, one. Exactly. Like they had the, the exactly. variety, but still felt like they kind of all existed. Exactly. In and, and we were going for like something that, you know, this guy is yellowish, this guy is greenish, but the shape and kind of like the hints that we have, like Della was saying, we are trying to highlight certain areas depending on what attack this guy is capable of doing. I think on this guy, mm -hmm. for example, yeah. we have a, a, an emissive mask that pops out of like nowhere that kind of hinting that this guy is about to attack. So there are a lot of stuff that we probably are not showing uh, necessarily here because it would take too long, but there are a lot of these different like uh, decisions that we are making throughout the process. And again, this is, um, these are the dreams. Yeah, again, so another new faction that looks fantastic yeah. in the game and we always kind of want to make sure they stand it's out. It's really fun to work on that, yeah. Oh, they're standing out all right. It's really it's awesome. Good. Uh, so obviously Brock and Sindri were a, a, a fan favorite and a personal favorite of myself too, uh, but they were really just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, we knew that in this game early on that we'd be going to Svartalheim, which is the realm of the Holdra. Um, so we'd see more of the Holdra there. So this is a character called Durlin. You can see some sketches from Stephen Oakley and the uh, kind of 2D collaboration that Raft did here. A great drawing. Steven's awesome. Yeah, he's so really good. great drawing. Yeah, and but Steven is fantastic. Uh, a mile a minute. It's like yeah. 300 drawings a day kind of thing. Oh, yeah. um, and, 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 uh, 300 drawings a day. In a, in a project that just has like stepping in the unknown, it's uh, just a, a wealth of ideas that, that Steven brings. Um, but we wanted to make a dwarf in Durlin that could hold his own visually and have that impact uh, as a character from the writing side that uh, Brock and Sindri did. He's completely different than them, so we wanted something different. Um, but still kind of opens up the world on what we had just kind of touched on with Brock and Sindri. Yeah, so I got a chance to work on this guy, which was awesome, because like you said, Stephen does 300 drawings in a meeting, mm -hmm. yeah. let alone a day. Uh, so yeah, this guy was awesome. I like to break it down, like I said, so he's got a lot of pieces, and I loved the design because each thing kind of contributed to his story. So like from the scroll, he's a bookkeeper, and so like the scrolls to the ink pots to the pen, even his friend, friend Diener, who's the little squid thing you saw. Um, you know, all of it contributes to like what he does as, as, as a job and also kind of backstory on who he is as a person, so. Yeah, so uh, unlike some of the other ones, he wasn't started from a scan. It was like a contribution of, of Raph doing a block out for the concept sketch that you saw um, in 3D, and then I took, I took that and did the final like high poly one. So for some stuff, like the pores and things like that, using uh, just like a base scan we have of just a random person was super helpful just to get those, those little tertiary details in there. 
But then I went in and like basically resculpted all the primary and secondary forms to to match what we want. And another important thing is like, you know, like you saw in the concept, he's got a little bit of an expression, and it's important that we have expression in the face, like with the wrinkles and the and the the shape of everything, but not too much because we are going to actually add that later. So we got to keep it kind of neutral, which was a good balance of like making sure he's interesting even without doing anything, you know, as a face. Yeah. So and adding all the, all the scars and the wrinkles was super fun. So yeah, on him, uh, I mean, he's got a lot of pieces too, but it's important to note that like the stitching and all the details are kind of large because he's so small, right? So like <laughs> you see him next to Thor or somebody, he's like, he's a tiny little guy. So you gotta make sure that those details are, are large to read, not only for baking, but just like as a gameplay thing, like we've been harping on the whole time, you know? You gotta keep that in mind. So for the jacket also, that was super fun, because like I said, I do stuff just subdiv modeling mostly, and then, and then add all those details after the fact. So I actually UV'd that whole strip that has the, the pattern on it, so I could swap it out if we want to with different concepts or different um, designs, which is always useful, especially for like the leather straps and things like that. It's looking awesome. Yeah, and then uh, there's a shot of some of his accessories and things like that. So, I yeah, know the materials. Yeah, the, the materials. Variety and the yeah, for sure. Breaking up between like the the velvet jacket and the leather sleeves, and then the cotton and, and leather combo um, is really important. So again, we we like to put all that detail in the in the high res file just to get a sense of what it's going to be like in the game. Yeah, that's just another great example of you're designing something that is uh, kind of smaller silhouette and what you're doing and, and that detail inside can really still get that visual impact as something as big as a dragon. Someone yeah. says they see a little Danny DeVito in this. They want to <laughs> see a little Danny DeVito. Here we go. It's always sunny somewhere. Come on. <laughs> sunny in Burbank right now. Exponentially it. sunny with the shine it. that these guys have brought with them. Look at yeah. the little and details then, on the back, okay, the little we'll backpack back. there. Look at that, look at that. Yeah, he's, it's important, like Andrew's saying, like, wow. you know, characters aren't only seen from the front, so focusing on every single angle, so even hiding in little, you know, things that people might not even notice, like the key in the pouch, and yeah. maybe what's it's in just, the pouch, uh, uh, and things like that. It always gives a sense of history that we, we like to do, and our, our fans will pick up on all those details, so uh, it never goes unnoticed, which is it really... does look like Danny DeVito. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah we do love to, anyway. to keep everything story focused and like have all those little details in there because we're assuming someone at some point right mm -hmm. we'll, we'll catch it's on for the fans yeah it's for the fans, it's for the fans yeah. uh, that's exactly why i make yeah. buttons in zbrush <laughs> it's for the fans <laughs> and we another do it for thing the fans. for uh for texturing i feel like it's important to keep track of these characters have a lot of patterns and a lot of details right so you want to you want to focus on like reusing what the patterns are to like not only make the character more consistent but to save yourself some time so even things like the shoulder straps I reused on the boots to give it a little more extra excitement all over the character. So yeah. Hey, it looks cool. Yeah. And that's how we turned out. So yeah, it was it was fun also with again color palettes. You gotta have yeah. the, the mix of those those greens and the reds to help um, him stand out in his his shop that he's in. And also compared to the character he's with all the time, which is the little squid. So the squid's more of a the purple, you know, cooler tones. So we like to to mix and match like that. Um, and then, obviously, within a God of War cast, we have a wide range of characters and creatures, and so this is one of the creatures called a knock-in in the game that uh, the players will run into. Uh, but definitely wanted something that uh, is kind of a little more spindly, uh, hanging out in some of the swampy areas, so you can see some of that reflection in there. This was done by Shan, and Bjorn Hurry also helped with the initial concepts on this character. But it's fun getting that, the cast of characters uh, big and small. Yeah, so this is probably the scrawniest guy in the game, and he's also tiny. So he, he mm -hmm. crouches a lot and runs around, so that's important um, because when he's in a pose, right, it looks like a lot of empty areas, right? But when, when he's crouched and in the game, his, his elbows and his knees and his head are all kind of like next to each other. So you have to keep that in mind mm -hmm. when you're sculpting that, you know, how does he how does he work and how does he animate? Um, and this so was you super do fun. animation tests to see it. Yeah, I did some. I usually do some pose before, tests, yeah. and we also we rely heavily on the gray mesh phase where we mm -hmm. kind of get something quick, right? Like a day or two, just to get it in the game and see what it looks like. You guys say gray? Are you just using madcap gray? We say gray mesh. There's still some colors and stuff oh, okay. in there, but it's a it's just a quick thing. You beat me to the punch on that one. I was thinking the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, oh, maybe these. Well, and it's just funny to too about the chat. Yeah. Hey. Well, it's interesting too, like some of the other characters, uh, like Josiah was saying, we, we evaluate to make sure they pop from the environment. This character actually had a different thing we wanted to kind of fade into the environment and be a little harder to find uh, when the player. Yeah, so when it's crouched, it almost just looks like a 
you know, it can blend into the leaves and the stuff in the background a little bit more. And this was super fun because, you know, uh, creatures are always fun. So doing all the skin details and, and getting the anatomy to still shine um, is always important. And then I love to just like get a little heavy handed with the details and then pop the anatomy back out with just a standard brush or something to make sure you're not losing all the forms. Because it can be easy, easy to get lost sometimes. Um, yeah, and same with like the wrinkles on the neck and all the scales popping out. It's just going in there and, and making something cool and trying to do it uh, the concept justice and also give it that kind of unique feeling where I'm not just stamping the same scale over and over again. It's like yeah, each one's a little bit different. That way the character, um, you might not think it's a big deal, but if you see the, the difference, like it does feel a little more natural to actually go in there and do that. And then uh, from one of our smaller characters to probably one of our larger characters, uh, Garm is in Norse mythology um, and looms large. Uh, this was our take on this. Uh, this uh, piece done by Carl Lindbergh uh, for Garm, and realizing this character was really fun. Obviously, uh, from the legends, he's he's been bound, so this is kind of uh, the take on, on what he looks like. And uh, Andrew had picked up the design from here. Yeah, it was such a such a you know a lot of responsibility to bring this character to life, especially with these amazing concepts that that we receive and kind of like the ideas behind it. I work uh, very close with Raf to sort of like understand what was like the general uh, take that we, he wanted to kind of portray with this guy. With this guy. But um, uh, as you might be thinking right now, a scale, that's like the main uh, thing with this guy. So in order to accomplish that, we kind of had a, a, like a little list of elements that we wanted to, to make sure were in this character from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So one of those things that we thought about a lot was uh, we had to make sure that this anatomy can hold up for all the challenges that we were going to encounter with this guy. It was something that we needed to put uh, together to make sense of how we were going to start placing all these alpha cards, which is probably one of the things that people's gonna be talking about a lot, and how we can like transfer this information to the rest of the team. Riggers needs to understand where are the, the, the joints, Animators probably have their ideas and they contribute a lot to, to the whole process of like realizing the shape of this character. But, and that was actually one of the challenges working on this guy because we were not just scaling up a, a regular wolf, mm -hmm. that's it. We were actually making decisions in terms of like the, the size of the paws and, and, and the posture and kind of the shape of the whole character. And that's something that started from the concept art and we were really trying to, 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 to put uh, into the model. Yeah, that's something I think you did good too. Is it's not just a one-to-one -one scale of the wolf. I think we're we're adding elements where it's still recognizable totally as a wolf, but we get a little bit of that mythical take to uh, the character. And I think, like you were saying, like all, all the details and even one of the challenges with a character like this is the, the player scale. Yeah, exactly. And we had to make sure that all this detail was going to actually be used somehow, and to under in order to to. To make this actually work, we had to start looking at a lot of uh, rather disgusting uh, pictures of, of, of sicknesses and skin uh, wounds and stuff like that. And we actually had to look a lot into all type of canine uh, uh, animals like uh, wolves, from wolves to, to, to hyenas and even our own uh, doggies at home. I remember, <laughs> I remember Raft even sending me pictures of, of of his dog and kind of like showing her her teeth and trying to tell me, yo, we need to make sure that we have this type of transition and we would like to make it look this way. And I was doing the same on, on my own. We were kind of studying our, our pets to sort of like bring a lot of that to, to this character. So it was also like a, something charged with a lot of love because it was yeah. kind of inspired by our, our pets. But, but And part but of that too is like that is what when Andrew was doing this and in the concept we thought about is like this will be, what do we see at player scale what we'll be attacking mm -hmm. those teeth are coming in the claws mm -hmm. so really making sure that the frequency of detail was kind of in those areas that made sense to the camera yeah. for the player and that connects a lot with the decisions that we took in terms of performance which because we were trying to also make sure that you know all this sculptor sculpture is was going to actually hold on into the mm -hmm. final mm -hmm. um, model so uh, we had to sort of like balance these things out. So the texture resolution probably in the back of the character is not as high in the front, but we are just trying to make sure we are, you know, using the memory that we have and the performance that, that we can handle in order to like make justice to what we were trying to accomplish with this guy. So those are the front, the front paws and these are the, the, the back uh, paws. I think that's the way we can call them. Um, 
And yeah, once again, a lot of references coming from, um, from real life. We tried to exaggerate that. And one of the things that uh, we tried to do with him, uh, talking about a little bit back to the anatomy stuff, is that we wanted him to feel nimble. And that's something that Raph was really like, uh, really focused on. We need to make this guy feel agile and fast. But how do we, on top of that, make him feel heavy? So we start putting a lot of like that detail on the on the on the skin itself, so you can sort of like feel the weight of this character. And you know, we have a lot of uh, audio cues and, and how this guy is extremely crazy. Hopefully, you guys will be able to to experience his his savageness in the game. But um, but yeah, there's a lot of shots of uh, the studies and analysis that we were doing in our research with our pets and the photographs and stuff. So and the Raph's dog, apparently. This is probably Raph's dog. Well, a lot Raph's of even dog. I'm learning something about uh, <laughs> that. Well, it's a footnote but, in the book. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, at some point, we start to, to covering a lot of that anatomy that really serve a lot of the, the purposes and objectives that we had. Like I said, transferring this information, the anatomical references, and the joint positions to the rest of the thing. We start covering that with a lot of cards. And, and to be honest, uh, I really don't have a magic trick here to, to the way we, we, we did it. I do remember using a little bit of uh, fiber mesh to, to do a first pass on, on, the, on the body. But for the face and to actually get to this uh, result, it was a lot of handwork, pretty much. Like we, it was just a, a, a matter of really placing the cards where they're supposed to be. This is a shot of the, of the pass. You haven't even seen the, 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 the chains and all the elements yeah. that bound him, which, which uh, hints back at the, the gameplay stuff and exactly. making sure that reads. Exactly. So again, with the, with the alpha cards, it was uh, a matter of like actually making sure everything is following certain directions. So I remember like, grabbing references and even drawing lines with polypane on top of this guy and kind of using that as a texture to place the cards in the you know, in the direction they're supposed to, to go to kind of have that flow. If you, if you grab your dog and you start seeing very up close the way the fur kind of flows around uh, their face, they, it's a very specific pattern and we were trying to make sure that happened. And on top of all of that, uh, in, when it comes to the body, Raph had the, the beautiful and amazing idea to also like have, you know, little scars hidden in there. So we have like bald patches and we have a rope that is wrapped around the, so, there was no other chance just to make it by hand, and, and we had the time, and we actually focused a lot of our efforts towards that, and, and this is the result. It took me uh, quite some time, but I think we did that. Yeah, and then uh, kind of in contrast to these characters that, that we're fighting against, uh, there's other characters in the world that we want to kind of build out and make sure uh, not everything's here to attack and kill you, and hopefully the, the aim of that is that it still feels magical, and there's areas you want to go back. In the first game, we did this with Charlie, and we have some other characters in this game uh, with characters that could be on your side and, and help you, uh, depending on the circumstances. So a mermaid, uh, one of the challenges with this, like a lot of the other characters, is uh, types of these characters have been done a lot in um, kind of by other properties and, mm. and subject matters. And again, doing a little bit of a take on this that hopefully uh, reads nice for all the uh, aesthetics that we've set up in the storytelling. This was done by Raph with a... Uh, a brief uh, kind of the scholar, uh, color and, and scale paint over by Shan, um, but was a really unique character. Yeah, and it was um, uh, a lot of, of work to kind of balance in, and I think that's the word that sort of like summarized the entire process with, with her. Uh, Raph's uh, concept was pretty spot on on what he was trying to, to, to do with this character, so it was a matter of actually making all of that a beautiful colors and sort of like little details make sense in the in the in the sculpture. So, so like I was saying, it was a lot of like back and forth between the the huge amount and, and heavy uh, patterns of of scales and and little details to at some point starting to you know smooth things out and, and sort of like find like a, you know again balance between these shapes and, and, and solve certain areas, just not with the smooth surface, but with a little bit of like a pattern. I remember, for example, on the, on the belly area towards the, the bottom, this image that you guys are 
watching right now, we, we for example, we went and started skewing and kind of modifying a wave, like a photograph of a wave of water, like something just dropping upon it. And, and using that, we started putting noise on top of that. That's something that we did uh, using Photoshop, and we brought that into, C, in, into ZBrush. We put that wave in there. We put some noise. We put it back into Photoshop. But it's trying to find a, a specific, like kind of like a watery pattern, like a wave, but at the same time, it's sort of uh, uh, giving these characters certain yeah. personality into the scheme. And that's yeah. a nice way to also, I think, uh, you and the team brought a lot of like gesture into the yeah. interior design of the character, which is something that was really uh, key for her. Yeah, for, for this character in specific, it was extremely important because I remember, for example, uh, we, we had conversations about, okay, we are gonna bring this pattern here, we probably can lay down the, the UVs in, in ZBrush and, and sculpt on the, on the UVs and maybe then we go back to the model and, and that's gonna make sense, but end up being extremely heavy, we were trying to make something that I think the word that Raf and, and I used a lot was uh, elegant, something that feel smooth, s some detail here and there, but it feels like a dress. That's like the whole uh, thing with this character. And again, one of the things with, with, with this one is that in, in contrast with what we do for an enemy, this guy and this character, we were trying to do something for a cinematic. Mm -hmm. So, yep. so we uh, at some point we had the idea of like the camera being super up close. Things change down the line, but all of this detail at some point becomes extremely useful. And uh, yeah, that's a nice element too. Like a little bit of the variety. We don't have to take all the combat considerations in, mm -hmm. and and can focus on the the look of the character and and how they'll act in the cinematics. Exactly. And here, again, another challenge. Let's sit down and start. Uh, texture in this character had, uh, Raf had um, a couple of wild ideas on what he was looking for and he actually painted some stuff that you guys can see here and 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 then I grabbed this, this thing again and we were trying to, for the most part, fake some sort of like translucency uh, that, that you find in some uh, goldfish and some ballerina uh, fish that, you know, you kind of can see through them a little bit and, and we did that with Diffuse. That's pretty much. We were painting this stuff in yeah, the and body, yeah, and even the stuff in the face too, which is really yeah. nice. Yeah, this the, the, this um, this character evolved a lot, and we kind of like play a lot with the values on the materials, like the metalness, the glossiness. We are trying to make sure that on this specific scene, you can see this character at its at its best. You know, so yeah, every every inch of the character, I think you put that attention to detail in, which really pays off in the end. Um, yeah. And then finally, uh, the last one we have here is the All-Father, Odin himself. Uh, this is a character we thought about in the first game in 2018 and knew 100% uh, he would be making uh, an appearance in God of War Ragnarok. And we did a lot of wide range of explorations here. It's a piece I did. Um, we wanted something that stood out from the rest of the Azer. We wanted each of them to look different. Uh, this is a character that fights and interacts very differently than the other ones and is something new for Kratos to encounter. Uh, in contrast to Thor and Baldur and Magni and Modi. Um, but we wanted a character too that uh, pulled from the mythology, the wisdom, someone who was cunning and manipulative, uh, can cut you with a word as easily as you can with any weapon. Um, this was the final design and in the art book there's uh, more that we can kind of show the exploration of that. But then Josiah and yeah. Raph had helped with this. I was gonna say, I, I uh, loved getting the sculpt from Raph because he did most, pretty much the whole outfit and I just did some polishing on top of that. Um, but it was really cool seeing how he set up the, uh, all the details on the shirt and then um, you know the hand sculpted cloth and stuff feels pretty natural and it's very cool. And then I did the, the head and the hands also. Uh, again, started from some scans because this also was based on an actor. So we got a great starting point on that and then kind of ad uh, adjust and adapt based on the story and the character, you know, add the classic eye patch in and all yeah. the uh, awesome got designs. The scans, some of the work you did there with the eye patch. Look at that guy. Yeah, he's awesome. Life. Or a word. Uh, and yeah, story-wise, like you want to make sure that it feels like what we want the character to be. So, so not 100% friendly and not 100% evil. Like you know, like maybe a manipulative guy, and you know, can't really tell what he's thinking all the time. And um, even the, I know you did a lot in the pattern work too, but yeah. you could see the raven motif on his shoulders uh, add a little more ornate elements. And I know when you came to the gold stuff too, that there's a bit of royalty in him, but still feels like he exists. Yeah, absolutely. And with the uh, the thing that Raph did on the outfit, he basically 
blocked in all those patterns on a flat plane because trying to get all that you know to work in 3D and then also <laughs> and then also sculpting on it can be a bit of a nightmare. So um, you know, think smart and plan ahead. So like he he did all those designs and patterns on a flat thing and then wrapped it around to match the outfit, um, which saved a lot of time and looks great. And uh, because of collaboration, you got to keep in mind like different techniques and things like that because then I went in and added the ravens and some other parts after the fact and I had to match the style that he did so learning that and sharing it with your with your uh, co-workers is super helpful yeah, um, that collaboration and just yeah. being economic at the same time because we do not have all the time in the world like that's a smart way to approach it like Josiah's mentioning is, is something we try and leverage yeah absolutely and then the uh, the fabrics like I said before we, we love to add all that stuff in the high res even if we end up redoing it in a low poly <laughs> because it just looks cool and also it's more fun um, it so yeah it, incredible this wow. is yeah. Whole, this I'm, incredible I'm, I'm almost detail. speechless just, yeah, yeah so for for the fabrics and things like that again it's just you know some planes subdivided up sculpted on and then alphas and then a little polish on top because like you never just want to drag something out and leave it as is you want to go in and add a little nicks and scratches and loose threads and like make it feel hand-worn especially in this game where everything is kind of handmade and that, that's part of the trick too is, is taking something that's as a, a subtle silhouette as this character and adding that detail so it still has that uh, visual punch that you want with the character mm. yeah. um, it, it's always easy to push the silhouette but then working inside of that is also a, a nice design element that the team focuses on yeah and same with the ropes we uh, you know you want to see the ropes and stuff in there but then we remake them <laughs> in the low poly because it has to be a, a tiling mesh and things like that, tricks like that, that to get it actually running in the game. But it just looks cool in ZBrush and we love to love to try stuff out and see how it looks. Yeah, and even, even elements in the costume like the ropes were hints from the mythology. Um, Odin had made sacrifices to gain his knowledge and so we, we put some of those things like the, mm. the elements of the rope actually come from some of the tails. Um, That's awesome. They look great, even yeah. on grayscale they look amazing. I mean it's, uh, it's really something to behold. And then for the, the final in-game, uh, there's a lot of um, clear distinction between blue and gold in his outfit. So it's really important to, uh, to keep it from looking too flat. You want to make sure there's a lot of breakup. So even in the gold, it might still just look like gold, but there's a lot of values in there to keep the right things popping out, like the ravens, uh, keeping them like as a focus. So that mm -hmm. even if you're not thinking about it, subconsciously you associate it with the character. And so did you inflate it a little bit more? Is that what it looks like? Did you inflate the rate? So it's a little bit glossier, and it's yeah. a little bit brighter in the diffuse also. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. it is a little bit more inflated, too. Yeah. So like, since I added that, actually, after we had already finished the character, essentially, and we went in and, and tweaked that a little bit, right. um, yeah, I, I had the control over like popping it out. And yeah, I definitely noticed it. I definitely noticed it. I you did. You had an eagle eye there. Not a raven's eye, but an eagle eye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah. My pleasure. And then we're for uh, we're here all week, just one eye. <laughs> and then for tattoos, everybody's got tattoos in this game. Uh, a lot of fun tattoos, and in this case, it's actually really awesome how they designed it, where the, the his ravens are actually represented as his tattoos. Um, so not only do they have a lot of cool features in the game, they also uh, every single inch of them like means something in the story. So we're very careful with that kind of thing. And then same with his face tattoo. Uh, Super fun to work on. I actually love uh, doing some stuff like that with poly paint and ZBrush and just turning off pen pressure because then you can just get some really sharp graphical yeah. edges and yeah, that's cool, yeah. paint all day, which is Good super advice. fun. Yeah, and the, the tattoos are also a visual nod back to our most tattooed character, Balder, since this is his father. We got that connection between the father and son. And as you'll see with the last couple of games, father and son relationships are a big part of uh, the themes throughout the game. Yeah. And then also for, uh, especially for the graphical read of the character, and in a couple scenes, he's got a cloak on. Um, so that's important to kind of follow through with the same elements where you have the gold patterns and things like that on the cloak also. So whether he has it on or off, you still get a similar read, but then a different silhouette, which is really cool. And same thing, like we did that all in ZBrush, and then you do a lot in the, in the texturing stage to get the same details to pop through and become interesting, so. Yeah, and that was, again, making sure we have some presence in the character, but when we stood up against the entire family of the Azure gods, that you could see that he was in the one in charge and, and the father of that family, but still had a bit of those through lines, like the, the greens that you put in there go back to Magni and Modi and even in Thor. Um, but yeah, just making sure as a set that, that they read good so we're not designing everything in isolation. Yeah. Beautiful. It's phenomenal work, guys. So, we just again want to say a big thanks for letting us come here and share this work. It's uh, it's been great for us. Uh, 
all the years of work and to show a little peek about what it is from the modeling team, uh, again, led by Eric Valdez and uh, uh, amazing work. And so we just want to say a big thank you and we appreciate it. Thank you. Well, we really appreciate you, you being here today to show yeah. us all of those fantastically detailed models and assets from uh, the world leading. I mean, it's an institution at this point. Paul Gabriel's nodding a, a very, very succinct nod. He says, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a little grin, and even making a small sound, hmm, he said. Mm -hmm. I'm going to taste salt in the morning. That's all I know. I'm going to cry my pillow. Can't sculpt anything like that. Oh, here we go. Let's take a look. Paul Gabriel's got some people that have been smashing questions, I'm sure. You want to take a few questions? Is that cool? Uh, well, there was a lot that came through. I was just letting them get through the four. That was the big 400 slides. They're like, just don't say anything. Let them get through the 400. Raft <laughs> drop, there's 400 slides. Yeah. They're like, let them get through the 400. Don't say anything. So, yeah, well, I think we you guys answered a lot. A lot of people were asking about the details. You guys were pushing the deals and actually putting the details in, sculpting most of that uh, that stuff in there, painting, figuring out ID, ideas as well. So thank you for sharing so much. That was incredible. I know a lot of people are taking back how much detail you guys were putting into these characters and thought process in them. So there was a lot of really great stuff um, that people really enjoyed that you shared. So. And the books were shared multiple times in the chat, so we'll see. Oh, hey, hopefully, right. uh, you put the link to the to the there was, place to purchase the book. A bunch of links. There's two, right? There's the deluxe version. Yes, it looks like, and then there's a regular. Yeah. Yeah. So. You're getting the deluxe one. Uh, Christmas is around the corner. That's right. Your birthday's almost the up. Thanksgiving, yeah, Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Yeah, Thanksgiving. Birthday and Christmas. You get a double. One of them. Oh, or just we know what to put. <laughs> we know what to put on your desk at the office. There you go. Yeah, I'm excited. Like, I'm, there's, so there's even more images in the book than, uh, than what you were saying. Yeah, we, we go through the whole cast and, um, and, and share that work. And it's similar to here. The, the aim, aim with that is what we're trying to do is also just walk, walk you through what it goes into making this and sharing that information because we face all those same um, design challenges and, and learning that and what really goes into making so games. Here's some two quick questions for yeah. you that I saw coming through multiple times. Um, how much time did you guys really get for each character, would you say, in general? And what was your polygon count limits for the hero characters, let's say? You want to go in? Well, we always try to keep things uh, as low as possible because it is a game. Sure? So we do want to keep it in there. So we try to optimize certain areas as much as possible so that the other ones we can keep high, right? Like things like the faces and the beards yep. and stuff like that. The beards are very important, as you yeah, can see. Yeah, yeah. So we, we try to keep it, you know, in that area, and like a lot of the hairs are around like 50,000 to 100,000. You know, it can, can go wildly different for just the, on the hair. character. Yeah. For just the hair, and then some of the characters can be 100 or 200,000. Like it's kind of all over the map. There's ones like the we'll, we'll, that we'll are really it. small, though. Yeah, we'll, we'll probably prioritize, too, the, the yeah. character. Like something like Kratos and Atreus will have, have mm, more of exactly. that, depending on, on the how much the presence is in there. And how many, uh, are you, how many U-dims and multiple meshes do you say? We usually have a, like between five and ten like different sets of U-dims, basically. Um, so some characters, but again, it's all over the place, so some characters like the knock and like a small thing that's just an enemy can only have maybe one or two, but then things like Kratos can have. We're trying to get Angel to come ten. back on the stage. He can get her to come yeah. back. Come get back on the stage. What are you doing? Come on, on stage, Angel. Come on. Yeah. Let's yeah. welcome her on. Yeah, bring that chair. Okay. Bring that chair. Bring that chair in here. Scoot. Okay, here she comes. Okay. And when then how much time you guys were getting? When it comes to the time, I know, Andrew, you said you were working quite a while nature. on the one. You got quite a yeah, bit Yeah, so when it comes to the, to the time we put in on these characters, it's really um, one thing you can just throw out there and just say uh, two months around that time, yeah. but it's not really two months. We, we go a lot into modifying these characters down the line depending on what the gameplay right. um, aspects and what, whatever need uh, comes out of the, out of the blue. And, and, and it's like... You can easily say that these characters uh, take the whole production. Like we are going back to them, we are tweaking things, we are um, making sure things actually like run well in the game. So yeah, and I, th I think yeah. some of that too, though, is, is maybe some of like the final detailing and stuff too. There's obviously, uh, like just I said, a limitation of making the game. We have to be responsible and economic about how we do this and what makes sense. So there's always a little bit of give and take on that, so uh, depending on where we are on the schedule, that's a huge consideration, making sure we hit those deadlines. I got one. Okay, go. Conceptually speaking, when you're designing that stuff, uh, do you sort of, um, what, which one maybe stands out to you as one you were very, very happy with? If you could point the finger at one. And then I'll have another question for you as well. Well, uh, uh, Atreus, obviously, uh, like I said, uh, I had worked on him in the 2018. That was nice creating a brand new character. Um, and then in uh, God of War Ragnarok, seeing him grow and putting that attention to detail, and I've worked closely with Raph and especially Eric uh, Valdez in the office, like all those little details, and uh, you know, I feel confident like 
with everyone that's working on it, we all equally care about the characters as, as, as much, and especially a lot of love for uh, Atreus. We feel like we've kind of grown with him, and like I said, I feel me and Eric and Raph all feel like proud parents of, of our boy. So that one, because of the transition you've seen across the design yeah, and it, time. And seeing how he grows and the, the, the narrative stuff, and then a, a secondary character for me is, is Anchor Boda, which I got to design a, a lot of, and um, again, who is, uh, has a connection with Atreus throughout the game that the, the players will see, but that design was uh, really special, and, and dialing in on, on one of those was, was fantastic. Okay. That's good to get that. See that? we got an inside, insider track right there. Okay. And then how many pages is the book? The deluxe edition, of course, because <laughs> apparently someone's getting it for his birthday and Christmas. Not both at birthday and Christmas. You get separate gifts. That's horrible. I didn't see the number of pages. <laughs> How many pages? I, I don't know. I gotta see if I can see if it says. Like, yeah, we tried to we tried to pack a, a lot of goodness in there, and yeah. working with Dark Horse was great, and, and the writer Amy was awesome. Uh, you know, we could have made a book five times as big. It, uh, and it's already how many pages? Six hundred pages? I don't. I, <laughs> Six hundred and forty-five pages. We'll getting, it's we'll, growing. We'll getting a lot of it's email growing. messages. In. <laughs> I don't see. It doesn't say how many pages. Uh, I think we're at uh, two something in there. In, yeah. in that neighborhood. Um, again, what we want to do is just show the, a little bit of the process the team goes through on that. Okay, yeah, that's awesome. What's the distinction between the deluxe edition and the regular humanoid version? Mm, I think it comes in a very nice... Yeah, box. it comes in a super nice big yeah. blue box. With Made of wood? A work. Like a know, balsa it wood? It opens up, there's some artwork in there. Mm -hmm. You're kidding. Well. No. no. Yeah, that's that's the big, big difference that I'm seeing. Has it so got far. a poster in there for the office? Uh, it's not poster size. It's book size. opens up and has a nice piece of artwork. But there isn't a poster in there is what I'm saying. I don't know. I don't see one. Does it come with a T-shirt? So we'll we'll see down the road. Maybe we can do a little parking. signing or something somewhere. Yeah. Oh, wow. So. Yeah. Well, it's, it's beautiful. I say, first, for those that really enjoy this artwork, I think the art book is definitely a must-get, especially for someone like me that likes to collect art books, too. It'll be on my shelf. I Appreciate will say it. that much for sure. So I couldn't thank you guys again. Oh, man. I'm taking something. time out of your day. You know, it is the middle of the day for people. <laughs> I want to ask them another question. Okay, Lou, you got another question? I, I'm full of questions. I can okay, talk to you all day about these things. Uh, any, this is open to any of you. Uh, one challenge that you had to overcome in the making of this, again, uh, seminal hit game, to, to get to the point of being rated 10 uh, is a lot of sleepless nights and, and energy. What's, yeah. what's one challenge that you overcame that you think is something you're very proud of as you walk away from this project now that it's complete? Go ahead. Oh, okay, I'll go. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that, that I learned is to really care for the character that we work on. You know, you guys were talking about the, the timeline that we get from production, but, you know, one thing is the, the days that we get. Um, but another thing is, you know, when I, when I play through the levels to polish stuff, I see things that could be better, that I could have, you know, made better. So I would, like, you know, sneak some time to bring it back, fix something, and then put it back into the game. And next week, you know, I'll be working on another task. And then I would still, you know, try to fix the cycle, like maybe come in on a weekend to like, you know, just try to get more polishing done. So, you know, it was a cool experience to be able to just, you know, care so much for your characters that you don't get, you know, stuck with only the, the, the deadline by production, but you just go like the extra mile. Okay, yeah, I can tell that. And you had that. The viewers saw that too. I can tell you that from the comments coming, they saw all of your passion that you guys put into this project, they saw it in what you guys were presenting and what you were sharing. They so. could feel it, yeah. Oh yeah, no, I, I can feel multiple it. Multiple times people saw it, you can see the passion they have. For sure. For these characters and what they did. With Even them. through the digital space, floating yeah. in the ether of the internet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've mm -hmm. succeeded at uh, translating that passion that you have. Anybody else have something that they overcame or a challenge that well, was? Well, I would say in general, I think this is something that everybody, I think, experienced a little bit, and we have talked about that stuff, is that coming from, um, Santa Monica releasing this amazing game that everybody respected, and the guys did such an incredible uh, job. Uh, we get into this uh, new challenge of actually, you know, making something that you know can be next to this masterpiece, as many people call, um, and you know, stand proudly beside that incredible product. So, uh, jumping into this was, uh, you know, that idea was in our minds all the time, like. We need to make sure what we are doing here is gonna, you know, be what the fans love and what is gonna be the best we can do. So I think just like Andy was saying, we we were going back at things where we really didn't have to go if we were in another studio. And this is probably not trying to knock anybody, but we were really in love with what we were working on, and we really tried to go all the way in. And, and I think part of that that we deal with too is, you know, not necessarily thinking what this will be at the end, but making sure during the process that we've we've put 
all our effort into each piece that we did. So however it goes out and, and is received, we can walk away saying we did our best. And I think that approach kind of gives us a little bit of that, that freedom to just, let's just focus on these characters and then the rest of it starts to gel as, as, as the team comes along. And then the great thing that, that I love is every step of the process adds to a character. We, we're very early on where we get to sit with the writers and the art direction with the design, but then when it hands off to modeling, it adds so much. And then we see the, the animation and the voice acting and the effects and it, it becomes, on the concept side, it's like we helped plant the seed, but then what it grew into is because of collaboration from all the other departments. And it's like, that is even a grander character and effect than we had initially thought in the beginning it's because the work of everyone on the team is really putting in that, that heart and their, their best into it. And the result thankfully shows and yeah. Raph kind of helps kind of really cultivate that culture. And I think the results um, are really based on the work that he's, he's put in there for the art department. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's significant. Well, I'm gonna say on every single character, like learning to, to collaborate and, and trust and rely on your team because not a single one of those things you guys saw was made by one person. Yeah. You know, every single one was a whole team of people. So jumping around and like like learning from each other and then also growing as an artist is, is always super key. So that's excellent. That's that's fantastic. Yeah. Words of wisdom. I, I think the other thing too is working on such a huge property. Uh, could be a, a real source of energy. Would you agree that that's something that helped you to get across the finish line and know that that was pushing you as you went along? You're like making history with this thing. It's, it's, everyone knows it's going to be great. I'd say like the, the, the energy that our, our fans have is fantastic. They've been continually supportive uh, from the last game to this one. You know, there's it, it, just like in everyday life, there's there's ups and downs that you go through. But uh, on those those long days, I would just you know pop on a YouTube video of our fan and just seeing the reaction and like. Uh, Hmm. We've mentioned they pick up on all the nuance we put into that, and that enthusiasm like amps me up again to, to jump back in and, and know that that'll be kind of seen by everyone out there. So yeah. I, I love the enthusiasm our fans have, and it, it helps inspire us as well. Well, that's the, that's the driving force here. The enthusiasm of the fans seems to be what pushes us all. That that goes yeah. uh, doubly for the ZBrush development team and everyone, uh, you know, working with Maxon across the globe to push the products to make them the best products, so that people like yourselves can use them inside of the pipeline and bring the yes. fans even, mm -hmm. uh, even greater heights of detail and realism and, and a game everyone can be a proud uh, sort of participant in, whether they're playing the game, whether they're sort of fans of the franchise or helping to make the stuff. I think we're all sort of in bed together making a, uh, an impact in a very positive way. And for you guys at this particular junction, the, the number of the day was what? Ten. So I'm going to take the, take the shackles and swing them in another direction. And I want to say uh, an emphatic thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Likewise, Bob thank you. you. Thank you Thanks so for much. Having it was thank you. incredible. Paul Good. Gabriel, any thank last you. words for these guys before I send us off? No, just thank you. I know I've been talking to them for a while about this, putting this together, especially one week after the game. Very gracious. They were in meetings with us while they were getting ready to deliver the game. So seriously, thanks. Oh, and thank you. It was a great yeah. experience. Raph, if you're okay, still watching, awesome. thank yeah, you, man. Raph, and Raph. Eric, we missed you. Love you, man. Yeah. So on behalf of my compatriot, Paul Gatebury, uh, I'd like to say thank you formally to Andrew Aritza, Angela Rico, Della Longfish, Josiah uh, Scholten, and from afar, Rafael Grissetti, uh, muito obrigado, and everyone else watching around the world. This was a presentation of the highest magnitude with members of the God of War team. If you haven't played the game, please do so. It's, uh, it's a winner. Ten, as they said, is the score that people are giving it around the globe, and we give it a ten as well from an art standpoint. Um, sit tight. We're going to be doing some giveaways with my uh, my friend here, Paul Gabriel. He loves to give uh, give away the kitchen sink. If you're watching still, stay tuned. He's going to give some stuff away. But I, I thank you again, and we'll be right back after this with some giveaways. So thank you so much, guys. Again, take thank care. You guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We're not done. That's only the second presentation for today. We've got Marco Plouffe coming up next. Some hard surface stuff, man. I'm telling you, if you want to learn about doing hard surface in ZBrush, this is a presentation you definitely want to see. And some collectible stuff is going to be thrown in there as well. But let's get to the giveaways between every single presentation. Again, you register. We're going to do the giveaways after every single presentation. Once we have finished, with giving these away, we reset our system, so in the next presentation, you will have to register again. So let's start with the All Access membership to the G ZBrush Jewelry Workshops. Let me spin my wheel here, and we've got a winner. The winner is David Kasten. David Kasten, congratulations, David. You are the lucky winner of a fantastic workshop. Great group of people over there. You're going to learn a lot. I'm just saying, you're going to learn quite a bit. 
All right, let's keep going here. Let's do one of these. Let's do a let's do a 10-week online course from Nomen. That's a, a big 10-week online course from Nomen. So this is going to allow you wherever you are in the world to take an online course. Let's draw the winner of that. And the winner is Connor Elwell. Connor Elwell. That's no bag of mints. Connor. That's a that's a that's there you go. price on that one. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a that's a really, really good one to have for sure. Kidding me? From anywhere yeah, yeah. in the world. Hey, listen, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. Let's keep giving them away. Let's keep giving some stuff away here. Let's do, here, let me do one of these. Let's stay with courses in here. Let's go with a, another bundle. So a ZBrush four course bundle from XMD Academy. All right, this is going to be phenomenal. XMD Academy. And the winner is for that. Clifford Gaines. Clifford, you are the lucky winner of the four course from XMD Academy. Let me put those name in both chats. Clifford, so you've the win. got it. Clifford Gaines, there you go. Well you know what? I'm going to do one more before you know we get ready for our next presentation. Let's do another one. Let's do another one here. Uh, yeah, let's do this one. Let's go with this one. Let's go with the, uh, there we go, a little bit some for the 3D concept artists, ZBrush end-to-end -end creature workshop. ZBrush creature end-to-end -end workshop. This is Pablo Munez, the 3D concept artist. Let's see who has won that for you. And the winner is Zach Ashton. Zach Ashton. Ashton, you are the winner. So I'm gonna put that in both the chats. So that's it for this run, but again, you can register again during Marco's presentation that's coming up next. I'm telling you, if you wanna know how to do hard surface, you wanna see how to do some, also some special surprise coming up too, don't miss this. This is, I'm, this is your thing, this is all you. I'm buckled up <laughs> in both places. And I'd also like to send a special thanks to our platinum sponsors again, Dell Technologies. Thank you again for being one of our platinum sponsors. And NVIDIA is also one of our other platinum sponsors. I thank you again for being a part of our show and all sponsors for being part of our show. Special thanks though to that platinum sponsor, NVIDIA and Dell Technologies. Really appreciate you uh, working with us. So don't go anywhere. If you're like me, I'm in a flight suit, double buckled up for Marco. We're going to bring him on stage here in a little bit, and we'll be right back with Marco Plouffe. Chaos we'll Mason. see you in a little bit. We'll see you soon.
Learn jewelry design and object fabrication through ZBrush. Expert, beginner, and every skill level in between. ZBrush Jewelry Workshops can help you bring your digital dreams into reality. Taught by leading industry professionals. Use the offer code SUMMIT to get a $100 discount on membership. Hello again, people at home and around the world. Louis Tucci here with Paul Gabriel live for the ZBrush Summit 2022. The magic continues. We just had a stellar presentation from the team at Sony Santa Monica with the God of War swinging the chains and making it real. My Lord, the amount of detail. I am hyped. Can you tell? Uh, yes, I can tell. Yes, moving you're ready at the to speed go. of light. You got. It. Wow is, the, wow is the right word, isn't it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, we're not done. We're, we're not done. We're not done we in any stretch more of the imagination, but how do you feel about it so far? I feel fantastic. I feel great. I'm you, super excited. You want excited. the book. I know you do. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm going to get it. It's going to happen. Well, guess what? Yes, talk to me. Next up, All right. a really uh, no stranger to the world of ZBrush. He's a nice guy, too. Mm -hmm. Always nice to see him. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be uh, Marco Plouffe, and he's going to be here with Chaos Maison. And it's, it's our pleasure to have him. We're going to be welcoming him to the stage. I am excited to continue the magic here across uh, day two. It's day three, really, if sure. you think about it. Because Your body we had a zebra, we had a zebra sculpt off. In case you missed it, you can check it out on, on our social media channels. You can recap. But let's bring uh, let's bring out Marco Plouffe uh, from Chaos Mission, and we'll talk to him more about some things that he's been up to. Uh, right uh, right now, let's do it. Marco, you found your way back home with the ZBrush team here onto the green screen stage in oh, yeah. sunny Burbank, California. I'm here with Paul Gabriel, Louis Tucci, and Marco Plouffe finally makes his way to the ZBrush Summit. How are you? I'm pretty good. Pretty good. It's really nice to be back here after, uh, well, the last time that we had the event. So uh, it's pretty cool. New stage also. It's pretty rad. Yeah. Pretty yeah. rad. You guys He's no well. stranger. This is number three for the summit for the you. Repeat right? yes. offender. This is number three. three. Exactly. The repeat. I think you're actually maybe the only one that's been three times that oh. I can think of. That's cool. So you're... You're in a special... Uh, Repeats class. aside, he's been working with the Four Horsemen on a new project, is that correct? Zach Patrick, yeah, 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 exactly. That's been like the huge project lately, so it's cool because I'll, I'll be like showing a little bit of that today, uh, mm -hmm. or at least like okay. I'll use that as like my platform to uh, for my presentation. Man, it's good. I'm happy to be here locked and loaded and the hits keep on coming. I feel like the most blessed person on planet Earth. I get to I'm going to try and zip it up as much as I can. You know I can't, but uh, I'm looking forward to what Marco's going to be showing everybody. It's you like your hard surface. It's no, no secret on this planet that Paul Gabriel is a big fan of hard surface modeling. And Marco, we're not going to chat over you. We're going to let you take it away now. Give the people at home what they're waiting for. They're not waiting <laughs> to hear us. They want to hear from you. Take it away, Marco Plouffe. All right, cool. All right. Well, I mean, so it's the third time I come here, but uh, for people who don't know me, I'll still present myself. Uh, my name is Marco Plouf. Uh, I worked for uh, 12 years in the industry as a character artist. And um, as uh, an artist, I worked in uh, like a few studios like BioWare, ADOS. But uh, pretty rapidly, I created my own company called Chaos Masons with uh, Cedric Seo. That was uh, eight years ago. And uh, basically, I'm like the co-founder of the company. I'm also a business manager, an art director, an artist there. And uh, we've been uh, pretty blessed to be able to work with a lot of like AAA uh, studios doing character art. So, uh, so that's pretty cool. And uh, yeah, in my career as an artist or um, with um, Chaos Masons, we've been able, I've been able to actually work with a few uh, like pretty cool projects and some giants of the industry and whatnot. So um, like our most recent project was uh, Gotham Knight, where we did like, uh, I don't know, like easily like 60 characters for the project. Oh, and I mean, they turned out wow. pretty good. Like I'm pretty happy, like and some important characters as well. So uh, you say 60, six zero. I want yeah, the six zero. to make sure they get this. Six How big was the team that you, um, just him. It's just him and Cedric. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, we were like a team of, uh, we, we started with like a team of 10, then like we went down to a team of four. Like a more on a more continuous Holy. basis, but it was a pretty long project, so like we we were not we didn't need to be like a huge huge team to accomplish all that. But you know what? In the end, it looked pretty cool, so like I'm very happy about that. And um, so yeah, that was the last project. There's like so much more to come that I'm super excited about, but I can talk. Zip about upper it right lip, now. he says. Look at that. He even did the <laughs> gesture. Got plenty to share today, that's for sure. Yeah, exactly. But like overall, with Chaos Mason and everything, like we've worked on stuff like. Uh, like The Witcher, Overwatch, uh, Apex, Borderlands, Outlast, Baldur's Gate, 
uh, PUBG, and of course I'm, I worked for Mass Effect and um, and Do Sex since we've uh, like as a as a as a personal artist, but uh, that's a lot of video game, right? Yeah, that was a lot, of, a lot to take in right there. You're that like, was a lot I to take in. I didn't take a, a breath, breath before doing the project. list. Let's <laughs> pause for a second. Man, Not I can't believe you and Cedric founded this eight years ago, too. That was a mind blower for me, too, man. Eight years yeah. ago. Holy yeah, time Lord. flies by, seriously. Yeah. So, uh, no, we're pretty lucky. I mean, we've put the efforts in, and uh, we're happy like to be able to show like everything we've accomplished so far. And, I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's just going up. It. Yeah, we applaud you. They've killed it. We all I remember the days when uh, at the convention center with Marco, me and Marco, yeah. like eight, I would say nine years yes. ago, probably 10 yeah, years ago. Yeah, yeah. Cedric, too, was, I think 13 years ago. I was yeah. running around in SIGGRAPH. Yeah, one of the time we went, it was like pretty yeah. much at the beginning of the of the, the company. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, long. Congratulations, man. Yeah. Thanks, man. Thanks to you, Cedric, if you're watching. Keep going. <laughs> and he's true, got right? a cool hat on today with that. It's oh, under, yes. under these lights, it's like a hot pink. I like it. Yeah, yeah. It's, pretty, uh, it's pretty contrasty with, uh, with the stuff, but I, don't know, I like it. I dig it. It's um, it's uh, me peacocking, basically. Yeah. Well, I don't know anything about peacocking. Stay tuned. Here we go. Here we go. So, um, so yeah, I've talked about a lot of video games and stuff, right? But the um, the the thing is, like, lately my my passion has been with uh, collectible figures a lot. Uh, for people that follow me, like you've seen that, like I've been working a lot on. Um, like uh, on statues that can be printed and everything. And I've always did that in my career, but like in terms of like spending my own time on my own projects, uh, I've been pulling a lot, a lot of uh, efforts into creating like, uh, like IPs that can be printed and whatnot. So that's kind of like a bit of what I'll be showing today. And the reason why I'm so passionate about uh, the collectible industry is because uh, video games are all fun, right? But something I really love to do is to be able to create kind of like a like a moment with the character, like having him, having him in a pose and like in some composition. Time. Yeah, exactly. Kind of try to tell like a story in one frame and that sort of stuff. And mm -hmm. I feel this is something you can accomplish. And if you can print it and paint it afterward and make it look cool, well, it's, uh, it's even better. So I uh, when I was asked to come here, I was like, okay, well, one thing that could be cool is to show like a little bit of that, but make sure things like stay relevant to like the video game industry as well. And basically, I told myself I could show uh, a project I've been working on and a few of the like methodologies and the techniques that I actually used to get to the uh, end product, which was a printed uh, sculpture. But the thing is that pretty much like 90% of what I have to show is applicable to video game as well. So either if you like video games or if you like the collectible, collectible industry, uh, like I have nice things to show. It's good to see awesome. that and hear that overlap is about to be demonstrated because we know it and maybe now the general public will know it even more. Happens a lot. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, people ask me that question often and it's, it's, it's the same thing I say. It's like you can pretty much approach it the same way for a long time and then at some point like you choose yeah, what, fork. Well, yeah, what fork you take, but a lot can be done before that. Um, so, yeah, um, j just before I start showing, I, I get into like the, the, um, the core of this. Um, some might know the Four Horsemen already. It's a series of character I've been working on for, uh, for a long time. It's the thing you can see on the screen right now. Also a stable in wrestling in the 1980s, but that's a different Four Horsemen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But those are, it's inspired. It's inspired, let's say. <laughs> yeah, Paul Gabriel. <Gabriel's. laughs> Woo! But the, uh, so, so I've been, uh, like, this was my first group of character that I created, and basically they were meant to exist into, like, a, a world that I, I, um, I worked in, like, behind the curtain. So, like, what that world is and, like, the characters that could live in it and whatever. And I basically um, I basically created this website called Neo-Apocalypse, no, neo-apocalypse.com, where people can learn about this universe. And this is a universe where the Four Horsemen uh, live, basically. And um, I've been created this other group of characters called the Archangels, on screen right now, uh, which are basically like the sequel in the story. And I'm basically just creating the story to have like these characters exist in the world and have some backbone for whatever other series of character I'll be creating afterwards. And uh, the thing that i the most proud about this project is that it captured the interest of uh, some, like a company that's now a collaborator of mine called XM Studios. And we've been able to produce these character into uh, yes. printed statues and everything. Victory. And they look like pretty, Victory. pretty rad. I just want to show you something Superb. here. Mm -hmm. Superb. It's, uh, it's a little teaser. Some of you might have seen it already. But it's basically just like introducing uh, the first character of the series called uh, War. War from the Four Horsemen. And what you see right now is basically the actual statue 
printed and painted oh, wow. uh, by XM. So it's my design, it's XM's production. And uh, I'm really happy to be able to say that it's the, uh, the first of the four that we're producing. It's uh, out on uh, pre-orders right now. Uh, and uh, I, I tell you, seriously, it's like one of my biggest accomplishments. I'm so, so you. happy of I like this. I bow to you, sir. Yeah. Well done. Well yeah, and done. they really did a great job for like the, uh, the production and everything. So seriously, it's really cool. When? So if you ever want to learn more about Neopocalypse, because I mean, I'll get to the good stuff now. But if ever you want to learn more about uh, the characters of that universe and have some cool uh, renders and ways to like view the characters and everything. Just go on neo-apocalypse.com. Go check it out. Uh, you'll be able to see the characters. Oh, you'll be that. able to actually also pre-order the you characters that, as well. Wow! Yeah, I'm and sure. uh, if yeah. you're a video game uh, geek like me, you'll like to know that they all have their own stats. Yeah. They all uh, yeah. attack you powers this? and this he made and that. stats for them all. Like, yeah, what's their strengths? <laughs> their agility? Scroll up again. Let's see. Never mind the stats. I want to see a backstory for them all. The what? Look at this death again. Show the death again. Oh my goodness, la muerte. Yeah, this is one of the oh, four. Oh boy, sold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've been having a lot of fun, basically. Wow. I've been having yeah. a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. So well, you're killing it. it looks, they're, they're amazing. Yeah. They're thanks, man. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Beautiful. Really great. And uh, now, boof, straight transition to ZBrush, Look where you can thing. see. Uh, well, the actual sculpture. That's so, the sculpture for the statue you just showed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Way to look at this. So uh, basically, um, I'll be using like a few of these uh, these models to uh, to show my process today, and um, I'll I'll be starting it by explaining like a bit about how I went for like designing them, or at least finding like the main like general idea for these characters. Uh, although like I'm I'm not necessarily like a concept artist or anything. There's still like a process that I like to use uh, for um, just giving me like a bit of a, like a, a stepping stone before I actually go in ZBrush. So I'll just really, really rapidly uh, show you uh, this uh, image right here. Um, as uh, many of us do, I always start by gathering references and that sort of stuff. And uh, really like, even if I don't really have like a, a specific idea of what I'm looking for, I'm just trying to get inspired by things that I find and everything. Maybe that I had an idea of like making the Four Horsemen because it's a, it's a theme that I like. And since I like to do hard surface, I knew I wanted to like make it with this kind of like visual. But I really started with just like capturing a lot of things that for me had some kind of like, um, uh, whatever, like just something that inspires me. Even if it's just a little detail of a, like an image or, or that sort of stuff. And this is, by the way, like a very um, short version of my reference. Like there's much more images normally. But still, I just do that. And it kind of like helps me to like daydream about like where I want to go with things uh, without, I, without me doing like anything using my pen or that sort of stuff. You do this at the beginning of whatever you're trying to conceptualize? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I'm trying to find like just like a, a one-liner concept that I that is going to be like a driving force to go forward with everything. Sure. And doing this actually kind of like helps me to unlock things in my head and, uh, and that sort of stuff. So this is really like the first phase of it. And afterwards, um, like I said, not a concept artist, but still I like to just uh, push a little bit more and doing like some small like thumbnails and that sort of stuff just to just to see if like the vision that I have in my head just translates at least in this very early stage because thumbnails you can do that do them in like a few seconds and that sort of stuff so I just go through that but I don't really overstay my welcome with uh, thumbnails because at the end of the day I'm a 3d artist so I'll jump like pretty rapidly into uh you're gonna thumbnail in ZBrush. Into in 3D. This. Yeah, exactly. I'll, I'll thumbnail in ZBrush, and this is where like the the exci exciting stuff, like at least for me, really like starts, right? But this is like a good way to just like just make it clear in my head where I want to go with things. And at the end of it, like the bottom section here is basically just like a like a few images that I find represents the best what I'm going for, and this will be the like most uh, abridged version of uh, the idea. Uh, and that's pretty much like all it is for everything that's like before ZBrush. But I just sometimes want to stop you for a second. That model on the screen that you have is 290 million polygons. Yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, by the way, a uh, pretty good computer that you have here to be able to run this scene because like there's a lot there's a lot happening in here. And uh, of course, I mean I don't work on everything at the same time like this. Like I chop it off in like pieces. Sure. How many subtools Paul Gabriel wants to know? 
What Dude, does it say? I don't know. I mean, right now there's like 138, wow. but this is not even the, the real amount yeah, because I merged things together yeah, yeah, for the final not the scene, model. basically. So it's pretty catastrophic at the end how but much. But I, I noticed on hard surface, you do use a lot more sub tools in a lot of cases in yeah. hard than you do in organic, I'd say. Yeah, exactly. So th thanks for like the folders and everything because yeah, that You're really like, helps to sort hey, it out. No? Right there. Yeah, especially when I need to do like. <laughs> there you 300 go. million pockets. This guy. Yeah. So, but uh, you know, at the end of the day, if I want to do like switch outs, like the hand, the hand just changed there, or like the the head just changed, with the folders, it's just really nice to be able to just like do those switch outs and stuff. Sure. Especially in the collectible industry, because it's it's a thing, right? To yeah, have switch different outs hands, different hands. Stuff. So uh, yeah, no, basically that's uh, look at that. Yeah, just basically. Yeah, <laughs> just, just so, another day. Yeah, in the, just another day. Just another day. My presentation. <laughs> so just do that, and like there you hey, go. We're done. Thanks for coming. Yeah, uh, thanks for coming. <laughs> So uh, yeah, um, this is like a, this is a demonstration of the uh, of the end product. But of course, like everything starts uh, somewhere more uh, more uh, humble. And um, basically, this is like a start, a good starting point to show you like where the whole process goes. And from the thumbnail that I showed you earlier, like I'll still go through like having my characters in uh, T pose, A pose, whatever you want to call them. And for doing a lineup, something that I thought was very interesting to do is to start even like her earlier with these characters. Uh, this is like a, something that can actually get, um, like it, it takes more time to actually go through everything, but I like to have my characters be um, like constructed with layers, basically. And I always start a bit like I would do with like a, like a human character that has armor or everything. So I'll just start with what's the character, what does the character look like if he was in quotes naked as an android. And um, I also work on this like blocking the four characters at the same time because since there's a group, they're also like a unit. Right. As like even the four of them together are a unit and they have to have like their own differences and their body archetype and that sort of stuff. So like I'll, I'll start like very uh, normally with like a, like a human human based mesh. Um, maybe if I was doing like a beast, I would start from a sphere, right? But might mm -hmm. as well start with a humanoid uh, figure. And what I do, or at least what I did, is to be able to save on time, the way that I like to layer the character is to use poly paint to really break what is like, um, more like the underneath, maybe like the, the synthetic muscles and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I'll go like a little bit more of a gray and I'll use it to um, for everything that's more like maybe like the cloth that's over, that's holding things together, a bit like a fascia if you, if you want. And then I'll use a lighter um, yeah. poly paint just to express what's really like over as like the, yeah. the, the top surface of the character. And for me, this is like really, really a quick way to really cut into anything that would be more like time consuming um, for creating like at least like the body of the character because it's like there's all these tools to create like many like assets and stuff but I don't think it's like right now the moment really to do those things when you're exploring when you're looking for shapes you really want to use like what's the quickest so for one I'll use uh, poly paint like this and also uh, at some point I'll start working on like the, the layers that would be on top of the character here and the layers here, I don't necessarily use um, like a lot of subtool anyway. Color. And just to give you an example here, like, um, okay. So you can see like the different colors. They're basically like all the layers that I will be adding on top. For example, if I click on this, this is basically a mesh that was hidden inside of the character. I'll do a little uh, demonstration afterwards. But it was a layer that was kind of like hidden in the character and I just like extruded the shapes out of the character trying to define like what would be like the armor on top. But it's pretty much like all one subtool anyway, except maybe for like the shoulders that you can see were made of like actually two, um, two subtools yeah. here. Just trying to say that like I try to be very like efficient in terms of like not creating too much stuff that can be in the way. And, um, and yeah, that's like how I, I'm able to pretty much get to, like for example, this uh, result uh, within like maybe like uh, like a day or two, like for like the blocking of this character. Then right? You, right, what you have on screen now is in a day or two. Yes. Well, I mean, the the, the underneath of the well, character was a like a day. <laughs> the this whole thing here. is a day or two. <laughs> All right. Well, I had a pretty good idea of what I was going for. Okay. Right? Like I. I 
You know, sometimes it takes. Max is going to say, "I worked four hours each one of those days." That's what's like. Yeah, well, I mean, you need to be like. I'm. I'm saying like eight hours full time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah really I started yeah. from a yeah. sphere, and I got this in four hours, and yeah. here it is. Enjoy. Well, you start from the human character, so. Yeah. <laughs> here we go. This guy. Jeez. But uh, but yeah, but seriously, sometimes I'll give myself the chance to explore further, and I'll just yeah. like like. Put it to the trash and start over and do something else, right? So, so I think that's good. You let yeah. go, let go. Yeah, exactly. Let go and then start again. You'll probably. And that's more. why I don't want to spend more than maybe like a day or two for like doing a whole thing like this because like maybe if I'm gonna scrap it, then it's like well yeah. I need to spend it like. Don't again. get married to it, as I say. Don't get too married to it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And basically, all of the characters will uh, be. Uh, I'll do the same thing until I have like. So you create this in essence almost skeleton pattern polypaint thing for all your meshes to start uh, with, for the most part, just for these? Well, I mean, the, since they're a group, and I wanted to find like a way that they're unified in their design, I actually yeah. went uh, and I made them like naked. But if I was to do like a one-off character that yeah. like you never see under everything, I'm not necessarily always going to spend like this amount of time. But since sure. it's like something more like a group, I was like, ah, oh, that's worth it. Plus, like I thought it was fun. So even mm -hmm. if it were, it's not like the maximum efficiency, I thought that, yeah, that could be cool. And I didn't really know also how much armor I wanted to put on them. So I was like, well, at least I'll have what's under the armor already done. No, and it's all blocking, right? So yeah. it's like, I didn't spend like that much time on it. But uh, yeah, so just to go into like demo mode for, uh, for a second right here, and I'll just take this character. Um, I'll split this off right now. And what I want to do is I just want to show you what I was um, talking about earlier where um, like what I do when I start uh, concepting. Um, well, for this part, I mean, it's already done. Basically, this, just, this is just using clay build up, dam standard to find like the things and using polypaint. So I kind of like explained that. But to build on top of this, the way that I work, and it, it didn't really change from like when I started to do 3D, is that I will duplicate this character. I'll just make sure there's no like. Sorry, layers. I don't want to interrupt you, but I, I have this yeah. question that's probably nagging a lot of people. Did you specifically make that uh, base for this project, or is that something that you do typically the way this looks? Oh, this is like a this is a, a base mesh that I use all the time. Okay. Like all the time. I have like a few, but they're all Great. pretty much just like like a, a certain like uh, archetype of body. So maybe like I'll have like a muscular one, a, sure. a more like skinny one, a female one, and that sort of stuff. I'm glad I asked you that. Yeah, but they all start from like, yeah, they all start from the same base. Um, so yeah, um, one of the first thing that I'll do is I'll just take this character, for example, and I'll just like uh, invert, inflate it. I always used to use, I always like to use a transpose line with right click in this one here to do that. It's a really quick way to inflate. And you can see that now, like everything is inside of the character, except for like a few things sticking out, but whatever. And once that you have this, I'll pretty much start from there and build on top using like clay build up or that sort of stuff. So you see, you can simply like paint and whatever like, um, wherever you paint, like it basically like shows um, like what's underneath. And this is how like I build like the top layers and everything. So this is the, uh, the armor pieces now. That yeah, yeah, exactly. Or like, I mean, it could be whatever you want, right? But mm -hmm. in this instance of this character, yeah, it would be like the, uh, his armor and everything. So you see, I'll just use like clay build up uh, to kind of like give the volumes and everything. And then I'll use uh, dam standard to um, just create some like inverted uh, volume to create like edges yeah. or uh, n not using alt, it will create just like the cavities and everything. So I can pretty much just like get like my volumes, uh, get planes if you use like ins and outs of, um, of dam standard, it'll create your volumes like this. And to give it like a smooth surface, I won't even like start using like H polish yet. I'll simply use uh, smooth because smooth will smooth out your mesh, and a smooth mesh give, already gives it a more like um, like hard surfacey look, mm -hmm. if I can say. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, or you can use like H polish. I'm just saying smooth really does a lot of work, especially in the um, in the uh, blocking stage. You, you don't want to always have to change your brushes, so it's it's really nice that like the shift key uh, gets you there. What material are you using for this for you? Because you obviously want the reflectivity. It's in a blend, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm in blend right now. You're just yeah. using a blend? 
Yeah. yeah. Or uh, at this point, I'd say I'm, I'm not looking too much at the material. Yeah. It's just, it was really just like I used the first thing that came here. Like if it was maybe this material, I would not sculpt with this one. Mm -hmm. But uh, or you could. It could be a challenge. It would be interesting. The next ZBrush challenge, oh, you have to sculpt you using this material wow, only. Wow, that would be something. Here we go. It actually might exactly. help because the normal map of that material, you would see the actual level change. Yeah, I'm not exactly. sure I can look at that for But you get hours. you like blind yourself. Yeah, yeah, you probably. Yeah. It'd probably yeah, get you squirrely eyed after a while. Yeah, sure. pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't heard someone say that in a dog's ear. Hey, well, there you go. I haven't heard that go. one either in a dog's ear. There you go. <laughs> bringing it today, people. So the, um, the, uh, another tool that I like to use is uh, basically just curve strap snap. It's been in ZBrush for a while, and I just find it works really well to create like... Um, to create like any kind of like belt-ish kind of thing, or it, it cannot, you can even be more than just a belt. You can basically just use it and say like, oh, you know what? It's like a metal uh, trim for like other another piece of armor or whatever. And it's just like a quick way to have like a mesh inserted on your uh, model and do whatever you want with it afterwards. Mm -hmm. And um, I just love it. You just have to be conscientious that you need to use a um, a uh, mesh that doesn't have subdivision or like layers. This is why. Once again, in blocking, I try to not use like too much like layers and whatnot, or have uh, subdivision levels to my mesh to be able to use tools like this. Yeah, you're keeping your freedom open. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, so the same the same way with the the curved tube uh, snap. So if ever like you need to have like a like a tube or something more tubular like this, you can easily place it on your model, and then you go to your move brush and you start like placing it around and just figuring out like where it goes. Uh, I don't mind for the stretching and that sort of stuff at this stage because it's, once again, I'm just looking for shapes and forms and whatever. Nothing, I'll never stop myself like polishing too much. And so even if like the tube has a stretch, it's like whatever, it reads as a tube, so it, it's fine, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so stuff like this, there's another, another one that I like to use as well. Uh, I don't have it in my quick shortcuts though because I don't use it often, but it's still a nice one, curve quad fill for doing like vast but thin uh, regions. I just take something like this here. This one I might actually split it into a, another sub tool just to have a bit more control over it, like maybe to uh, reduce the, um, the, 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 the thickness. And uh, like I could, if I want to sculpt in it, now maybe the resolution is not uh, superb, but something that I can do pretty easily is, for example, let's say hide this polygroup uh, I'll do a mirror and weld. Um, I'll do an auto group because I know that there's like a mesh in the middle now that I did my mirror and weld. This way I have one continuous shape. I can just Z remesh it. Let's say 2000 polys. That might be a little too much. There we go, a little better. And from there, uh, you can simply like give it like a quick, um, whatever, a quick shape to simulate like a cape just to be able to say like, ah, oh, well, there you go, that's a cape. And I use a lot of my imagination at this point to tell myself, oh, it looks good, it looks really credible. But you know what, as long as it reads, I mean, I'm good enough for like the, um, the, the, um, the um, concepting uh, point. I like the stage. joy with which he said that. He said, I use my imagination, and he laughs. laughs. <laughs> People, you can use your imagination for the entire presentation. If ever <laughs> I do something that looks ugly, just tell yourself, wow, no, it's that in my so head. good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so there you go. This is just a, a nice, like, quick way to create, like, a, somewhat of, like, a cape for the character. Um, so you don't put the little, it's interesting, you don't put the little silhouette window that we have. That's oh, yeah, I've just, like... You've just gotten used to doing it. I just got used to, like, always, like, pushing back the character and that sort yeah. of stuff. Right. I, uh, it's, not, it's, a, it's a great feature. We work in a similar fashion, you and me. It's fine. Carry yeah. on. There you go. Yeah, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just making an observation you know for myself. I mean? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. It's all good. You probably stop talking out loud when I'm thinking, huh? <laughs> right. Well, uh, we're all good here. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, something else that I, I like to do is just using the good old extract... Uh, especially for doing like uh, just taking part of a mesh that like really does like follow the um, the the silhouette of the character. So I'll just like mask like part of it. Let's say like this, and uh, I'll extract it. And I'm uh, most of the time I don't even look at like the the result. I'll just like commit to the extraction right away, because uh, like I do often, I'll just grab whatever like 
subdivision it gives me, uh, sorry, not subdivision, but like, uh, like mesh or shape it gives me, yeah. uh, always run it through uh, ZRE mesh to just get something. Uh, most of the time it's to get a lighter um, like density of polygon. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason is because uh, with a lighter density of polygon, you just have more like flexibility into like melting the shape away um, and redoing the whole um, shape. It's just because like it, the, the, the brushes react more uh, uh, vividly or they're more reactive to the shape. So uh, yeah. So once you get this here, uh, I'll put it into double again, and you can simply like start moving it around, get like a hood shape pretty rapidly as well. And in the idea of uh, conceptualizing things, it just like helps to uh, really go fast and add stuff on top and, and whatnot. It's kind of weird. The the pressure is uh, the pressure is very um, is very uh, low. Like I have to press like super hard to get something. Oh really? Anyways, whatever. It'll uh, it'll work. But basically, yeah. Like I'll do that, and this is just like the first step. You continue to do that, and or like I said, use your imagination now and just tell yourself like, wow, that looks pretty great. But yeah, that's the basically the tools I actually would use to create some of those meshes. Um, the um, I sometimes for like stuff that I know that are going to be like floor meshes, like especially like shoulder pads and that sort of stuff, I'll go grab like the IMM primitives, maybe like uh, the sphere, let's say, uh, insert sphere, there we go, and I'll just add them on top like this, split them into their own uh, sub tool, afterwards, and uh, after that I can simply like start exploring the, um, like, its shape in a very, um, yeah, in a very, like, uh, uh, typical, like, way of, like, sculpting the volumes and, and that, that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah I'm, so, I, I'm sorry, it's, like, uh, it's really hard. The, the pressure doesn't seem to actually go, like, pretty. Really? Yeah, I'll try to. Well, you see, if I actually just like uh, make make the Z intensity like higher, it actually uh, works a little bit better. I'll tell you what, we modulated it because you said you were so fast. We wanted to see if it would slow you down a bit. <laughs> How's that for on the spot? Yeah, I guess I should not have said that, eh? <laughs> I shot could, myself uh, in the foot. We could try re restarting the Wacom driver and see. Yeah. Got a controller um, on that thing. Well, I mean, it's not it's not really gonna, gonna like stop me uh, stop me enough. I'd sure. say so. Uh, it should okay. be uh, it should be okay. But whatever, this is not really a demonstration of the whole process. This is just me like showing like a few uh, like quick tricks that I like to use while doing concept. And uh, yeah, and of course, I mean, uh, just to say that Dynamesh is always my friend. At any point, if I do like a transformation to the mesh that's going to like just like hinder my uh, my resolution to create like volumes and stuff, of course, I'll always just Dynamesh whatever I have in this uh, instance. And so, at this point, I'll actually uh, end up having, uh, boom, boom. like I'll, I'll end up like creating something like this out of just like using those tools. Everything that you see on the character right now, uh, I'm like pretty certain doesn't have like one single tool that I just didn't show like right here. So it's all about just like figuring out like what looks good, exploring like the designs and everything, and then you have like your, um, you have your character in this uh, level of, of uh, detail, which is, like I said, um, since I'm using tools that are pretty simple, you can get there like relatively fast if you like know what you're going for with the design and everything. So you can have like this whole group of character done like pretty quickly. And once that you have them, then you can start really figuring out like what uh, looks like how they can be like different but similar at the same time, right? Because mm -hmm. since they like a group of this, uh, like a character called the Four Horsemen, they have to look like they're part of the same group, but you don't want to do four times the same character, so you kind of like, you have to find like what makes them different one from the other. Like Death here, for me, the example, like my goal was to make him look kind of like a necromancer. So all of his like armor, they kind of look like skulls mm -hmm. or like animal skulls or human skulls. Even if it's just like, it's not really like a head, it, it has kind of like a skull-ish aspects to it. Whereas War right beside him had to look more like a dark paladin that this is like, this is what I was going for, right? But I figured that out while I was sculpting the characters, like the, 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 
the look of them and the look of their armor and everything. Her was more like elegant, that sort of stuff. And uh, Famine here was more like uh, like disheveled, fallen knight, that sort of stuff. And those are all, thing, all things that I pretty much like figure out uh, when, I'm, um, when I'm sculpting the characters inside of ZBrush because it gives me a little bit more time while I work on like maybe like uh, finding my shapes. Uh, I find that like it gives times for my, my brain to just like see, like to, to, to just figure out what I see and what I like and get to, um, get to something uh, that I find is a good direction, something that I will commit to push further afterwards. Um, at this stage, I'm not done with the blocking though, because something, especially when it comes to uh, printing, something you wanna block is, you wanna block the final pose of the character pretty much right away. Um, so, for example, like this is like the, ne the next target in my process. I'll try to have the character posed uh, in the blocking, so you see like if you look closely, it's still the blocking, I didn't do anything more. Well, I mean, there's now a horse, that's something more, yeah. but it's... <laughs> He's got a brush for that. Yeah, exactly, the, the horse brush. I am M horse, he blinks, I am M horse, horse. <laughs> horse. Do, 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 do. Processing, and yeah. there it is, I am M horse. And the, um, the uh, it's a really good brush, uh, thanks for adding it to ZBrush. And, uh, it's our but, pleasure. Yeah, yeah no, no problem. Uh, but whatever, I mean, the, the horse was the same process. So it's just rinse and repeat the whole thing, but just start from horse. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea is to be able to get to this, uh, to get to this thing right here. And um, the way that I go by is that I'll just take, for example, uh, my posed uh, model. And I'll decimate it. I'll create uh, polygroups just for like some of the sections, even like if the section is, uh, is merged, like this belly section here, I'll take it. And this way, from like a character that stands in a, a pose, it's really just a matter of like moving the character around and finding the right composition because since they're in different like poly, um, poly groups, you can always just uh, use uh, like the transpose line, control click on it, do like a, a bit of a blur, like a masking blur, and you can always just rotate the character around until you pretty much like put it in a pose that for you looks like uh, it would make for a great composition at the end. Um, I'll, I'll go into detail of like the posing later on a more complex character, mm -hmm. but this is just to say that from the very, very beginning, I wanna know where I'm heading. Like it's very important for me. Uh, it's a thing, like it gives me confidence, I'd say, to uh, commit to my character and to push forward because the next step afterwards, like the polishing and everything, they'll take like much more time, right? Mm -hmm. And you, you, if you commit to do something that's gonna take a lot of time, I find that it's always better to know like where you're going so that you're not yeah. too much in the dark right. or at least less in the dark. Yeah. At least clear about your intention. Let me, let me slip a quick question in there for yeah, you. Yeah. Um, how do you circumvent or overcome the, the hardship of the, the hard surface parts when you're posing that? Let's say you had like, uh, an elbow pad or a knee pad in this case, how are you avoiding the sort of distortion? It's a, it's a very good question. If, if I could have almost asked you to ask this question for my next uh, step, so yeah. that's pretty great. It's not even scripted, I just, you know, this is what we do here. Yeah, exactly, well, I think we were mind reading as well. Yeah, because this is where I was going. Brothers and Z, <laughs> brothers and Z. Yeah, exactly, brothers and Z. Basically, the, um, the idea is that this blocking here, um, it can stretch, it can do whatever it wants, and like, I don't really care with it. Because the thing is that if it does stretch, I'll know that it's something that I need to change on the design before I go further into like, polishing. So it's really the time to make those mistakes and to see what's really gonna work or not. And especially when it comes to the, the, um, the final pose of the character, well, I'll know that like, if I actually do something like, extremely exaggerated, well, I have to have the design kind of like work for it the same time. So this is the one thing that's cool about uh, sculpting is that sometimes you can also sculpt for the final pose, actually. Not for like every condition of like the movements and everything. Right. So this is kind of like a, a one little like cheat thing that's kind of fun in terms of like matching design with um, 3D print and uh, statues and whatnot. So if you look at this character, for example, it's kind of hard to say because it's still like pretty like blocky, right? But you can see how like the, the back of the calf uh, armor actually goes inside of mm -hmm. the, the thigh armor. While this is kind of like for me a good uh, demonstration that in the uh, posed character, or at least let's take the one that looks good, in the posed character, well in this section here, I'll need to maybe like cut it just so, so it allows for more space before I um, 
due to polishing. Let's yeah, say. especially if you've gotten that deep. This is the biggest problem I see with hard surface. They go too soon trying to do the cool polishing parts. Mm -hmm. And then once they get moving, they're like, uh, this is all not working together anymore. And then yeah. now you're reverse engineering trying to go backwards. You know, and that's the thing. That's the thing that's fun is that if you know things ahead, I mean, you won't fall uh, like in these pitfalls. But yeah. at the same time, I mean, I did fall in a couple of pitfalls uh, over my career, and I still do. And there's yeah. always a way to fix it afterwards, and it's fine, right? It's not. There's no like real point of no return. It's just like, yeah, you might save like a couple of hours, maybe, if you just like think ahead. I like think the things to yeah. be careful of for people who are just getting started is burning out on um, artistic sort of um, stamina. Yeah. And then just realizing, oh God, I have to go backwards, and like now I don't have yes. the energy to fix it. You know, that's a reality for a lot of people. So yes, indeed. They feel like, so deflated, you know, that they, oh no, what have I done? Yeah. So this is just like giving you like a little bit of like extra stamina, I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one thing I can say also, by the way, is uh, this was my T pose for the horse. Like I already knew I wanted the horse to do like um like a I think it's called counting when they go on their uh, legs like this. Anyways, whatever. Oh. Like I wanted the horse to be kind of like in that position, so I actually modeled him in this position, knowing that the end result is like pretty close to this. I'll do that sometimes, not all the time, because like uh, it's fun to work on a character that has like a nice gesture and everything. Mm -hmm. But I found that for the, ho the the horse, like it was inspiring enough to do it in that pose here. That like that's what I went for. It just helps for the final posing of everything, I'd say. Speaking of the pose, I really like, I like death the way that you have handled the sort of inflection or the bending of the um, abdomen region. A lot of people don't do that. You know, he's got a, do you see that, Paul? You see how he's like lurched over a little. Yeah, you know, I was inspired by the Napoleon uh, painting. Yes. Like him on the horse. Now that you say it, it's, it's so stark, it's right there. Yeah. So, um. Oh, look, they're all there together. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the, um. A whole community of killers. Just, uh, put them a bit more lined up. There we go. It's very powerful to see them all there lined up like that. Look at that. There's not even enough screen space for that stuff. Yeah. My and, but also, I, I think it's like very important to be able to view them as a group like this because, once again, for the same reason I, I said earlier, you kind of like want them to look like a, a unit, like a legion. Really. Oh, like they look like a legion, all right, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. It's great. Yeah. And uh, also, an extra thing, uh, I, I like to think about like how they're gonna look on your shelf if you have the four of them. Like for me, like this is like the winning composition. You know what, short story, uh, I did an interview. Uh, if you go on neoapocalypse.com. I've been again. sharing it, I've shared it. Huh? He's in the chat right there, that's what he's doing. Don't yeah. think he's texting his friends. He's, he's well he is, he's, he's communicating <laughs> with all of our friends. Thank you, Paul. Chat, he, yep. He's sharing it in the chat right, right now again. Yeah. And if you check the interview on the website, uh, I, you'll see that the, the statues are in the background. Well, I didn't even did it on purpose, but I ended up placing them in the exact same composition oh, really? just yeah, by you default. Yeah. By de yeah. Because I, I think it's just like I, when I did it, I, I figured out like this was like my favorite composition, and just naturally I went back to like this composition when I placed them in the background yeah, I can for the see interview. That. Looking good, man. Looking yeah. good. I feel good just looking at this thing. <laughs> there you incredible. go. Incredible. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, at this point, if you if you feel it, I mean, you've you've pretty much covered like the design of the character, or at least the main shapes and everything. You've designed the, the pose. You've designed them as a group. So it's like, okay, well, when you have this, now you can pretty much like decide to go into something that's more like a commitment. So like the polishing and everything. Excellent. Yeah. I actually also used this like image almost to show it to a couple of my friends to ask them like, do you think there's like potential into creating this project and maybe like get the in, like the interest of the people? Uh, because since we're doing like statues, like people have to like buy them to show like there's the support, we'll right? It. Yeah. So it's like, do you think like there's going to be like a, like a clientele for this? I think the answer is you... yes, 100%. Well, thank you, I appreciate this. I have to sit back when I say that, 100% yes. There is an audience waiting for everything. But you want to have also like something to show them to be like, because you don't want to tell them like, oh, I have this idea about the four horsemen. You want to have like something that you can like show them and be like, hey, what's your feeling about this? And I find that this is pretty much the quickest way to get like the more the more bang for your buck, let's say, right? Because like yeah. you didn't spend that much time. It took a while, but just imagine if that was like all in polish, it would have taken like months and months ex instead of like maybe like a few weeks, right? So, and it does like. <laughs> A few weeks. I like his <laughs> few your weeks. concept of like, time is. Very hey, this is a few weeks for every, everyone. Everyone else, eh, it's about six months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd like to say I think he might have a skewed concept of time here. Yeah. I, know, I just think because he's perfected his workflow, so that's what I'm saying. This is the one that you guys get double buckled up for, Marco. Man, this workflow he's perfected. He's not messing it. around. 
Man. Well, it's all, like I said, it's all based on efficiency. Like, I, yeah. I, I, I'm not stopping time when I work. It's really just, like, I think I, I figured out, like, a few of the shortcuts that just, like, helped me, like, go through uh, a few steps that sometimes, like, you can get lost in and sure. that sort of stuff, right? Yeah. Um, so at this point, um, this is, for example, like, the, uh, the, the polishing of uh, death in its A pose, T pose, whatever. This is the polished version that we're looking at right now on the screen. Yes, yes. This is basically like the final version. The only thing that's not there for this character is like the cape. This portion of the cape is still like the, um, the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the blocking. Mm -hmm. Because I knew that this character, like the, the cape, let me get back to um, the actual final model. The cape of this character is extremely flowy and it really plays with the composition and everything. So there was like no purpose for me to make this cape in, uh, in symmetry or in T stance, right? Like I knew that like it was, it, it was going to have like a lot of like movement and everything. So I basically like told myself, well, this is gonna wait for after the posing. Uh, which is actually like one of the, the, the subject that like I wanted to talk about is basically just knowing like when it's time to do um, something in T-pose, when it's time to do something uh, like in posing, right? And I find that there's like many schools of, school of thoughts because I know a lot of artists that they're going to pose like the naked, the naked character like pretty early or like a, like a um, uh, kind of like, a, not early in the sense of like blocking, but early in the sense of like the elements on the character, like pretty early they're going to pose the character and just finish it like in their final pose, which is absolutely fine. I think this is like a great way of, work, of working. Sure. But you know, like when you're working with a lot of sub tools, uh, stuff like that, uh, sometimes, like especially when it's like hard surface and everything, sometimes you kind of like want to have like a lot of your character finished in T-pose before posing him. Um, so you kind of like just have to be um, like, you have to make choices, I guess. And for me, the cape was one of those choices. Let's do it at the end. And the rest, uh, since it's pretty much like symmetrical, like I can pretty much do it right away. Or if you know that a mesh is not really gonna bend or anything, yeah, you can do it in a stance right now. Like for example, like the hood part, uh, anything that's cloth here or like this like upper cloth um, section. Like I knew that in the final posing of the character, it will probably not be bent so much. So it's not like if any, uh, modification to this part would make it look like bent or whatever. So, yeah, I thought that this would help a lot. Um, so in the same idea of like, what do I do now? Uh, another one is just to think ahead about like what you want to use like in symmetry. And uh, something that I do for, uh, for my character, oops, not this one yet. Sneak peek. This guy, <laughs> sneak peek. <laughs> Um, so there's something I do for my characters is that the, the, the position of the arm and the position of the, um, at least the position of the upper arm and the position of the thigh, I try to make sure that it's somewhat like on a straight line so that from the Z axis, I can still work in symmetry for those, uh, for those models here. So if you use local symmetry and you put yourself in like Z symmetry, you, at least you benefit from having this like model be in the scene on the character, but be somewhat of like an orthographic view so you can actually just use um, the symmetry. For parts like uh, the gauntlet or uh, the, the greaves, like the tibia section, uh, for those what I do is I always take my, my blocking, I place it into like another scene and I construct uh, those pieces in orthographic view like this here. So, this is done like fairly easy because it's just a matter of grabbing like a section of your character. Like you can basically just like take this one here, clone it into its own, um, its own Z tool. You erase sections of it um, like this. And then you basically just place your floor, remove perspective, and you aim for like the center. Oops. All right, like this, rotation. You pretty much just get like a ballpark, um, a ballpark um, estimation of like if it's in the middle, and then you just mirror and weld. And if you haven't lost um, like too much volume, well then you know that like you're pretty much like smack in the middle of your uh, your mesh. You can even like move it like this, try to just like eyeball what's in the middle. And you see like something like that, you haven't lost much volume. You can always get it back by simply like doing this. And um, this thing, if I do the high res of this, I'll know that like I can always just place it back on the character afterwards and like it's gonna fit, um, 
is going to fit at least 90 95%. So the modification you'll need to do once it's on the posed model, it's not going to be like really big. So um, this is pretty much like the, um, like the idea for anything that's not in a kind of like a orthographic uh, view of the character. So basically this was the idea of like, what do you do now? What do you do in pose? So if we jump into, uh, okay, so how do you do all that, that polishing? Like in more, yeah. uh, in more uh, precise steps, uh, we can take uh, part of the character, for example. I'll just create a little screenshot of him right there. Just as a kind of like a, an example of like where I'm going with this. And uh, let's just take my blocking is this one here. All right. So how do I get from uh, the blocking, or at least like this armor section, to um, this section here, which is more finished? Uh, that is the question. So I'll start by basically just like splitting everything into like auto groups, just to kind of get like only the part that I want to I want to be working on. It's going to be this one here. Activate symmetry. And I'll start by simply like isolating kind of like the section I'm going for. Hiding it, deleting everything that is hidden. I'm using my shortcuts for those. And then I'll just get enough resolution on the mesh so that I can start using um, polypaint. And what I'll do is I'll just quickly, oops. Yeah, this is a good one. I'll just quickly draw the, uh, the, bun the border of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Also, uh, sometimes I'll draw, if I want like negative space in my model, like let's say like this was, this is supposed to be like a, a hole, yeah. I'll also uh, mask this portion out. But this is like a pretty like a full mesh, so this is gonna be fine. Once that I get this, I simply do a, um, um, mask by intensity to change my polypaint into like an actual mask. So uh, mask by intensity, this is in my shortcuts, this is where I place it. I'll hide this and I'll just see if there's like a, like, um, like a hole in my uh, mask, which there's none, which means that I can reverse this, uh, delete everything. There are subdivisions, so whatever. Delete, and now if I auto group this, I have this section that is all clean and whatnot. And from this here, the next step that I'll take is basically just get rid of everything that is kind of like mid details or actual details. I'll simply use like the clay uh, brush to kind of like get rid of it visually because the step afterwards is gonna rely on uh, like one of the algorithms. So what I'm doing is I'm just like doing something that I'm sure is gonna help like the, uh, the algorithm to understand like what I'm going for. So getting rid of like anything that could be distracting and I'll even start kind of like emphasizing uh, on what's like what's my goal, like what, I, what, what am I going for in terms of the planes of the object. And if you look at the planes, I'm basically like drawing them right now. Like this is what I'm gonna go for, like you can, it's all bumpy and stuff, but you can see what I'm going for. There's this section, there's this section, and this one here is split in this one and this one here. Once that I have this, I can even take H polish just to give it like a little extra uh, clean pass, let's just say. Very slick series of operations you've just demonstrated there with yes. batting an eyelash. Did you catch that? I caught it all. <laughs> it. It's a good thing it's being recorded. We can watch yeah, it again yeah. later and watch regular it again and again. Speed. Yeah, I'll tell you, this is really rinse and repeat. This is like, this, like when I do like my streams and everything, like I always tell people, you always need to start working on like this part, this part, this part. Right. And it feels like it's always like this three three steps that uh, is just going to help you in the long run. So um, the first step was like the basically the um, the piece itself. The second step was its edges, and the third step is its uh, planes. So right now what I'm doing is I'm just making sure the planes are readable, 
and I've used the edges right before to kind of like insist on where there's a plane change. Once that I have this, I'm actually pretty much ready to get my, uh, my final mesh for this character. So what I'll do, uh, my final mesh will be a Z-Ray mesh, but right now it's uh, kind of like a uh, Dyna mesh. So what I'll do is I'll simply start to kind of like select the areas that I want to be really like the different planes. Since they're really visible, because <coughs> I've used the, uh, the cavity and everything, I can simply go over like this, hide them, give them different poly uh, groups. There we go, and now uh, all of my planes have like these like different sections here. And by the way, I mean, there's going to be other planes on this character later when I'm gonna be placing the mid-level details and that sort of stuff, but this is pretty much like uh, what I do is I break down like what's major shapes and then what's like the other like less, um, like, um, how could I say that, less um, like elemental things, let's say. So, uh, these, I do these because what I want to do is before I said remesh, I want to put the uh, keep group option on. And what I'll do is I'll simply click Z remesh with my keep group. And it's going to give me, uh, oops, I actually put the resolution too high. So let's go back and try with uh, maybe a th around like a thousand polys. Yeah. There you go. Okay. I'll just do that again. All right, so for most of it, it's pretty good. Uh, I got like a little artifact here and I could actually just like try to, to, um, to fix it by hand. Or what I could do, sometimes when I get like stuff like that, that happens, I just try to use like the other uh, Z remesh option, which is like the one where you click, um, you click uh, the alt. alt. The alt key. Yeah, yeah, the alt key, exactly. I cannot use it in my shortcut. You see, like, it actually gives me, like, something different, so that's good. Um, so when I, when, I, when I get this, sometimes you'll get, like, meshes like this, but most of the time you can actually get some pretty good results, and you can always fix it by just reapplying another Z remesh on top of it, and you get something that's actually pretty clean uh, really fast. So you might say, like, oh, but you lost, like, it, it, got, it got, like, like smoother and stuff. And, yeah, sure, it, it did, but, I mean, it's never like something that you cannot like repair uh, relatively quickly. You can get back like the shapes that maybe might have been like too smoothed. Like even it, when the algorithm works like from the get go really quickly, I find that it's always better to just like start really working on having the shape that you want, the silhouette that you want at this stage here. So now you have this, you see it's much cleaner. You can already see like where I'm going in terms of like having it polished. So what I'll do is I'll do a little bit of the same of what I just did before, but like with this mesh now. So I'll start kind of like making sure that like the curves, the elements of this object are um, more in line with like the final result that I'm going for. So what I'll do is I'll look at it from like different views, try to make sure that the line flow of my, um, of my mesh is kind of like clean. Like if you look at this line here and the line that it does, at this point I'll try to make sure that like this aspect of it is um, is good, because it's probably going to be like the final state of this um, portion. So that was for the the line flow and that stuff. And now once I got the entire piece one, once I get the uh, the edges correct, so two. Now I work on three, which is the planes on the object. So what I'll be doing to get something clean is I'll actually hide them uh, one by one using uh, their polygroups once again. I'll just uh, use a material that is just easier to uh, see. And I'll just H polish things so that they look uh, like flatter, more hard surface, I'll do this for every section. I use a combination of alt and uh, not pressing alt when I use uh, H polish. Hey, what does the alt button do? 
Uh, it kind of like just like instead of like like pushing in the shape, it kind of like elevates it like a little bit higher. Well, Both definitely. of them are trying to flatten it to a certain like average, but there's still like a direction that it goes. And I find that it's really good. And another thing that I find that using the Alt key does is, for example, let's say I, 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 I use it like this. Look at this part here. If I don't use Alt, it's kind of like crushing this mm -hmm. part in. But if I use Alt, it's elevating it without really affecting like in the radius of the brush also. So there's that that you can use at your advantage actually. Uh, in this instance, I find that just like hiding sections like this is like works well for me. And although, although they're, they, they still like have like they're a little bit bumpy between themselves, uh, this will be fixed in another step I'll show like right after. And the final one, like for this curved uh, section here, I won't be using H polish because uh, um, the thing about H polish, since you're flattening stuff, sometimes you might lose a bit of like your, uh, your curve. And one thing that I find really um, works well for me is using sm the smooth brush, but by removing the shift key from... Um, the alt smooth. Yeah, like the alt uh, smooth. I, I, I call it the smooth relax. Like I don't even know if it's yeah. his name, but... It's a, a smart polish smooth brush, which is now it's called officially alt smooth. Alt smooth? Because we All shipped right. it now, you can actually make that your default. Can I still call it smooth relax? Yeah, yeah. Call it I call it relax. Awesome. In fact, that's how I explain it. I explain it more as like you're relaxing the topology yes. more than pushing. You're holding I, I like to go a little step above and say it's like Superman. I'm not pushing Ooh. through the wall. Oh, look at this. I'm thing. just only climbing the wall like Spider-Man. Just good. relax. Just relax. Just relax. So I could, have, I could not have said it in better words because that's what I'm trying to do with this mesh here. If I use, use H polish, like I'll probably start like crushing the, um, uh, this like curve here. It's not a big curve, but still H polish is gonna start like flatten stuff and I might lose um, like the volume that I have. Uh, and Alt will kind of like elevate it, but add like planes to it. So the, I feel that like using, um, so it's, it's smooth and it's not the normal smooth because normal smooth is basically going to like flatten your mesh also, you see? But by using, so you press shift, you click on the screen, you remove your finger from shift and now you smooth. And it kind of like does not, you see it didn't destroy my volume, but it did relax pretty much everything so that like I get rid of like the uh, more like uneven aspect of this mesh. So now you see it kind of like looks huh. pretty clean. It's like a Tuesday afternoon smooth, very yeah, relaxed. Exactly. It's a Taco Tuesday afternoon smooth. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and yeah, there's one last thing that I do in order to really like bring it to like its maximum level of polishness. Uh, but this one requires that I create a thickness for the the, the piece first. So I'll. I'll just do a little, um, little panel loop. I'll use my shortcuts once again. I pretty much put all the sliders to the minimum. I just decide of like the, 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 the good thickness and I press uh, ignore groups because I have polygroups, right? And I don't want to create uh, different meshes. I want it to be all one mesh. Mm -hmm. I click panel loop and now I have uh, my thickness here. So it's pretty cool, that's pretty great. And uh, from there, from there, from there, um, I'll just make sure that um, all of the hard hedges or hard corners, or at least the corners that I want to keep um, kind of like sharp and stuff, I'll just make sure that they have creases. So first step, I can already tell ZBrush, hey, you know what, everywhere there's like po different polygroups, I want you to create, to add creases. So crease polygroup, now there's like dots on the, on the lines here. I know this is gonna stay sharp. And I do the same for every corner I want to, to keep sharp. Uh, my favorite way is to actually use a Z, the Z Modeler tool. So I just switch to Z Modeler. If you go on an edge, you can choose Crease Edge, and then you just click every edge that you want to uh, keep uh, hard. You could also use um, um, Polygroup by Normal to kind of like let the, the, so the, the software uh, do um, like basically choose where to press to put the polygroups and stuff uh, creases well polygroups and creases But I kind of find that doing it manually like this works pretty uh, rapidly as well. So there we go So now that we have that uh, this is pretty uh, pretty like um, Important in the pipeline because what it does is that if you subdivide so you see I'm subdividing but I keep uh, the hard edges where I want Okay so this is where I'm going for with the creases. 
But I'll just do one last step before doing that, and it's to add this final level of uh, smoothing. First of all, I'll create a store morph target just in order that I can come back to this state of the mesh if I want. And what I'll do is I'll go in deformation. And you see, like, all my tools are all, like, one next to the other, right? So everything I'm showing with my shortcuts, I just get to do them, like, extremely rapidly because they're all there. But just to show you, like, this is where you would find it, polished, crisp edges. And with polished, crisp edges, you'll see that all of my surfaces that still have, like, artifacts and stuff are going to get pretty much, like, to their, like, most smooth that they can get. So polished, crisp edge, I just, I don't put a lot. And you see, it's already, like, much much smoother. See before, after, before, after, works pretty well. And the reason why I did a morph target, it's because if you look in this area here, it got pretty round, and maybe that's not what I want to do, but with... You made that look really simple. I'm a, I just want to say to you... It is simple. Oh, yeah. It is simple. It's just that, like, you kind of, like, have to understand, like, the way to go by it so that the, 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 the tool really, like, responds the way that you want it to respond, right? right? Like, you have to give it a chance. And this is why I did the preparation before to really make it, like, the kind of curve that I want and the kind of edge that I want so that this, like, more, like, automated process just makes it clean, like, instantly at this point, at this, like, moment. And, uh, yeah, so... Um, so I'll just grab my morph brush, and because I saved the morph target, everywhere that I paint, I'll just get like the shape how it was before. So, uh, like I'm pretty happy with the rest of the result, but like that curve here was a bit too uh, polished, and this is how I prefer it. At this point here, I pretty much have uh, the mesh how I want it to be, with the uh, surfaces all cleaned and everything. So I can go for the actual subdivision of the mesh, and what I'll do is I'll simply tell him to, to, like, to, to do a crease level of, let's say, uh, one, so that my first subdivision stays a hard surface, and my second subdivision actually starts to smooth where my creases are, so that it creates kind of like a little like round bevelly um, like aspect to my mesh. If you find that this is too round, you can always go back before it smooths, putting to two of crease level, give it another, cre uh, another crease level, and then uh, when you subdivide, it gives you that round crease, but this one is tighter than the first one. So it really just depends on like if you're going for tight creases or more rounded creases, mm -hmm. basically. So uh, you have this. The next step afterwards, it's like, it's like another chapter, let's say. It's more about like creating the, the mid-level details, because now you have your mesh, and this is the mesh you're gonna keep for pretty much the rest of uh, the time that you're working on this character. So at this checkpoint here, um, you need to like know that you're not really going to need to do much more like changes that have to do with the topology of the mesh. So we're really going into like sculpting now at this you're committed. point. Committed. You're committed. You're committing committed. to something. Committed. A point of no return. Well, like I said, it's kind of like point of no return E. But at the same yeah. time, there's kind of like ways to go at it, right? Because I can always right. just like said remesh what I have, tell him to keep the polygroups, reproject. There's a lot of tools that I can have. Mm -hmm. It's just that they, they're not going to be the quickest way to get to your, your ends, right? So you kind of like want to just be thoughtful at this moment because it's kind of like point of return E. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, at this point, since we're not really going to change the mesh anymore, that's when I'm going to start using the layers just to like be able to do like before and after on my work. So I'll add this layer and I'll start to add uh, mid-level details to this mesh. Um, my style is that I always start with like some uh, trim details and the way that I go at it, I'll just show you um, the way that I did it for the horseman, is basically just to um, isolate the edge, uh, shrink it, and at some point, Control shift S people. Control shift S. And yeah, control shift yeah, X yeah. for grow and shrink. <laughs> grow and shrink. Exactly. X. And once that you have actually the section you want, you can mask it and you can just inflate this. Uh, once again, I'll use the transpose line with right click, and it's just going to inflate Ooh. it, and you're going to get like this um, this edge right off the bat. And uh, something else that I could have done right before that is save a morph target of this, uh, inflate it. 
and then I can decide that maybe some parts of the, the, the model should not have like an edge. So I can basically just like give it like, um, like a, a certain like uh, look. Uh, it's like offsetting from just like a, a constant mm -hmm. uh, edge like this. And uh, or something I like to do sometimes is, uh, it's once again, it's the morph brush. I just put the focal shift to like almost 100 and you just like take a section, maybe like this one here, and you just press like not too long on it. And you can have kind of like a halfway like of the, 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 the length of this. So it just adds like a bit of, um, of uh, I don't know, like uh, yeah, a offset. Change, yeah, a of variation. Change, yeah, a variation. Line. Sure. Yeah, there you go. There's different type of layering happening. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There seems to be a theme today with layering. Are there you right? watching oh, yes. leather? Leather upon leather with the uh, yeah. God of War mm -hmm. team, and now That's he's true. doing it. Yeah, correct. We find That's ourselves true. in the shot here live yeah. with Marco Pluff. It's all about layers. It's Summit all about layers. Yeah, I think my next, the next time I come here, I'm just going to talk about layers. <laughs> I, I, I say it right now. I come here for the fourth time. Just there layers. That's the theme. Layers. Uh -huh. so, to rule them all. One layer to rule them all. <laughs> <laughs> so this is one thing that I like to do. Um, another way that I, I like to play with the, uh, the trims here is to uh, take a mesh that would actually, kind of like damn standard when you use out, it kind of like uh, pushes thing out and it pinches it. Well, this is one brush that's called Orb Crack that I like to use a lot. And uh, when you use out, it uh, basically does this kind of like edges uh, here. And um, something that I like to do is, for example, I can take, um, I'll just use another layer. Once again, I'll mask like the front, but I'll keep the, the thickness uh, masked. I'll bl just blur it a little bit. And you can basically like take a section of your mesh, maybe a little bit bigger than that. And you can basically like manually add like um, a... Um, like a ridge. Yeah, a ridge, yeah, exactly, yeah, a ridge to it. Uh, sometimes you can even like mask like a portion of it like this. And then when you draw it, you, you have it already like sectioned off like this. I find this actually works pretty well That's as cool. well. And uh, so yeah, this is uh, something else. I, I actually did it on the character here, you can see. This is how I did this uh, portion. Um, of course, there's always the masks and everything. This is one of my favorite. Uh, anytime that you want to just like have your entire surface kind of like um, uh, I'm gonna say layer again, I'm sorry. It's fine. Kind of like yeah. layer in Do it. or whatever. You can just like mask it off. You find like a shape that's appealing, that, that, that uh, follows the, the line flow of your model, All right? You can have it like this. And um, my point is, is going to be to, All right, there we go, it's clean enough, I guess. If you move it, you can just like add like a different like layer on the model, but there's many things that you can do before that. You can always, you can like move it just like on the side here to kind of like create like a, like a tapered, um, a tapered uh, leveling, let's say layering, whatever. And this is by, basically, basically this is done uh, with the move brush and using the alt key, which is basically going to push the mesh in the direction of the normal of the polygons. Uh, I really love this, uh, this brush. And, Something else that you can do uh, to the, uh, the masking just to have more variety is at this point, uh, maybe I'm gonna lower the resolution here. At this point, you can always play with the, the blurriness and the sharpness of the mask to kind of like round things off. So you see, I, I uh, blurred and sharpened. I will do it again. And the more that I do it, the more that like the shape itself becomes round. Uh, what I like about that is because it rounds the corners here. So sometimes I'll actually do a couple of them just around the corners, and then I'll remask another portion that I don't want it to be rounded, and it creates this kind of like shape where like these corners are rounded, these ones are a bit more sharp. So it's just more things that I can do. More things that you can do is you can also uh, blur with uh, control, the control key, which is basically going to blur in one direction of the mask only, and it creates for very cool like fall off effects when you push it in. So you see that like you have uh, the, the rounding and then like this edge here is sharper. So this is another like profile of uh, the mask that it creates and uh, I think it's pretty cool. But for the example, I'll use this one and I will basically move it like this. 
There we go. So now I have like this detail here. I always like to uh, give it just a little smooth afterwards. This may be too much. Just to kind of like blur it a little bit so it's not too, too sharp. And now you have this. And this is basically like the way that I go by uh, using my, uh, my masks. You can of course uh, do it like much bigger than that. You can go, you can go and pass like planes. It doesn't need to be isolated into like a, a section of your mesh. So there's like a lot that you can do in terms of uh, like using mask to control your shape. That does not look good, but uh, it could be. But if you use your imagination, you <laughs> well <Yeah>. placed. <laughs> I have that song in my head. Don't do it. We're gonna get it. Don't do it. Don't do it. We're gonna get tagged on the on the feed. So um, yeah, another tool that I like to use. Uh, this one is a fun one. This one uh, I get a lot of reaction when I use it. Uh, so trim hole. Um, so basically what it does, it just like takes the angle of the camera and it just like pushes, it pushed the mass like uh, forward. But if you actually move the cursor and you take like an angle to it, sometimes you can have like instantly some like pretty cool like effects, like something like that. Um, you can always smooth it or add some lazy mouse in, in case like you have like uh, strokes within like this section here. But the idea is that you can basically push your mesh uh, like this and get some pretty cool results um, just by like like experimenting with like the angle of the mesh and the movement of things that sort of stuff so you just play around figure out you, you'll find cool stuff to do and um, the other one is uh, trim front trim front is kind of like the same idea it's going to take the angle of the camera and um, I like to place uh, a a small circle alpha on this one. And what you do is you just calculate like the angle of your, uh, of your mesh and if you use out, it's just gonna bring everything to the same level depending on the angle of the camera. And this is how I do like those kind of like details here. Like it's pretty rapid to be able to do something that looks like a, it's just responding to a, like a portion of the, the surface. So uh, I like it. It looks old cool, school. are you kidding? Yeah, they're old school ones. Yeah, yeah. They're old school. Little nibs. They are, they are. But you see, it's like, that's that's just to say that like um, the things you can do with like simple brushes and ZBrush, yeah. depending on like the angle of this and that or whatever, you can join like, just a couple of things together and it just like creates a new effect. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can fall on like a very cool visual language that you just use for the rest of your career afterwards. Yeah. Like I do. He says <laughs> fall into a visual language that you use yeah. for the rest of your career. That's actually well said. You, you, I'm glad you said it. Are you kidding? Well, me? You, you added the first part to it that I was like, oh, that's a better way of saying it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like that needs to go on your website. Maybe, eh? Yeah. There you go. I have yeah. to hire you guys for like PR and stuff. Hey, no. Hey, no. Huh? Hey, oh. <laughs> hey, oh. Um, of course, mold lines is uh, something uh, very um, important when you do yeah. uh, hard surface stuff. Um, basically, mold lines, I like, I, I use two profiles of uh, mold lines. The ones that uh, the dam standard gives me, which is pretty much like a, like a, a round fall off and then like a sharp edge, and orb crack, which gives me uh, two hard edges. So depending on like maybe the other um, visual language that you used on your armor, you'll decide to go for like one profile or the other. But this is pretty much like what I'm going for. So you take orb crack, you go in strokes, you basically maybe augment the lazy radius, and you'll, get, you'll just get like more control over um, doing the lines here. Um, so for example, let's say I take it here. I save the amorph target because I know that I'm going to maybe like draw over things that I don't want to draw over, like this thing here. Uh, so basically, at any point, I can always just go here and I can um, get it back. Actually, sorry, no, I didn't do it correctly. There we go. Like if nothing happened. And this I would do at the end after I'm done with all my, my, my when my mold lines are done, so I don't do it for every line, right? Mm -hmm. And once that I have this, I like to add some, um, some offsetting or some variety to the mold line so that they're not like just always constant. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll just add like a, an extra line inside. I'll just take like, a, like a, a bigger radius and I'll just do like a line on a line so it just it has like a portion of it that's been kind of like... Um, uh, a line on a line. A line on a line. It's made me think of Dracula for some reason. Mm. 
and you can just use also the uh, uh, the standard brush if you want to do like a like a lip a little, here. A ridge. Yeah, some ridge. Really so basically, it's just to say that once you've drawn a line, you can add on top of it just to like make it a little bit more like rich, right? Because you're not going to want to make uh, mold lines like this everywhere and make it too busy. So sometimes what it's fun is to make one line but add complexity to this line and it's going to make the entire thing look like rich without looking too um, busy. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so there's that. And um, I mean the last thing in terms of like uh, the, the shape themselves, it's pretty much just like IMMs at this point. So the way that I go by adding IMMs is I always create a new, um, a new mesh. And this, me this mesh will, I will remove all the layers, all the subdivision levels. And I can actually just start placing uh, IMMs on them. So you just take anything from any library that you have, something that looks kind of, uh, kind of cool. And uh, it's just a matter of placing it, good old IMMs. And once I have this, I just make everything disappear but the IMM. I delete what is hidden, and I have uh, my two subtools here uh, together like this. Uh, once you have one IMM in place, this is where I'll be like placing other IMMs using this uh, subtool because it doesn't have layers or uh, whatnot, so you won't have any like um, warnings of like, oh, you can do this because there's layers and that sort of stuff. So yeah, um, and IMMs, um, I mostly use IMMs for like those kind of like small details, maybe like belt buckles or like buttons like this. Um, sometimes like, uh, like circular joints on the character. But I try to not use any IMM for like what's my major shapes of my character. That I, I try to have like agency over it. Mm -hmm. So it's always going to be for like smaller stuff that like I will be uh, personally uh, using them. So... Um, now we're getting into like more like detail stuff, but detail stuff, I find that it, th there's not like really like much to say because in the end, uh, I find that like detail is more about uh, visual language than anything because all my detailing, most of my detailing at least, it's all done using just like the simple brush and placing alphas and stuff like that. So it's really a matter of just like figuring out uh, shapes that you think look good on your character and trying like placement until like it actually like resonates. There, there's there's an old theory about like uh, details and choices and that sort of stuff, right? But that's a whole other book, for sure. But the idea is that you can get like a lot done just by having like a few alphas that you find inspiring and just like testing like how does it look in like certain areas. The one tip I would give is a bit like I said for the line, is try to not, not add details everywhere. Just have specific areas that like you add details there and put your details right there. So it creates kind of like a balance of like empty sections and sections where there's like details and what. Can I interject for a second? Some breathing room. Yeah. What? Speaking of breathing room. Yeah. What's the resolution on this piece right now? The like in terms of like uh, the polygon polygons? count. He's asking polygon count. How many polygons are on that? Thing? Um, it's. Uh, there are no subdivision ten? levels, correct? One million. Ah, okay. One million. One million. How many subdivisions you got on there? Uh, five. Five. There you go. And, and he doesn't does remesh, right? You don't remesh this because it's already no, remeshed. It's already no, remeshed. this is yeah. This is really like chat. the final mesh. Yeah, the that's final it. Mesh. And it's quite simple. I mean, I, I just wanted to draw people's attention to that. It doesn't have to be sort of a, a gabillion polygons. It's only a million, mm -hmm. and it looks that tight and smooth because of all the planning. I just wanted to pause and give people that kind of moment to reflect on that. Yeah. You know what's interesting also about oh, that me. is <laughs> you. <laughs> it's um, the. Um, in terms of like working fast, you have also to be smart about like how dense your mesh is because like even the best computer at some point is going to start to uh, is going to start to have problems. Like chug chug a like, lug me. Pardon? Like chug chug a lug me. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> hey, listen. Absolutely. We're here live. Yeah. So basically, um, the um, the the the. Uh, Jesus Christ. Um, I really yeah. threw you off with that one. No, 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 that's good. The polygon. That's sorry, good. I really took We're you. We're all good. Oh, chug, chug, a lug me really threw him off. <laughs> exactly. it's, it's really <laughs> just, you got me on a journey right <laughs> there for a second. <laughs> <laughs> just, I didn't need it. I needed a flashback of a different time. He needs reflection time on that one. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I was on the Take a water break for a minute here. <laughs> take a sip. Everybody have a sip. Everybody, Everybody have a sip. Have a you sip. at home, too, take a sip of water. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> I should have taken the cue that it was actually time for water. 
It wasn't, but you had a look on your face like you'd gone, <laughs> like I'd taken you back to like some sinful nights in Montreal. Exactly. <laughs> time stopped for me. I went on I a did, I years saw it. journey. <laughs> now I'm back here. I'm just like, like Brutopia, circa 2002. <laughs> I'm on stage right now making a presentation. What's happening? Exactly. So, uh, <laughs> at this point, at this point, the uh, what I wanted to say is that since you talked about like resolution and that sort of stuff, for me, like there's two things I want to say. The first one is that. Uh, to be able to be efficient, I never try to go over what's my need in terms of subdivision. So what I'll do, I didn't show it, but about what I'll do is when I start adding subdivisions to my mesh, sometimes what I'll do is I'll just take an alpha that is kind of like, um, like an alpha that will be probably like the smallest that I think I'm going to go for my needs. And I'm just going to check like how it reacts to the subdivision, to the maximum subdivision that I give it. So maybe I would have like subdivide to four, place that detail, realize it's too pixelated, subdivide to five, check that detail and see like, okay, you know what? This has enough resolution for like the, uh, the, the, the renders that I'm gonna go for at the end. And contextualized resolution, not just yes. resolution for the sake of saying I have like, you know, this thing can has 10 million points, but in Absolutely. context, right? Absolutely, and this is, uh, I think it's very important because it, you'll, you'll get to really know like what you're going for, what you're aiming for, and you won't create like uh, excess, in especially in terms of stuff that is very like costly for like your processor or your RAM or that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. Uh, and in the end, you'll be able to work like on a full size character like death in one scene, just because you made those smart choices. So you basically have to tell yourself, well, okay, what am I doing? Am I doing a full character? Am I focusing on the head? Uh, what are the renders I'm gonna show at the end and know that like you might not need to go like so crazy on the details in this area or the like resolution or, yeah, or I've that, said that sort of for stuff. years. In intent should drive your workflow, you know, and in, in yeah. what is the intention, the final product, what is it for and, and yeah. you know, what are you but, trying to make and what for? But sometimes when you don't know where you're going, it's right. like you'll let yourself driven drive by uh you you'll let yourself be driven by like uh subdividing just because you want the resolution yeah. to be good without knowing what's really or chasing easy. design yeah. without having a, a clear path, you know? Yeah, exactly. And um, I just want to show you like this example here. Um, Look at this, Paul. Wow. So, um, like once again, like this is the uh, the print of a uh, death, right? Captain Happy, I call him. Yeah, Captain. <laughs> Exactly. Time for the last ride. Hey, he's having a laugh. He's having a laugh. It's not <laughs> so, because he looks crazy that he cannot... That someone's going to be having a laugh at that final moment. It yeah, ain't me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or maybe everyone. Uh, they don't Perhaps. Know. But basically, the, the point of like showing you this, uh, well, first of all, is because I think it's lovely. But the second reason is because um, talking about like what's the result that you're trying to get, uh, especially when it comes to printing, you're gonna want to basically know how small that you can get in terms of your detail sure. uh, and what's going to actually uh, translate once it's printed. Because depending on like if it's like a, like a one for one scale, one fourth, one tenth, whatever the size you're going for, uh, at some point you're not gonna wanna go like too fine into the details because it's just gonna look blurry at the end because it's not gonna print what correctly. What size is this thing? Uh, this one is one fourth, so basically it's like well, I don't know if like people are going to see, but whatever. Let's say like a little bit more than a half a meter high and half a meter wide. It's it's massive. It's really massive. It's gigantic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, half actually, a meter, half a meter. If you're going to do high, it, do it big. Yeah. Half a meter exactly. in height. There's probably like a picture here of like. And just to break this down for our folks watching all over the world, I uh, think that they is big. Have one on their site. Oh. That is big. Yeah, there, there was a uh, like I would need to. I know where there's like a picture. It's just I would need to look for it. But there's like Let a picture see. of like somebody beside the statue, and it's like. Like yeah, how many centimeters are we talking about? Uh, in centimeters? Yeah. Yeah, inches. like uh, in, in inches for the for the American. Oh, oh dude. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> how many centimeters? Math. How many it's, centimeters? Yeah, I mean, there's the actual size in the, oh, you, you see, you, you know what, there you go. You're asking me a question about technical stuff. It's written right here on this page. That's what I was hoping. There you go, dimensions in, well, millimeters. So, okay. there you go. How many millimeters? Whoop, uh, 450 by 510 by 840. Wow. So yeah, like half a meter wow. in. Uh, that is a big piece. Yeah, and also one meter in height because of, because of like the scythe and everything. Like it's this one. One meter in height? Almost. 550 millimeters is uh, like about 21 inches, 20, yeah. close to 22 inches. That's a big boy. For Americans. Oh, it's a big it's boy. It's a big boy. It weighs probably like close to 70, 80 pounds. Can I weatherproof it and put it in front of my house to scare the neighbors away? You can, you can. Yes. But I think somebody's pro probably just going to capture it and take it home. That's actually true. That's what I would do. Especially actually. where I live. 
And um, so basically, the idea is to know like what's uh, the end product. So the end product for this one was the, the statue you just you just saw. And because of like the scale, I knew that. What the Paul's I, doing over here. He's just doing a hand job. Yeah. It's well, 85 centimeters by 81 centimeters by 56. Is, how is yeah, exactly. Like I see myself in the the camera right there, and it's not. I can't even like do it. Like it's the frame is not even like. It's bigger than the frame he's in. Okay, so yeah. that gives us an idea. If someone at home is measuring this and put it on their shelf, <laughs> yeah, exactly. like, I'm gonna buy this. Please tell us. Right. How Someone's looking. Hey, ha that goes back to hashtag it. The right? measurement of your desk for Marco's thing. Hashtag yeah. ZBS22. It's a good challenge. <laughs> see who can fit it away? Well, that's the one they're supposed to be sending to doing their selfies. If you got a selfie out there, do it. Selfie how you're watching us. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. There's some good Correct. ones. I've been looking at them. There's some fun, fun ones. Look at this thing, though. I'm, can, can you maximize that screen? Look at this thing. Get me off the he screen can. and show the they people can. the pony. I mean, jeez. Yeah. Look at the detail on that thing. And it's two heads. Kendari, let's get the... Yeah, yeah there's two heads oh, switch my. out. This one also has, like, a, a hand switch out. I have, like, this one. Oh, you the, have a hand switch out, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, like, the grasping hand and the, the hand that has the, the, the you know, time... Oh, man, I'll tell you what I do. Did you make any compartment for the switching out, or they just... There's no compartment for them. Compartment? Yeah, I always wonder this with the hand switch outs and stuff and the head switch stuff for collectibles. Why we don't put something in the base that you can store when you're not using the That's one true, hand? Right? Underneath. So it's not just laying on your shelf, what right? You pull out a little thing, it's stored hey, there, it's nice. You need to go pack in there. this. Uh, right well, I'm saying, you're making them. <laughs> I want a little LED inside that thing. Oh. Yeah, I, yeah, that would be pretty rad. Yeah, that's that's the cost then to going up. Well, that's me. Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah, customize yeah, exactly. my own. Well, for this one, for this one, we wanted to go like artist series. It was like more relying on like the like the paint of it, like yeah. more like uh, traditionally, let's say. Look at this thing. Yeah. I mean. But it's nice to be that guy. Look at him. I'm happy. I'm really happy of what XM did with the, the paint job. Like I gave them a lot of freedom as long as they follow like the important ideas. Of you like didn't give them a choices. master. Did you just give them a ZBrush master or anything for painting? Uh, I gave them free. I gave them re renders. The renders that I had yeah. and like they did a first pass and then I was like, okay, well this like color needs to be like hotter or warmer. And I really just like made th these uh, th these uh, changes in case that it actually like goes a little bit too outside of like the theme right. of like what they are. But like. Choices for like how the skin would look, or like the some hues and stuff, or uh, like I was like, you know what, you're the experts. You know how it's gonna look once it's going to be printed, painted, and everything. And uh, like I trusted them a lot in, in those choices. And you know what, pretty happy with it. That's a great. That's a great look at that piece. Yeah, a great horse. So basically, wow, Paul. Um, to get back on track, the idea is like if you look at details like uh, this one here, or, like this little dot, like this little dot or at least, you know what, this little dot and this line right here, it's pretty much like the, um, like the smallest that I, I would actually go for in terms of deciding the scale of a detail. No, not you. He really wants to be in the shot, this one. I keep going. Second time or third time that guy's made an appearance. There's something to be yeah. said about it. He really wants it. He really but, wants uh, it. But if you look at hit here, like you see, like this is pretty much like the finest line that I will go for. Because when you do 3D printing, you kind of like have to be conscientious about um, yeah, the final result. The same way that like the uh, the perforation uh, here on the the cape, like this was pretty much like the size that I knew already that one fourth would look good. Because if I go actually smaller, they would start they would start to go to look really like shallow, and it would just not look good. So you really have to stop yourself a certain sometimes for like the scale of things and that sort of stuff. Um, and I like to go in between. I like to go as small as I can so that like it's nice for the renders, but also smart so that like it prints correctly. So I'm truly trying to hit like both worlds at the same time uh, as much as I can. Um, so yeah, so that was for the, uh, the, the the details and that sort of stuff. Let me get back on track. Where was I? Here. There we go. Okay. So yeah, detail placement, that's really just like what there is. It's, uh, it's all a matter of like choices and most of it I do just by placing alphas uh, like this. And uh, sometimes, uh, since I have a form lab at home, sometimes I do like test prototypes of sections. You have a form two or form three? Form two. Form I two. wish I had a form three. Mm. It looks really good. But uh, you know what, my form two is still like Rocks. incredible. It, yeah. The details I've are really nice. Too. Yeah, yeah, and I get like I can do my prototypes and stuff, and I can see that like things work well. And then when I send it to like a like a production studio or whatever, I I know that like it's gonna look like okay at the end, right. even yeah. better, right? Because they're better than me. It's just at least I tested. Um, Is the perforated cloth that you were showing was that micro poly? Someone was asking what the cloth was. It was like how I did pattern. it. Yeah. Oh well, you know what? That's exactly what I was gonna show. Look at this. There we go. You can't, this stuff right itself. It's all, all in the same mindset. Oh, that's incredible. Look at this. I'm gonna script it the thing even if I wanted to. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> so basically, the way that I go uh, at it is uh, I'll just like use UVs for uh, a lot of like this stuff. The moment that like a pattern really gets like over the entire character, I'll rely on uh, UVs to do this. So I'll start by working on a clone, of course. Even ZBrush tells you to work on a clone, so you listen. Yep. Uh, I'm gonna bake everything, make sure it doesn't have any subdivision levels. Uh, so once that you have this uh, here, okay, so we see the topology. All right, so uh, basically I'll uh, simply use the poly groups that I have, and I'll just make sure that my front section plus the thickness of it is on one poly group and that the back is on another poly group. Once that I have this, I'll simply tell him uh, split by poly group, make it symmetrical, and unwrap. And it's gonna go pretty fast. And if I put like a texture on it, you'll see that, uh, there we go. So I have like this texture, it's already placed symmetrically, if that's a word. And it if is. I do flatten, you can see it's already symmetrical, so you're all good. Um, I think Danny uh, Bell yesterday like showed a bit of like the UVs, and you, you see yeah, like you can the pretty much like orient them right away so that it really goes in the direction of your patterns and everything. And I find that like if you just like cut things on their seams or for metal plates, you cut them on their like what's the front, what's the back, you'll always have like the, the chance to put things in the direction that you want for it to look like. Um, I love that our presenters are watching the presentations and watching yeah. the presenters and coming <laughs> back and talking about each other before and after. Well, I was just trying to make sure like I don't repeat stuff no, no, too no, much as great. well. I'm like, when he showed that, I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna say a quick word. I think this one is a great one to compound. Go ahead. Yeah, for sure. So once I have this, you just copy UVs, you put it in your, uh, in your object here. Uh, so paste UVs. And uh, so now you can actually like have the same texture here just to confirm, you see, you're good, you're good. And the way that I go by is uh, I'll uh, create a morph target. I'm gonna work on a layer. I'm gonna go into surface, noise. I'm gonna tell him use UVs. I'm gonna use the plugin here. I'm gonna take spheres. I'm gonna say okay. And then I'll just, um, since we're doing something hard surface, I'll get rid of the noise. I'll just take the effect by itself and I'll, I'll reduce the plugin until I have like the size that I'm going for. Let's say this one. I'm gonna augment, actually I'm gonna not use any poly paint and I'm gonna play with the strength to know like how deep I wanna go and like if I'm going up or down. Once I got this, I click OK. Now it's on my mesh. For the moment, it's just a preview. But if I actually apply to mesh, it's gonna apply this uh, detail on my layer here. From the layer, I can duplicate the layer to double the intensity. Uh, I can merge it, so now it's on one layer. And from there, I can apply also a morph target to this, hide my layer, and just draw where I want this detail to, uh, to appear. So you get like a lot of control um, by having it done all over your character, and then you decide where exactly you want it to appear. Like right now, it looks kind of weird like this, like maybe it would be best if it's actually like maybe inside of a section, but that's basically like the way that I go by to use This guy's these. on fire. Yeah. So many tricks, many tricks. There's a lot more. They call sure. him Marco many tricks ploof. <laughs> There you go, Marco of all things. Yeah, Marco, many tricks. A smorgasbord of smorg tips and tricks. <laughs> <laughs> many tricks on a Tuesday. Tricky yeah. Tuesday. Bring the Tricky Tuesday. <laughs> Tricky, Tuesday. <laughs> Tricky Tuesday. Tuesday, live with the ZBrush crew. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, like, that's pretty much like all of the major tricks that I use when it comes to creating details and uh, medium details. So from, um, from this uh, point out, if you just use everything, and you apply it to all of the meshes of the character, you'll pretty much end up with uh, with this like fully um, fully finished uh, model here. Like once again, nothing that is on screen right now, or I'd say easily 99% of everything that you see on screen right now, I've just shown all of the tricks in my in the past minutes. So it's yeah, it's really just a matter of uh, rinse and repeat, uh, yep. going at things. And uh, there you go. Time check for you. You got about 19 minutes. 19 minutes? Yep. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. All right. 
Well, okay. Well, I have like two sections I wanted to talk about. The last one is not really that Take important. Take your time. Take your time. We'll so, get there. So uh, I'll just uh, I'll just jump right in into like the uh, the last portion that for me I think is really important for like the entire presentation in terms of uh, uh, posing the character, uh, posing the character in composition. So we're going to talk about well, posing the character. Yeah. Um, the demonstration I'm going to do is uh, something that takes a lot of time if you want to do it well. Uh, people think that like posing the character should be done like quickly and that you should not have to redo anything and that's not the case. That's the a bit idea, of a fantasy. Yeah, exactly. It's a fantasy. Yeah. But you know what? Sometimes it's, it works pretty well and sometimes you have to redo some parts. But the thing is that you have to be smart about it as well. And for having tested it on like close to like 60, 70 models, complex models, this technique work, you just have to know like what to be careful about. So when you're posing, actually, you know what, I'll just say I'm gonna do a little demonstration here, but if you wanna see like the full process on a character, just go on uh, chaosmasons.com, go at the bottom, go on our links, uh, you'll find our YouTube page, and on the YouTube page, if you check our playlist, there's one that's called um, Mantis. You're, so you're, you're doing YouTube, I shared your Twitch, so your YouTube? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the Twitch is the videos, it's just they're archived on YouTube as well, right? They just watch this for free on the YouTube. Well. You watch them for free. This is unbelievable. Yeah. yeah, they just have to. They just have gotcha. to injure me, and the rest is free. What so a time to be Sharing away. Sharing domain. away. Yeah, and uh, so you know what? While we're uh, while I'm I'm saying this, I'm just going to uh, delete a bookmark. few uh, a few meshes because one thing that you have to be careful when you're working with um, Transpose Master is that if you have like a lot of Z tools open, like I have right now, Z tools of like millions and millions of polygons, you kind of like have to be careful um, because it can actually make the software crash because this is like ludicrous, the amount of like things that I have in the RAM in this instance. So let me just delete those. All right, and I'll open and my- of course for the younger viewers watching, you would have named all of your tools. Correct. <laughs> they're named. They're named. Just checking. What a named your sub tool. You mean PM three D underscore six nine? Yeah, we know this. PM three underscore six two yeah. is not a name. No. No. Okay. No. Final seven. Final eight, eight. Final. Really, the final one. Really, six. really, really, the final. Yeah. Really. yeah final, <laughs> final. Final. The final with the change. This time, it's really the final. Like the name is just like. <laughs> and then my last name because they're submitting it to me as a student. Exactly. Not good. Yeah. Name your name your files. So, um, so basically, yeah, the, the, the YouTube was just to say that, like, I show the entire process. I spend, like, I think four hours posing, like, a fully mechanic mechanical character. So the proof is there. The technique works. But just to give you a bit of a taste of, like, what I do is, first of all, I always try to make sure that, like, the design of the character allows for, for uh, bending parts and that sort of stuff. So uh, for th these characters, I really try to make sure that, like, everything around, like, the, the waist here or, like, the elbow... Um, it's, it's like a material that can be flexed. And if not, if it's a joint, I really try to, I kind of like test during the blocking that if you turn the object around the joint that it's not going to penetrate with each mm -hmm. other, right? So uh, clip into each other. So this, I did that. Uh, sorry, I did this for this guy here. And for things like, for example, the, the shoulder here, I really try to make sure that things are kind of like modeled in a way that like things can slide into each other. So you see like all the plates here on the shoulder. Basically, if the character like lifts his arm, well, the, the plates can slide into one of each other. And this is gonna give me a lot of flexibility for placing this character into the, the final pose. So I, I, I try to make like smart choices like this. Uh, but at the end, uh, like my technique still works for uh, like a lot of um, different design decisions, let's say. I'm gonna show you, um, so okay, well, one thing that I can say as well is that I try to separate my model into sections. So for example, like the arms, I'm going to section them like this. Uh, the legs are going to be sectioned. And I'm gonna actually, sometimes I'm gonna pose like just a portion of the character. Like I could be posing this first and then the rest afterwards or even like a section like this. And the reason why I don't pose everything at the same time is just to give me a break. I'll place like a portion of it and then I'll commit my Transpose Master and I'll save my project and then I'll go back to Transpose Master. Because the thing is that at the end of the day, I have the, um, I have the, the, the final posed model already done. Like I'm posing the character over this model here. So it's like, 
I, I figured that out. What we were seeing at the mm -hmm. beginning of the presentation is like, there's no unknown or almost no unknown for me. You so I just need going. to pose you know my end character. Results. Like, you know your end results. You know yeah. exactly your end finish line. So if I pose my character on top of this guy here, there's nothing that's going to really like go wrong or at least nothing that cannot be like easily fixed afterwards. <clears throat> so the way that I'm going to go to do this is I'm going to figure out a section I want to pose. Let's say this one here. I'm gonna go into um, my Z plugin, transpose master, here, oops. And I'm simply gonna click on transpose master. It's going to make all the cal calculation necessary to uh, pose the character. And then uh, I'll start by putting into polygroups elements that I know that I might actually uh, pose one at the, at the same time or in two parts, let's say. The entire uh, underbody of the character will be one section and the plates will be its own section on top of be able to uh, separate them what is like the belt section and the thigh section. So I'll work with these three things here. Uh, since we're posing the character in, um, sorry. Since we're posing the character in a non-symmetrical position, I'll actually have different polygroups for uh, everything that's like symmetry and whatnot. And the legs here, the underbody, I'm gonna start by just like really quickly masking a portion of it just to be able to select it rapidly. I'll try to have it like follow kind of like the, the flexion areas of the body. Then I'll do the same for like the upper part here, like this. So. Those are my sections, and this one I'm also going to make non-symmetrical, all right? And I will add my final pose in this, um, in this file here. Warning, before uh, uh, committing the transpose master, you have to delete uh, this extra subtool that I added, or else it's gonna confuse the software. So just a reminder to delete this one here. But basically, we have our final model. Uh, I just need to pose uh, my polished model on top of this here. It's also important to note that you're, you know, you've posed it in a way that is not overtly extreme away from the standard uh, pose that you had at the beginning. Yeah. It's not going to be um, going from like an A pose to something that is drastically different. Uh, but it, it could though. It's just it that can, you, would need, you would need to plan ahead and like your, the pose, you would just need to make sure that like if the character is really going to do like an, a, right. an exaggerated like elevation like this, well, his giant shoulder maybe is not a good thing, right? That's exactly what I was hoping you were going to say. <laughs> and also, I mean, like in real life, it's like you have this much armor, you don't have flexibility, so don't choose like a, a, a position that doesn't work. Right. You're Anyways, broken the context of that design. Absolutely. So um, what I'll do is I'll start by placing the pivot. This is pretty much how I start like every posing of my characters. I'll just figure out like, like that the, just trying to make sure that like the angle is like somewhat what I'm going for. Uh, this one actually is gonna need to be rotated a bit like this. All right. And when it's time to place the limbs, I'm gonna actually add a layer just to make sure I can go back and I can simply mask, blur. And a little warning, a little warning over here. Um, it's always best to make sure that the topology of what's gonna bend is not drastically different one from the other. Because when you're blurring your mask, the spread of the blur is gonna act differently if your me mesh is dense or not dense. So like the blurriness, and I made it on purpose to actually make a little mistake here. But if you look at the, um, the tube here, it's very high and the thigh is much bigger than that. So because I blurred, uh, once you're going to place, like you're gonna move the character like this, the bending of the cloth, well, it doesn't really show, but the bending of, but bending of the cloth will act differently on the high density mesh and the low density mesh. So this is something you just have to be a little bit careful about. And uh, maybe you'll want to uh, remove some subdivision levels of your mesh just so that it uh, kind of like, um, uh, it's, it's more like averaged with the rest. Yeah, in essence, make every first level be relatively the same type of polygon size. Exactly that. So you're getting consistency with your bend and your masks. And yeah. all, on all of them as low as possible without degrading the, the design. Yeah, mm -hmm. keep that silhouette. Man, the three of us, we should have a show. Wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> we'll, t we'll talk about during the pause, I think. <laughs> yeah.
Chug, chug, lug me. So the <laughs> <laughs> I distracted him again. <laughs> so at this point, um, what I'll do is I'll take some of my meshes that were maybe like bent or that doesn't make any sense if like that they're curved, and I'm going to use the occasion to kind of like just straighten things out a little bit. And uh, this is something you can do also like at the end, but uh, it's, it's also something you can just do once that you know that like you've placed your thing correctly. You just like try to get rid of like any impressions of stretching just by replacing things correctly like this. And this is also why I made uh, some like more, uh, like some smart choice into like what's hard surface and what's flexible because areas like this, since it's gonna bend a lot, you just really wanna make sure that it's like an object that if you bend it, it's not gonna like remove the the nature of like what it is. So I'll do this, I'll, for example, I'll, I'll mask the, the armor here and I'll start like, oops, putting, it, putting things back into like place. And the reason why I do this uh, with Transpose Master is really just because like I get to move everything at the same time. I'll still do a pass where like every, uh, each of my subtools, I'll just scrutinize them and see if I've added any like bend, but this is basically like how I go uh, at placing them all together like this. And uh, also, I'll, sometimes I'll just hide them and um, I'll mask portions of them just to maybe like add some mass that I might have lost during the, uh, the move. And once I replace the mesh, if I see that my mesh are interpenetrating like this here, well, this is why I said earlier that like this entire like layering of object is, um, is really helping because when you layer stuff, you get to place them back afterwards. Um, you just have to find like something that looks just like, like. Would make sense. That makes sense, yeah, exactly. And also, by the way, don't, don't shy away from uh, using the move brush to move your things because the things, like move brush, the problem that sometimes like it can have is that if you use it like on um, if you use it on, um, on like a hard surface object, sometimes it can bend some areas that you don't want it to bend. But the idea is that pretty much everything can be bent without looking bent, except for stuff like primitive shapes. So stuff like the circle here, the moment that you bend it, now it looks absolutely off. But like plates that don't really have like very primitive shapes in it, you can move it and it's it's not gonna look like that bent. So the idea that like you cannot reshape a hard surface object is not true. You actually, you really can. It's just some stuff is more sensible to the eye um, and some is not really sensible. So you see this plate, which was hard surface, well, I pretty much like bend it to kind of like fill the holes and do all that stuff. And this is how I'm actually gonna go by to uh, place the entire character. And the one, Final thing, how much minute do I have? Uh, I would say probably... Seven minutes. Seven minutes. I seven was going to say that. Seven, seven minutes. minutes. Right. I thought it was timing you. So the one thing I'll say is that um, I've, I've shown that like I use like polygroups and masking and blurring to move my object. But like I said, sometimes the topology is just going to make things not really move equally. Like for example, if I take this upper body part here and I just blur it and move it. So... You see that like all the meshes are kind of like um, separating from each other and you're creating negative space. And I think a lot of things are not really like bending accordingly. So what I do to average this uh, mask, but to the same kind of like spread along all of the different meshes with their different density is I place my mask uh, by hand, just using uh, the mask with the, uh, the dot stroke like this. So really just by hand. And the reason why I do it by hand like this, it's because um, the, the, the radius of your brush will apply the same strength of mask everywhere on every vertices at the same intensity. It doesn't have to do with like the density of the mesh. It really like just makes it much more equal. So you kind of like have by hand to uh, make that kind of like fade or that gradient. But once you do, and you don't need to be like extremely um, like precious about like the spreading. After that, you see the way that it's gonna bend, it's not gonna do like all the separations and everything because the vertices were pretty much allowed the same kind of like movement and range. So you do this, you place it into position, and now you can actually keep your mask 
and already start to kind of like move the mesh around to give it more of like, um, like a flow that's gonna look maybe less like bent. Sorry, I keep pressing on the, the right. Uh, that's great, just keep doing what you're doing, looking good. <laughs> there you go. Marco, many tricks ploof here on a Tuesday. Uh, Tricky Tuesdays. There you go. Magic fingers. Zebra Summit, Marco 2022. Ploof. I really want tacos now. Yeah. Well, you Actually, you know what? I'm going for Mexican sport, yeah. after. Hey, thanks a lot, There pal. you go. Look at that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Perfect. We're here all week. Perfect. Think of yeah. us while you're eating that taco. We're down to, <laughs> we had about 90, what is it, uh, 180 seconds are left here, two and a half minutes. Three Perfect. Minutes. What did you say? Three minutes. There are about three minutes left. Okay. Well, you know what? That's, it's pretty much done. The idea is that, like, because of, like, that mask, I was able to move things in a way that, like, is not, like, really spreading everything around. Um, well, once I apply the, um, the transpose master to this, like, I'll just do it. Don't forget to delete that mesh. Yeah. Don't, oh yeah, don't forget. Uh, there we go, forget like this. Delete. And here, brother. Boom. Uh, transpose. So this is like the step where like if I had like a ton of Z tool open, it might actually be problematic. Uh, so now that I actually uh, remove from the RAM most of it, it's gonna find correctly like the mesh, it's gonna apply the changes, everything should be fine. So you see it's already moving things around. The best part about this, you get to see all the subtools. Mm -hmm. Somebody at home wants to know, what, what happens if I change my mind after I do that? Change your mind about what? Change your mind. About the pose, yeah. What happens if they change their mind? Then well, I mean, at some point, you kind of like have to commit, and this is why you, 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 you do a lot of iterations you could with do a walking layer. until yeah. you figure out which is the one you want. But the idea is that if you actually pose it like this and you, you still have changes to do, you can always go back and transpose master afterwards and replace it and do changes and whatever. So you can go and transpose master as much time as you want over this process until you figure out that the, the, the final posing of your character actually uh, looks good. Yes. So there we go. Uh, at some point, you must commit. Don't be commit. Uh, yeah, exactly. Plus, I mean, at this point here, like there's still like some stretches in some areas. Like I'll still go, go right. over like areas that were maybe a bit problematic and like move things around just to just remove a bit of the impression of the, of the, the stretching. But the idea is that those are the most problematic sections that I just showed you. The, like, the rest is much more of a breeze and you don't get much like distortion and that sort of stuff. So it ends up being like a really cool, um, like a really uh, viable way for posing characters that are pretty complex. And like any kind, any kind of, of character. Like, I mean, if you're posing a character that's organic with like anatomy and everything, you're still gonna have to like rework like how the anatomy is after like deflection. So the same idea that stuff have to be um, like fixed after this step is applicable to organic or to hard surface. Okay, so, let's finish with your model in, in its uh, entirety on the screen perhaps. Show the, show the yeah, whole Yeah, well actually, you know what? I'm kind of like, I'm loading, loading this model here. Okay, and oh, the, this is one of my faves. Yeah, the idea is just to, to, to show you that like at the same time, uh, characters, depending on like their style or, or, any, or anything, every trick that I showed here um, can be applied. Uh, applic um, applied. Applied, yeah, all the things. Can be applied to any style or anything like that, or I, at least the range of possibility is pretty vast. So for something that like looks compact like this, I'll use the same, same, same method to get the, the same oh, results and everything. So uh, the sky is the limit. Wow. It's an angel, right? It's, it's, it's the sky is the limit, and it's come to that time when we reach for the sky and stretch a bit and say thank you so much. Marco, many tricks, Ploof, here. Uh, merci beaucoup, monsieur. Ben, ça fait plaisir. Ma, et, superb, superb. For our <laughs> French correspondents and people at home, he's got a big smile on his face. We appreciate it. Uh, I'm Louis Tucci here live for the ZBrush Summit 2022 with Paul Gabry. We're going to send you off and we're going to do some giveaways. So thank you again to Marco Plouffe. And I'm sure their fans along, along all over the world are saying yes, 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 and more and more and more. <laughs> but uh, we'll be back after this with some giveaways. All right. Thanks. Awesome. So much. Thanks, Mayor. My pleasure. All right. Well, uh, that was amazing. Like I said, double seatbelt for that one. No ejection here. But I got a special, 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 one more time, giveaway. Special giveaway. This is involving Marco, actually. 
Marco has teamed up with the XMD people, and we're going to give away one of those statues. Come on, what a we're time to give be away alive! A war wow, statue, Magnus. right now, live. Can I we're do a jig? Let away. me do a jig. You gotta do a jig. Holy moly! Right. That's important. So one of you right now wow. is about to win the war figure from XM Studios that Marco just showed. The guy riding on the horse. It's, it's in pre-order right now. So obviously, if you're the winner, you got to give time for I, it to be. Put together, shipped to you. It's not something you're going to be able to get instantaneous. Is the word flabbergasted? And if you live in the Montreal area, I mean, if you're uh, walking the streets, you're running a Marco, hey, uh, I have a pen available. Je me souviens. Yeah. Je me souviens. <laughs> All right. So let's uh, let's take a look at the model. I got an image up so you guys can see what we're giving away. Of course, just to remember, look here's at this what thing. we're looking at. This thing, jeez, old piece. And we we went. It's big. It's big. It's big. It's big. Get that space. Someone said I only have room for it on my kitchen table. Well, guess what? Make Get rid of the room. table. Get rid of the table. <laughs> Make some room. Make some room. All right, here we go. Here's our winner for Marco's piece. All right, Martina Nimic. Nimic. Martina Nimic. I am going to put it in both chats. You are the winner of Marco's War Piece from XM Studios. Congratulations. That's a unique one. That's a big one for sure. Thank you for watching. I know we got some more stuff, though, to give away. I'm going to continue giving stuff away. I want to now give away a four-course bundle. Almost like I'm giving away a meal, speaking of that. All right, so let's do a XMD Academy. Four course bundle, four course bundle. That's four little works. That's four workshops for you to watch again and again. So here is our winner for that. Uh, Tatessa Naveen. Tatessa Naveen. Here you go. Let me put those in the chat so you have your name. You see it in the bright lights. You're in Hollywood. There you go. It's happening. Let's keep going, Louie. I keep wanting to give some stuff away. Mm -hmm. This guy's the mm -hmm. giveaway king. <laughs> yeah, I might Here as well have go. some power when I've got it. That's there the power go. of ZBrush. That's the power of the, my mouse. Here we go. And my keyboard, too. Tap a tap. All right, let's do a space chug, chug mouse a from 3D Connections, a space mount enterprise kit. Let's draw the winner for that and see who we have here for this. Rodrigo Gonzalez, Rodrigo Gonzalez, you are the winner of that wonderful giveaway from our 3D Connection friends. Once again, I've put it in the chat so you can see it. You know what? I'm doing one more. One more, he I'm says. I'm doing another one. one I'm doing more. another one. Why not? Wow. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Wow, mm -hmm. wow. Let's do this one. Let's do one of these. All right. Let's go ahead and put this one up. So we're going to do an all-access membership an all-access membership here. All right, so let's draw the winner for our all-access membership, ZBrush Jewelry Workshop. Let's draw the winner for that. Here we go, great set of instructors. You're gonna get Memo, Memo, Aber, uh, hold on, Alberto, Memo, Alberto. Here you go, let me put that in the chat as well. So you have that. And you know what, Louis? I'm gonna do one more. I'm feeling, feeling good. good. I'm feeling. I'm just it's feeling good. Raining, feeling generous. raining giveaways over here. Raining giveaways. Let's do. Let's do one of these. We haven't done one generous. of these yet today. We have not done Holy one of these. Smoke. There's more coming. Don't you worry. A one-year subscription to Nomen Workshop. So you've got a prefla as a I digital do. gold for digital PC. gold. Lots of artists wow. you can go and take a look at. You're gonna have one year to get just get so much. Brad, Brad, you are a winner. Brad LeMay, Brad LeMay, you are the winner for that Nomen one year subscription. The MIT of the CG world. And then listen, we're not done. We are not done. We've still got more presentations coming. We got still two more. We got a beautiful one that's gonna be about scan data, the scan truck. Look, we're gonna go inside the scan truck. I've said it, we're doing another one of these. You're gonna see right inside how photogrammetry works. We're gonna be looking at that. And then we have our friend Ara is gonna be showing us how you can use scan data. And don't forget, we still have Pixar with Lightyear too today. Stay and tuned. All these other giveaways. So we look forward to seeing you. Don't go anywhere. We'll see you soon. Bye for now.
Learn jewelry design and object fabrication through ZBrush. Expert, beginner, and every skill level in between. ZBrush Jewelry Workshops can help you bring your digital dreams into reality. Taught by leading industry professionals. Use the offer code SUMMIT to get a $100 discount on membership.
Hello again, people at home and around the world. Day two continues here with the Zebra Summit 2022. Paul Gaber with his arms reaching for the sky. I am Louis Tucci, and I am flabbergasted by what I have seen and the stuff that has been shown. I'm sure you are, too, watching at home. The saga continues, Paul Gabry. We are about to do something, another behind the scenes, on location unique. with our- Unique, another unique. Unique, unique. Is, a, is an understatement, brother. This is the future of everything hip and cool, and we've got our very own um, on location, ZBrush correspondent and fellow teammate, Ian Robinson, is gonna take us there. But right now in the studio, I wanna introduce old time ZBrush friend, and the guy's been with us in the community for a number of years. We're happy to see him here on the green screen set, the Mobian Studios in sunny Burbank, California. We've got uh, Ara Kormenikian, and he's here waving hello at the people. Let's get a shot of Ara. Say hello. We're going to go live with the scan truck outside, and we're going to be... Uh, are we doing a scan? We're doing scan. Are we're we scanning scan you or me? No, no, no. We're not no, scanning we're not me, scanning are we? Me or you. No, we're not Look scanning at this. you. No. Are you kidding me? Look no, at all that hair. We're not scanning you. Okay, we're going to be gonna scanning also... Ian. Ian. We're scanning Ian. Yeah, we're scanning Ian. A scoundrel. Yes. I can't believe it. No wonder, he didn't say, no wonder he was so coy. He said, oh, I'll do it. I mm -hmm. said, okay, cool. Here we go. So without uh, without further ado, it's going to be Ara Kermanikian, Jigs Love, and Vlad Gallet taking us on a wild ride through the 3D Scan Truck Tour. And I am Louis Tucci and Paul Gabriel. Let's take it over to Ian live now in the parking lot. Awesome. Well, hey, welcome everybody. My name is Ian Robinson. I'm with the Maxon team and I'm here in Burbank, California. And we're looking at this massive truck behind me called the Scan Truck. And we're going to take a deep dive on what happens with photogrammetry in this thing. So come with me. Let's do a ride. Paul, Louie, always awesome to chat with you. So if you have any questions or the audience does, feel free to bug me. But let's see what this is all about because it's wild. <laughs> <laughs> hey, welcome aboard the Scantrex hey, spaceship. Thank you so much yeah. for having me. How are you doing? Thank How's you, it thank going? you. It's going good. So, who are you? Introduce yourself, please, so everybody can uh, know yeah. who you are. Yeah, I'm, I'm Jigs, and this is Vlad, and uh, we built the scan truck here. This is actually the second version looking of it. Good, guys, uh, looking version. good. Yeah, of the rig. Um, but we built the original one in my garage. Classic, what? classic story, right? No, no, you really? That's <laughs> yeah. awesome. Yeah. Cool, dude. Yeah. Awesome. So, like, I'm seeing a lot of stuff, and I'm sure the audience is like blown away already just by the presence of this. But I'm seeing a little pup over here. Can you explain <laughs> what, what is this? Is so this, the this is yeah, this is the late Shmoo, uh, my my English bulldog that we 3D scanned and then uh, lock over at uh, there. You have it 3D. Uh, 3D printed him and made us a golden schmoo nice. to uh, have him always with us, which is wow. kind of our, he's kind of our mascot. That's super <laughs> cool. And that happened here. Yeah, yeah. So come on in. Uh, check yeah. this out. Cool. So this is, like I said, this is the second um, version of our photogram mobile photogrammetry studio. Um, this one is 160 DSLR cameras. We have the Canon SL3s. Um, we have 216 custom LED cross-polarized strobes. Wow. Um, so essentially, we'll do this with you in a bit, but essentially, the person stands here in the middle, stands in this position, and we take a, an, a photograph from every angle all at once, wow. and then reconstruct that into a 3D model, yeah. where we give that to someone like you, and ZBrush to go in and clean it up. Perfect. And you know I'm gonna wanna do that. Yeah. <laughs> this is perfect. Cool, cool. So all the magic happens here. You take the shot, but there's more to it than that, right? It's just not a click, click, we're done. It has to be processed in some way. Yeah, that's where that's Vlad's department. So cool. he, he runs our post processing division and Yeah, so we got our uh, mobile workstation here. So we got this is kind of like the, the mission control. 
So we got a computer that's operating the rig, so we can actually scan from this laptop. Wow. And the reason why we picked a laptop is because this is actually really easily replaceable. <laughs> okay. So we got we got a bunch of these on the truck in nice. case we need to like switch them out. Um, and then we have our main operating workstation, and this is the beefy machine. Okay. So up in the front of the truck, over the the cupola area, we got a server rack with a powerful machine, so that we can actually process the data on site. Nice. So okay. We can scan, process. Um, we got an onboard generator, so uh -huh. we can actually power this entire rig, Ooh. and we can go and scan anywhere. So this is 100% mobile. So anywhere in the world where this truck can actually be, you guys take it. So have you gotten to like some crazy wild like, like locations, fun locations you guys? Been? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for Dune, we were out in the desert. Uh, that yeah. was pretty awesome, uh, and it was actually kind of nice for the elements when it was super hot. We got three ACs on board, <laughs> so we're kind of chilling. We had crew members kind of coming in and hanging out and being like, "Oh yeah, I'll be back in a couple minutes." Nice. Um, but yeah, and also just going to celebrities' houses and stuff. You what? know, yeah, being able just to kind of like zip in and zip out with this rig. The other rig that we just built uh, is even bigger. Um, that one's uh, based out of Atlanta right now. Okay. Um, and that lends better to places with more space. Okay. So like LA, you've got some older studios and things. That, you know, this 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 is a 24 foot box truck. So this nice. is this is right at the at the brink of <laughs> the wind is hitting us right now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> See, feeling that cross. Yeah, track, I right? love it. This, this is great. It's great space. I mean, you're cozy too. Look yeah, at this. we got to keep nice it couch. comfy, especially yeah. on set. You know, you're on 12, 14 hour days. You want to be comfortable and yeah. And we always try and create a fun vibe for people on here, you know, and play music, and um, it's good. Nice. Yeah. So where can this technology be used? You know, my first guess is, okay, I want to be put into a video game or maybe a film or maybe 3D printed, but, like, what is the range that this technology really takes you? What can you implement it in? Sure, we'll go over some of that. We'll show some examples. Um, I mean, everything from, you know, AR, VR, film, TV, all things metaverse, yeah. you know. Um, I mean, Stables. video games. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're, yeah we've been we, we've we've just now started to get more into the games, which is fun. They've got a lot a lot bigger volume too. You start doing like sports teams and stuff oh, like that. Cool. And it's really cool because it's like you know the the, the applications are endless, yeah. and and you know just watching the technology explode in general yeah. and being kind of on the cutting edge of that. I mean, it's never a dull moment, for no. sure. <laughs> no, you, you must be enjoying it, because this yeah. is super awesome, cool. Well, you mentioned some Yeah, let's check clips. it out. Let's check those out. Yeah. You want to cue it up? So we're not going to have audio on these, so maybe we can talk about some of the stuff that you're seeing quickly cut through. There's the truck. <laughs> <laughs> that was the first version of the rig. So you'll notice we painted everything white in there. And that was using specular light. Okay. So, and that was different cameras, different lights, different rig. So we ended up just shredding this rig, taking everything out, and um, painting the room black. And now we're going cross polarized light, wow. which actually gives you a lot of like subdermal blood flow, a lot of the d the details that you wouldn't get okay, um, cool. with specular. I saw a lot of posing of the faces too. Like, yeah, you can you can get different facial expressions and then be able to. Just so I, you want to be screaming, I can be screaming. Like yeah. that's yeah, it doesn't always have to be stoic. Or is is there a, a time and a place for that to be put in? Yeah, you know the more uh, facial action coding system poses that you scan, uh, the more abilities you have to show with your blend shapes. Nice. So I mean, technically you could take one neutral scan and start morphing it, but it's just not going to look as real as if you get these real dynamic yeah. expressions. So some, sometimes you do upwards of you know 100 plus facial scans and create all those blend shapes. Yeah. Um, so that's yeah. good for anybody who's into blend shapes and trying to get into some more crazy animation, but with lifelike, this could definitely help with that process. That's totally. really cool. That's really cool. Yeah, it's like one of those things, the more you put into it, the more realistic the model becomes. Oh, nice, okay. Yeah. So it's not just a click and we're done. Like, you could do you could do a lot, but you want to invest more, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. That's so awesome. We also wanted to show you a little bit of, a, like, a video of our studio. Yeah. So you can get an idea of what we kind of go through day to day and all the different toys that we got. Let's do it. That's super cool. So this is a robotic scanning solution that we built um, we used a KUKA arm, a structure light laser scanner, and a high megapixel uh, single camera for photogrammetry with cross-polarized light. 
Um, that's for objects. Okay. That was the original scan truck. And you can see that the truck is parked right inside the studio. So yeah. It's a, Pull it it's in, a, take you know, yeah, park yeah. it. Like, yeah, that's cool. It's um, like our spaceship that's like docked at the port, you know? Yeah. yeah. Now I saw some shiny bits in there. Is, 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 you know, specular really easy to capture or do you have tricks for that? We got some tricks for that. Perfect. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay, cool, cool. Wow, this is really intense and like there's so much happening, <laughs> but it's so cool that it's portable. That's what I'm really digging about yeah. it. You said 160 cameras? Yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah, it's really like opened up a lot of doors for us. Um, you know, there's certain talent that just they don't want to deal with it. Um, and it, when we can come to their house, they literally come outside for a couple of minutes if we just need one or two scans. And they're like, OK, I'll do that. So it's, it's opened up projects that I think wouldn't have happened um, otherwise. Wow. Um, and it's fun for us. I mean, we're always in different situations and kind of like having crazy experiences with the truck. So Yeah, that's yeah. super cool. I mean, Paul, Louie, are you seeing half of this stuff? It's mind blowing. Is, it's just about as wild. mind blowing as that t-shirt he's wearing, which looks like me on the front of it. It's insane. The yeah, whole thing is blowing my mind. T-shirt's wild. <laughs> <laughs> this reminds me to be here now, always. Because oh, otherwise yeah. my head's in a million places with the tech. You know, you got to keep it centered, otherwise it gets Perfect. <laughs> oh, that's super cool. Okay, so I'm really curious. I'm really curious what it's gonna look like when you scan me. Yeah, so you wanna get, get scanned? Can we get scanned? Yeah, do sure. That? Yeah, then we'll come back to this, that's great. Of course. Perfect, perfect. Cool. Well, come on in. We're gonna do it. All right, you All right. ready? I'm ready. Here we go, getting scanned. All they right. already want the model, sense. Ian. They said, how fast Here are we, we getting the model, so yeah, Ian? Put both okay. feet there and stare okay. in that direction. That's great. And then and you put your like hands this. out. That's great. Spread your fingers a little bit. About more. to go to the matrix. Oh, perfect. <laughs> now my favorite part. I'm going to raise you up into position. Oh, here we go. Oh, 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 oh. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Going up. Stay there still, Ian. Stay still. Great. All right, Vlad. Are you ready? Okay, and I am ready. All right, and holding. Three, two, one. Nice. Just like that. Yeah, now you see all the different images. So we broke up your body into quadrants. We focus wow. a lot on the face. Um, we have different different lenses, you know, zoomed in on the face, the hands. Hands are really tricky. There's a lot of occlusions in between the fingers. So Okay, yeah, you, it makes, have, yeah. That's why you wanted me to really spread them. That makes totally. That makes sense. And also that that awesome position that you're standing in, almost like a TSA like Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, pat me down. Right. <laughs> wow, this is really, really cool. Wow. So that's I'm that's speechless. it right there. I mean, even with that, just a just a single A pose, we yeah. you know you can create so much content with even just something like that. You know, wow. um, now for if we were to build out a full avatar of you, we'd want to do a base scan. Yeah. So probably in shorts, no shirt. You know, as much skin as possible to get oh, all okay. that information, um, and then we would layer the clothing on. Like if you had a jacket and different stuff, so we could we could break it all out and retopologize it all separately and have nice. it move so it's not all kind of glued to you. Yeah. Um, That's super cool. And then the facts as well and building that out. But what's what's really cool though, you know, like you can always build on these things. Right. That's, that's what I like, you know, we've done a lot of talent um, where, you know, they needed, they just needed an, a, a full body A pose for, for the project. And yeah. I said, well, hey, while we have them here, why don't we do do some blend shapes, you know? Yeah. Let, let's get, get a couple outfits, whatever. And then, you know, a, a year or two later, they come back with another project. They're like, oh, we, we need his face to be animated. It's like, okay, well, we have that in the can, you know? Yeah, so it's kind of cool. That's cool. I yeah. like that. Well, it's also really simple. I mean, as the audience just saw right now, I just walked in there, you set me up, and then you fired it off. Now, I know that part's easy, but how long would you say it takes to stitch this together just to have something that then could be worked on? So from time to scan to, t to a computer process? Sure. It really depends on the processing power of your, of your computer. Okay. So, I mean, this probably took us uh, anywhere from like 40 minutes to an hour. Yeah. And, you know, it depends on the resolution you, that you're trying to achieve. But you can see that these are the still images, and we got 160 of these frames. And now with the software called Reality Capture, we took all of them and aligned them in a 3D space. Nice. So you can see that each one of these little icons, and I can actually make it a little bit larger to show you. Wow. These are all of the images that we've just taken and align them in space. Wow. And can, because I'm seeing color right now, you're able to uh, get textures off of this as well, or at least have some, some sort of color reference for the artist who uh, ends up cleaning it up? 
Well, that's the beauty of photogrammetry. That's the best thing about it, is that not only you get the geo, yeah. and I can show you what that looks like. So right now in the solid view, you'll see the model without any texture information. And this is completely raw. So we took the images, reconstructed, and you can see that. Wow. It's looking pretty nice, yeah. right? I mean, it already looks like a statue. <laughs> <laughs> Ready for 3D print, right? right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we should do you next. OK, OK. <laughs> and then we add the color through projecting these images on top of the mesh. Wow. And we end up with a hyper-realistic model. Now, this, of course, is not finished. There's still a process of cleanup, yeah. you know, in ZBrush, yep. obviously. <laughs> and then retopology, rigging, and getting this model optimized for a game engine, and then, of course, animation. Nice. Wow, this is, this is a lot. Paul, Louis, do we have, do we have any yep. audience I, questions? I got a question sure. coming through. Just a, a techie question here. What's the uh, shutter speed that they're putting Ooh. the cameras at? Techie question. Shutter speed, which I like. What is it? So for for this, we're at what one tenth? Yeah, for this one actually is interesting because yeah. the strobes dictate the the shutter speed. Right, right. So yeah. we had uh, actually I'm going to show you a, a slide um, where we had a a previous iteration of this truck. Yeah. We used what's called diffuse lighting. Okay. So the LEDs were actually pointed on the outside of the truck and bouncing off the walls. Nice. So it was, it was like a diffuse lighting condition. Nice. So then our shutter speed really mattered, whereas this, the strobes are pointed at the subject, yeah. and it's just a blink of an eye. Um, so I'll, I actually wanted to show you another slide of uh, <laughs> us building the rig. Whoa. <laughs> this is the original OG, yeah. uh, circa 2018. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's, it's crazy that how much has changed from 2018 to now, 2022. It's only a few years, and yet, I mean, I'm, the setup looks similar, but I'm sure there's a lot of differences, too. Totally. Well, that's the cool thing about our field, is that the technology is, facing, is changing so fast that we're constantly trying to keep up and learning new skills, yeah. learning new, new ways of doing it. And this is our, you know, this is the first truck we build. We also build a a trailer that is now deployed in in basically East Coast. It takes okay. care of all of the East Coast region from nice. Atlanta to New York to Albuquerque, New Mexico. And this is the second one we built. We learned what we, we used what we learned on this one right. and applied it here. And then trust me, the next one we build is gonna be a lot <laughs> different too. <laughs> I'm sure, 100%. Yeah, wow. I mean, honestly, this this stuff is so cool. I just I'm kind of speechless on it because it's just I, I know some photography. I did a little bit myself, but like this just takes it on a whole nother level because you're taking what essentially was just once a, a to capture a moment, and now you're just taking that moment and you you can essentially change it and manipulate it and put it wherever you need to, and that's that's super cool. Yeah, and you know I like it for uh, you know historical preservation. You know yeah. you got artifacts. You've got like sports memorabilia, you got yeah. music memorabilia, you got so many like different like places you can go with it. Um, and uh, it's- Oh, just, that's cool. Yeah, wow. this is a list that yeah. we put together. Cause I mean, us getting into this field, we really just, oh, it's games, it's movies. But as soon as we started digging deeper into it, like all of these other avenues opened up that we never even imagined. Yeah. So yeah, it's been really fun and we got some- uh, I see you got reverse engineering. Could you talk about that a little bit? What does that mean? Because that's just, to, to that seems very like vague, but I'm sure you have a very specific, can you talk about it? Yeah, of course. That's the technical side of our business. Okay. So this is when we take a part, whether it be you know part of the car or maybe an airplane, and we 3D scan it, and then we create drawings so that the technical team can actually manufacture the part. So it's basically wow. taking something that's already in existence, digitizing it, and then building it back up to that original part. But now you can you know, use different CNC milling techniques yeah. and essentially mass produce it. Wow. So sometimes, you know, if an airplane is old and then like the part can no longer be manufactured, 
we can reverse engineer it and make that part. Wow, that's that's we clever. Be scanning. Yeah. I mean, you're in LA, <laughs> so there's car culture galore. Yeah, so yeah. I'm sure there's guys hitting you up, being like, I have this 1960 something that I need I'm to salivate it right now, Ian. Yeah, but <laughs> the beach will show you the laser scanner. It gets down to what the 0.25 microns or something. I mean, wow, thing's pretty awesome. Okay, cool, cool. So here's some some of the works that the uh, recent works uh, we were on. Wakanda Forever, that was amazing. Beautiful film. Yeah. Um, and uh, Dune and... Scanning uh, hot in the desert. That was pretty good <laughs> yeah. cool experience for us, yeah. <laughs> Especially with AC, I'm sure you guys were just fine, like you were yeah, mentioning exactly. earlier. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah, and Doctor Strange too. that was fun. Um, a lot of the Marvel stuff, and it's just cool to see, you know, like, we basically entertain all different types of projects. I mean, we, we you know, from, from every level, and there's kind of pros and cons to all of it, you know? Yeah. Um, but but working with Marvel on some of the really high level stuff has been, uh, I mean, educational to say the least, for yeah. sure. You know, like every time we're there, they're like, "Oh, hey, can you try this? Try that?" We're like, "Okay," you know, <laughs> like, trying to figure it out. You know? Yeah, for sure. So this little clip uh, shows uh, our work with Konami. Um, this the, drone pilot was amazing, by the way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whoa! <Right? laughs> Going all inside the trailer, giving us the 360 view. Pretty cool, That's right? That's trust right there. Yeah. <laughs> you know how tight it is in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Look, he ducks this bar right here, too. Whoop. Whoop. Whoa. Yeah, so we've been getting into that. Uh, here's uh, with uh, Rockstar. We did uh, Grand Theft Auto, so we did Dre um, and uh, and Jimmy. Um, nice. It was cool pulling, pulling up to his house. This is really important for us to be able to provide that service. Yeah. And we did this, you know, when COVID was still in effect. So it was really cool because there's basically very minimal crew and we can go to places and get the production going. Even though a lot of places were stopped, we could still operate. Nice. Yeah, nice. we parked on his basketball court. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty sweet. Okay, to have a basketball court, that's pretty ballers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, so a uh, question before, you, cause you mentioned some outside tech, yeah. which is really cool, but just real quick, like if there's anyone interested in trying to get into this field, do you have any like just beginner friendly tips you'd like to like let them know what the look for i mean did you guys have photography experience yourself yeah that you were totally like yeah this was something that you could transition to yeah i would say start with one camera yeah. first before you get into a, a, a rig like this because essentially what you can do with a single camera all of the same principles apply in the camera rig like this right so if you can get really good and and basically you know learn all the tricks and learn the software yeah then you can get into this okay cool yeah so start start crawling don't start running <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is kind of so cool too to think I, like i've really loved watching like even you know with music and when ableton came out it just really like leveled the, the play field for yeah. people you know you don't need to have a record label to 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 make amazing music now you know and same yeah. thing with this it's like one camera you know get get some beta versions of some photogrammetry software start playing with it you know yeah um i just love how accessible it is for everyone you know yeah that's super cool. cool paul go ahead you got a question coming in yeah well actually i think because you were asking about how we get in someone was asking do they work with uh freelancers like how somebody wants to get it scanned how do they work oh. with them Oh, do you guys work with freelancers? Like somebody who's like interested in this technology and wanting to figure it out? Absolutely. And scan themselves? Sure, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And yeah, just, yeah we, we also have a, um, our virtually conscious uh, sector of our company. So when, when people have projects that help make the world a better place, revolved around education, helping people in some way, we're always uh, game to, to try and help make those projects happen. You nice. know, so we'll, we'll How do, do they handle the bottom? Uh, whatever we can to help make those yep. projects happen, you know? And, and especially, you know, we, we've been bringing on, we've been building our team. It's so funny, I was thinking about it with ZBrush yeah. and Lime. We're always building our ZBrush team. So, oh, nice. you know, different artists that are looking to, you know, either freelance or, or potentially come on full time with us, we're always, you know, trying out different artists and, you nice. know, yeah. Okay, cool. It takes a village. So, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Definitely uh, hit us up on yeah. info at the scan truck. Okay, yeah, cool. Totally. Well, the scan truck, that's so easy to remember. Uh, we yeah, we were going to be photogram a truck, but that was just like. No, that's a, that's a mouthful. Um, we had another question. How do you handle the bottom of somebody? So, like, you know, the whole just, I'm assuming that's the question. That's a great question, yeah. yeah. I'm so all trying to dance this question out. How do you, how do you handle yeah, yeah, the bottom? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's definitely limitations, and some areas will be occluded. So the way to solve the, you know, the mystery of like what's on the bottom of your foot <laughs> yeah. is to actually take texture photography. Okay. 
or sometimes we'll take, you know, scan the shoes separately and combine that scan data. But basically anything that we can get with the camera rig, yeah. we'll do texture photography and then that data can be added to the overall data set. Okay, is there ever a time where maybe you just uh, have the artist in ZBrush kind of make up you know, they have enough information that makes the person what it is, mm -hmm. but do, is there ever a point where it's like, you know what, that we didn't get their foot, just go ahead and sculpt a foot? Does that ever happen sometimes? Yeah, sometimes, you know, artists have to do a little interpretation. Yeah. But of course, we'll, you know, if the actor can do it, we'll just tell him to stand yeah, take their shoes hands. Off. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool, man, cool. Nice. Paul, do, does the audience have any more questions? Louis, do you guys have any Yeah, questions? there's more questions coming through. More Another tech question, obviously, because he brought up okay. start with one camera. I guess okay. this could be a couple. What camera are they using and lenses are they using? And then what Vlad was saying, start with one camera. What would he recommend for that one camera? Okay, cool. So, all right, so this is a big question. All right, but because uh, I know we got more to show. Sure. But um, what camera and lenses are you using? And more specifically, uh, you've mentioned one camera, Vlad. Like, what would be the camera and lens setup you would have them use if it was just one? Sure. You want to take the first one? Sure, yeah. These are the Canon SL3s. Um, they're great. We actually had Nikon. Full uh, frame? Uh, no. Okay, so yeah. crop. Crop. Perfect. Yep. Uh, and we use a variety of lenses, Vlad. What do we What do we have? We got 50s, 50 millimeter prime. Yeah, 50s and 35s. Yeah. Those are those are kind of like the the go to, mm -hmm. up to 70 millimeters on the face. Okay. So we're trying to get as much detail yeah. on the face as possible. So we're trying to crop in. So that's why you go with crop body though too, right? Because you got helps. the 50 mil, and that kicks you to almost 85. So. And you don't want like too wide. You don't want to go too too distorted if you're trying to, you know, when you're overlapping the images, you got that distortion. It's better to have more overlap than to have super wide angle lens. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. I would say that's true. And then and, what, oh, go and ahead. If you, yeah, if you're shooting with a single camera, I would say something that's full frame would be cool. Okay. Uh, because you get a lot of data for that. And if you're spending the money, you know, like, to get 160 full frame cameras would be really expensive. Yeah. But if you're getting one, get the full frame. Yeah. <laughs> so okay. like a Sony Alpha 7, and like as far as the lens, I would say uh, a Nifty 50. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Tech Perfect. sharp. Tech yep. sharp. Yeah. Awesome. Prime, cool. definitely. So would my Canon 60D crop body 50 mil work? If I want to go great. home and start going. I'm totally. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. You, I'm going to try. I love it. <laughs> okay, yeah. cool. So I know there's more questions. Yeah. But we have outside stuff to Let's do. Let's check it out. So yeah. we're going to go out that way, if you don't oh, mind leading yeah, the way. Yeah, please. The beach, we're coming for you. All right. Perfect, perfect. Man, this stuff is super cool. Like, <laughs> I'm just, wow. All right, I'm going to come back here. What's happening? Hey, how are you? I'm good. My name's Ian. Who are you? The beach. The beach. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So, OK, we got a light bulb. We got some trigonometry thing happened here. Can you yeah. explain what's happening? <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, I think you just went through the photogrammetry pipeline, right? Yes. So photogrammetry with cross-polarized light is phenomenal for textures and you get really good 16K quality, you know, texture maps. So everything looks really good in terms of the color space. Yeah. But uh, photogrammetry kind of works like your cell phone. Okay. It's like triangulation. Okay. Right, so your, your phone knows where it is based off pinging off three towers, right? Right. So. If you have objects like that don't have features or is black in color or highly specular, then photogrammetry has a tough time. Right. So I'll give you an example, right? Now imagine you're the camera okay. in there, and this is an object, right? Okay. <laughs> so as I rotate, you know where you are in right. 3D space in relative to this. Okay. But what if I do this? Ah, okay. So now you, you don't know there. where you are. Yeah, okay. Right? So the algorithm has a tough time when it has to work with anything that's very shiny because light bounces off of it. Uh, anything that's black, because there's no information in there, uh, or anything that's highly specular. Okay. Right? So that's where this comes into play. Okay, cool. So this is called structured light scanning. And what you have here is a scanner. And in typical structured light scanning, you still have to put stickers on an object to know where the scanner is in relative space. Okay. But with this, you don't have to. Perfect. Because these targets that are all around this scanning head are seen by those two cameras. Okay, so this is talking to that machine yeah, exactly. that's always updating it on the exactly. fly. Exactly. Wow, that's so you, super cool. Yeah, so you've got a pitch axis, you've got a roll axis, and you've got a yaw axis. 
Oh, so, so you're flying an aircraft. Exactly. That's <laughs> all day long. That's so cool. And uh, yeah, so all these targets are have a unique ID. Yeah. And they're seen by those two cameras there. Okay. And that's how it knows where in space it is, and that's how it can scan uh, the object. That's super awesome. So, uh, I don't know, can we run through an example of some sort? Like, you know, let's, let's, make, see this. let's make it difficult. Okay, right? yeah, let's, let's do okay. it even more. Let's let's get the uh, oh my god this the pharaoh head. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so not only is it a pharaoh head, yeah. but this thing is like I, I can see myself Absolutely. in it. So this is a mirror finish almost. Yep. And you're gonna scan this. Absolutely. You got that right? Yeah. Paul, Louis, that, that, audience. That is just. You want you want to bet on it? <laughs> no no no. I believe you <laughs> because you're here. But it's like just it's it, it's, it's it doesn't always translate. That's tough. That's that has to be tough. That's a monument of a different That's kind. Right. I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> All right, go and ahead. I'm going to start scanning. Again with the monument challenge. I like it. All yeah, right, you ready? Perfect. Let's do it, yeah. What's he doing? What kind of black magic is this? I know, right? It's just intense. Absolutely. There we go. Long scan. And boom. What does the audience think of this, this setup? Because this is, this is another so level. We if you look at the TV in real time, it just constructs instantly. What? And this is like spray painting. <laughs> so you're just That's spraying so it. That's so wild. Wow. And it's, yeah, the only thing is you're creating the right on the computer instantly. Okay, cool. Now, yeah. well, that's 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 going. That's another level of awesomeness yeah. right there. Now, yeah, so we accidentally broke this connection here, yeah. but at the same time, like, yeah, you're just you're just spraying and praying, <laughs> so That's to speak. Exactly. What you, what you got to do? That's it. That's uh, so cool. So, how how long does it take to after you're done scanning it? Yeah. Would you say how long does it take to actually process on the computer? Is it like it looked real time? Yep. But I'm sure there's like a construction process. How long does that usually take? It's um. So the, the the scan's instant, okay, and it's live, wow. um, but it's still considered raw data, okay, right? It still needs the cleanup and stuff like that. Yeah. But the the good thing is that it's I don't need a modeler anymore. I don't need a hot surface you modeler. You don't need me anymore. No, 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 no. I need to, I need to hang on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Well, I did that because I don't know how to model. Oh, okay, so, okay, okay. Because I have this. I got you. I got you. Um, <laughs> but it it makes life so much easier because yeah. now you have in like. This will probably take me about five to six minutes to scan. Right. And now I've got a raw mesh yeah. that I can go bring in a ZBrush or any other platform that you have and edit it, re-sculpt it, add things onto it. Nice. Um, and like I said, like this is used for objects like this, which is impossible to get in any other way. No, absolutely. And so now, I mean, I'm just blown away. Yeah. I'm serious. Like this yeah. is super cool. Um, so I mean, this is a little bit more portable. So, but it's it's more condensed. I mean, that inside was pretty condensed. But uh, what are the like limitations of scanning? Can you scan big objects, or is this so maybe focused more on like something smaller? Like, I mean, we've scanned airplanes. I'm sorry, what? We've scanned an airplane. Ski, ski. Okay, that's it. What about, what about the other <laughs> way, Ian? How small can it go? Yeah, it's uh, okay. it's very modular. Okay, well, how small can you go? Uh, okay, I'll give you some details. Uh, so the precision of this is 65 microns. Okay which is 0 0.025 millimeters. Cool, so tiny. Very, very tiny. Perfect. And it's great for like reverse engineering. Wow. Because it's absolutely accurate data. Yeah. And you could take that data, and the limitation right now is your 3D printer. Okay. Because it can't print something that fine. Right, right, right. So in 10 years from now, when technology is caught up on the printable end, yeah. this data is still relevant. But can this also be used for CNC? Absolutely. Oh, okay. So nice. it's end to end, so you can scan it, you have a, a mesh yeah. that you can pull surface off it and have a CAD file. Okay. And then you could you know, throw it as an IGES file or an SDL file, right. um, and you can feed it to a CNC, uh, a 3D printer, yeah. and you can make molds out of it. Sweet. You could do whatever you want to. Perfect. It's a lot of fun. So Ian, if they're doing something yeah. more with like it a is. glass, and it's, or uh, a crystal, do they have I'm just to reset it with this. that scanner? So, so we had a question coming in. Yeah. Uh, when you're doing something that's like really glass, like this, for example, yeah. this is very, see-through, do you have to do like a special powder or like a gloss, or can you just scan it as is? Just scan it. Just scan it as yeah. is? You don't need any matting spray, you don't need anything like that. I'm just gonna reset this if you don't mind. I don't mind, yeah, yeah. So so it looks like they don't need to powder it or, or spray it. Uh, yeah, that's that's amazing. And you don't need trackers either. You don't need trackers either, yeah. right, right. Yeah, so it's that's what, that's what these trackers do, right? So it knows the pitch roll on your axis. Wow. So 
here's for the person who had the question about uh, the light bulb. Yeah. We'll set it up. So actually, now that we have this screen, I can walk you through a few things, right? Okay, cool. Um, there we go. This is actually cool. So what we do is we actually calibrate this C-Track with this particular bar. And okay. I think we, uh, we call it the rain dance. Because <laughs> it is kind of like a rain dance. Oh, so you got this reference here, and you walk, and it gives you a green mark. So there you go. You hit the green mark. And this is how you define your space. So, so when I when I, when I want to extend my volume and I want to scan something bigger, I can just infinitely go and extend my space. Ooh, wow. Okay, so so y when you scan something, can you basic you're scanning it to scale essentially if I'm understanding you correctly? Absolutely. <laughs> it's it's uh, the accuracy is 0 0.025 millimeters. Wow. So you yeah. can't you can't cheat that. No, not at all. That's wild. We're just going to be on this side so you can yeah. do your rain dance. That's really awesome. Yeah, it's fun. It's, uh, it's a quick. So the thing is, like, the, because it's so precise, the temperature actually affects the calibration. Oh, OK. So because we're out here in the sun uh, and the temperature is changing so rapidly, uh, it affects the, the, uh, the calibration file. So, so you would do this more maybe indoors, typically? Oh, absolutely. In a temperature control room, that would be great, because uh, then you get accurate information. What's the ideal temperature, would you say? Uh, what's comfortable, like 72 and sunny. OK, nice. That's nice. Perfect. Yeah. It's actually, I'm the limiting factor here, <laughs> not that. Because if it gets too hot, I don't like it. Right, right. <laughs> cool. Yeah, we well, we have a few more minutes, so, but yeah. yeah. Um, oh it's, my gosh. I, I can't even like begin to, to fathom this technology, but it's super cool. And yeah. I can definitely see how it can be very easy to integrate things from the real world into whatever projects oh, you're be working on. Absolutely. It's, um, uh, it is kind of like the future of what it is, right? Like yeah. it's when you get highly, highly precise objects yeah. uh, that's very easy to scan, it's essentially a tool. And now it's like you scan something, you've got a 3D model of it in the digital space, yeah. and the world's your oyster. So you can do whatever you want with it. OK, cool. I might have some car parts to <laughs> Good one. So Paul, Louie, I'm sure more questions are coming in. Hit me with your best shot, guys. What do you got? Yeah, so they were asking again what that scanner is made of. What is it kind of uh, light? What's exactly? So what's, yeah, OK. What's the scanner made of exactly? Like some people are still asking like. Sure. So these are all aluminum tubing. OK. And these are trackers that have a unique ID. OK. So each tracker has a basically like an RFID. OK. That has a unique signature. Um, you've got two cameras down here. That, and then you've got the laser projector there, and it's a blue laser. Okay. Uh, and it projects a pattern on the object, and it's witnessed by these cameras. Oh, okay. So these wow. cameras are capturing the information in real time. The two cameras on the sea track are noticing these trackers, mm -hmm. so it knows exactly where it is, and that's how the scan happens. Okay. And you've got basically three different modes. Uh, like a typical camera, you've got shutter speed, yeah. uh, which controls the, you know, in a camera, Shutter speed controls one of the three functions. You get f-stop, shutter yeah. speed, and ISO. Uh, a shutter speed in a structured light scanner it depends on the object. Okay. So if you're scanning something black or highly chromatic or specular, yeah. uh, you bump up the shutter speed. Okay. So it increases the strength of the laser, so the pattern's more uh, recognizable. Nice. And that's how you scan it. Okay. And then okay. if you're scanning something on white, you go like an HDR, so you go low shutter speed. Right. And that's how you're able to capture that information. Wow. And it's, it, it's, it's actually very intelligent. So if you had an object that's white, chrome, black, yeah. all in one plate, I can put it on a high dynamic range, and it'll automatically adjust the shutter speed as I scan the whole thing. Wow. And I don't have to do anything. So you just you set it up? Set it up in scanning. HDR, yeah, and scan it. That's crazy. Man. It's fun. This yeah. is super, super cool. It well, is. We are really excited to also see how this is going to be translated, because we know we have Ara on set with Paul and Louie, right. and they're definitely going to be going over a little bit of the cleanup process. Yeah. Uh, before we do that, does the audience have any final questions they'd like to ask before we kick it back to you, Paul and Louie? Yeah, one last question, because this is so portable, especially with the truck. Yeah. Uh, there's obviously movement happening in the truck. Do they have to recalibrate the cameras when they get to their destination, or how do they lock everything down? Oh, great question. So they're asking about, because everything's so portable, with the truck and this setup here, um, what does the calibration time look like to set things up? Is, the, is, there, is that like a big process or? 
No. Um, so for this, it's you need about 20 minutes for all the systems to get up to uh, temperature and spec. Okay. Um, so it's kind of like how a, a gyroscope spool, uh, spools up, right? Okay. It just needs a little bit of time. Um, and this is calibration of this. So in 30 minutes, we could be good to go. 30 minutes? 30 minutes. Oh, okay, awesome. cool. Yeah. That is yeah. super impressive. Yeah, it takes 10 wow. minutes to pack it up, 30 minutes to calibrate it, and then wow. you can scan it for a whole day. So it's really quick. So Absolutely. you can just show up on a set, give yourself a couple minutes, mm -hmm. get everything going, mm -hmm. and then start scanning, and Absolutely. then pack up, yeah. and just yeah. make millions. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's super awesome. It is, it is. And uh, I mean, like, I think in traditional, like, VFX and film sets, they have, like, the Faro, you know, where yeah. they go, and it's a LiDAR that goes around and captures environments. Yeah. Um, and that's portable as well. But if it's high detail and accuracy that you want, you can treat this the exact same way. Okay. Now, you said you, you scanned a plane. How long did that take you, if you remember? Uh, I do. Uh, <laughs> I'm so me, sorry. <laughs> uh, I mean, we, we really went very, very accurate. Like, you can go down and see the lettering on the actual switches. Wow. Uh, but it took me about, like, I think, six hours. Okay. Six hours? Yeah. Yeah. I got yeah, a Ferrari with, and the, we with got our all name the on it, as well. so it's, okay. it's good fun. Well, my buddy yeah. Louie has a Ferrari, so... Okay. <laughs> we, we have scanned a car. We scanned a Mercedes-Benz. Oh, man. Yeah. Okay, cool. That's really awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. This has been GTO amazing, super eye-opening, and just, just wonderful to get to see new technology that's going to always change the way we work as artists. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. And right. we definitely need hard service modelers. Okay, right okay. I appreciate <laughs> you. I appreciate that. you. I'll <laughs> tell a couple of my friends that too. All right, Paul, Louie, I'm going to let you take it away from here. But thank you again to Scan Truck uh, yeah, coming out here and hanging out with us. This is super awesome. Wow, awesome. wow, wow. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Ian Robinson on location yet again with go another ahead. home run. Paul Gavery, the, the song continues. The hits keep on coming. And look who we've got with us, as you mentioned. We have Ara. Kerminikin, and he's here live with us. I got Paul Gabery. Yep. And what are you going to do for us now? Well, I'm going to do a brief uh, presentation, and then I'm going to show how you can take this amazing stuff that they do in the scan truck, and they're scanning uh, uh, devices, and then how you can start using that in ZBrush. Uh, ZBrush is the hub for everything you can use it for, so um, I'll share some of my experiences awesome. and my work with it. So I don't know if you guys can see my screen. Um, yeah, they'll put it up. Oh yeah, they got you covered. All right. Yeah, we got you covered, we'll put it up here. Just giving them, there okay. you go. Cool. All right, so um, I'll do a, a brief introduction of myself. One thing that's kind of key is that I am a ZBrush Live streamer and I stream every Friday night from 7 to 9 p.m. Uh, LA time. So um, you guys can tune in. Ask me questions about this stuff or any of the other things that I work on. You can see I mostly work on uh, hard surface stuff, mechs and whatnot, so you can do that. Um, to get a hold of me, uh, I'm pretty active on some of the social medias, Instagram uh, most of all. So here's my link tree if you want to get a hold of me. And if you want to see my work, uh, you can see it at uh, kermaco.com. So um, please um, connect with me on the socials. And um, if you have any questions about my work, tune in on my ZBrush Live um, streams, and uh, I'll be more than happy to answer them for you. Um, I actually don't work for the scan truck. I work for a company called Autograph. And um, you can see some examples of things that I work on in here. I work with a very amazing creative team. And uh, they do uh, amazing stuff. Of course, I uh, contribute to that. So I do this kind of work, um, working on scans and, and whatnot, and also modeling things like this football, et cetera. So, uh, that's what I do during the day, and of course I do uh, a bunch of other um, fun ZBrush stuff uh, at night. Uh, so shout out to my team over at Autograph, and um, here I also want to let you guys know how I know these folks from the scan truck, and that's uh, because I wanted to do a tutorial on this, and uh, I did it for the Noman Workshop a while back, and I partnered with uh, the folks at Scantruck, and they uh, basically did the scanning portion of it, and then I did the cleanup portion of it. So if you guys are interested in seeing more of this uh, stuff that I'm going to show today in more detail in a tutorial format, uh, you can uh, subscribe to the Noman Workshop and, uh, and watch. Uh, They're also a sponsor. They are. Summit, exactly. And we're giving away one and year if you're one of the lucky months, ones, you might win a six-month yeah. subscription to the Nomen Workshop. There you go. So there's that. And it's Look the MIT this. of the industry. Here we Man, go. it feels like someone planned their show out. 
you know, in addition to, to this, Jeez. they have a bunch of other really amazing tutorials too. It's it's really, um, of all the tutorials, I think they're the, the MIT or the, the cream of a, the crop yeah, of tutorials. Louis was calling and them it's the an honor for me to have, call them the have my stuff on there. Yeah. All right, so moving on, um, let's talk that. a little bit about photogrammetry. Uh, I think they covered stuff. I couldn't hear what they were talking about, so maybe there'll be some repetition here, but basically um, photogrammetry happens with all those cameras. They all take the pictures. Uh, the pictures get loaded into software like Agisoft or uh, Reality Capture, and then what happens is uh, you, know, you get in, into something like this, and then it reconstructs uh, your form with something called a point cloud, and then you can export that out as an FBX. And you get a bunch of things with it, and uh, I'll show you what those are uh, in a minute. But the benefit of uh, photogrammetry is you get likeness, so you definitely get the likeness of the person. I know there are a lot of amazing zebra sculptors that uh, do likeness really, really well, Chris Costa being one of them, uh, uh, Marco De Luca, there's, there's quite a few of them. And so they start with a sphere and then they come up with an amazing likeness, but uh, in production, especially in the types of, uh, of uh, uh, projects that I'm on, we don't have that kind of time to spend to start from a sphere and get it to the likeness. So this gets you the likeness immediately. Uh, it gets you proportion, so everything is exactly proportional uh, to what it actually is. And you also get a texture. So um, with that, I just want to uh, mention that uh, photogrammetry is not like a, a, a big deal. It's, uh, of course, if you're going to do professional scans, you could use uh, companies like the Scantruck, and there's many others internationally. Uh, we work with some companies in the UK. Uh, so th there's, there's a lot of companies that will do this for you. If we were, you're working with talent whose time is very limited, uh, going with a professional service is the best way to go. But uh, you can also do this yourself. So you can do it with a cell phone. So if you have a cell phone, uh, you can download an application like Maxon Moves or Polycam or Scandi. I've got a bunch of them listed here. Uh, and you can just go around your subject. If your subject is not moving, uh, if it's just a static object, it's a lot easier to do. Uh, if it is a, um, a moving, uh, if it's a human, you have to get them to be very um, still. Uh, and you also have to worry a little bit about the lighting, but they give you instructions on how to do that. And I've gotten some great results uh, doing that as well. Um, in addition to that, you can also buy scans. You can buy scans from 3D Scan Store, uh, Epic Mega Scans for, uh, you know, you, you, um, like terrains and sand and materials and all kinds of fun stuff. Render People has uh, renders you can buy, Turbo Squid, and there are many others. So for ZBrush artists to be able to use photogrammetry data, there's plenty of it out there that you can buy. And if you want to do your own scanning, you can do that as well. And again, if you're going to work with something that's more professional, professional talent, actors, uh, things like that, um, uh, services like um, the scan truck are the way to go. All right, so that's enough slideware. Let's uh, get into the demo. So first things first, this is what the scan looks like once you load it in. So once you load in the FBX, you can see here that you get a very, very dense model. So looking at this one right here, uh, if you look at the poly count, it's about 20 million polys. So that's quite a bit of data um, on here. And as I zoom in closer and closer to this, you'll notice that it is, um, as my teacher at Noman used to say, triangle soup. So it's basically a bunch of triangles. Uh, so what happens is that the scan software scans a point cloud. So every one of these vertices is a point that's scanned. And then what happens is that uh, a, um, the software connects them all and produces this triangle soup. So the good news is here, if I turn the polyframe off, I've got, um, not perspective, but polyframe. If I turn the uh, uh, polyframe off, you can see that I've got a perfect likeness. This is definitely me. Uh, everybody who can recognize that it's me. And also, I would like to apologize that this is going to be a lot of scans of me and talking about my data. I'm not an egotistical maniac. It's just that we had a different subject we were going to do, but uh, circumstances. That's totally fine. Don't even say any more. It's okay. good to see you right. both in the flesh and digitally yeah, speaking. Well, not only that, we're going to pop them up in the environment. Now, and he's going to pop too. up in the AR. That's Put it there. right. Lots of, lots of um, aura. And aura. also, I would like to excuse my uh, little COVID pouch over here. I didn't flatten the curve during COVID. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> but the, the good news is, this is the kind of stuff that we can uh, easily arrest. Well, you're in zebra. You a little move brush, and you're exactly. good. Exactly. However, you cannot use the move brush on here because this triangle soup is really not conducive to that kind of stuff. So then you have to use some of the ZBrush capabilities uh, to fix that. 
Now, in addition uh, to getting this uh, kind of point uh, cloud over here, you also get polypaint. So when I bring up polypaint, you also notice that I definitely get a polypaint of this uh, as well, right? So here's kind of uh, the, uh, the T-shirt with uh, the material on it. Uh, everything is, is in pretty much detail. I can zoom in on this uh, quite a bit. And you can see that you can see a lot of the detail. Let's see um, your face up on there and then look up at the camera for the people at home. Look at that. All right, it's here him. we go. Yeah. Um, wow. All right. And I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. So here, if I, um, if I hide the, the polypaint for a second, you can see that it even catches the inside of your retina. Uh, and uh, the scan goes all the way um, inside the lens of your eye uh, to, to show you that detail. So now we have a perfect representation. We have uh, a great texture uh, as far as polypaint is concerned. And we also, with the software, in the FBX file, we also get a texture map. So we also have a texture map here. If I turn that on, that's there. But if you can see here, the UVs are horrendous, right? Like, what is that? Uh, really, really kind of crazy UVs on this. So um, again, we get a lot of good stuff, but none of it is usable until it's brought into ZBrush and uh, use some of the ZBrush capabilities to, to get that stuff out. Um, so the first thing I usually do is I just bring this in and do a scaling of it. So I use the Scale Master plugin to make sure that this is to scale. Uh, and also, um, let me go over to my other subtool here. So going over to, to uh, the subtool here. So this is the same. Uh, I, I, I have two scans. The one I showed you was processed using Reality Capture. This one is used uh, by, uh, by um, doing, um, using Agisoft. And for some reason, Agisoft gave me a Yondu uh, fro over here. So uh, we'll also see how we can correct uh, issues like that. So uh, first things first, uh, I, the first thing I do is I bring in a uh, one scale cube. And the way that that works, uh, and uh, do I have it on solo? I don't. Where are you, cube? Oh, is it in here? Yep. All right, so I have a one foot cube that I bring in. Again, Scale Master um, does that for me. So here under Scale Master, basically the things that I do uh, is that I, um, where are you, Scale Master, here we are. Okay, so the first thing I do is I go in here and I say set scene scale, and then I basically put in the height. Uh, it comes in correctly sometimes with the FBX, but if it doesn't, I can always correct it. And then once that's done, uh, another really important thing to do is to ZBrush scale unify. And what that will do is it will put my model, even though it is to scale now, it will put it into ZBrush's working environment of uh, two by two by two, right? So it does that for me as well. And then the last thing is um, I will go ahead and create a one unit helper, which creates this cube. Uh, and then I basically have that for reference. Uh, I put it in a folder, so it is available for me just uh, for scale reference. OK, so now we have this data. What do we do with it next? The next thing we do uh, is uh, we uh, examine it. So here, I'm going to turn off my, uh, is there a texture on here? I think there is. So let's turn that off. And let's look at the model, right? So if I'm looking at this model, I will notice that I have some issues. Uh, and I don't know if I'm on the right one here. Uh, there's a little bit of glare on here, but that should be OK. All right, so um, I think, you know, like the, the little Yondu fro over there, and um, there's a hole right here. You can see that. Uh, sometimes I was wearing a black pair of pants, so sometimes with uh, black pair of pants, it doesn't really come through. But I just want to point out, like, what does come through. So you can definitely tell what brand of shoes I'm wearing here. Uh, you can definitely uh, look and see the different folds. You can even see the stitching on the T-shirt. Uh, if you go to the face here, you can definitely see a lot of detail on the face. Uh, you can see my stubble. Um, again, photogrammetry um, does not work very well with hair. Uh, luckily, I don't I'm have lost. that on. What's I, that? I'm lost. I know. You would, you would have to put your head up in a ponytail and there shake your beard. There is no me. You would, you would have made a bald cap. Yeah, you could do that as well. This will never fit in a bald. They don't make bald caps that big. Sure they do. Come on. Maybe a chin one, two. two chin one, two. Everything. Chin cap. Chin, chin cap. cap. You can scan my cheeks and my nose and my forehead, maybe. Hmm? Right. However, <laughs> you can fix all that in ZBrush, right? I know how to do that. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, you get this kind of like shaving foam kind of stuff that's happening over here. All right. So uh, now we have um, this thing looking good. What we need to do is fix some things. Another thing that isn't showing up here is that you get these floaty bits, right? So sometimes uh, when you do your scan, um, there are these things that are kind of come into the scene that are floaty bits. 
So the best way to get rid of those is you hold Control Shift and select a little bit of your model like this, and then Control Shift A, which I think is visible all, all right? All, yeah. Show and all. Then what that will do, show all, and what that will do is basically uh, show you the entire model, but not show you the floaty bits, and then you just go to Delete Hidden, and they go away. So that's one way of, of fixing that problem. No more stragglers. What's that? That's no right. More stragglers. No, that's an important tip, actually, for those that are dealing with photogrammetry, because there's always yeah. going to be some floating pieces of geometry somewhere, and then you might not even see them either. Yep. So select just the main portion and do what yeah. Ara just said, for sure. Right, and then uh, just do that. And I got to thank you for giving me that tip. Uh, mm -hmm. Paul is always amazing. Um, so he told me about that. and. Uh, it, because before I used to go and select each one of those floaty bits and delete them and then try and find them again. So that really right. solved my problem. So Glad I could thank help. you. Pretty good dude. Uh, Glad I could help. This guy. I'm just trying. So uh, ah. the other thing that you notice that is that there are holes under the feet here. Um, you can see that they're occluded because of the normals. And so the next thing you do is you use, uh, you go under geometry and close holes. And uh, what that will do is, um, Modified topology, close holes here, it will close the holes for you. Again, it will not give you good topology, but it will definitely get you to a state that's good. So instead of doing these um, things live, I actually have them pre-done. Uh, so here is the next model, which is the exact same thing, but with those problems solved. Now the other thing also you'll notice is that the scan works really a lot in detail in some areas, but in other areas it's kind of this big blocky uh, area. Uh, but none of that is really important right now because uh, we don't really um, care about that. We're going to clean it up. Another uh, place that has issues is underarms. So here you can see that I've got all this crud over here. Even though I closed the hole, I still have to do a little bit of cleaning up of that. Now, there's no way you are going to be able to do any of this cleanup with this type of topology, right? So the first thing you want to do, um, I totally forgot to show something. Um, I'll show it later. Um, the, the, um, the first thing you got to do is um, make sure that you get this into something that's sculptable, right? Um, so the first thing you can do is dynamesh it. So I would uh, I dynamesh this at the highest resolution possible. So just go in here under um, geometry, dynamesh, and, um, and crank this up. Now don't worry about um, getting... Um, the blur here to, uh, to zero or anything like that. Just crank this up to 20, uh, 424 and click Dynamesh, and that will create, give you a Dynamesh model. Now, with this Dynamesh model, you can go in and start sculpting on it, right? You can start kind of cleaning up some of this area. So I got rid of my uh, little Jan Dufro over there and uh, did a little bit of cleanup on the, under the underarms, but not that much because it's really not that obtrusive, okay? So once you have that, and once you've kind of cleaned it up, just kind of uh, done some sculpting cleanup, uh, the next thing to do is to take this DynaMesh model and not the original one, and then zero mesh it, okay? And you know, just zero mesh it with the uh, regular um, zero mesher settings, and in which case you get something like this over here, all right? So, um, and of course, this is subdivided. So here you basically have the zero mesh model and this is what it looks like. Of course, you lose a lot of the detail and there's some really horrible topology going on here, but that doesn't matter at this point because what you're doing is you're just getting this to a state where you can start subdividing it and then, um, and then doing uh, multi-level sculpting on it. And what I mean by multi-level sculpting on it is that you can make, modif make big sweeping changes, like here I've uh, moved the arms down from the original posture, which was this, okay? And you don't wanna do that with millions of polygons, you wanna do that with the least amount of polygons as possible. So, whoops, I showed something over here that, okay, here we go. Um, all right, so basically um, you can do big gestural changes at this low level of a subdivision, and then you can start walking this thing up. So you walk it up to the next level of subdivision, et cetera. Now, while you're doing this, uh, and before you make the sweeping change, uh, what you do is you uh, dynamesh it, I'm sorry, zero mesh it, and then you project. So you project um, the original model. So the original model had 20 million polygons. Uh, this one, uh, at the lowest subdivision level, is at, is at about 9,000 polys. So it's not really that much. You subdivide it and subdivide it and subdivide it. So here, I'm just gonna go ahead and continue my subdivision level, uh, hide polyframe. 
and you want to get it to the exact number of polys, or not the exact, but kind of a close number of polys to what you had before. Um, and what we have uh, here is uh, yeah, about 23 million. So I went a little bit over, that's fine. Again, every time you subdivide, you're multiplying your topology by four. Um, so you can actually you know, get it exactly the same, but a little bit over doesn't matter. ZBrush will eat up 20 million polygons like there's no tomorrow, uh, so you're good there. And now, this is where most of the work happens. Uh, you can just go down in subdivision levels and do cleanup. So shift D to go down in subdivision levels and, and kind of maybe fix that area under the arm. Uh, and then you start moving up in subdivision levels and maybe start cleaning up some of the hair that's on the arm here. Uh, clean up uh, the stuff in between the fingers and whatnot. Uh, and then just continue to kind of move up in subdivision levels and do some cleanup. So here's an example of an area between the thumb and uh, the, the uh, index finger where you're, you have a little bit of uh, stuff that you might need to get rid of. Actually, I think that's not bad. I'm trying to see, okay, here we go. So like, for example, I wanna clean up this area over here. So I wouldn't clean this up at a higher subdivision level. I'd drop this down even further to here. And then I just use the move brush. Um, I don't know if my keystrokes are right. I'll just pick it up from here and just kind of tuck this a little bit back and then start adding the subdivision level back and then just start kind of little by little as I'm moving up and down in subdivision levels, uh, fix this up, right? Um, and then eventually you'll get to uh, a model that looks pretty good. Um, you do all the cleanup this way. Um, some of the brushes that I use to clean up are um, just the smooth brush, uh, the, I use H polish sometimes. A couple of brushes that are super, super useful for this uh, are not available in the brush menu, but they are available in ZBrush. So if you go to the brush uh, menu here and you go to the smooth brushes, there's a couple here that are super, super useful. And I, I think here we go, where are they? Smooth brush right here. And then uh, there are the smooth peaks and smooth uh, valleys, right? So these two brushes are indispensable, and I'll go ahead and choose the um, smooth uh, peaks one. And those work really well for areas like, for example, here. I've got a little bit of hair poking out, and I'm gonna go ahead and go to subdivision levels where I can actually see those. So here I am at subdivision level. I think I must be at the highest one. Let me make sure. Subdivision level six, yep. And so here I can just kind of hit this, uh, oops with the shift key, and you can see how I'm kind of getting rid of some of those anomalies. Uh, I mean, I don't really want to show the pores on my arm, they're, they're not important, but if there are certain factors that are sticking out, uh, this really, like you can see here, uh, there's a bunch of them, and this really takes care of that part. And then if I go to the other one, the smooth valleys, let me skip this, and do the same exact thing. That pulls the inside parts out and then that kind of makes it a little bit smoother. Um, sometimes it's a good idea to save a morph target if you just wanna bring certain things back and forth, uh, but um, ZBrush is really great for this. So right now, I've gone from like this kind of alien uh, triangle soup scan data to something that I'm really familiar with in ZBrush, which is uh, multi-level sculpting uh, with something that has uh, a quadded topology. Okay, now um, remember to make sure that you bring in your, uh, uh, your poly paint and your texture map to this. Uh, and this could also be um, unwrapped, so you just use UV Master to unwrap it and you basically apply uh, the texture or your poly paint to that. Uh, so you basically will get at this, uh, you know, with this model, you will also get um, that level of detail. So here I've got my poly paint, I've got my texture map, and I've got it cleaned up. Uh, you might need to do some texture painting oops, uh, in here to clean up some of this texture, but there's a, a, good, a great way of doing that too. And I guess this would be the right time to show the thing that I forgot to show earlier, which is another magical thing that ZBrush does. And that is when you bring in your scan data, so when I brought in the scan data, if you bring it in as an FBX file with the cameras, uh, those cameras actually get brought, brought into ZBrush as images. So here, uh, if I have this uh, object, um, the model here, and I want to actually zoom in on the exact camera and put my sculpture in front of it, I can do that. So right now, I just have a perspective camera, but notice here, I've brought in all 160 cameras from that scan.
right? So if I go to my, um, let's go to one of these cameras. Let's go to, and this is going to be interesting to try and get this to stay in still. Here we go. Let's go to camera 17. Uh, that's not a really good one. <laughs> um, let's go to a different one here. Uh, let's go up to, let's go to camera 7. OK, so here's a, a perfect example, right? So you see my scan over here. However, if I um, reduce the opacity of my model, you'll see that beneath it is the picture, right? So I can zoom in, uh, or I can just bring up the opacity of that. And I have that camera stored, so I can always go to this camera. And here, I can either project on some things that weren't on there by using the Z project uh, brush, as uh, Paul told me a few minutes ago. Uh, so I can bring in the details as well as the poly paint uh, in, onto the model. And again, I can go to any one of these cameras. So here's camera eight. There's that. I can reduce the opacity of it and see the uh, image underneath and then go back up. Um, and I can uh, toggle the uh, opacity mode on and off. So um, this is a great way to kind of go in and capture some of the stuff that maybe uh, didn't come through right um, and, and be able to do it that way. Um, so that's another way you can kind of go in and, and kind of polish up your paint and get it to look a lot better. All right, so now um, I've got my model. Uh, let me go ahead and turn off the camera here and go back to my um, perspective camera. And basically, you know, it's just when I go to the different cameras, it goes to the camera po pointing to the object and also puts the image that the camera actually took during the photogrammetry session uh, right behind it. OK, so now we uh, have that model. Uh, so the next thing we want to do is we want to wrap that model to good topology, right? So here, I've got the exact same model. And uh, I, I think I picked, did I pick a dark color? Why is this showing up? Let me try a different. Um, oh, the texture is on, that's why. All right, so let me turn the texture off. Here, oh, it is off. Okay, so why is this so dark? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, if you look at it here. Um, Polyframe's on, I think. Is it poly? Okay. Yeah, polyframe's on. Ah, okay. But even with it's off, it's weird. Okay, it doesn't matter. I, can you see it? Can everybody see it okay? The topology on here? It's mm dark. It is dark. OK, so let's do this. Let me make sure that I don't have anything on here. And if worst case scenario, I'll just, um, oh, yeah, that's why. This is one. OK, so I'll just uh, fill it with white. Nope, that's not doing it either. Um, oh, that's You have one. a texture you're transparent. The topacity is all the way down. That's why. Yeah. All right, here we go. We're good now. OK, so we're looking at this, and now it's got good topology. So how do I get this good topology on here? Now, you can do this in ZBrush. Uh, you can do the project, uh, uh, go in here under the, the project um, option and do projection. But um, I use a third-party tool to do this called ZWrap, and I'll show you guys how that works. And it's pretty great. So here, I've got a base mesh that I use. And this is one that I uh, purchased and repurposed on. Um, I purchased it from ArtStation and repurposed it uh, by getting rid of the toes because we really, you know, I mean, when it's very rare that you get toes with, with sculpt data. And basically, what you do here is you just load the two models. So I've got here's the scan and um, a low poly version of it. And then here is the model itself or, or the topology. And then you basically just match points. And you don't have to be do too many of them uh, for this one. I think I did about, uh, anyway, it looks like about 50 of them or so, 52 uh, points. And you just basically um, map different um, points. So like, let's say here, I want to do this area and this area. I want this uh, topology to be in this area. So basically, you just kind of place points on both of these, right? And then uh, once you do that, once you get the, the points placed, and again, you don't have to go overboard. You just place the points where you want them to be. And then you go to the wrapping here. And um, I was complaining about something. Um, oh, let's see. I think I made a, let me undo this. I think, did I add, yeah. Uh, so there's, I think I added extra points. I added that 54 fourth point. No worries. So let's go back to point select here. Yeah, I added this 54th point. So let me lift that back up to, oh, I don't want to add a point. I want to move this one. Here we go. 
move this to here and click here and now we're good. Uh, and now we go to wrapping and click on compute and this is the coolest thing ever uh, to watch. So I just click on this button and then it basically, well, this is a pretty fast machine I'm working on. Uh, usually it kind of does the little animation, but you can see that it took that good topology and wrapped it around uh, my model. And then I basically take that and load it into ZBrush at the lowest subdivision level. So this is what I do. And then um, all the subsequent subdivision levels with all the details on top get added to that. So here we go. So I've got my model uh, with uh, the, the polygrouping, uh, I mean, sorry, not the polygrouping, but the, um, the polypaint as well as uh, the texture map, but I have it on a great uh, topology that I can animate with, okay? So that's the first stage, how I'm doing, I'm doing great on time. All right. Okay. So, um, so that's basically how to do the body and get it from a triangle soup hell to something that has good topology that can be animated and you can do stuff with it. And in a little while, I'll show you how you can pose this model. Uh, again, there's uh, manual ways of doing it with Transpose Master, but then there's faster ways of doing it as well. Uh, any questions coming in or anything like any that? Any questions there, Paul, live on the floor? Uh, so there was the Z-Wrap is what you just showed? Yes. Uh, for everybody. Um, and then the plugin that you were using to show all the UVs was already mentioned. So I think everyone's been answering them as you've been okay. going, actually. Okay. Keep the train rolling. Awesome. Okay, so now the most important part of the scan, are, again, the proportions are important, so this is exactly my proportions. Uh, but again, the head is the most important part. And uh, sometimes you want to do some extra things with the head. Um, like, for example, you want to make it smile or, may, or have expressions. So I don't know if they talked to, about it during the, the scan truck uh, talk, but in addition to doing the body scan, uh, they also do facial expression scans. And uh, you can load those in, or um, I'll show you this other trick uh, that I use. So there is this uh, base mesh that you can get from the 3D scan store. And it's free if you're not going to be using it commercially. And if you are going to be using it commercially, there is a fee for it. Uh, but it is a, a really good topology head, right? And it comes in three different subdivision levels, right? So it comes with uh, the three subdivision levels that are in there. It comes in as a ZTL. And if you load that ZTL in, uh, it gives you <laughs> this magic, right? So it gives you these layers. Uh, and so when you go to the layers here, you'll notice that you have all of these different layers. Uh, and each one of them has different expressions on them. So for example, I want to close the eyes. I can close the eyes, right? And if I want uh, to the brows down, I can do that. And uh, these might show better maybe with polyframe off. Uh, if I want to do a close smile, and you can see that the topology is moving uh, according to what I need, right? If I have, want to do a smile open, uh, if I want to do a long face, you know, oh, right? Uh, if I want to open the mouth to the side, open the mouth to the other side, right? All these expressions come with this base mesh, right? Uh, cheek pulls, cheek suck. Mm, mm, right? It, it's hard not to do these without, without the sound. Mm, a cheap mm. puff, right? Okay. Like, you know, doing that. Uh, and then there's the phonemes, right? There's the, uh, there's the ch. You know, if you're, somebody's going to make a ch sound, ch, right? Or somebody's going to say, <laughs> right? So all of these, like everybody's kind of thinking of Gollum right now from Lord of the Rings, like M, M, right? So it does all these for you. This base mesh does. Okay, so um, you've got all of these layers that come in with this base mesh. Now, what if we were able to wrap this base mesh onto an existing model and then get that model to do these expressions? And that's exactly what I've done. So here, uh, what I've done is I, in my uh, model here, I've got, uh, let's hide these ones. I've got a bust, and let me go ahead and bring that up. So basically, I took just the bust of me. Uh, and you'll notice here that something is a little bit different in this one, where I don't have the beard, OK? And I don't have the beard because I actually did a laser scan of me in 2009, uh, which you can see like the technology's evolved so much. Because with that laser scan, 
uh, it was just head on, and you can see these, um, maybe the polyframe will show it better, but you can see that it, it occluded some of these areas. But the good news about it is I had my mouth and chin without, uh, the, um, without the beard. So I basically just projected that, used the Z-Project brush to, be, to get that to come onto uh, the, the uh, mesh that I had. Okay, so once I had this, then I basically went back to wrap and did a mapping of my face to that model. Now what's really nice about that base mesh that I talked about is it comes with this texture map. And I think somebody showed that yesterday uh, where they basically had the topology on there. I think it was, uh, it was Damien, right? He showed uh, the face with the topology yeah. on there. Yeah. So this does the exact same thing. But in addition to that, it also has these points where you can map the points to the points on the scan. So this actually is a pretty arduous process. And I had to do it at work for uh, maybe about 10 facial expressions for the character I was working on. So it gets to be a little bit tedious, but um, it, it goes by pretty fast. And then you basically just get this kind of mapping of what you have here, which is the scan data, to this base mesh that has all these points that should be corresponding to what you have over here. And again, similar to that, you just go in here and you click on Compute, and it basically wraps that your head onto that specific uh, mesh. Now here, the mouth is a little bit open, so to fix that, I can very easily go to select points here and maybe put uh, a few more points, maybe one, two, three. So I'm doing this live, and then one, two, three. The only thing you need to make sure of is to make sure that the points are corresponding. So 107, 108, 109, and then 110, 111, and 112. And then go back to wrapping again and click on compute. And then now it's uh, the wrapping is a little bit closer to what we want. And then you just basically export this, load it into ZBrush. Again, ZBrush is the hub of all of this stuff. And then you get something like this over here, right? Um, this is looking a little bit ominous. So let's go ahead and add some eyes. Uh, there we go. Time uh, check for your R. 15, 15 minutes left. 15 Whoa, minutes. okay. That's good. Know. I'm actually... 15 minutes. Yeah, I, I can do it. 15, 15 minutes. minutes. Uh, okay, so here we've got the eyes uh, that came in, right? Uh, and in addition to this, what's really great about this base mesh uh, is that uh, 3D Scan Store has a bunch of displacement maps and texture maps that you can map onto there. So I basically just took one of those texture maps and, and uh, added it to it. And there's also a displacement map. Uh, and there's also a, a primary, secondary, and tertiary displacement map. So you basically um, can bring that on. And now you can see that I can zoom in quite a bit and get some really good detail on here. Uh, maybe if I turn, uh, or if I just uh, say new texture here, you can see the level of detail I'm getting. And all this is happening very, very quickly. Uh, again, I would love to do these uh, uh, by hand and take my time. But with the production schedules that I have, I have to move pretty fast. So you can see that I've added primary, secondary, and I can even subdivide this one more level uh, to level seven and add tertiary uh, detail to it. Uh, so it's all, again, store a morph target so you can erase certain areas if you need to, uh, but you can get some really great stuff. And what's really amazing about this is I also get all those layers. So all those layers are here. Now the problem is this is pretty high resolution, so I have to do this, um, all these things a little bit slower. So I'm gonna do the cheek puff here and you can see that I'm doing a cheek puff on my sculpt, right? Without having to sculpt this, I can just get all these expressions given to me right in here. Um, again, this uh, machine is really fast. What is this thing? I want one of these at home. Uh, yeah, I'm and like, in there. Don't worry about it. Wait, whoa, he's complaining. Wait, the speed's too much? No, no, it's... How about the side super smile? quick? No, the, the, side the, smile? the speed is really good. I yeah. want one of these machines at home because at my machine, this it's thing a, falls. It's a Dell Precision. Uh, 25th Dell anniversary of the Dell Precision. And it's actually a mini tower. It's not even a full system. Mm. It's quite impressive. My character Our in here is saying, mm, give me mm. one of those. Dell, if you're listening... Am I right? That's a Dell, that's oh, a Dell 25th anniversary. Here's the other funny thing. If you go the other direction with these, you get some really funky stuff happening. Uh, so, oh, you look like a Mad Max character for a second there. Right, whoa, you know, and again, it, it, with the sliders, if you use the sliders on fun. top, they're better off. Okay, how many minutes do I have to go? At least 11. Oh, wow, okay. All right, so that kind of gives you an idea minutes. of uh, how oh, you can well, do a bust. Not bad. And um, 
So that way, if you have close-ups and if you're doing expressions, you wanted me to do one, uh, Louis, I will definitely... A side smile, I want this one. Ah. Side smile, okay, smile. Slack jaw, um, do they call that, I think. Slack jaw. Cheek pull, you want to... The best part is when you pull on these, you actually do it to your mouth, even though you don't need to. You I know. Do it. Like, you're pulling on the slider and you're like, Mm, I'm gonna do it too. Ah, yeah. see, he's doing it. I'm doing it. Look, ah. you can't oh, stop. I can smell with the rock. Look at my eyebrow. Too. I yeah. cooking. Bring those. Look at my face, real quick. Look at. It. Use me for um, reference. I, are you asking me to look at your? I'm looking. Look at me. I'm looking at you. Look at me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So like you do that, you take a picture of right. it, and then you try to match that yeah. in here, uh, which which is really awesome. People at home saw uh, the eyebrow, the people's eyebrow. Oh, oh, and you can put in oh, eyebrows, oh, and uh, you can put in um, uh, eyelashes and all that kind of stuff, right? So now I've got the teeth. I can go back and do that, and I've got one other thing to show, and the timing is just working out perfectly here. So here, for example, if I do that cheek pull, I have the teeth inside. Uh, I got to talk to Dr. Zhivago. There you go. Uh, yeah. And get my actual teeth scanned. I've got some generic ones in here, but yeah, you can you can get some really. Interesting expressions going on here, and le and uh, last but not least, let's talk about posing the model itself. So, um, got a model here that I've already posed. So I'll just go back to that. Let's turn all this off and move up to. This is something else, Paul. All right, I can't believe we we'll get to see this stuff all day. I mean. Day two, we're look at this scan truck. Look at all right. kinds of the so gods of war. Here, here's a pose. Of course, I can pose this thing. Oh, what's going on with the button? Ten minutes, all right. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. All right. I'm good. I will. I'm exactly where I want to be. So here's a pose that I really I got very very quickly. Uh, again, uh, this is something that I can fix. This used to be hell, but now it's not because um, you know it, it used to, posing is kind of hard um, and. Posing things right, it takes a long time, but there's this new thing, basically, that does it through GoZ. And I don't have time to show the entire process, but you can watch it, but there's this program called Character Creator. And basically, what you do is you go to the low subdivision level of your model, and you send it over to Character Creator, and then you basically place a few points, and it rigs it for you, it binds it for you. It's not perfect, or I'm not used to it, I just got this. Uh, it just came out in October. Um, and so once you do that, you basically can go in here and they have libraries of motions that you can apply to it. So here, for example, I want to have my guy uh, walk, right? So I just go to walk here, loads in that. There's the animation Whoa, of the walk. you're gonna get us canceled. Wow, that is a pretty mm. fancy walk. Look at that guy. Right? Look at um, that walk. Oh, Great yeah. show right mm -hmm. there. Fresh in the air. I, I think I chose the female walk. Let's terror. go ahead and choose the male the walk. The terror, here we go. Yeah, this is gonna be a little bit like, yo, okay? So, um, but what's really beautiful about this is you can also choose some idle poses, and you can get some really natural looking poses, so you just basically go, oh, okay, whatever here. Yeah, just a little right? movement, just, just a, a little, little movement. Little movement. Just, just a little. A little. See a street foot? That's our street foot right there. Yeah. Come on, West Coast, baby. And then That's you the just roast. press Go Z, and yeah. it shoots it back into ZBrush, and then you can add the higher subdivision levels. Mar somewhere Marco, so, somewhere Marco Plufo was up here a minute ago, was looking at that going, wow, press the button, here we go. Right, so, I mean, what Marco does is amazing, like, that guy's yeah, work blown. is unbelievable. Uh, but, um, and, but it's just, you know, like if you're again, you're in, in fast production, uh, you get a mocap, uh, you can put it in here, you can match it to the mocap, or you can go to their vast library of motions and you can match, uh, match the motions to here. And then you just basically add the higher subdivision levels and all this is happening in this beautiful, amazing program that I thank you guys for every day of my oh, life. Oh, hey. Thanks. ZBrush. Thanks, thank all you. Right. To end that, that's, swell. that's real swell of you to say that. Thank you. I also want to mention a couple more things. Um, I had some slides for if I didn't have ZRap working, but I do. Uh, I just want to mention that I also do mechs, and I do have a training on Noman Workshop on that as well. I mostly do mechs. That's kind of my passion, but I do this kind of stuff for work. I do organic as well. ZBrush is my tool of choice. It be Kermeco. Kermeco. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so you can basically. Um, sense. What were you saying? It makes sense. He was giving you another one. Yeah. Kermec. Oh. Kermec. Oh, oh, that's awesome. Oh, yeah, like get Mac. it? Kermeco. Man, that's why. Look at that. It sank now. A Louis and moment. that's a moment with Louie. A moment with Louie. It's like a marketing workshop happening here live on the real, real time. It's like deep thoughts. We got an AR model of you as well, yes, by the way. Yeah, What's that? Leave more time because we have an we have an AR model of him to pop up. We as well. do have that's an AR point. model. Yeah. All Stay right. Well, one. that's my presentation. Thank well, you. Well, let's Sian take a look at live, but let's have that. Let's take a look at Ara at a larger size. La larger than, than life, Ara. Can than just up there, in person here with us. He's you know. larger than life in, in a way. Yeah. 
Well, look, that's look, a ballerina. That's a ballerina. Here it comes. Burned away. There he is. And that's, look at that. That's, that's, that's the scan. That's the original scan you did, right? Uh, that was that was one that was done um, when I did the the tutorial. Uh, so it's an older one, but again, it was posed using the look um, at that. the the software I showed you. Uh, but yeah, um, you can load this right. I mean, I, this is in Unreal, so yeah, you just decimated yours, right, and then just threw it in Unreal. That's pretty much it. So we're you all in Unreal right this now. Way. You think about objects, think about people, think about all this stuff. You guys scan stuff, put it in. You know what he good. looks like? All the looks like you're what? the offensive offensive coach for like a football team there. He does. Hey, well, I kind of am working with uh, football uh, people. I, I've so. said that. <laughs> That's true. You are, That's Mr. True. Mr. Monday Night. Here we there go. You go. So, right. man, that was a lot. Paul, how do you feel about it? Listen, I'm excited. I know a lot of people have been excited about this whole day, whole day, and they really appreciate <laughs> someone walking them through scan data and how to process the data, how to get it onto new meshes. So I know several people are like, I've been looking for something like this to understand it better. So any questions? Thanks. There? Thank, oh, we got all the questions. I mean, let me see no if I missed. Questions. Oh, one last question did come up. I don't know. I maybe. Saw it pop up. Do you know any good Android app scanning software? Does any, I, I don't. The stuff that I put up uh, does have Android stuff as well. Let me bring it back up here. Um, uh, I think, I think um, Polycam does have an Android version. Scandi has, I think some of these uh, that I brought up earlier, uh, if you go back to the video and watch it, uh, some of the, the um, scanning software that I brought up does have uh, Android versions as well. Let me come at you about something. There, you had your clean-shaven face there. That was like the the clean-shaved face colorway. If you had wanted to put the beard back, you'd probably just take like a sphere and pop it in there and just start manipulating and, and sculpt the hair. Correct? You could, or you could just scan bash the one you had before and bring it in and put then just back in and uh, sculpt in some more of the hair. You just, or you can use fiber mesh. Right. Okay. And then right. what? You're going to fiber mesh it and maybe dyna mesh that hair? Are you fiber mesh or how does that? How uh, that no, work? you just fiber mesh it. I, th I think a couple of a few um, ZBrush um, summits ago, uh, Damien showed how to use uh, fiber mesh, and that's probably the best fiber mesh hair tutorial I've ever seen. So go watch that. Interesting. And well, then, you're talking about Damien Kendall? Yeah. 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 Dame, standard. Dame, Dame Standard Brush. Yeah. Dame Standard Brush guy. Chock yeah. full of information. Hey. So the the other thing would be like if it was for a 3D print of that magnitude. Then definitely we would be dynameshing that. Yeah, you'd, yeah, yeah. You would need to have. Volume. You set. can. Yes, there have been, first and sculpt on. You could it still use fiber mesh. Just make the bigger volumes. Right. That's right? what I was thinking. And then, then you can have that all. You got to use unified mesh or dynamesh or live boolean for that matter. There's so many ways to go. See ahead. what I did? I got you going on it. <laughs> this is again one of those things where things just keep popping in my head of ideas of way to do it another way and another way and another way. And that's the beauty that I like. Try it. And that's uh, find different techniques, and that's the point why we also do the summit is invite people like R and the scan truck and show you all what is possible in ZBrush and that there is. Did you have fun with the segment? Something. I loved it. I I'm a big photo, photo, uh, photogrammetry person. I've been playing with scanners for I don't know about 12 years now, 10 years. So I got one on my phone. You know that, right? You do. Everyone's got one on their phone. Well, I got a nice one. It works really well. <laughs> I mean, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna name names, but at this point, everyone's got one. At this point, one. most people, yeah. Yeah. So what about you? Did you have a fun time? Thank you very much. I did. I've been going to Zebra Summit since the first one, yeah. and uh, I'm really happy to be part of the con contributing community. It's good to Thank see you, you back here in person me. again. Yeah. Yeah. It was good to have you in person, and it was also good to see your colleagues out there, Jigs Love and uh, Vlad uh, Galat. And we also had our uh, on-location correspondent, our fellow teammate and friend, uh, Ian Robinson. Ian, man, you, you really run the gamut this week. He's gone into Sideshow Collectibles. Today, he got himself scanned it, ready in about an hour. It's like lens crafters. He's going to get his scan. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, don't, uh, don't run away from uh, the screen because we're going to be doing some giveaways and yep. such. And I just want to say thank you on behalf yeah, of Yeah, thank you, Ara. Say again. And thank you, Ara. I, I'm about to. I just doing? want to say thank you. Is that OK with you? Can I, Paul, can I, go can ahead. I, can I have a moment with Please. Paul? Thank you. All right, thank you Moments for being a part. Jigs and Vlad, thank you, too, for being a part of this segment. I know uh, we've had a lot of conversations. I was super excited to bring something like this to you all as well. Again, this is something very unique that we've never done before, right? So tomorrow we've got another one of these. Hey, hey, hey. Where we're going Spoilers, somewhere. Brother. We're doing a locational thing again. Spoilers. So I, I was really excited about these three locational ones just to... We did a good, I, think, very different. I think, you know, the team did a great job pull, pulling it together yeah. today. It was really good. I really want to good. thank, uh, are you done thanking him? I'm, I'm done. Thank you. Okay, go, 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 okay go. fair enough. On behalf of everybody at, uh, at Maxon and uh, the entire ZBrush team, 
I want to thank you for being here today and, and demonstrating, again, some of these future technologies, the current and future technologies, and how they are impacting and affecting workflows, and how they are going to impact and affect uh, change, probably in educational circumstances. As your colleague was saying earlier, you like to work with educational uh, partners to help uh, the youth of today learn the skills of tomorrow. So I'm, I'm R -S squared. R.S. Squared. <laughs> R.S. Squared, two, right. I'm elated to be a part of that as well. So on behalf of all of us here, uh, thank you very much. And we will go to Paul Gabriel with our prizes. He's standing up. Look at that. What are you doing? He's attacking. Can't go too yeah. close. Virtual versus the real. Let's, <laughs> let's run the real. We'll be back for some prizes with Paul Gabriel. <laughs> I'm Louis Tucci. We'll see you soon. All right, here we go. Some giveaways again, and as always, for those of you that are just turning in for the first time, why? Number one. Number two, <laughs> let's get some giveaways going here. So again, you register during the shows. We'll put that up for you when registration becomes available. Between the presentations, we wipe the slate, so it's a clean set of open for people to register. So you do have to register every single presentation. It's not one of these things where you register once, and then that's it for the whole day. You gotta be here, you gotta be live, be able to see this. So as you see, we're giving away the ultimate ZBrush guide course is one of the things we're gonna give away right now. So let me see who my winner is for that. And I am, oh, Darren Naveen. Darren Naveen, let me put that in. You are the winner. So let me put that in. Can they win there. twice? They can they win twice? No. Paul says, nah. uh, I'm putting in the chat. Stop distracting me. I'm Sorry. trying to stay focused over here with hey, giveaways. Listen. Checking my notes. Okay. Running through the game here. So let's keep going along here. Let's do let's do one of these. Let's do since we since Ara was here with us and he brought it up, the Noman Workshop. Let's do a six month subscription. A six month subscription to the Noman Workshop. So here is our winner, uh, Jenna. Hold on, I just. Close it without looking at the last name. <laughs> Jenna Soverna. So, oh boy. It's that kind of day for me right now. Want so me to help you Soverna. Okay. Soverna. It's one of those one of those one of those days for me going right now. Soverna. There you go. <laughs> so let what well, I got more. I got more. I got more keep stuff. It coming, man. People. I'm gonna keep, keep them coming. coming. I'm gonna keep them coming. Keep it rocking and rolling. All right, let's give away one of uh, Shane Olson's lifetime membership to his 3D character workshop. This is something for those of you who really want to know how to do characterized uh, characters. This is it right here. So I'm going to draw that winner. How let's long is a lifetime? Get. It's a long time. It's a long time, that's for sure. All right, let's see who we got here. And let me make a copy of your name, Walter. Walter, you are the winner here. So Walter Jemens. Walter Jemens, here you go. Put it in the chat so you can see your name. There you go. I'm, I'm going. I'm still going. I still got one more to one. give. I got more to give. I got, I've got. i got more. Want to re-give that other one from Marcello? No, no, no. Can't do it right now. That's not right. how the system works. Lily, Fair stop enough. throwing curveballs at me. Sorry, brother. Okay. Four-course bundle to XMD again four course bundle so there's four courses here that you're going to get access to all right so here is our winner let me copy that confirm george crudo george crudo you are the winner he was a contestant in the sculpt off george crudo he was holy smoke i remember we showed his work oh there look at it look at you with those memories look at that hey. it's all coming smarter than coming I look. together for you right now it's coming i'm, I'm gonna do one more i'm doing one more Okay, because I'm, I'm just, I'm on a roll right now, and I'll be honest with you, I'm feeling good about this. Let's give away a tablet. Let's give away a Sense Labs Pen Medium Bundle tablet. You got everything you're seeing there in the picture. You got a sack of money Why you want to hand off? Why would you not want this? <laughs> Why would you not? Okay, here we go. Pen Tablet Medium. Let me draw the winner here. Here we go. Here we go. Let me get a copy of that. Autumn Nunberg. Autumn Nunberg. You have won a medium Sense Labs tablet bundle. Congratulations on that. All right, so those are their giveaways for this segment. We still have more, oh, and we still have Pixar coming up next. So don't go anywhere. 
We've got Caleb Rice from Pixar coming to show us Lightyear. Looking forward to seeing you back when we got him all ready to go here on the stage. We'll Locked see you in and loaded. Just a little bit. Locked and loaded. Hey, this uh, program, remember, is brought to you by our platinum sponsors, Dell Technologies and NVIDIA. Once again, promotional consideration and sponsorship brought to you by our platinum sponsors, Dell Technologies and NVIDIA. Dell celebrating the 25th anniversary. See you in a minute. Learn jewelry design and object fabrication through ZBrush. Expert, beginner, and every skill level in between. ZBrush Jewelry Workshops can help you bring your digital dreams into reality. Taught by leading industry professionals. Use the offer code SUMMIT to get a $100 discount on membership.
Learn jewelry design and object fabrication through ZBrush. Expert, beginner, and every skill level in between. ZBrush Jewelry Workshops can help you bring your digital dreams into reality. Taught by leading industry professionals. Use the offer code SUMMIT to get a $100 discount on membership. Live from the Mobian stage in Burbank, California, I am Louis Tucci, and to my left is Paul Gabriel. We are here on behalf of Maxon ZBrush, and a hello to all of our Maxonian friends and colleagues around the globe. We are now into deep, deep water into day two of the ZBrush Summit 2022. We had a sculpt off, and now we're going to finish up the day. Paul, how are you feeling over I this? I feel slide? fantastic. Super ready for this one. I, I you have am worked. Excited. I'm going to stop you from talking for one second oh, and okay. give you, and I'm going to give you your just desserts. Paul Gabriel has worked tirelessly for over eight years to make this next presentation possible with our friends from a little north, a little nicer. We are now going to what I call infinity and beyond. We're going to be bringing to the main stage uh, from Pixar. Caleb Rice, that's Caleb with a K. Roll the tape, let's get it set up for him to make his way onto the stage, and we are live in a second. We'll see you in one moment. Paul Gabriel, it's yes. really happened. You've done yes. it. I have to stand and give you a high five. Everybody, we did it. There he yeah, is. Pixar. Bam. Paul Gabriel right. has done it yet again. Ladies and gentlemen, Caleb Rice, welcome to the main thank stage you, here at the Zebra Summit 2022. How are you feeling? Yeah, I'm feeling good. Uh, thank you all for having me. Well, thanks. For, and then for him, too. He did a lot of footwork, too, to help us make this happen, too. You to, were on the other uh, end no of it. No problem. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. everybody there, too, that 
was willing to work and uh, let's yeah let's go ahead and have them show some light here. Now, hold yeah, on a second before you get awesome. anything started here. I want to draw attention to Caleb Shirk. Can we get a shot? Wait, of is that is that from the Pixar uh, store? Stand up a little bit at, the, the, at Pixar. No, no. Uh -huh. oh. I think yeah, still well, my sister got it for me. I'm not sure where it's that. from. Oh. But. Because you guys still have the unique store, right? At the uh, at, we do at the still have the store. Yeah. Awesome. So. Thanks. Yeah, for their that. store. By the way, their store is unique. You can only get the stuff at their store at at the studio. Yep. Like it's nowhere else. Like it's some of the artists are still doing designs there and everything, right? Yeah. Exclusive store, is what you're saying. Yeah, it's exclusive. You have to go to wow. Pixar Studio to get the yeah. merch there. It's awesome. We're very pleased to have you on behalf of everybody. Thank you. I'm a child right now. I'm just yeah. saying. He's freaking out. He's fanning just out. He's fanning out. A child right now. What was his name again? Evil Knievel, the guy. No. What? What's his name? Oh. Keanu Reeves. <laughs> Uh, ride the bikes. Uh, Duke, uh, Duke, oh, well, God, now you're going to, kaboom. Uh, Kid kaboom. Kid kaboom. There Kid kaboom, my favorite. Okay, take it away. Oh, well, thank you. And, no, I'm, I'm super stoked to be here. I mean, I'm a ZBrush fan just as much as uh, y'all are Pixar fans, so uh, I wouldn't have a job without uh, ZBrush, so thank you all. Thank you for I being here. I'm excited. Hey, um, nice all right, I will, let's see. I don't know where the keynote's showing up, but if it's on It'll pop my up. screen. Let's get his okay, screen cool. up on there. Uh, there you go. Yeah, there. okay, cool. So yeah, uh, today I'm just gonna do a talk sort of uh, uh, kind of compressing a little bit of art sculpting uh, on Lightyear. And uh, there's obviously a lot of different spots uh, in the pipeline where ZBrush is used and can be used, but I'm just gonna sort of talk about being, uh, being an art on, uh, on Lightyear and, and how we used uh, ZBrush. So yeah, uh, first off, I'm uh, just gonna show the sculpts I did of our uh, main kind of cast. Uh, Lightyear uh, had Buzz, obviously. Um, and one of the cool things was our uh, art director, Matt Nolte, kind of gave all of us uh, a, a different character to sort of focus on. So uh, Dean Heason had Buzz uh, sort of focus on his design. Uh, Matt took Darby, I took Mo, and then uh, Grant uh, took Izzy. So we each kind of had a different character that we were Focusing on, and uh, you know, we all sort of helped each other, and and I think ZBrush was a big part of that back and forth. Uh, so, I mean, some of the things I don't even have proof of <laughs> when they were just a drawing design because it was like Matt or or Grant or someone would just do a do a sketch, and then we'd do something quick in ZBrush, and then that sort of just was what evolved into some of these designs, and so. Yeah, so uh, I'm just gonna go down and uh, start with just where we started and how we kind of came to uh, Buzz's design, some of the other characters' uh, designs. And so uh, we still have two uh, clay sculptors at Pixar, uh, Greg Dykstra and Jerome Ramft, and they still are on um, all of our films. And I mean, there are definitely two sculptors who inspired me in terms of just my ZBrush sculpting. So it, it definitely was an honor to get to work with, uh, with Greg and, and I've worked with Jerome as well. And they've been the clay sculptors at uh, Pixar forever. So, uh, it, you know, that's kind of where, uh, where sculpting starts and, uh, and it, you know, it's cool that now we get to do digital sculpts as well and uh, with the clay sculpt. So uh, this was sort of before I came on to the film and uh, Greg had done this, uh, Matt had done a pass uh, that's up there of, of some drawings and uh, Dean as well of, of Buzz and, you know, the story just continuously evolves and, uh, you know, this was Angus's, uh, Angus McLean his movie, his his story of how he wanted to tell the uh, the sort of movie that was, you know, the movie in Toy Story. Yeah. And uh, that story just evolved, and, and that's how 
all Pixar movies are. There's so many versions of the movie before that final version. And so this version was definitely a younger buzz. And, uh, and so, as you can tell, it changed a lot from, from this starting point. So here was my first pass at sort of taking all those uh, drawings and uh, the Greg sculpt and Matt's designs, Dean's designs, and, and sort of getting into ZBrush and, and kind of throwing something on the board. <laughs> and so uh, this was sort of our first buzz that, that was in, in the computer. And uh, I mean, it, it wasn't long before the story changed and he wasn't this young anymore. Um, so it didn't feel like that was, it was the correct character. And that's part of, part of the design process is just like, how does that character feel? It's almost like you're casting for a movie and it's like, oh, no, that, that actor doesn't really fit. We're, let's keep, uh, let's keep casting. So, uh, we, you know, we kept casting and, uh, this wasn't necessarily our, our final buzz, but it was a, it was a starting point for that, uh, for an earlier version, and um, so after that, it, you know, it's more back to the drawing boards. So uh, Dean was sort of in charge of the design, and so he continued to do do design passes, and um, you know, we'd watch different boards and uh, things as the story evolved, and it started. The movie started to become more about an older version, an older buzz than what was originally. Uh, in the story, and so, you know, the design evolves. Uh, Greg came back on and did another sculpt uh, uh, as Dean was sort of doing these designs. I was like trying out some other characters, and so, you know, it, it, it was always like a nice kind of process when everybody sort of evolved on and working together to figure this stuff out. And as you can see, it's like now we're starting to get closer to that point where we were like, oh yeah, I think this is this is the design. Mm -hmm. um, and so after that, um, I had done another pass of of Buzz, and uh, this was sort of the uh, the version that I, I handed off to the characters team. And you know, characters in animation they continue to sort of build on the design and stuff. So, you know, it's sort of like in art, we just get it to a certain point where we're like, that that feels right. And then, um, you know, and it, it just kind of continues after that. But yeah, this was uh, sort of where I left off with Buzz and uh, we even uh, on this uh, right image over here, did a little 3D print of the head, which is the gray thing down there and just, uh, it, you know, having Greg sculpt in person, it was nice to have uh, another s sculpt uh, that that you could see uh, in person, sort of what that looked like. And um, yeah, and uh, we had uh, in animation, Jean Claude Tran was our uh, draw over lead um, in animation, so he he had done a really cool sketch. And so I took the ZBrush sculpt, and so this image up top was trying to hit just kind of move points around until it, it felt like his, um, his drawing because there was something kind of cool about that. And so, you know, there's just, it can, there continues to be exploration on, on these designs. And um, so the next one I'll, I'll talk about is um, on, on socks. Socks. And uh, yeah. So real quick question though, because oh, in the yeah. documentary, Angus was standing in front of the model with ZBrush behind him. Yeah. Were you in those meetings and mm -hmm. you guys were making changes live with him inside yeah. of ZBrush? Is that what you were doing? Yeah, so. In real time. Yeah, in real time. Uh, Did so he do that with all the you, characters? You didn't see me, uh, but I'm like off screen at a little computer is the, you know. Uh, You're looking for, being wait, projected. where am I? <laughs> and uh, yeah, and so. It's my foot. Yeah, that was pretty much, a, a, there's probably my foot in there, but yeah. Uh, we definitely did a lot of uh, interactive stuff with uh, with Angus, which was, uh, I mean, it was great because it, you know, it helped sort of evolve things. And, you know, at Pixar, it's always about like, okay, trying to figure out the director's vision and like who the characters are that, um, 
that they're trying to bring to life and, and tell their story. So, um, yeah, whenever it's like it can be interactive with the director, that's, right. that's always like super helpful to all the designers, to all the sculptors, everyone. So, um, Socks was, they had done a couple different passes of Socks, but um, Nicole Castro is, was a story artist and she had boarded out the um, first scene with of Socks where you kind of meet Socks and Angus loved the boards and she'd even made this poster from uh, yeah, the old, yeah, and the I, old one. I don't know where the, I'm like, the boards might be somewhere online. I, I didn't find them, so, and obviously I don't, you know, can't just like show that kind of stuff, but um, yeah, anyways, she did a great job boarding it. So my pass of socks was sort of based on, on those boards. Um, and so this was the ZBrush sculpts I did a, of socks and, awesome. uh, she had just sort of like this uh, football shaped head cat and I was like, okay, this is already pretty cute. So um, yeah, it was fun to get to do a pass of socks and a great I, I character. always loved great the, that yeah. character. Cute. He was a fun character yeah. in the movie. I like cute sometimes, that's cute. He became a fun character. And uh, yeah. yeah, so, and as you can see, uh, you know, things changed from this design once it went into model rig and in animation, um, I think, Tim Pixon was doing, he's an animator, was doing these tests with this model and sort of like simplifying rather than having all those joints moving in the arms and legs, uh, just sort of like they were stiff and just sort of the cat was moving like this and it was so much funnier, you know? So, you know, sometimes animation will do something that's like, oh right. yeah, that's, that's way better. So, you know, they kind of simplified the, um, the legs. I think Michael Comet did the, the final model rig on this. And Are you doing these poses yeah. before? Yeah, so after you're doing these poses. Yeah, so I do all the, you know, uh, all the poses and expressions, and it just kind of helps <coughs> see if the design's working. And right. you know, you're trying to get that same feeling. In this case, it was like some of the feeling that were that were in the boards and some of the things that Sox was doing. Like, I remember there was a shot of like socks running and there's just kind of like the the hands in the air that I thought, okay, this is really funny and would be a fun. Uh, so yeah, different poses kind of based on uh, things from uh, from reels and, and stuff, but just seeing if like, will this will this sort of work for, for animation and uh, you know, that Right. That just feeling yeah. of like, yeah, this is feeling right. Like this could this could be the character. So, um, yeah. So socks was a fun one, and then yeah, that the character does. sheet for the animators in a way too. Um, clever, very clever. Uh, well noted, Paul. Hmm. And uh, yeah. So uh, next uh, next character I'll go over is Darby. So uh, Matt Nolte, uh, he was our character art director, and. Matt was the one who sort of gave me my uh, a shot to, to do character design on this and um, is the reason that I got to stay in the art department at Pixar. So um, I'm like so thankful for him and our uh, Tim Evett, our production designer who brought me on to, to Lightyear because I, I originally was hired to do um, characters like model rig and uh, on day, basically on day one at Pixar they were like, oh well, you, would you be interested in doing some sculpting? Our uh, production designer, you know, recommended that you come on to do sculpting work, sure. and uh, it was it was Tim, and they they were like, okay, uh, yeah, we want you to sculpt Buzz Lightyear for the <laughs> like on my first week, and I was like, oh, okay, oh hello, yeah, welcome. Hello. I'm, one of, yeah, I'm one of the famous characters from Pixar. Here you go. And so yeah, and and sort of by doing um, like working on Buzz and and then on Socks, Matt was like, oh, I want to give you some character design assignments, and and he really like mentored me, and I, he comes from a 2D animation background, so I just learned so much from, I mean in the just the way that he uh, goes about character design. That's Were you nervous? Um, oh yeah, I was really nervous at first. And I mean, I looked up to all these people, you know, I, sure. uh, and so, it, but you know, once you start working with everybody and it's like, oh, everybody's so cool and it, 
it's just, it's like a meet your heroes moment in a good way, not in the, in the don't meet your heroes moment. It's like, a, oh yeah, you can meet your heroes and they, they can really be awesome people. Awesome. They have so, the same passions as you, right? So, yeah. Yeah, there's a connection. I'm with that. Both. Yeah. So anyways, Matt, here's his awesome designs for Darby. I included this other one that he had done of Buzz in an earlier version of Alicia. Um, and, and I'll get to that later, but that was another reference I was using. But um, here was my pass at Darby, and she was, <laughs> she was a fun one to get to work on. Uh, I just loved that, like, Matt is always thinking just like, let's make it super graphic, simple shapes. And if you look back at Pixar, that's just a common, with all their characters, it's, it's really like, breaking it down to really simple shapes and kind of going from there. And, and it's almost like just adding detail if necessary in a way and not trying to, you know, if we really need, you know, that eye bag or that whatever it is, sort of like thinking big and working into the detail. So w with sculpting, it, it was thinking about the character design process of just, you know, how how they work on characters at Pixar. So th this really was like such an opportunity too for me to just learn so much about character design and stuff. So yeah, Darby was a great example because Matt already had all these great drawings that uh, I was pretty much just trying to make what he did in the drawings. So uh, yeah, Darby was a fun one. And her, her design also, it, you know, evolved once that got into animation and model rig and that kind of stuff. But yeah, this was the, the version I passed off, which I had fun with it, so. She was a fun character, too, in the movie. Yeah. Like, Pixar's character development is just ridiculous. Par excellence. Dude, it's, it's awesome. French kiss. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, they, a lot of the characters all had very different roles, too, from the, from the last movie. I mean, I think at this point, she was like, an ex, like a bug exterminator. Um, and so, you know, a lot of these sort of like outfits and things are sort of based on what uh, their original sort of role in the film was. Um, but that howitzer for shooting insects, look at that thing. I know. Yeah, that's a, that's an insect gun? A, yeah. <laughs> so, that's, that's, I'm just that's some serious I'm just saying you're blowing holes in the floor at this point. Where did a cockroach go? He survived. Good, good call, Louis. <laughs> but yeah, so um, the next character <laughs> I wanted to talk about was uh, Alicia and um, Dean had done a really cool design of Alicia, but uh, the story was changing and um, eventually Alicia and Izzy w became related. So once that happened, you know, her, her design changed, but sort of before they, they were related, um, Alicia, ha we all sort of did different passes on uh, Alicia's design. And so this bottom one was uh, another example of where I got to just sort of do a, a, you know, a, a design, and this was sort of aging up uh, a design Dean had done, and then over on the right here uh, was a drawing I'd done of, of an Alicia design, which I then took uh, for this um, one of Buzz and her, the sculpt I did, um, and you know, tried to uh, tried out my own design, uh, and I had done kind of put a bunch of different uh, Alicia designs from uh, all of us. I think Grant, uh, Dean, and Matt, all, everybody had, had done a pass at uh, what Alicia might look like. And uh, so it, w it was just a good way of, um, and I was kind of going off of one of Matt's, that earlier drawing I'd shown with uh, Buzz talking to her. And, uh, you know, so sometimes, you know, if, if we weren't quite finding the character design, everybody would just sort of start taking passes and drawing. So it was it was super collaborative, and um, and so then uh, after was when you know Matt was like, I want you to start working on Mo, and uh, Angus had come up to me and said, uh, I want. I'm thinking of Taika Waititi, so I want you to try to make him look like Taika. And so I had done a ton of sketches of Taika, and um, and I just started in drawing and just was sort of sketching. And uh, eventually, I did uh, I think like four different 
versions in ZBrush of Mo, and there was one that everyone, like everyone was sort of walking past my computer and they'd be like, oh, that's the one. And so it's always fun when everyone sort of agrees like, yeah, that's it. And, yeah. and it just comes down, it's like, oh, that character feels right. And, uh, you know, that, that's sort of that ending goal of, of what we do in art is like, oh yeah, that character feels like it's, it's the one we want. So um, I think this was back when he was, uh, so his uh, outfit sort of reflects, it's, uh, he was a doctor, like a, like a children's doctor, and uh, <laughs> kind of different character, but still uh, pretty uh, silly and goofy. And so mm -hmm. I had fun kind of working on this character that was gonna be kind of fun and silly. That's great. Really so thank you. Uh, and yeah, so you know, with the expressions and stuff, it was like I had all this reference now from Matt and Dean and like how they handle sort of then doing all the character, drawing out all the character expressions and stuff. And I had already sculpted a lot of those. So I was like, okay, now it's even easier sort of for me to like draw sort of like, okay, what's the squash and stretch? What's all this stuff? And it's like once you sort of run the character through that and just see how it articulates, try to think about how it's gonna articulate and stuff, it, it sort of informs the design too. Sometimes I'll, I'll start messing around with, with that kind of stuff and I'll go back and change the design because I'm like, oh, it doesn't, you know, something just is unbalanced and it's not working. So, but still just trying to keep that kind of cartooniness and, uh, uh, and then th this was uh, Grant's designs for Izzy and um, Diaz, and uh, this is a good example of one where I didn't, I was searching and like couldn't even find the the original uh, designs for them because they were just like uh, sketch you know sketches Grant had done, and uh, and they they sort of just evolved into you know I had done a couple of early. Uh, designs of of both these characters and then it just sort of was like we had them in there start to you know hone in hone in on the design and and then eventually it just you know it it was these characters and uh so yeah this is uh sort of last two i, I put in here is just cool uh, ones that we i'm not gonna lie i own the art book yeah i knew you were gonna Got say it. that it's on my <laughs> shelf I have it. I really there. like her pants. You missed, but I'm a big art book collector. I don't know if you saw. Oh, really? I, I usually get a lot of the art book movie, and we were we were talking to God of War. I'm like, mm-hmm. Check mark. The deluxe edition. He pre-ordered. He was pre-ordering while we were on the set. I mean, he was buying pre-ordered. the damn thing over here. I just like seeing the work that you guys all do, and everybody oh, does. That's so cool. You pull it off the shelf, get inspiration. I like yeah. the pants on that uh, that character. She's uh, she's interesting. That's that's an interesting. Yeah, and this element. this was a version where she was, um, like a. Pl um, like a forest ranger type character. And um, a lot of the costumes, I mean, Grant, Grant did a ton of work on, on really like all the costumes. And uh, we had uh, Callum Watts, an, an artist who, who does, did a bunch of like Star, uh, Star Wars type, uh, sure. I mean, he, he's done work on Star Wars, but uh, he did a ton of costume work. So a lot of this costume stuff is based on his, uh, his stuff, which, definitely was leaning more realism and then we sort of just like stylized it a little bit but a lot of the um, a lot of the costumes in the film are, are based on uh, his his work that he had done he had done early on and so for your that's... your face expressions that you were doing is yep. this is that what ends up getting put into the blend shapes or is that no so the animators are using that no it, it's more of a, a sort of model packet type uh, mm -hmm. you know just piece of artwork and and I would you know uh, everybody in the characters team had access to all the um, all the sculpts and stuff that I did and sometimes they'd be brought in and you know uh, but with with the rigging process and, and characters process, it's it's pretty much like okay, we have to really like. Um, it, it's more of a reference point, like a trying to hit a drawing almost, because, you know, with. Um, it, it's very difficult, basically, you yeah. know, getting all the rigs and stuff to, to do a lot of these things. So. Um, yeah, it, it's more of a reference point, and and none of this stuff has like 
final topology or anything. So, right. you know, when I ha hand this off, it's like characters will will sort of do a pass, and you know, it'll have the final topology, um, and then uh, at Pixar, it, the people that do the final model also rig it. Um, so, you know, that's a whole nother huge process, yeah. and then animations involved in that, and then animation will try posing it, and rigging will have to go back and and sort of uh, do a lot of work. I mean, it's, you know, it's a, a process to get these characters moving and doing that kind of stuff, so, um, yeah. So when, when I'm doing it in a sculpt way, it's not really thinking about the topology um, for the for the final topology, but um, I do think about topology when I sculpt, and I'll, I'll, I'm just going to sort of demo uh, a character, and yeah, I, I'm I'm thinking a lot about um, sort of edge flow and stuff when I'm when I'm sculpting. Yeah. Uh, oh, so, finally, somebody yeah. says what I was thinking. I was thinking that the whole week. I was waiting for. You thinking about edge flows the whole week? I was thinking about edge flow the whole week. <laughs> I swear to you, it's, 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 that's the only thing on my mind. I was waiting. Like yesterday, I tried to get Damien Candley. He says, "Yeah, the edge flow." And here we are again. The yeah, edge yeah. flow. <laughs> what a joy. I, well, as a Pixar fan, I know every film they try to do something, I don't know, because I mean, you're here, I'm going to ask. Yeah. Technology-wise, they're always trying to push something on a film. Like, you know, obviously, like, Incredibles was hair. Bugs Life was crowd. And I think, yeah. like, Bray was mm. fur and hair, right, and figuring all that stuff out. Well, was there something specific on Lightyear 2 that they're like, hey, we've never really done this. Let's push this yeah. element. I mean, I think the, the thing on Lightyear, and that comes from more of, like, let's really push the just level of detail, mechanical, you know, which uh, something like Zerg, for example, it's like had all these pieces and, uh, you know, that's very much unlike any any Pixar character. Yeah. It's just like... It's good to see a, you make a triumphant return. Uh, yeah, yeah. A, a lot of detail on that kind of stuff. And um, I did some final modeling on the film. I got a character's credit, but I didn't. I don't deserve credit for any of the, you know, rigging, uh, anything like that. But I did some of the final modeling, and it was it's tough stuff, Is you it? know, to do. Well, I I did. I mean, Greg Peltz designed Zerg and did a whole sort of uh, VizDev model. Yeah. I did some final modeling on like his head and that blaster thing, um, because it was just such a massive thing that. Um, you know, it, we sort of split it up to just to get it finished, right? Um, because then uh, characters had to rig it to do all that stuff, and uh, so um, yeah. I, so I was on helping out with all, uh, with some of the modeling stuff, um, but uh, Greg's uh, Greg Peltz's way of doing his previs stuff was he was using Maya and just sort of. Uh, bashing together shapes and, and things like that. So there's there was a lot of just like uh, intersecting pieces type stuff. Um, and then you know it's like you have to do all that all that geometry. So uh, I had to do like all the final geometry on the the head and stuff. But it was already in like it already looked like how it did. It right. just had to have that sort of final yeah. um, topology. Um, You're going to do a demo for us yeah. today? Yeah. A live demo? Yeah. We're going to see a live uh, demo? Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. Wow. Um, okay, I will Are People at home ready for close that? Close out of the show. <laughs> that is it. Mm -mm. Uh, Unbelievable. The rare ready. opportunities keep they're on. Not ready the for gift it. that keeps on giving. The Zebra Summit 2022. Paul Gabriel. Oh, my goodness. Caleb Rice is here from Pixar doing a live demo for us on the floor. Wow, e wow is the it's only. Come full circle for me. Come on. He's, when I was in college. Paul Gabriel's like a young boy here smiling. He's out, like it's Christmas we like, in July. We all went to the theater and like, uh, what? And then it was like, what's going on? I was like, Your life I picked changed. the right field. <laughs> I was excited. Good stuff. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Cool. Okay. Uh, Without further ado, on. I guess I gotta, take it away. Um, one second. Got a little bit of. Freezing. This should fix it. There we go. Alrighty. Um, sorry, let me just get situated. No worries. So I chose Darby just because I thought this is a great example of sort of that basic shape yep. lockout. And, uh, you know, even uh, this is Matt's design, but it sort of follows a lot of that principle of, of just how we think about design at Pixar and that. 
you know, how can we just start with simple shapes? Um, so this isn't the actual um, way I, or the actual start of Darby, but it's pretty much what I did, because um, I was like, I don't think I even have that saved anymore, because I, I just get sort of like, you know, some blocked out shapes in there. And with Darby, I really did just start with, um, with some, uh, you know, cubes. And so I, I would just bring a cube in basically, and I'm like, okay, this is gonna be your head. And then uh, get another cube in here, and it was like, okay, this is gonna be the lower part of her face. And then, you know, just uh, from here is, uh, getting in, uh, oh, sorry, my hot keys are, are being a little weird. Um, you know, getting in some plainer stuff, and then, you know, really just trying to think big shape stuff, not even thinking about, uh, about detail at this phase. So, um, yeah, this, as you can see with her nose, uh, I started also with a, um, with a cube. So, uh, and just started to try to bring out, okay, here's where I'm gonna have a nose, and, and I'll really like, just kind of subtly add some stuff, but it's, it's all just thinking big shapes at this point. Um, and I've sort of cookie cuttered uh, in some, some next steps, so, uh, you know, from here, it's like, I could go in and sort of do a subdivide and start thinking about, um, okay, I'm gonna want her to have folds there. I'm gonna definitely want, uh, you know, sort of some, uh, some more anatomy, um, things like that. And just, I, I wanna keep things sharp still, you know, honestly as sharp as possible. I don't wanna do too much smoothing or anything yet. And you're using Trim Dynamic, is that what you're using to, to kind of? Yeah, I'll, uh, sometimes H Polish. Uh, yeah. yeah, in fact, I probably would, would use H Polish um, to just get that nice sort of planer thing in there. Oh, you're going almost back to like cartoon, like, you know, they would just get shapes. They would just get exactly. shapes, so, get characters down and then work in the character. Yeah, so same, same theory as, as that. And that's, I mean, that's really, the same sort of theories in, in design is just how um, how can I kind of break this up into simple shapes? And so, you know, I'm like, okay, I know she's gonna need sort of a nasal labial fold and, uh, and a mouth and, you know, so I'll start to just go in and sort of put some landmarks and uh, where I, I might want some, some folds and things like that. So, but I still wanna keep all those cubes intact and, and uh, you know, with her neck, I probably would have add, you know, adds uh, a little more anatomy in, into there. And um, I mean, I, I love doing just like move and clay build up at the beginning and like nothing else. Um, and yeah, so this is starting to get a little, a little bit of what I want um, just in terms of uh, little details, but nothing, nothing too precise and crazy yet. So it's like, okay, here would be a little more detailed. So started to pull out sort of where the uh, nostrils, uh, a little bit of shaping in the ears. And another thing I would uh, probably just block into that I, I haven't done yet um, is some hair uh, and so I'll, I'll just block in something quick here. Uh, let me turn on. Sorry, I'm like, this, <laughs> this Cintiq's so big I had to like look around to see where, <laughs> where my hand is. This is nice though, this new Cintiq. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not used to this, free to adjust this fancy. Uh, but yeah, just trying to think big shapes and uh, you know, she's got sort of this slicked back hair, so a um, little bit of a, a V sort of coming coming down um, that receding hairline. <laughs> so just something to sort of block it out and 
this would be one where get some subdivision in there and uh, just get some hints of the directionality of her hair. So it's starting to, to yeah. feel like the, you know, just uh, it took like no time, but just having a little bit of something in there yeah, that's quick, to life you know? already. And so mm -hmm. get to, you know, get to a point where I'm like, all right, I, I still have sort of everything separated here. You know, you can just see this is all still very much cubes. Um, and so going in here and then I would, you know, Dynamesh and at this point I'm like, did I even, oh, okay, sorry, this would be me Dynameshing it. Um, so I just have sort of my Dynameshed thing and this is pretty, you know, pretty rough, but here I would definitely want to like really, wherever I do want there to be any kind of full, you know, folds or creases, anything like that, I really want to like over exaggerate at this point. Um, because my next step would to be uh, to Z-Remesh. And, and I'm pretty much using that Z-Remeshed model for as far as I can go with it. So for all the expressions, so even at this stage, I'm starting to think about, okay, this isn't our final design yet, but what do I want the character to do? What, um, you know, with a lot of these, I wanted to try to just really over-exaggerate and give them like a, that cartoony squash stretch, things like that. But you know, what other like mouth shapes with, with Darby, it was like Matt had drawn her, have this ooh mouth shape that like really came out far. And so it's like, okay, how am I gonna, you know, build in sort of uh, details and topology to support that without having to kind of Z-remesh for each, um, each pose. So, and that's sort of the principles of, um, of topology as well. Um, but I'm not, I'm not going that deep. I'm just trying to think like, still keep it loose and stuff, but that's definitely something that is in the back of my mind at, at, this, um, at this stage. And so, you know, uh, we're starting to, <laughs> it's like she's very lumpy, very, you know. What not material are you, are you using skin shade for? What material do you have? Yeah, so this is this is skin shade four, and then I just um, I'm like, this is my secret startup. Right. It's yeah. just skin shade four with like a little bit less spec, just like a hair less, and that's that's all it is. Um, and so I use that. I mean, with all the stuff that's in every uh, thing that's just right out of right. ZBrush, is that's all it is. I'm how I'm showing it and stuff, and um, I just feel like it it has it, the shadows aren't too harsh and you know there's just that nice sort of clay fall off feeling um soft it's and got a soft look there's a, there's a softness to it that i'm like oh I, yeah so that that's kind of, that's what i use for for everything and it's been um yeah it's been really helpful and and even when i i then pull stuff in to sort of render things out um you know, even if it's in an, another software, it feels like it's it's close and, and it gives a, a similar result. Um, and I'm not sort of like shocked when I go into another, uh, you know, if I throw it into Maya or something and uh, it's... Well, then, I'll tell you what, Leticia's saying she's loving what you're doing right now. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> she's watching. Uh, He's here with us tomorrow. She is. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. Leti yeah. I, Leticia is wonderful. She's one of my yeah. best friends. And Be beast tomorrow. Yeah, Leticia. I'm excited to see her and, and Charles. Charles. Yeah, I know Charles, another one of my hits favorite favorite coming. people. So yeah, the hits keep on coming. The yeah, team rolled into town. They're coming with a vengeance. Yeah, that was um, Charles gave me my first start at DreamWorks. So oh, did he? He hired me uh, to work at DreamWorks. So that's the oh, that's how awesome. I got into feature animation was was from him. So yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, that that was great. I, in fact, I was just talking about how, like, I don't know if I'm allowed to be talking about how great Trolls 2 was, but um, it really was a great experience. That's where I worked with Charles and Leticia. Um, but, yep. yeah, great experience, and 
uh, yeah, excited to hear their talk tomorrow. I think you're allowed to spread positivity. To it's, your, it's your path. <laughs> it's your path. That's Absolutely. true. So yeah, I, that was it. Was one of the yeah one of my favorites was working on that with with them and that whole crew. They were they were the best. So um, yeah. So from here and you know I just sort of did this uh, <laughs> kind of quick and you know this wouldn't actually be I, I'd probably go a little further than than this right here, but. Um, this right here is just hitting zebra mesh, seeing what I get, and already I'm, you know, sort of getting uh, that nice planar stuff that I wanted to keep in the topology, um, and you know I can either sharpen it, soften it, and you know I have that edge flow that I want. Um, so, you know, if I wanted to sort of pinch all that stuff. Um, just hitting divide, it already gives me some nice kind of planar stuff. I have enough in here to sort of, um, you know, add uh, some, well, maybe I would want a little more there, but, um, you know, starting to add some smaller details, maybe if she, I want her to have dimples, something like that. and. You know, in the final, it's like starting to look at uh, three quarters, something like that, um, is, you know, how to, how to uh, sort of pull back now. You know, now we're at a point where it's like, okay, she can't just have an actual cube. So how do I bring some anatomy into that? Mm -hmm. and, and one thing is like, it, you know, in the art, in drawings, one of the things is like you have line width. And how do how do you have line width in um, in your sculpt? And that's you know that's these areas like these harsh planes. That's kind of your line width. So handling those planes where you know maybe it goes rather than just this is sort of the same all across right in this plane. So maybe I soften it down as it comes, and then I could let's say sharpen it up here, I don't know, um, but maybe that's not the right thing. But that sort of idea, so it can go from sharp, it'll fall soft, that would sort of give the idea of like a thicker line. Um, and then if the line kind of thins, maybe it gets sharper. Or maybe, um, so you know, maybe that doesn't work. Uh, maybe you try the opposite where it sort of goes um, softer and then it actually pinches more uh, more in the middle. So thinking about things like that, and um, like that's a lot of what I'm thinking about for these details is like what what's the line width I can get in here, and what kind of. I think uh, it's phenomenal to hear you talk about this this way because it's truly linked to the the, the basic premise of drawing first. Yes. So it's almost like you're you're drawing it in 3D. Exactly, and that's uh, and I think that that's kind of like, I mean that's why I love ZBrushes. It um, and and. I mean, it, it is sculpting, and it's it's sort of being able to just do those things and use use these tools in a way that you would use real tools if you were to sculpt it, or and mm -hmm. you know if, if you were to take a drawing and sculpt it, you would still be thinking about those things as a, sure. um, if you were using clay or whatever. So, um, yeah, just just taking all those all those principles and stuff from um, kind of real life. Stuff and and it's the same when you know you're you're doing something in uh, uh, in Photoshop if you're doing a drawing Procreate whatever and uh, you know you want to have those areas of um, of like mimicking the real uh, real paint or whatever you know mm -hmm. um, so it it's yeah same same kind of premise. Um, so yeah, so as you can see, it's like just going in there and now it's so easy for me to create a lot of that uh, sort of soft um, and clean looking stuff, even though I didn't really do much to make it clean. It's just like it's already sort of baked in that way yeah. um, into my topology. So, you know, I can go in and sort of crispen things up, soften them, whatever. Um, but now I have enough that if I want to start, you know, uh, sort of, you know, 
putting expressions in, I have that support and that topology to start um, doing that kind of stuff. So uh, with her though, I'm like, I don't want her mouth open. I, I would want it closed. So I'll do that first. Um, and so we're, we're starting to get somewhere. I'll, I'll give her a little bit uh, darker skin here. And let me just. Yep, you got about 13 minutes. So okay, you can awesome. Check. So when you're doing this, are you given any freedom to kind of give your own personal input? In well, yeah, and, and, and with Darby, it's definitely, a, you know, I, I feel like I, I was more just going from the design, but yeah, yeah with, with other characters, it's, um, you know, especially with characters where it is maybe just something real quick and, it, you know, there's still a lot to be designed, uh, then I'm gonna start sort of trying to figure things out. And, and you know, same, same with um, even sometimes when you, you do have uh, something you're trying to match, you know, you're still kind of having this freedom to, to play around and, you know, sort of have fun with it. So, uh, yeah, that's, ooh. She's coming to life. Right in front of your <laughs> eyes. It's just incredible what a few strokes uh, can do. Yeah. She also reminds me a little bit of Up. Yeah, a, a little bit. Yeah, definitely. I mean, similar idea. Um, I'm going to steal that hair I did earlier. Uh, okay, insert. Um, oh, was there going to be sort of like Q&A kind of thing or? Yeah, I've actually um, been throwing questions that have been coming up. Oh, okay, Those Questions cool. I'm asking you are coming from the chat. Okay, awesome, awesome. I wasn't it's sure if I should me, uh, it's try to. All fanning it's up. not just me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't sure if I should try to uh, wrap no, you're up. Good. But, yeah, no, um, you're in okay. a good no job. Stress. Good pace. Yeah, um, no you're broadcast to 190 countries. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, let me. So you specialize mostly in characters, or do you do environments as well? At the um, yeah, so now I'm, uh, I'm fully uh, on the art team. Uh, for the past, past two shows I've, I've been on, uh, and uh, on, on this current one that I'm on, I, uh, it's, it's pretty early, and so there's been opportunities to sort of get to do a little bit of environment stuff, and uh, uh, I mean it's cool. I, I like I like characters the most, but um, it is nice in art when you know you sort of get to try different stuff too. Um, I mean I don't think I'm a, a, that good at, at environments and stuff, so it's like you know, it's like a learning thing um, in a way because I've, I've m mostly just worked on characters, so that feels comfortable. But I guess there's always that you want to tr get out of your comfort zone and, and keep learning. And, you know, I think that that's for everything, you know. You, you always want to do that and keep sort of pushing, so. Yeah, speaking so, of pushing, this yeah. is like totally out of left field. The way, the way it looks right now, it kind of reminds me of uh, Joe Pesci and the Irishman. And, uh, yeah, she's she's definitely uh, Uncle Joe Pesci. The other she's day. going everywhere right now. She is a little Joe Pesci, <laughs> a little hangry. for sure. She was definitely the like the rougher character for right? the show. The movie. A lot of people so, are like, saying, yeah. not me. Straight to the point. She was she was straight to the point. Right? One pretty much. There the is movie. that quality to it. Yeah. So, anyways, um, and yeah, may, maybe the hair is making her uh, a little overly. Uh, that was a compliment, by the way. Part part of the yeah. part of the mob or something. Caleb, so you know. Okay. That's a compliment. <laughs> I say Joe Pesci, you're in good stead. <laughs> There's a question from somebody. Did you learn anything yeah. cool while you were working on Zerg? Oh, on Zerg. I mean, I was basically doing, uh, you know, final topology stuff. So I, I definitely can't take uh, take too much credit on on Zerg. Uh, but with all the hard surface stuff, it was a huge learning experience for me because 
I did uh, Zap Patrol. I did, uh, and Zap Patrol was one that I started that helmet in ZBrush. I just was like, okay, let me figure out how the heck this helmet works before I really started in on the final topology. Um, and then I, I worked on quite a few of the suits. Um, the, you know, uh, there was quite a few people that sort of took different pieces and stuff, but yeah. Um, yeah, I had to do multiple sort of like, yeah, uh, I did like a um, pre-vis for the, that final suit that he wears. I did all the final modeling on the alpha suit that he wears, which is the, you know, one you see on the mm -hmm. um, posters and, and sure. that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, so, you know, sometimes it was just doing pre-vis stuff, sometimes it was doing uh, the final, um, final, final modeling, and, and both of those things for hard surface is tough. <laughs> and I almost, I was like, I almost don't want to tell anyone that I did any of this because I don't want to have to do it again, because <laughs> it's tough, uh, tough stuff to do hard surface. And that's, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I was almost like, I, I don't want to admit that I, I worked on that stuff because I don't want to be like, hey, can you come do some more uh, hard surface suits and stuff? And uh, yeah, I might, that just, that's tough stuff for me. But punish yourself on purpose. I, mean, I know, exactly, but yeah, I guess I, I outed myself a little here that. <laughs> how um, early do you, uh, someone's asking, how early do you bring poly paint into your process? I, I like seeing stuff with color and it, it helped, for me it helps see the shapes and stuff better. Like right now, it's like I can see her face already better just by having a little bit of poly paint on it. So I'll, I'll show, rather than continuing to do this, it's like I'll just show like where I would end up. Um, and so, yeah, with Darby, it's like um, here was where it was like, okay, I'm in a good place. I've sort of added, added all those details and stuff. And now, you know, I sort of, go through and try to push and pull what I have. And so it's like I want to open up her mouth, see how far I can really push and exaggerate that stuff, trying to hit those map, uh, map poses that he had done. And uh, so it's like you got your, uh, <laughs> you got your stretch, uh, you got your squash. So just kind of going through and five opening. Minutes, Caleb, five minutes. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and oh, he's got great. kind of a sneer. Just so uh, getting those expressions in and, and sort of starting to feel that character, for me, it helps. So I always, it's like if I have a character, I've done the neutral model, I want to get it into some sort of pose as quick as possible to start seeing like, sure. okay, is this feeling right? Is this able to do what I want to do? So here's that kind of ooh shape where she's... Um, you know, really bringing, <laughs> bringing those lips out. And, um, yeah, so th that's the Darby. Um, I know I only have a couple minutes, so was there anything else uh, that you all wanted, wanted me to show ZBrush-wise? Any, any questions for him up there? Or? Um, Paul Gabry? Uh, let's see, I was just asked those. I'm looking at two chats. So. Okay, yeah, no worries. It's managing a lot of chat. Are the yeah. final sculpts for ringing rebuilt from scratch? The final, um, like the final model? Yeah. The final model is, uh, so on some of the characters, they would do a, a wrap of the, um, of the topology onto the sculpt. Um, but then, obviously, things, because some of this stuff's done so early and, and design sort of evolves uh, as it's going on, uh, you know, the people doing those models will have to sort of evolve the, the model, you know? So, um, but with some of the early sculpts, it's like a topology has to be created. Um, so, yeah. And where you were at with her, you were still in Dynamesh, where you were just at with her, were you still in Dynamesh, or did you already have a remesh? So yeah, all this stuff is now. Um, that one's Z remesh now. Yeah, so this is all. So like you make your, that shift when you're gonna start doing the expressions. Is that when you make the shift from the Dynamesh to the Z remeshed version? 
Uh, no, I, I keep the Z-remeshed version. So this is my Z-remeshed version. Mm -hmm. And uh, then going through here is I'm just taking that Z-remeshed version and pushing it around. And, you know, I'll go down to, to sort of my, uh, oh, well, that's not it. Um, I'll go down to like my base level and that's where I'm doing all those, um, all those, you know, movements of like moving the mouth around yeah, and opening it up and um, is uh, in this low and then, and then is the high res is where I go in and sort of um, add any of those details or wrinkles that might be sort of activated by, <laughs> by some of the expressions, so. So someone, because yeah. you opened her expression, uh, creating any uh, tips for creating the mouth cavity? Were you just using clay buildup and pushing in to do her cavity? Yeah, that? I was. Um, the the mouth cavity is uh, just pushing in, and uh, and and that is another thing. So that's part of why I leave the mouth open. And what I would probably do in this case, this is, I just did this quick as sort of a test. But in mm -hmm. if I was actually you know doing this, I would uh, sort of go in here and try to mask just the mouth um, and then which um, I'm like it's because it's live it's not gonna let me do it but um, <laughs> you know I would essentially there we go uh, just have the mouth and uh, just push that back probably make it bigger um, with masking so now I have this mouth that sort of goes uh, goes back and then when I Z remesh now I have a lot of topology back there so yeah. I'll polygroup that um, once I have the uh, once I have the Z remeshed model and then I have that on a separate uh, do you have perspective on or off when you're doing this oh it's like you have you're right I turned it off I turned it off to do a mask and I never brought it back on oh, okay so but you so okay. you work you work in perspective then Yes, um, I yeah. always work in perspective. Yeah. Oh gosh, the yeah. I've been showing all this stuff, and uh, nonetheless, um, it looks nice. And they're giving yeah. us the wrap-up signal. Inside. Oh, the wrap. Okay. All so, right. Well, yeah. Thank I you think all. It was an amazing circumstance to have you here with us. We want to say thank uh, you so much. Thank you uh, all. Yeah. Paul, tell him thank, thank you because you worked so hard to make yeah, this well, happen. Look, and he did. He did a ton of work to, to make this all. Both happen, of you. So yeah, no Caleb, problem. Thank you. You and you. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, it was a. Uh, it was an exciting one for me to be able to get the pick team from Pixar to come down and be able to show what you guys have been doing with ZBrush. So I'm happy you did. Yeah. Happy you did. Well, you were the last of today, the second day of the formal ZBrush Summit 2022. Uh, I think we're going to do cool. one last giveaway. I've got giveaways. Cool. And I think uh, we'll thank you so much for now, Caleb Rice. All right. Yeah, thank you. Pixar thank you all. Into infinity thank and you beyond you go. Thank yeah, you so much thank you guys. Here. Absolutely. Cool. Let's kick it to Paul with some giveaways. Yeah. Right, so what you're telling me is some giveaways, huh? Last of the giveaways uh, for day two here. Last Summit. of the giveaways here. Last of the giveaways. All right, let's finish this off and get some giveaways out there. So I'm going to do a one-year subscription to Noman Workshop. Again, fabulous. You're going to get a lot of information. It's a lot here. of value. Lots of value here. So definitely, uh, let's see who we got value. here. Let me copy that. Let me confirm it. That's one year. Sylvain. Oh, let's hold on. Sylvain. One year of black belt training. Hold on, and I gotta, well, I gotta clean up the chat. I just noticed something in my chat here. Sylvain de Chavigny. Chavigny. Sylvain Chavigny. There you go. You are the winner of a one-year subscription to the Noman Workshop. Let's keep it rocking and rolling here. Let's keep moving down the line. I've got another one. I'm just giving it away over here, like I had anything to do with this. All access membership to ZBrush Jewelry Workshop, an all access winner to a jewelry ZBrush Workshop. Really great crew over there, Thomas Holdebach, the founder, and with Eric Keller, you're gonna learn a lot from them, Wilson. Wilson, you are the winner. Wilson Chen, Wilson Chen, you are the winner. Congratulations, you have just won some time with Mr. Thomas Wittelbach and Eric Keller. Always a good time. Always a good time. Oh, let's do this one. Yes, I got another one. I got another one. Okay, so this is, again, keep in mind, this is the on-site animal anatomy workshop. This is, takes place in Vegas, so you will have to get to Vegas. 
that's not part of this. You got to be able to get yourself to Las Vegas Hold on for one the on site animal anatomy workshop. But there's also the lioness anatomy piece that they have here that you're going to win as well. So you're winning multiple things. Hold on one here. second. Huh? We're not giving you a ticket to Las Vegas. No. Nope. No get, ticket to Las Vegas. Get the class. You got to find your way to Vegas. You got to find your way to Vegas, for sure. So Alberto, Alberto Tufino, you have just won that awesome giveaway from our Anatomy Tools and Evolution. You gonna do one more? Uh, I, yeah, I got, I got, I got, I got two more actually. All right. I got two more. I got two more two to give more away. More it is. So let me show this image. All right, we've got a Nomen online 10 week course. Oof. A Nomen online 10 week course. Wowie. Yeah, Wowie is right, my good man. And a bag of money. Wowie, a bag of money. Oscar, Oscar, you have just won that. Oscar Baralis. You, I am putting in the chat so you can see the name officially in both chats. Yes. There you go. Uh, I've got I got another one. I got another one. Let me show this image. It's, it keeps coming. It keeps coming. All right. So there we go. The ultimate ZBrush guide course. The ultimate ZBrush guide course. Here you go. Let me confirm the winner. And then here who has won that? Garin Lu. Garden, wait, oh, here it is. Let me put it over here. It's easier for me to see on this white one. Garin Lee, Garin Lee, or Liu, could be either or. I don't. L I U. Know. Not good. L I U. Liu. Liu. Yeah, Liu. Liu. Very nicely done, Paul. Okay, thanks. Are thanks, there, Louis. Are there no more prizes? There's no more prizes. We're done with the prizes. That's it for today. Keep in mind, we've got more tomorrow. Um, so we got a lot more coming on for those, for our sponsors, more giveaways. Again, you have to register between every single presentation. That, that so, Louie, what else we got going on? Tomorrow, last Wednesday, tomorrow. the last day, a small, slow tear falls down my cheek. We'll start off the day with the AFA Foundry and Forum from ZBrush to Bronze. There will be some pouring. That's uh, no secret now. It's uh, going to be on location with... We're Louis. going there. Paul Gabriel is going We're doing to be a taking tour. us inside the foundry tomorrow. Be here live, 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Frame store, creatures from scratch to screen, always nice. Raphael Phillips, Wakanda Forever, with his uh, collectibles, creatures, and clay. A really, really amazing body of work from him. Sea Beast, bring in the Sea Beast action, uh, making of characters and viz dev models. And then the last one, the big one that they all wait for, that they ask the questions about, is the ZBrush presentation. With members of the ZBrush team here, the Maxon ZBrush team, Broadcasting around the globe, new features under the hood to check it out and see what we've been up to and give a sneak peek as to what might be coming forward. I'm Louis Tucci, uh, and on behalf of my associate, Paul Gabery, this was day two inside the ZBrush Summit. I want to thank Ian Robinson, our on-site correspondent, day for three today's technical. action. We'll be back tomorrow again. Uh, until then, everybody stay safe, and thanks so much for the support. Thanks, everybody.
Learn jewelry design and object fabrication through ZBrush. Expert, beginner, and every skill level in between. ZBrush Jewelry Workshops can help you bring your digital dreams into reality. Taught by leading industry professionals. Use the offer code SUMMIT to get a $100 discount on membership. Three, two, one. 